Prologue Julie The scapulae had been taken eight days ago, and Julie Ma was finally ready to be shot. It had taken all eight days trapped in a storage locker for her to get to that point. For the first two, she'd remained motionless, sure that the armored men who'd put her there had been serious. For the first hours, the ship she'd been taken aboard wasn't under thrust, so she floated in the locker, using gentle touches to keep herself from bumping into the walls or the atmosphere suit she shared the space with. When the ship began to move, thrust giving her weight, she'd stood silently until her legs cramped, then sat down slowly into a fetal position. She'd peed in her jumpsuit, not caring about the warm, itchy wetness or the smell, worrying only that she might slip and fall in the wet spot it left on the floor. She couldn't make noise. They'd shoot her. On the third day, thirst had forced her into action. The noise of the ship was all around her, the faint subsonic rumble of the reactor and drive, the constant hiss and thud of hydraulics and steel bolts as the pressure doors between decks opened and closed, the clump of heavy boots walking on metal decking. She waited until all the noise she could hear sounded distant, then pulled the environment suit off its hooks and onto the locker floor. Listening for any approaching sound, she slowly disassembled the suit and took out the water supply. It was old and stale. The suit obviously hadn't been used or serviced in ages. But she hadn't had a sip in days, and the warm, loamy water in the suit's reservoir bag was the best thing she had ever tasted. She had to work hard not to gulp it down and make herself vomit. When the urge to urinate returned, she pulled the catheter bag out of the suit and relieved herself into it. She sat on the floor now cushioned by the padded suit and almost comfortable, and wondered who her captors were. Coalition Navy? Pirates? Something worse. Sometimes she slept. On day four, isolation, hunger, boredom, and the diminishing number of places to store her piss finally pushed her to make contact with them. She'd heard muffled cries of pain, Somewhere nearby, her shipmates were being beaten or tortured. If she got the attention of the kidnappers, maybe they would just take her to the others. That was okay. Beatings she could handle. It seemed like a small price to pay if it meant seeing people again. The locker sat beside the inner airlock door. During flight, that usually wasn't a high-traffic area though she didn't know anything about the layout of this particular ship. She thought about what to say, how to present herself. When she finally heard someone moving toward her, she just tried to yell that she wanted out. The dry rasp that came out of her throat surprised her. She swallowed, working her tongue to try to create some saliva, and tried again. Another faint rattle in the throat. The people were right outside her locker door. A voice was talking quietly. Julie had pulled back a fist to bang on the door when she heard what it was saying. No. Please no. Please don't. Dave, her ship's mechanic. Dave, who collected clips from old cartoons and knew a million jokes, begging in a small, broken voice. No. Please no. Please don't, he said. Hydraulics and locking bolts clicked as the inner airlock door opened. A meaty thud as something was thrown inside. Another click as the airlock closed. A hiss of evacuating air. When the airlock cycle had finished, the people outside her door walked away. She didn't bang to get their attention. They'd scrubbed the ship. Detainment by the inner planet navies was a bad scenario but they'd all trained on how to deal with it. Sensitive OPA data was scrubbed and overwritten with innocuous-looking logs with false timestamps. Anything too sensitive to trust to a computer, the captain destroyed. When the attackers came aboard, they could play innocent. It hadn't mattered. 
There weren't the questions about cargo or permits. The invaders had come in like they owned the place, and Captain Darren had rolled over like a dog. Everyone else, Mike, Dave, Wan Li, they'd all just thrown up their hands and gone along quietly. The pirates or slavers or whatever they were had dragged them off the little transport ship that had been their home and down a docking tube without even minimal environment suits. The tube's thin layer of mylar was the only thing between them and hard nothing. Hope it didn't rip. Goodbye lungs if it did. Julie had gone along too, but then the bastards had tried to lay their hands on her, strip her clothes off. Five years of low-gravity jujitsu training and them in a confined space with no gravity. She'd done a lot of damage. She'd almost started to think she might win when from nowhere a gauntleted fist smashed into her face. Things got fuzzy after that. Then the locker and shoot her if she makes a noise. Four days of not making noise, while they beat her friends down below and then threw one of them out an airlock. After six days, everything went quiet. Shifting between bouts of consciousness and fragmented dreams, she was only vaguely aware as the sounds of walking, talking, and pressure doors and the subsonic rumble of the reactor and the drive faded away a little at a time. When the drive stopped, so did gravity, and Julie woke from a dream of racing her old pinnace to find herself floating, while her muscles screamed in protest and then slowly relaxed. She pulled herself to the door and pressed her ear to the cold metal. Panic shot through her until she caught the quiet sound of the air recyclers. The ship still had power and air, but the drive wasn't on, and no one was opening a door or walking or talking. Maybe it was a crew meeting, or a party on another deck, or everyone was in engineering fixing a serious problem. She spent a day listening and waiting. By day seven, her last sip of water was gone. No one on the ship had moved within range of her hearing for twenty-four hours. She sucked on a plastic tab she'd ripped off the environment suit until she worked up some saliva. Then she started yelling. She yelled herself hoarse. No one came. By day eight, she was ready to be shot. She'd been out of water for two days, and her waist bag had been full for four. She put her shoulders against the back wall of the locker and planted her hands against the side walls. Then she kicked out with both legs as hard as she could. The cramps that followed the first kick almost made her pass out. She screamed instead. Stupid girl, she told herself. She was dehydrated. Eight days without activity was more than enough to start atrophy. At least she should have stretched out. She massaged her stiff muscles until the knots were gone, then stretched, focusing her mind like she was back in dojo. When she was in control of her body, she kicked again, and again, and again until light started to show through the edges of the locker and again until the door was so bent that the three hinges and the locking bolt were the only points of contact between it and the frame. And one last time, so that it bent far enough that the bolt was no longer seated in the hasp, and the door swung free. Julie shot from the locker, hands half-raised and ready to look either threatening or terrified, depending on which seemed more useful. There was no one on the whole deck. The airlock, the suit storage room where she'd spent the last eight days, a half dozen other storage rooms, all empty. She plucked a magnetized pipe wrench of suitable size for skull cracking out of an EVA kit, then went down the crew ladder to the deck below. And then the one below that. And then the one below that. Personnel cabins in crisp, almost military order. Commissary where there were signs of a struggle. Medical bay, empty. Torpedo bay, no one. The comm station was unmanned, powered down and locked. The few sensor logs that still streamed showed no sign of the scopuli. A new dread knotted her gut. 
deck after deck and room after room, empty of life. Something had happened. A radiation leak. Poison in the air. Something that had forced an evacuation. She wondered if she'd be able to fly the ship by herself. But if they'd evacuated, she'd have heard them going out the airlock, wouldn't she? She reached the final deck hatch, the one that led into engineering, and stopped when the hatch didn't open automatically. A red light on the lock panel showed that the room had been sealed from the inside. She thought again about radiation and major failures. But if either of those was the case, why lock the door from the inside? And she had passed wall panel after wall panel. None of them had been flashing warnings of any kind. No. Not radiation. Something else. There was more disruption here. Blood. Tools and containers in disarray. Whatever had happened, it had happened here. No. It had started here. And it had ended behind that locked door. It took two hours with a torch and prying tools from the machine shop to cut through the hatch to engineering. With the hydraulics compromised, she had to crank it open by hand. A gust of warm, wet air blew out, carrying a hospital scent without the antiseptic, a coppery, nauseating smell. The torture chamber, then. Her friends would be inside, beaten or cut to pieces. Julie hefted her wrench and prepared to bust open at least one head before they killed her. She floated down. The engineering deck was huge, vaulted like a cathedral. The fusion reactor dominated the central space. Something was wrong with it. Where she expected to see readouts, shielding, and monitors, a layer of something like mud seemed to flow over the reactor core. Slowly, Julie floated toward it, one hand still on the ladder. The strange smell became overpowering. The mud caked around the reactor had structure to it like nothing she'd seen before. Tubes ran through it, like veins or airways. Parts of it pulsed. Not mud, then. Flesh. An outcropping of the thing shifted toward her. Compared to the hole, it seemed no larger than a toe, a little finger. It was Captain Darren's head. Help me, it said. Chapter One Holden A hundred and fifty years before, when the parochial disagreements between Earth and Mars had been on the verge of war, the belt had been a far horizon of tremendous mineral wealth beyond viable economic reach, and the outer planets had been beyond even the most unrealistic corporate dream. Then, Solomon Epstein had built his little modified fusion drive, popped it on the back of his three-man yacht, and turned it on. With a good scope, you could still see his ship, going at a marginal percentage of the speed of light, heading out into the big empty. The best, longest funeral in the history of mankind. Fortunately, he'd left the plans on his home computer. The Epstein Drive hadn't given humanity the stars, but it had delivered the planets. Three quarters of a kilometer long, a quarter of a kilometer wide, roughly shaped like a fire hydrant and mostly empty space inside, the Canterbury was a retooled colony transport. Once, it had been packed with people, supplies, schematics, machines, environment bubbles, and hope. Just under twenty million people lived on the moons of Saturn now. The Canterbury had hauled nearly a million of their ancestors there. Forty-five million on the moons of Jupiter. One moon of Uranus sported five thousand, the farthest outpost of human civilization at least until the Mormons finished their generation ship and headed for the stars and freedom from procreation restrictions. And then there was the belt. If you asked OPA recruiters when they were drunk and feeling expansive, they might say there were a hundred million in the belt. 
ask an interplanet census taker, it was nearer to 50 million. Any way you looked, the population was huge and needed a lot of water. So now the Canterbury and her dozens of sister ships and the Pure and Clean Water Company made the loop from Saturn's generous rings to the belt and back, hauling glaciers, and would until the ships aged into salvage wrecks. Jim Holden saw some poetry in that. Holden. He turned back to the hangar deck. Chief Engineer Naomi Nagata towered over him. She stood almost two full meters tall, her mop of curly hair tied back into a black tail, her expression halfway between amusement and annoyance. She had the belter habit of shrugging with her hands instead of her shoulders. Holden, are you listening or just staring out the window? There was a problem, Holden said. And because you're really, really good, you can fix it even though you don't have enough money or supplies. Naomi laughed. So you weren't listening, she said. Not really, no. Well, you got the basics right anyhow. Knight's landing gear isn't going to be good in atmosphere until I can get the seals replaced. That going to be a problem? I'll ask the old man, Holden said. But when's the last time we used the shuttle in atmosphere? Never, but regs say we need at least one Atmo-capable shuttle. Hey, boss! Amos Burton, Naomi's Earth-born assistant, yelled from across the bay. He waved one meaty arm in their general direction. He meant Naomi. Amos might be on Captain McDowell's ship, Holden might be executive officer, but in Amos Burton's world, only Naomi was boss. What's the matter? Naomi shouted back. Bad cable. Can you hold this little fucker in place while I get the spare? Naomi looked at Holden. Are we done here? In her eyes. He snapped a sarcastic salute, and she snorted, shaking her head as she walked away, her frame long and thin in her greasy coveralls. Seven years in Earth's Navy, five years working in space with civilians, and he'd never gotten used to the long, thin, improbable bones of belters. A childhood spent in gravity shaped the way he saw things forever. At the central lift, Holden held his finger briefly over the button for the navigation deck, tempted by the prospect of Ade Tukumbo, her smile, her voice, the patchouli and vanilla scent she used in her hair, but pressed the button for the infirmary instead. Duty before pleasure. Shed Garvey, the medical tech, was hunched over his lab table, debriding the stump of Cameron Padge's left arm when Holden walked in. A month earlier, Padge had gotten his elbow pinned by a thirty-ton block of ice moving at five millimeters a second. It wasn't an uncommon injury among people with the dangerous job of cutting and moving zero-G icebergs, and Padge was taking the whole thing with the fatalism of a professional. Holden leaned over Shed's shoulder to watch as the tech plucked one of the medical maggots out of dead tissue. What's the word? Holden asked. It's looking pretty good, sir, Padge said. I've still got a few nerves. Shed's been telling me about how the prosthetic is going to hook up to it. Assuming we can keep the necrosis under control, the medic said, and make sure Padge doesn't heal up too much before we get to Ceres. I checked the policy, and Padge here's been signed on long enough to get one with force feedback, pressure and temperature sensors, fine motor software, the whole package. It'll be almost as good as the real thing. The inner planets have a new biogel that regrows the limb, but that isn't covered in our medical plan. Fuck the inners and fuck their magic jello. I'd rather have a good belter-built fake than anything those bastards grow in a lab. Just wearing their fancy arm probably turns you into an asshole. Padge said. Then he added, Oh, uh, no offense, Exo. None taken. Just glad we're going to get you fixed up, Holden said. Tell him the other bit, Padge said with a wicked grin. Shed blushed. I've, uh, heard from other guys who've gotten them, Shed said, not meeting Holden's eyes. 
Apparently, there's a period while you're still building identification with the prosthetic when whacking off feels just like getting a hand job. Holden let the comment hang in the air for a second while Shed's ears turned crimson. Good to know, Holden said. And the necrosis? There's some infection, Shed said. The maggots are keeping it under control, and the inflammation's actually a good thing in this context. So we're not fighting too hard unless it starts to spread. Is he going to be ready for the next run? Holden asked. For the first time, Padge frowned. Shit, yes. I'll be ready. I'm always ready. This is what I do, sir. Probably, Shed said, depending on how the bond takes. If not this one, the one after. Fuck that, Padge said. I can buck ice one-handed better than half the skags you've got on this bitch. Again, Holden said, suppressing a grin. Good to know. Carry on. Padge snorted. Shed plucked another maggot free. Holden went back to the lift, and this time, he didn't hesitate. The navigation station of the Canterbury didn't dress to impress. The great wall-sized displays Holden had imagined when he'd first volunteered for the Navy did exist on capital ships, but even there more as an artifact of design than need. Ade sat at a pair of screens only slightly larger than a hand terminal, graphs of the efficiency and output of the Canterbury's reactor and engine updating in the corners, raw logs spooling on the right as the systems reported in. She wore thick headphones that covered her ears, the faint thump of the bass line barely escaping. If the Canterbury sensed an anomaly, it would alert her. If a system errored, it would alert her. If Captain McDowell left the command and control deck, it would alert her so she could turn the music off and look busy when he arrived. Her petty hedonism was only one of a thousand things that made Ade attractive to Holden. He walked up behind her pulled the headphones gently away from her ears and said, Hey. Ade smiled, tapped her screen and dropped the headphones to rest around her long, slim neck like technical jewelry. Executive Officer James Holden, she said with an exaggerated formality made even more acute by her thick Nigerian accent. And what can I do for you? You know, it's funny you should ask that, he said. I was just thinking how pleasant it would be to have someone come back to my cabin when third shift takes over. Have a little romantic dinner of the same crap they're serving in the galley. Listen to some music. Drink a little wine, she said. Break a little protocol. Pretty to think about, but I'm not up for sex tonight. I wasn't talking about sex. A little food. Conversation. I was talking about sex, she said. Holden knelt beside her chair. In the one-third G of their current thrust, it was perfectly comfortable. Ade's smile softened. The log spool chimed. She glanced at it, tapped a release, and turned back to him. Ade, I like you. I mean, I really enjoy your company, he said. I don't understand why we can't spend some time together with our clothes on. Holden, sweetie. Stop it, okay? Stop what? Stop trying to turn me into your girlfriend. You're a nice guy. You've got a cute butt, and you're fun in the sack. Doesn't mean we're engaged. Holden rocked back on his heels, feeling himself frown. Ade, for this to work for me, it needs to be more than that. But it isn't, she said, taking his hand. It's okay that it isn't. You're the XO here, and I'm a short-timer. Another run, maybe two, and I'm gone. I'm not chained to this ship either. Her laughter was equal parts warmth and disbelief. How long have you been on the cant? Five years. You're not going any place, she said. You're comfortable here. Comfortable? he said. The cant's a century-old ice hauler. You can find a shittier flying job, but you have to try really hard. Everyone here is either wildly underqualified or seriously screwed things up at their last gig. 
and you're comfortable here. Her eyes were less kind now. She bit her lip, looked down at the screen, looked up. I didn't deserve that, he said. You didn't, she agreed. Look, I told you I wasn't in the mood tonight. I'm feeling cranky. I need a good night's sleep. I'll be nicer tomorrow. Promise? I'll even make you dinner. Apology accepted? He slipped forward, pressed his lips to hers. She kissed back, politely at first, and then with more warmth. Her fingers cupped his neck for a moment, then pulled him away. You're entirely too good at that. You should go now, she said, on duty and all. Okay, he said, and didn't turn to go. Jim, she said, and the shipwide comm system clicked on. Hold into the bridge, Captain McDowell said, his voice compressed and echoing. Holden replied with something obscene. Ade laughed. He swooped in, kissed her cheek, and headed back for the central lift, quietly hoping that Captain McDowell suffered boils and public humiliation for his lousy timing. The bridge was hardly larger than Holden's quarters and smaller by half than the galley. Except for the slightly oversized captain's display, required by Captain McDowell's failing eyesight and general distrust of corrective surgery, it could have been an accounting firm's back room. The air smelled of cleaning astringent and someone's overly strong yerba mate tea. McDowell shifted in his seat as Holden approached. Then the captain leaned back, pointing over his shoulder at the communications station. Becca, McDowell snapped. Tell him. Rebecca Byers, the comm officer on duty, could have been bred from a shark and a hatchet. Black eyes, sharp features, lips so thin they might as well not have existed. The story on board was that she'd taken the job to escape prosecution for killing an ex-husband. Holden liked her. Emergency signal, she said. Picked it up two hours ago. The transponder verification just bounced back from Callisto. It's real. Ah, Holden said, and then... Shit. Are we the closest? Only ship in a few million clicks. Well, that figures, Holden said. Becca turned her gaze to the captain. McDowell cracked his knuckles and stared at his display. The light from the screen gave him an odd, greenish cast. It's next to a charted non-belt asteroid, McDowell said. Really? Holden said in disbelief. Did they run into it? There's nothing else out here for millions of kilometers. Maybe they pulled over because someone had to go potty. All we have is that some knucklehead is out there blasting an emergency signal and we're the closest. Assuming... The law of the solar system was unequivocal. In an environment as hostile to life as space, the aid and goodwill of your fellow humans wasn't optional. The emergency signal, just by existing, obligated the nearest ship to stop and render aid. Which didn't mean the law was universally followed. The Canterbury was fully loaded. Well over a million tons of ice had been gently accelerated for the past month. Just like the little glacier that had crushed Padge's arm, it was going to be hard to slow down. The temptation to have an unexplained calm failure erase the logs and let the great god Darwin have his way, was always there. But if McDowell had really intended that, he wouldn't have called Holden up, or made the suggestion where the crew could hear him. Holden understood the dance. The captain was going to be the one who would have blown it off, except for Holden. The grunts would respect the captain for not wanting to cut into the ship's profit, They'd respect Holden for insisting that they follow the rule. No matter what happened, the captain and Holden would both be hated for what they were required by law and mere human decency to do. We have to stop, Holden said, then gamely. There may be salvage. McDowell tapped his screen. Ade's voice came from the console as low and warm as if she'd been in the room. Captain? 
I need numbers on stopping this crate, he said. Sir? How hard is it going to be to put us alongside CA-2216862? Was stopping at an asteroid? I'll tell you when you followed my order, Navigator Tukumbo. Yes, sir, she said. Holden heard a series of clicks. If we flip the ship right now and burn like hell for most of two days, I can get us within 50,000 kilometers, sir. Can you define burn like hell? McDowell said. We'll need everyone in crash couches. Of course we will, McDowell sighed and scratched his scruffy beard. And shifting ice is only going to do a couple million bucks worth of banging up the hull, if we're lucky. I'm getting old for this, Holden. I really am. Yes, sir, you are. And I've always liked your chair, Holden said. McDowell scowled and made an obscene gesture. Rebecca snorted in laughter. McDowell turned to her. Send a message to the beacon that we're on our way, and let Ceres know we're going to be late. Holden, where does the night stand? No flying in atmosphere until we get some parts, but she'll do fine for 50,000 clicks in vacuum. You sure of that? Naomi said it. That makes it true. McDowell rose, unfolding to almost two and a quarter meters and thinner than a teenager back on Earth. Between his age and never having lived in a gravity well, the coming burn was likely to be hell on the old man. Holden felt a pang of sympathy that he would never embarrass McDowell by expressing. Here's the thing, Jim, McDowell said, his voice quiet enough that only Holden could hear him. We're required to stop and make an attempt. But we don't have to go out of our way, if you see what I mean. We'll already have stopped, Holden said and McDowell patted the air with his wide, spidery hands, one of the many belter gestures that had evolved to be visible when wearing an environment suit. I can't avoid that, he said. But if you see anything out there that seems off, don't play hero again. Just pack up the toys and come home. And leave it for the next ship that comes through? And keep yourself safe, McDowell said. Order. Understood? Understood, Holden said. As the ship-wide comm system clicked to life and McDowell began explaining the situation to the crew, Holden imagined he could hear a chorus of groans coming up through the decks. He went over to Rebecca. Okay, he said. What have we got on the broken ship? Light freighter, Martian registry, shows Eros as home port. Calls itself Scopuli. Chapter 2 Miller Detective Miller sat back on the foam core chair, smiling gentle encouragement while he scrambled to make sense of the girl's story. And then it was all pow, room full up with blade boys howling and humping shank, the girl said, waving a hand. Look like a dance number, except that Bomi's got this look he didn't know nothing, never, and ever, amen, you know, okay? Havelock, standing by the door, blinked twice. The squat man's face twitched with impatience. It was why Havelock was never going to make senior detective, and why he sucked at poker. Miller was very good at poker. I totally, Miller said. His voice had taken on the twang of an inner-level resident. He waved his hand in the same lazy arc the girl used. Bomi he didn't see. Forgotten arm. Forgotten fucking arm, yeah, the girl said as if Miller had spoken a line of gospel. Miller nodded and the girl nodded back like they were two birds doing a mating dance. The rent hole was three cream and black fleck-painted rooms. Bathroom, kitchen living room. The struts of a pull-down sleeping loft in the living room had been broken and repaired so many times they didn't retract anymore. This near the center of Ceres' spin that wasn't from gravity so much as mass in motion. The air smelled beery with old protein yeast and mushrooms. Local food, so whoever had bounced the girl hard enough to break her bed hadn't paid enough for dinner. 
Or maybe they did, and the girl had chosen to spend it on heroin, or Malta, or MCK. Her business, either way. Follow, okay? Miller asked. Boom evacuate like losing air, the girl said with a chuckle. Bang head hops, can is too? Can, Miller said. Now all new blade boys, overhead I'm out. And Bomi? The girl's eyes made a slow track up Miller. Shoes to knees to pork pie hat. Miller chuckled. He gave the chair a light push, sloping up to his feet in the low gravity. He shows and I asked, Casey, Miller said. Como no, the girl said. Why not? The tunnel outside was white where it wasn't grimy. Ten meters wide and gently sloping up in both directions. The white LED lights didn't pretend to mimic sunlight. About half a kilometer down, someone had rammed into the wall so hard the native rock showed through, and it still hadn't been repaired. Maybe it wouldn't be. This was the deep dig, way up near the center of spin. Tourists never came here. Havelock led the way to their cart, bouncing too high with every step. He didn't come up to the low gravity levels very often, and it made him awkward. Miller had lived on Ceres his whole life, and truth to tell, the Coriolis effect up this high could make him a little unsteady sometimes, too. So, Havelock said as he punched in their destination code, did you have fun? I don't know what you mean, Miller said. The electrical motors hummed to life and the cart lurched forward into the tunnel, squishy foam tires faintly squeaking. Having your outworld conversation in front of the Earth guy, Havelock said. I couldn't follow even half of that. That wasn't belters keeping the Earth guy out, Miller said. That was poor folks keeping the educated guy out. And it was kind of fun, now you mention it. Havelock laughed. He could take being teased and keep on moving. It was what made him good at team sports, soccer, basketball, politics. Miller wasn't much good at those. Ceres, the port city of the belt and the outer planets, boasted 250 kilometers in diameter, tens of thousands of kilometers of tunnels in layer on layer on layer. Spinning it up to 0.3G had taken the best minds at Tycho Manufacturing half a generation, and they were still pretty smug about it. Now Ceres had more than six million permanent residents, and as many as a thousand ships docking in any given day meant upping the population to as high as seven million. Platinum, iron, and titanium from the belt, water from Saturn, vegetables and beef from the big mirror-fed greenhouses on Ganymede and Europa, organics from Earth and Mars, power cells from Io, helium-3 from the refineries on Rhea, an Iapetus, a river of wealth and power unrivaled in human history, came through Ceres. Where there was commerce on that level, there was also crime. Where there was crime, there were security forces to keep it in check. Men like Miller and Havelock, whose business it was to track the electric carts up the wide ramps, feel the false gravity of spin fall away beneath them, and ask low-rent glitz whores about what happened the night Bomi Chatterjee stopped collecting protection money for the Golden Bow Society. The primary station house for Star Helix Security, police force and military garrison for the Ceres station, was on the third level from the asteroid skin, two kilometers square, and dug into the rock so high Miller could walk from his desk up five levels without ever leaving the offices. Havelock turned in the cart, while Miller went to his cubicle, downloaded the recording of their interview with the girl, and reran it. He was halfway through when his partner lumbered up behind him. Learn anything? Havelock asked. Not much, Miller said. Bomi got jumped by a bunch of unaffiliated local thugs. Sometimes a low-level guy like Bomi will hire people to pretend to attack him so he can heroically fight them off. Ups his reputation. That's what she meant when she called it a dance number. 
The guys that went after him were that caliber. Only instead of turning into a ninja badass, Bomi ran away and hasn't come back. And now? And now nothing, Miller said. That's what I don't get. Someone took out a Golden Bow purse boy, and there's no payback. I mean, okay, Bomi's a bottom feeder, but... But once they start eating the little guys, there's less money coming up to the big guys, Havelock said. So why hasn't the Golden Bow meted out some gangster justice? I don't like this, Miller said. Havelock laughed. Belters, he said. One thing goes weird and you think the whole ecosystem's crashing. If the Golden Bow's too weak to keep its claims, that's a good thing. They're the bad guys, remember? Yeah, well, Miller said. Say what you will about organized crime, at least it's organized. Havelock sat on the small plastic chair beside Miller's desk and craned to watch the playback. Okay, Havelock said. What the hell is the forgotten arm? Boxing term, Miller said. It's the hit you didn't see coming. The computer chimed and Captain Shadid's voice came from the speakers. Miller, are you there? Hmm, Havelock said. Bad omen. What? the captain asked, her voice sharp. She had never quite overcome her prejudice against Havelock's inner planet origins. Miller held up a hand to silence his partner. Here, Captain, what can I do for you? Meet me in my office, please. On my way, he said. Miller stood and Havelock slid into his chair. They didn't speak. Both of them knew that Captain Shadid would have called them in together if she'd wanted Havelock to be there. Another reason the man would never make senior detective. Miller left him alone with the playback, trying to parse the fine points of class and station, origin and race. Lifetime's work, that. Captain Shadid's office was decorated in a soft, feminine style. Real cloth tapestries hung from the walls, and the scent of coffee and cinnamon came from an insert in her air filter. It cost about a tenth of what the real foodstuffs would have. She wore her uniform casually, her hair down around her shoulders in violation of corporate regulations. If Miller had ever been called upon to describe her, the phrase deceptive coloration would have figured in. She nodded to a chair, and he sat. What have you found? she asked, but her gaze was on the wall behind him. This wasn't a pop quiz. She was just making conversation. Golden Bow's looking the same as Sohiro's crew and the Loka Grega. Still on station, but distracted, I guess I'd call it. They're letting little things slide. Fewer thugs on the ground, less enforcement. I've got half a dozen mid-level guys who've gone dark. He'd caught her attention. Killed? she asked. An OPA advance? An advance by the Outer Planets Alliance was the constant boogeyman for Ceres security. Living in the tradition of Al Capone and Hamas, the IRA and the Red Marshals, the OPA was beloved by the people it helped and feared by the ones who got in its way. Part social movement, part wannabe nation, and part terrorist network, it totally lacked an institutional conscience. Captain Shadid might not like Havelock because he was from down a gravity well, but she'd work with him. The OPA would have put him in an airlock. People like Miller would only rate getting a bullet in the skull, and a nice plastic one at that. Nothing that might get shrapnel in the ductwork. I don't think so, he said. It doesn't smell like a war. It's... Honestly, sir, I don't know what the hell it is. The numbers are great. Protection's down. Unlicensed gambling's down. Cooper and Hariri shut down the underage whorehouse up on six, and as far as anyone can tell, it hasn't started up again. There's a little more action by independence, but that aside, it's all looking great. It just smells funny. She nodded, but her gaze was back on the wall. He'd lost her interest as quickly as he'd gotten it. Well, put it aside, she said. I have something. New contract. Just you, not Havelock. 
Miller crossed his arms. New contract, he said slowly. Meaning? Meaning Star Helix Security has accepted a contract for services separate from the series security assignment. And in my role as site manager for the corporation, I'm assigning you to it. I'm fired, he said. Captain Shadid looked pained. It's additional duty, she said. You'll still have the series assignments you have now. It's just that in addition... Look, Miller, I think this is as shitty as you do. I'm not pulling you off station. I'm not taking you off the main contract. This is a favor someone down on Earth is doing for a shareholder. We're doing favors for shareholders now? Miller asked. You are, yes, Captain Shadid said. The softness was gone. The conciliatory tone was gone. Her eyes were dark as wet stone. Right then, Miller said. I guess I am. Captain Shadid held up her hand terminal. Miller fumbled at his side, pulled out his own, and accepted the narrow beam transfer. Whatever this was, Shadid was keeping it off the common network. A new file tree, labeled JMAO, appeared on his readout. It's a little lost daughter case, Captain Shadid said. Ariadne and Jules Pierre Mao. The names rang a bell. Miller pressed his fingertips onto the screen of his hand terminal. Mao Kwiatkowski Mercantile? he asked. The one. Miller whistled low. Malquick might not have been one of the top ten corporations in the belt, but it was certainly in the upper fifty. Originally, it had been a legal firm involved in the epic failure of the Venusian cloud cities. They'd used the money from that decades-long lawsuit to diversify and expand, mostly into interplanetary transport. Now the corporate station was independent floating between the belt and the inner planets with the regal majesty of an ocean liner on ancient seas. The simple fact that Miller knew that much about them meant they had enough money to buy and sell men like him on open exchange. He'd just been bought. They're Luna-based, Captain Shadid said. All the rights and privileges of Earth citizenship. But they do a lot of shipping business out here. And they misplaced a daughter? Black sheep, the captain said. Went off to college, got involved with a group called the Far Horizons Foundation. Student activists. OPA front, Miller said. Associated, Shadid corrected him. Miller let it pass, but a flicker of curiosity troubled him. He wondered which side Captain Shadid would be on if the OPA attacked. The family put it down to a phase. They've got two older children with controlling interests, so if Julie wanted to bounce around vacuum calling herself a freedom fighter, there was no real harm. But now they want her found, Miller said. They do. What changed? They didn't see fit to share that information. Right. Last records show she was employed on Tycho Station, but maintained an apartment here. I found her partition on the network and locked it down. The password is in your files. Okay, Miller said. What's my contract? Find Julie Mao, detain her, and ship her home. A kidnap job, then, he said. Yes. Miller stared down at his hand terminal, flicking the files open without particularly looking at them. A strange knot had tied itself in his guts. He'd been working series security for thirty years, and he hadn't started with many illusions in place. The joke was that series didn't have laws, it had police. His hands weren't any cleaner than Captain Shadid's. Sometimes people fell out airlocks. Sometimes evidence vanished from the lockers. It wasn't so much that it was right or wrong as that it was justified. You spent your life in a stone bubble with your food, your water, your air shipped in from places so distant you could barely find them with a telescope, and a certain moral flexibility was necessary. But he'd never had to take a kidnap job before. 
Problem, Detective? Captain Shadid asked. No, sir, he said. I'll take care of it. Don't spend too much time on it, she said. Yes, sir. Anything else? Captain Shadid's hard eyes softened, like she was putting on a mask. She smiled. Everything going well with your partner? Havelock's all right, Miller said. Having him around makes people like me better by contrast. That's nice. Her smile's only change was to become half a degree more genuine. Nothing like a little shared racism to build ties with the boss. Miller nodded respectfully and headed out. His hole was on the eighth level, off a residential tunnel a hundred meters wide with fifty meters of carefully cultivated green park running down the center. The main corridor's vaulted ceiling was lit by recessed lights and painted a blue that Havelock assured him matched the Earth's summer sky. Living on the surface of a planet, mass sucking at every bone and muscle and nothing but gravity to keep your air close, seemed like a fast path to crazy. The blue was nice, though. Some people followed Captain Shadid's lead by perfuming their air. Not always with coffee and cinnamon scents, of course. Havelock's hole smelled of baking bread. Others opted for floral scents or semi-pheromones. Candace, Miller's ex-wife, had preferred something called Earth Lily, which had always made him think of the waste recycling levels. These days, he left it at the vaguely astringent smell of the station itself. Recycled air that had passed through a million lungs, Water from the tap so clean it could be used for lab work, but it had been piss and shit and tears and blood, and would be again. The circle of life on Ceres was so small you could see the curve. He liked it that way. He poured a glass of moss whiskey, a native Ceres liquor made from engineered yeast, then took off his shoes and settled onto the foam bed. He could still see Candace's disapproving scowl and hear her sigh. He shrugged apology to her memory and turned back to work. Juliet Andromeda Mao He read through her work history, her academic records. Talented pinnace pilot. There was a picture of her at eighteen in a tailored vac suit with the helmet off. Pretty girl with a thin, lunar citizen's frame and long black hair. She was grinning like the universe had given her a kiss. The linked text said she'd won first place in something called the Parish Dawn 500K. He searched briefly. Some kind of race only really rich people could afford to fly in. Her pinnace, the Razorback, had beaten the previous record and held it for two years. Miller sipped his whiskey and wondered what had happened to the girl with enough wealth and power to own a private ship that would bring her here. It was a long way from competing in expensive space races to being hogtied and sent home in a pod. Or maybe it wasn't. Poor little rich girl, Miller said to the screen. Sucks to be you, I guess. He closed the files and drank quietly and seriously, staring at the blank ceiling above him. The chair where Candace used to sit and ask him about his day stood empty. But he could see her there anyway. Now that she wasn't here to make him talk, it was easier to respect the impulse. She'd been lonely. He could see that now. In his imagination, she rolled her eyes. An hour later, his blood warm with drink, he heated up a bowl of real rice and fake beans. Yeast and fungus could mimic anything if you had enough whiskey first. Opened the door of his hole and ate dinner looking out at the traffic gently curving by. The second shift streamed into the tube stations and then out of them. The kids who lived two holes down, a girl of eight and her brother of four, met their father with hugs, squeals, mutual accusations, and tears. The blue ceiling glowed in its reflected light, unchanging, static, reassuring. A sparrow fluttered down the tunnel, 
hovering in a way that Havelock assured him they couldn't on Earth. Miller threw it a fake bean. He tried to think about the Mao girl, but in truth, he didn't much care. Something was happening to the organized crime families of Ceres, and it made him jumpy as hell. This thing with Julie Mao? It was a sideshow. Chapter 3 Holden After nearly two full days in high gravity, Holden's knees and back and neck ached, and his head. Hell, his feet. He walked in the crew hatch of the night just as Naomi was climbing up the ladder from its cargo bay. She smiled and gave him a thumbs up. The salvage mech is locked down, she said. Reactors warming up. We're ready to fly. Good. We got a pilot yet? She asked. Alex Kamal is on the ready rotation today, so he's our man. I kind of wish Volka had been up. He's not the pilot Alex is, but he's quieter and my head hurts. I like Alex. He's a bullion, Naomi said. I don't know what a bullion means, but if it means Alex, it makes me tired. Holden started up the ladder to ops in the cockpit. In the shiny black surface of a deactivated wall panel, Naomi's reflection smirked at his back. He couldn't understand how belters, thin as pencils, bounce back from high G so quickly. Decades of practice and selective breeding, he assumed. In ops, Holden strapped into the command console, the crash couch material silently conforming to his body. At the half G, Ade put them on for the final approach, the foam felt good. He let a small groan slip out. The switches, plastic and metal, made to withstand hard G and hundreds of years, clicked sharply. The night responded with an array of glowing diagnostic indicators and a near subliminal hum. A few minutes later, Holden glanced over to see Alex Kamal's thinning black hair appear, followed by his round, cheerful face, a deep brown that years of shipboard life couldn't pale. Martian raised, Alex had a frame that was thicker than a belter's. He was slender compared to Holden, and even so, his flight suit stretched tight against his spreading waistline. Alex had flown in the Martian Navy, but he'd clearly given up on the military-style fitness routine. Howdy, XO, he drawled. The Old West affectation common to everyone from the Mariner Valley annoyed Holden. There hadn't been a cowboy on Earth in a hundred years, and Mars didn't have a blade of grass that wasn't under a dome, or a horse that wasn't in a zoo. Mariner Valley had been settled by East Indians, Chinese, and a small contingent of Texans. Apparently the drawl was viral. They all had it now. How's the old warhorse today? Smooth so far. We need a flight plan. Ade will be bringing us to relative stop in... He checked the time readout. Forty, so work fast. I want to get out, get it done, and get the camp back on course to Ceres before she starts rusting. Roger that, Alex said, climbing up to the knight's cockpit. Holden's headset clicked. Then Naomi's voice said, Amos and Shatter aboard. We're all ready down here. Thanks, just waiting on flight numbers from Alex, and we'll be ready to go. The crew was the minimum necessary. Hold in his command, Alex to get them there and back, Shed in case there were survivors to treat, Naomi and Amos for salvage if there weren't. It wasn't long before Alex called down, Okay, boss, it'll be about a four-hour trip flying tea kettle. Total mass use about 30%, but we've got a full tank. Total mission time, eleven hours. Copy that, thanks, Alex, Holden said. Flying tea kettle was naval slang for flying on the maneuvering thrusters that used superheated steam for reaction mass. The knight's fusion torch would be dangerous to use this close to the Canterbury, and wasteful on such a short trip. Torches were pre-Epstein fusion drives and far less efficient. Calling for permission to leave the barn, Holden said, and clicked from internal comm to the link with the Canterbury's bridge. Holden here. Knight is ready to fly. 
Okay, Jim, go ahead, McDowell said. Ade's bringing her to a stop now. You kids be careful out there. That shuttle's expensive, and I've always sort of had a thing for Naomi. Roger that, Captain, Holden said. Back on the internal comm, he buzzed Alex. Go ahead and take us out. Holden leaned back in his chair and listened to the creaks of the Canterbury's final maneuvers, the steel and ceramics as loud and ominous as the wood planks of a sailing ship, or an earther's joints after high G. For a moment, Holden felt sympathy for the ship. They weren't really stopping, of course. Nothing in space ever actually stopped. It only came into a matching orbit with some other object. They were now following CA-2216862 on its merry, millennium-long trip around the sun. Ade sent them the green light, and Holden emptied out the hangar bay air and popped the doors. Alex took them out of the dock on white cones of superheated steam. They went to find the scopuli. CA-2216862 was a rock a half kilometer across, that had wandered away from the belt and been yanked around by Jupiter's enormous gravity. It had eventually found its own slow orbit around the sun in the vast expanse between Jupiter and the belt, territory empty even for space. The sight of the scopuli, resting gently against the asteroid's side, held in place by the rock's tiny gravity, gave Holden a chill. Even if it was flying blind, every instrument dead, its odds of hitting such an object by chance were infinitesimally low. It was a half-kilometer-wide roadblock on a highway millions of kilometers in diameter. It hadn't arrived there by accident. He scratched the hairs standing up on the back of his neck. Alex, hold us at two clicks out, Holden said. Naomi, what can you tell me about that ship? Hull configuration matches the registry information. It's definitely the scopuli. She's not radiating in the electromagnetic or infrared. Just that little distress beacon. Looks like the reactor's shut down. Must have been manual and not damaged because we aren't getting any radiation leakage either, Naomi said. Holden looked at the pictures they were getting from the night scopes, as well as the image the night created by bouncing a laser off the scopuli's hull. What about that thing that looks like a hole in the side? Uh, Naomi said, Ladar says it's a hole in the side. Holden frowned. Okay, let's stay here for a minute and recheck the neighborhood. Anything on the scope, Naomi? Nope, and the big array on the can can spot a kid throwing rocks on Luna. Becca says there's nobody within twenty million clicks right now, Naomi said. Holden tapped out a complicated rhythm on the arm of his chair and drifted up in the straps. He felt hot and reached over to aim the closest air circulation nozzle at his face. His scalp tingled with evaporating sweat. If you see anything out there that seems off, don't play hero again. Just pack up the toys and come home. Those were his orders. He looked at the image of the scopuli the hole in its side. Okay, he said. Alex, take us into a quarter click and hold station there. We'll ride to the surface on the mech. Oh, and keep the torch warmed up and ready. If something nasty is hiding in that ship, I want to be able to run away as fast as I can and melt anything behind us into slag while I do it, Roger. Got it, boss. Nights in run like a bunny mode till you say otherwise, Alex replied. Holden looked over the command console one more time, searching for the flashing red warning light that would give him permission to go back to the cant. Everything remained a soft green. He popped open his buckles and shoved himself out of the chair. A push on the wall with one foot sent him over to the ladder, and he descended headfirst with gentle touches on the rungs. In the crew area, Naomi, Amos, and Shed were still strapped into their crash couches. Holden caught the ladder and swung around so that his crew didn't look upside down. They started undoing their restraints. Okay, here's the situation. The scopuli got hold and someone left it floating next to this rock. 
No one is on the scope, so maybe that means it happened a while ago and they left. Naomi, you'll be driving the salvage mech, and the three of us will tether on and catch a ride down to the wreck. Shed, you stay with the mech unless we find an injured person, which seems unlikely. Amos and I will go into the ship through that hole and poke around. If we find anything even remotely booby-trap-like, we'll come back to the mech. Naomi will fly us back to the night, and we will run away. Any questions? Amos raised one beefy hand. Maybe we ought to be armed, Exo, in case there's piratey types still lurking aboard. Holden laughed. Well, if there are, then their ride left without them. But if it makes you feel more comfortable, go ahead and bring a gun. If the big, burly Earther mechanic was carrying a gun, it would make him feel better, too. But better not to say it. Let them think the guy in charge felt confident. Holden used his officer's key to open the weapon locker, and Amos took a high-caliber automatic that fired self-propelled rounds, recoilless and designed for use in zero-g. Old-fashioned slug throwers were more reliable, but in null gravity they were also maneuvering thrusters. A traditional handgun would impart enough thrust to achieve escape velocity from a rock the size of CA-2216862. The crew drifted down to the cargo bay, where the egg-shaped, spider-legged open cage of Naomi's mech waited. Each of the four legs had a manipulator claw at the end and a variety of cutting and welding tools built into it. The back pair could grip onto a ship's hull or other structure for leverage, and the front two could be used to make repairs or chop salvage into portable pieces. Hats on, Holden said, and the crew helped each other put on and secure their helmets. Everyone checked their own suit and then someone else's. When the cargo doors opened, it would be too late to make sure they were buttoned up right. While Naomi climbed into her mech, Amos, Holden, and Shed secured their suit tethers to the cockpit's metal cage. Naomi checked the mech, and then hit the switch to cycle the cargo bay's atmosphere and open the doors. Sound inside Holden's suit faded to just the hiss of air and the faint static of the radio. The air had a slight medicine smell. Naomi went first, taking the mech down toward the asteroid's surface on small jets of compressed nitrogen, the crew trailing her on three-meter-long tethers. As they flew, Holden looked back up at the night, a blocky gray wedge with a drive cone stuck on the wider end. Like everything else humans built for space travel, it was designed to be efficient, not pretty. That always made Holden a little sad. There should be room for aesthetics, even out here. The night seemed to drift away from him, getting smaller and smaller while he didn't move. The illusion vanished when he turned around to look at the asteroid and felt they were hurtling toward it. He opened a channel to Naomi, but she was humming to herself as she flew, which meant she, at least, wasn't worried. He didn't say anything, but he left the channel open to listen to her hum. Up close, the scopuli didn't look all that bad. Other than the gaping hole in its flank, it didn't have any damage. It clearly hadn't hit the asteroid. It had just been left close enough that the microgravity had slowly reeled it in. As they approached, he snapped pictures with his suit helmet and transmitted them to the Canterbury. Naomi brought them to a stop, hovering three meters above the hole in the scopuli's side. Amos whistled across the general suit channel. That wasn't a torpedo did this, Exo. This was a breaching charge. See how the metals bent in all around the edges? That's shaped charges stuck right on her hull, Amos said. In addition to being a fine mechanic, Amos was the one who used explosive surgery to crack open the icebergs floating around Saturn and turn them into more manageable chunks. Another reason to have him on the night. So, Holden said, our friends here on the scopuli stop, let someone climb onto their hull and plant a breaching charge, and then crack them open and let all the air out. Does that make sense to anyone? Nope, Naomi said. It doesn't. Still want to go inside? If you see anything out there that seems off, 
Don't play hero again. Just pack up the toys and come home. But what could he have expected? Of course the scopuli wasn't up and running. Of course something had gone wrong. Off would have been not seeing anything strange. Amos, Holden said. Keep that gun out just in case. Naomi, can you make us a bigger hole? And be careful, if anything looks wrong, back us off. Naomi brought the mech in closer. Nitrogen blasts no more than a white breath on a cold night. The mech's welding torch blazed to life, red hot, then white, then blue. In silence, the mech's arms unfurled, an insectal movement, and Naomi started cutting. Holden and Amos dropped to the ship's surface, clamping on with magnetic boots. He could feel the vibration in his feet when Naomi pulled a length of hull free. A moment later, the torch turned off, and Naomi blasted the fresh edges of the hull with the mech's fire suppression gear to cool them. Holden gave Amos the thumbs up and dropped himself, very slowly, into the scopuli. The breaching charge had been placed almost exactly amidships, blasting a hole into the galley. When Holden landed and his boots grabbed onto the galley wall, he could feel flash-frozen bits of food crunch under them. There were no bodies in sight. Come on in, Amos. No crew visible yet, Holden called over the suit comm. He moved off to the side, and a moment later Amos dropped in, gun clutched in his right hand and a powerful light in his left. The white beam played across the walls of the destroyed galley. Which way first, Exo? Amos asked. Holden tapped on his thigh with one hand and thought. Engineering. I want to know why the reactor's offline. They took the crew ladder climbing along it toward the aft of the ship. All the pressure doors between decks were open, which was a bad sign. They should all be closed by default, and certainly if the atmosphere loss alarm had sounded. If they were open, that meant there were no decks with atmosphere left in the ship, which meant no survivors. Not a surprise, but it still felt like a defeat. They passed through the small ship quickly pausing in the machine shop. Expensive engine parts and tools were still in place. Guess it wasn't robbery, Amos said. Holden didn't say, then what was it? But the question hung between them anyway. The engine room was neat as a pin, cold and dead. Holden waited while Amos looked it over, spending at least ten minutes just floating around the reactor. Someone went through the shutdown procedures. Amos said. The reactor wasn't killed by the blast, it was turned off afterward. No damage that I can see. Don't make sense. If everyone is dead from the attack, who shut it down? And if it's pirates, why not take the ship? She'll still fly. And before they turned off the power, they went through and opened every interior pressure door on the ship. Emptied out the air. I guess they wanted to make sure no one was hiding, Holden said. Okay, let's head back up to Ops and see if we can crack the computer core. Maybe it can tell us what happened. They floated back toward the bow along the crew ladder and up to the Ops deck. It, too, was undamaged and empty. The lack of bodies was starting to bother Holden more than the presence of them would have. He floated over to the main computer console and hit a few keys to see if it might still be running on backup power. It wasn't. Amos, start cutting the core out. We'll take it with us. I'm going to check comm, see if I can find that beacon. Amos moved to the computer and started taking out tools and sticking them to the bulkhead next to it. He began a profanity-laced mumble as he worked. It wasn't nearly as charming as Naomi's humming, so Holden turned off his link to Amos while he moved to the communications console. It was as dead as the rest of the ship. He found the ship's beacon. No one had activated it. Something else had called them. Holden moved back, frowning. He looked through the space, searching for something out of place. There, on the deck beneath the comm operator's console, a small black box not connected to anything else. 
His heart took a long pause between beats. He called out to Amos. Does that look like a bomb to you? Amos ignored him. Holden turned his radio link back on. Amos, does that look like a bomb to you? He pointed at the box on the deck. Amos left his work on the computer and floated over to look. Then, in a move that made Holden's throat close, grabbed the box off the deck and held it up. Nope. It's a transmitter, see? He held it up in front of Holden's helmet. It's just got a battery taped to it. What's it doing there? It's the beacon we followed. Jesus. The ship's beacon never even turned on. Someone made a fake one out of that transmitter and hooked it up to a battery, Holden said quietly, still fighting his panic. Why would they do that, Exo? That don't make no kind of sense. It would if there's something about this transmitter that's different from standard, Holden said. Like? Like if it had a second signal triggered to go when someone found it, Holden said, then switched to the general suit channel. Okay, boys and girls, we've found something weird and we're out of here. Everyone back to the night, and be very careful when you... His radio crackled to life on the outside channel. McDowell's voice filling his helmet. Jim, we may have a problem out here. Chapter 4 Miller Miller was halfway through his evening meal when the system in his hole chirped. He glanced at the sending code. The Blue Frog. It was a port bar catering to the constant extra million non-citizens of Ceres that advertised itself as a near-exact replica of a famous Earth bar in Mumbai, only with licensed prostitutes and legal drugs. Miller took another forkful of fungal beans and vat-grown rice and debated whether to accept connection. Should have seen this one coming, he thought. What? he asked. A screen popped open. Hassini, the assistant manager, was a dark-skinned man with eyes the color of ice. The near smirk on his face was the result of nerve damage. Miller had done him a favor when Hassini had had the poor judgment to take pity on an unlicensed prostitute. Since then, security detective and portside barman had traded favors. The unofficial, gray economics of civilization. Your partner's here again. Hassini said over the pulse and wail of Bangra music. I think he's having a bad night. Should I keep serving him? Yeah, Miller said. Keep him happy for... Give me twenty minutes. He doesn't want to be kept happy. He very much wants a reason to get unhappy. Make it hard to find. I'll be there. Hassini nodded, smirking his damaged smirk and dropped the connection. Miller looked at his half-eaten meal, sighed, and shoved the remains into the recycling bin. He pulled on a clean shirt, then hesitated. The blue frog was always warmer than he liked, and he hated wearing a jacket. Instead, he put a compact plastic pistol in his ankle holster. Not as fast to draw, but if it got that far, he was screwed anyway. Ceres at night was indistinguishable from Ceres in the daytime. There had been a move, back when the station first opened, to dim and brighten the lights through the traditional human 24-hour cycle, mimicking the spin of Earth. The affectation had lasted four months before the Council killed it. On duty, Miller would have taken an electric cart down the wide tunnels and down to the port levels. He was tempted, even though he was off duty, but a deep-seated superstition stopped him. If he took the cart, he was going as a cop and the tubes ran just fine. Miller walked to the nearest station, checked the status, and sat on the low stone bench. A man about Miller's age and a girl no more than three came in a minute later and sat across from him. The girl's talk was as fast and meaningless as a leaking seal, and her father responded with grunts and nods at more or less appropriate moments. Miller and the new man nodded to each other. The girl tugged at her father's sleeve, demanding his attention. Miller looked at her. Dark eyes, pale hair, smooth skin. 
She was already too tall to be mistaken for an earth child, her limbs longer and thinner. Her skin had the pink flush of belter babies, which came with the pharmaceutical cocktail that assured that their muscles and bones would grow strong. Miller saw the father notice his attention. Miller smiled and nodded toward the kid. How old? he asked. Two and a half, the father said. Good age. The father shrugged, but he smiled. Kids? he asked. No, Miller said. But I've got a divorce about that old. They chuckled together as if it was funny. In his imagination, Candace crossed her arms and looked away. The soft, oil and ozone-scented breeze announced the tube's arrival. Miller let father and child go first, then chose a different compartment. The tube cars were round, built to fit into the evacuated passages. There were no windows. The only view would have been stone humming by three centimeters from the car. Instead, broad screens advertised entertainment feeds or commented on interplanet political scandals or offered the chance to gamble away a week's pay at casinos so wonderful that your life would seem richer for the experience. Miller let the bright, empty colors dance and ignored their content. Mentally, he was holding up his problem, turning it one way and then the other, not even looking for an answer. It was a simple mental exercise. Look at the facts without judgment. Havelock was an earther. Havelock was in a portside bar again and looking for a fight. Havelock was his partner. Statement after statement, fact after fact, facet after facet. He didn't try to put them in order or make some kind of narrative out of them. That would all come later. Now it was enough to wash the day's cases out of his head and get ready for the immediate situation. By the time the two breached his station, he felt centered. Like he was walking on his whole foot, was how he'd described it, back when he had anyone to describe it to. The blue frog was crowded, the barn heat of bodies adding to the fake Mumbai temperature and artificial air pollution. Lights glittered and flashed in seizure-inducing display. Tables curved and undulated, the backlight making them seem darker than merely black. Music moved through the air with a physical presence, each beat a little concussion. Hassini, standing in a clot of steroid-enhanced bouncers and underdressed serving girls, caught Miller's eyes and nodded toward the back. Miller didn't acknowledge anything. He just turned and made his way through the crowd. Port bars were always volatile. Miller was careful not to bump into anyone if he could help it. When he had to choose, he'd run into belters before interplanet types, women before men. His face was a constant, mild apology. Havelock was sitting alone, with one thick hand wrapping a fluted glass. When Miller sat down beside him, Havelock turned toward him, ready to take offense, nostrils flared and eyes wide. Then the surprise registered. Then something like sullen shame. Miller, he said. In the tunnels outside, he would have been shouting. Here it was barely enough to carry as far as Miller's chair. What are you doing here? Nothing much to do with the hole, Miller said. Thought I'd come pick a fight. Good night for it, Havelock said. It was true. Even in the bars that catered to interplanet types, the mix was rarely better than one Earther or Martian in ten. Squinting out at the crowd... Miller saw that the short, stocky men and women were nearer a third. Ship come in? he asked. Yeah. EMCN? he asked. The Earth-Mars Coalition Navy often passed through Ceres on its way to Saturn, Jupiter, and the stations of the belt. But Miller hadn't been paying enough attention to the relative position of the planets to know where the orbits all stood. Havelock shook his head. Corporate security rotating out of Eros, he said. Protogen, I think. A serving girl appeared at Miller's side, tattoos gliding over her skin, her teeth glowing in the black light. 
Miller took the drink she offered him, though he hadn't ordered. Soda water. You know, Miller said, leaning close enough to Havelock that even his normal conversational voice would reach the man. It doesn't matter how many of their asses you kick. Shadid's still not going to like you. Havelock snapped to stare at Miller, the anger in his eyes barely covering the shame and hurt. It's true, Miller said. Havelock rose, lurching to his feet, and headed for the door. He was trying to stomp, but in the series' spin gravity and his inebriated state, he misjudged. It looked like he was hopping. Miller, glass in hand, slid through the crowd in Havelock's wake, calming with a smile and a shrug the affronted faces that his partner left behind him. The common tunnels down near the port had a layer of grime and grease to them that air scrubbers and astringent cleaners could never quite master. Havelock walked out, shoulders hunched, mouth tight, rage radiating from him like heat. But the doors of the blue frog closed behind them, the seal cutting off the music like someone hitting mute. The worst of the danger had passed. I'm not drunk, Havelock said, his voice too loud. Didn't say you were. And you, Havelock said, turning and stabbing an accusing finger at Miller's chest. You are not my nanny. Also true. They walked together for maybe a quarter of a kilometer. The bright LED signs beckoned. Brothels and shooting galleries, coffee bars and poetry clubs, casinos and show fights. The air smelled like piss and old food. Havelock began to slow, his shoulders coming down from around his ears. I worked homicide in Tarrytown, Havelock said. I did three years vice at L5. Do you have any idea what that was like? They were shipping kids out of there. And I'm one of three guys that stopped it. I'm a good cop. Yes, you are. I'm damn good. You are. They walked past a noodle bar a coffin hotel, a public terminal, its displays running a free news feed. Communication problems plague Phoebe Science Station. New Andreas K. game net six billion dollars in four hours. No deal in Mars, belt titanium contract. The screens glowed in Havelock's eyes, but he was staring past them. I'm a damn good cop, he said again. Then a moment later, so what the hell? It's not about you, Miller said. People look at you, they don't see Dmitri Havelock, good cop, they see Earth. That's crap. I was eight years in the orbitals and on Mars before I ever shipped out here. I worked on Earth maybe six months total. Earth, Mars, they're not that different, Miller said. Try telling that to a Martian, Havelock said with a bitter laugh. They'll kick your ass for you. I didn't mean... Look, I'm sure there are all kinds of differences. Earth hates Mars for having a better fleet. Mars hates Earth for having a bigger one. Maybe soccer's better in full G, maybe it's worse. I don't know. I'm just saying anyone this far out from the sun, they don't care. From this distance, you can cover Earth and Mars with one thumb. And... And I don't belong, Havelock said. The door of the noodle bar behind them opened and four belters in gray-green uniforms came out. One of them wore the split circle of the OPA on his sleeve. Miller tensed, but the belters didn't come toward them, and Havelock didn't notice them. Near miss. I knew, Havelock said, when I took the Star Helix contract, I knew I'd have to work to fit in. I thought it'd be the same as anywhere, you know? You go, you get your chops busted for a while— then, when they say you can take it, they treat you like one of the team. It's not like that here. It's not, Miller said. Havelock shook his head, spat, and stared at the fluted glass in his hand. I think we just stole some glasses from the Blue Frog, Havelock said. We're also in a public corridor with unsealed alcohol, Miller said. Well, you are, anyway. Mine's soda water. Havelock chuckled but there was despair in the sound. When Havelock spoke again, his voice was only rueful. 
You think I'm coming down here picking fights with people from the inner planets so that Shadid and Ramachandra and all the rest of them will think better of me? It occurred to me. You're wrong, Havelock said. Okay, Miller said. He knew he wasn't. Havelock raised his fluted glass. Take these back? he asked. How about distinguished hyacinth? Miller countered. I'll buy. The distinguished hyacinth lounge was up three levels, far enough that foot traffic from the port levels was minimal, and it was a cop bar. Mostly Star Helix security, but some of the minor corporate forces, Protogen, Pinkwater, Alabique, hung out there too. Miller was more than half certain that his partner's latest breakdown had been averted, but if he was wrong, better to keep it in the family. The decor was pure belt. Old-style ship's folding tables and chairs set into the wall and ceiling, as if the gravity might shut off at any moment. Snake plant and devil's ivy, staples of first-generation air recycling, decorated the wall and freestanding columns. The music was soft enough to talk over, loud enough to keep private conversations private. The first owner, Javier Lio, was a structural engineer from Tycho who'd come out during the big spin and liked series enough to stay. His grandchildren ran it now. Javier III was standing behind the bar, talking with half of the vice and exploitation team. Miller led the way to a back table, nodding to the men and women he knew as he passed. While he'd been careful and diplomatic at the Blue Frog, he chose a bluff masculinity here. It was just as much a pose. So, Havelock said as Javier's daughter Kate, a fourth generation for the same bar, left the table, blue frog glasses on her tray. What is this super-secret private investigation Shadid put you on? Or is the lowly earther not supposed to know? Is that what got to you? Miller asked. It's nothing. Some shareholders misplaced their daughter and want me to track her down, ship her home. It's a bullshit case. Sounds more like their backyard, Havelock said, nodding toward the V&E crowd. Kid's not a minor, Miller said. It's a kidnap job. And you're good with that? Miller sat back. The ivy above them waved. Havelock waited, and Miller had the uncomfortable sense that a table had just been turned. It's my job, Miller said. Yeah, but we're talking about an adult here, right? It's not like she couldn't go back home if she wanted to be there. But instead, her parents get security to take her home whether she wants to go or not. That's not law enforcement anymore. It's not even station security. It's just dysfunctional families playing power games. Miller remembered the thin girl beside her racing pinnace. Her broad smile. I told you it was a bullshit case, Miller said. Kate Leo returned to the table with a local beer and a glass of whiskey on her tray. Miller was glad for the distraction. The beer was his, light and rich and just the faintest bit bitter. An ecology based on yeasts and fermentation meant subtle brews. Havelock was nursing his whiskey. Miller took it as a sign that he was giving up on his bender. Nothing like being around the boys from the office to take the charm out of losing control. Hey, Miller, Havelock, a familiar voice said. Yevgeny Cobb from Homicide. Miller waved him over, and the conversation turned to the homicides bragging about the resolution of a particularly ugly case. Three months' work figuring out where the toxins came from, ending with the corpse's wife awarded the full insurance settlement and a gray market whore deported back to Eros. By the end of the night, Havelock was laughing and trading jokes along with the rest of them. If there was occasionally a narrowed glance or a subtle dig, he took it in stride. Miller was on his way up to the bar for another round when his terminal chimed. And then, slowly throughout the bar, fifty other chimes sounded. Miller felt his belly knot as he and every other security agent in the place pulled out their terminals. Captain Shadid was on the broadcast screen. Her eyes were bleary and filled with banked rage. She was the very picture of a woman of power wakened early from sleep. Ladies and gentlemen, she said, 
Whatever you're doing, drop it and go to your stations for emergency orders. We have a situation. Ten minutes ago, an unencrypted signed message came in from the rough direction of Saturn. We haven't confirmed it is true, but the signature matches the keys on record. I've put a hold on it, but we can assume some asshole's going to put it on the network and the shit should hit the fan about five minutes after that. If you're in earshot of a civilian, turn off now. For the rest of you, here's what we're up against. Shadid moved to one side, tapping her system interface. The screen went black. A moment later, a man's face and shoulders appeared. He was in an orange vacuum suit with the helmet off. An earther, maybe in his early thirties. Pale skin, blue eyes, dark, short-cropped hair. Even before the man opened his mouth, Miller saw the signs of shock and rage in his eyes and the way he held his head forward. My name, the man said, is James Holden. Chapter 5 Holden Ten minutes at 2G and Holden's head was already starting to ache. But McDowell had called them home at all haste. The Canterbury was warming up its massive drive. Holden didn't want to miss his ride. Jim, we may have a problem out here. Talk to me. Becca found something, and it is sufficiently weird to make my balls creep up. We're getting the hell out of here. Alex, how long? Holden asked for the third time in ten minutes. We're over an hour out. Want to go on the juice? Alex said. Going on the juice was pilot speak for a high-G burn that would knock an unmedicated human unconscious. The juice was the cocktail of drugs the pilot's chair would inject into him to keep him conscious, alert, and hopefully stroke-free when his body weighed 500 kilos. Holden had used the juice on multiple occasions in the Navy, and coming down afterward was unpleasant. Not unless we have to, he said. What kind of weird? Becca, link him up. Jim, I want you to see what we're seeing. Holden tongued a painkiller tab from his suit's helmet and reran Becca's sensor feed for the fifth time. The spot in space lay about 200,000 kilometers from the Canterbury. As the cat had scanned it, the readout showed a fluctuation, the gray-black false color gradually developing a warm border. It was a small temperature climb, less than two degrees. Holden was amazed Becca had even spotted it. He reminded himself to give her a glowing review the next time she was up for promotion. Where did that come from? Holden asked. No idea. It's just a spot faintly warmer than the background, Becca said. I'd say it was a cloud of gas because we get no radar return from it. But there aren't supposed to be any gas clouds out here. I mean, where would it come from? Jim? Any chance the scopuli killed the ship that killed it? Could it be a vapor cloud from a destroyed ship? McDowell asked. I don't think so, sir. The scopula is totally unarmed. The hole in her side came from breaching charges, not torpedo fire, so I don't think they even fought back. It might be where the scopula vented, but... Or maybe not. Come back to the barn, Jim. Do it now. Naomi, what slowly gets hotter that gives no radar or radar return when you scan it? Wild ass guess here, Holden said. Hmm, Naomi said, giving herself time to think. Anything that was absorbing the energy from the sensor package wouldn't give a return, but it might get hotter when it shed the absorbed energy. The infrared monitor on the sensor console next to Holden's chair flared like the sun. Alex swore loudly over the general calm. Are you seeing that? he said. Holden ignored him and opened a channel to McDowell. Captain, we just got a massive IR spike, Holden said. For long seconds, there was no reply. When McDowell came on the channel, his voice was tight. Holden had never heard the old man sound afraid before. Jim, a ship just appeared in that warm spot. It's radiating heat like a bastard, McDowell said. Where the hell did that thing come from? 
Holden started to answer, but then heard Becca's voice coming faintly through the captain's headset. No idea, sir, but it's smaller than its heat signature. Radar shows frigate-sized, she said. With what? McDowell said. Invisibility? Magical wormhole teleportation? Sir, Holden said. Naomi was speculating that the heat we picked up might have come from energy-absorbing materials, stealth materials, which means that ship was hiding on purpose, which means its intentions are not good. As if an answer, six new objects appeared on his radar, glowing yellow icons appearing and immediately shifting to orange as the system marked their acceleration. On the Canterbury, Becca yelled out, Fast movers! We have six new high-speed contacts on a collision course. Jesus, H. Christ on a pogo stick, did that ship just fire a spread of torpedoes at us? McDowell said. They're trying to slap us down? Yes, sir, Becca said. Time to contact. Just under eight minutes, sir, she replied. McDowell cursed under his breath. We've got pirates, Jim. What do you need from us? Holden said, trying to sound calm and professional. I need you to get off the radio and let my crew work. You're an hour out at best. The torpedoes are eight minutes. McDowell out, the captain said, his calm clicking off and leaving Holden listening to the faint hiss of static. The general calm exploded with voices. Alex demanding to go on the juice and race the torpedoes to the cant. Naomi chattering about missile jamming strategies. Amos cursing at the stealth ship and questioning the parenting of its crew. Shed was the only quiet one. Everyone shut up, Holden yelled into his headset. The ship fell into shocked silence. Alex, plot the fastest course to the camp that won't kill us. Let me know when you have it. Naomi, set up a three-way channel with Becca, you, and me. We'll help however we can. Amos, keep cussing, but turn your mic off. He waited. The clock ticked toward impact. Link is up. Naomi said. Holden could hear two distinct sets of background noise over the comm channel. Becca, this is Jim. I've got Naomi on this channel, too. Tell us what we can do to help. Naomi was talking about jamming techniques. I'm doing everything I know to do, Becca said, her voice astonishingly calm. They're painting us with a targeting laser. I'm broadcasting garbage to scramble it, but they've got really, really good shit. If we were any closer, that targeting laser would be burning a hole in our hull. What about physical chaff? Naomi asked. Can you drop snow? While Naomi and Becca talked, Jim opened a private channel to Ade. Hey, this is Jim. I have Alex working on a fast burn solution so we can get there before... Before the missiles turn us into a flying brick? Good idea. Taken by pirates isn't something you want to miss, Ade said. He could hear the fear behind the mocking tone. Ade, please, I want to say something. Jim, what do you think? Naomi said on the other channel. Holden cursed. To cover, he said, Uh, about which thing? Using the night to try and draw those missiles, Naomi said. Can we do that? He asked. Maybe. Were you listening at all? Uh, something happened here, drew my attention for a minute. Tell me again. Holden said. We try to match the frequency of the light scatter coming off the cant and broadcast it with our comm array. Maybe the torpedoes will think we're the target instead, Naomi said like she was speaking to a child. And then they come blow us up? I'm thinking we run away while pulling the torpedoes toward us. Then when we get them far enough past the cant, we kill the comm array and try to hide behind the asteroid, Naomi said. Won't work. Holden said with a sigh. They follow the targeting laser scatter for general guidance, but they also take telescope shots of the target on acquisition. They'll take one look at us and know we aren't their target. Isn't it worth a shot? Even if we manage it, torpedoes designed to disable the cat would make us into a greasy stretch of vacuum. All right, Naomi said. What else have we got? Nothing. Very smart boys in the naval labs have already thought of everything we're going to think of in the next eight minutes, Holden said. Saying it out loud meant admitting it to himself. Then what are we doing here, Jim? Naomi asked. Seven minutes, Becca said, her voice still eerily calm. 
Let's get there. Maybe we can get some people off the ship after it's hit. Help with damage control, Holden said. Alex got that plot figured out? Roger that, XO. Bleeding G, burn and flip laid in. Angled approach course so our torch won't burn a hole in the cant. Time to rock and roll? Alex replied. Yeah, Naomi, get your people strapped in for high G, Holden said, then opened up a channel to Captain McDowell. Captain, we're coming in hot. Try to survive and we'll have the night on station for pickup or to help with damage control. Roger, McDowell said, and killed the line. Holden opened up his channel to Ade again. Ade, we're going to burn hard so I won't be talking, but leave this channel open for me, okay? Tell me what's happening. Hell, hum. Humming is nice. I just really need to hear you're all right. Okay, Jim, Ade said. She didn't hum, but she left the channel open. He could hear her breathing. Alex began the countdown over the general calm. Holden checked the straps on his crash couch and palmed the button that started the juice. A dozen needles stuck into his back through membranes in his suit. His heart shuddered, and chemical bands of iron gripped his brain. His spine went dead cold, and his face flushed like a radiation burn. He pounded a fist into the arm of the crash couch. He hated this part, but the next one was worse. On the general calm, Alex whooped as the drugs hit his system. Below decks, the others were getting the drugs that kept them from dying, but kept them sedated through the worst of it. Alex said, One. And Holden weighed five hundred kilos. The nerves at the back of his eye socket screamed at the massive load of his eyeballs. His testicles crushed themselves against his thighs. He concentrated on not swallowing his tongue. Around him, the ship creaked and groaned. There was a disconcerting bang from below decks, but nothing on his panel went red. The night's torch drive could deliver a lot of thrust, but at the cost of a prodigious fuel burn rate. But if they could save the cant, it wouldn't matter. Over the blood pounding in his ears, Holden could hear Ade's gentle breathing and the click of her keyboard. He wished he could just go to sleep to that sound, but the juice was singing and burning in his blood. He was more awake than he'd ever been. Yes, sir, Ade said over the calm. It took Holden a second to realize she was talking to McDowell. He turned up the volume to hear what the captain was saying. The main's online, full power. We're fully loaded, sir. If we try to burn that hard, we'll tear the drive right off the mounts, Ade replied. McDowell must have asked her to fire up the Epstein. Mr. Tukumbo. McDowell said. We have four minutes. If you break it, I won't bill you. Yes, sir. Bringing mains online. Setting for maximum burn, Ade said. And in the background, Holden could hear the high G warning klaxon. There was a louder clicking as Ade strapped herself in. Mains online in three, two, one. Execute, Ade said. The Canterbury groaned so loud Holden had to turn the calm volume down. It moaned and shrieked like a banshee for several seconds, and then there was a shattering crash. He pulled up the exterior visual, fighting against the G-induced blackout at the edge of his vision. The Canterbury was in one piece. Ade, what the hell was that? McDowell said, his speech slurred. The drive tearing a strut. Mains are offline, sir. Ade replied, not saying exactly like I said would happen. What did that buy us? McDowell asked. Not much. The torpedoes are now at over forty clicks a second and accelerating. We're down to maneuvering thrusters, Ade said. Shit, McDowell said. They're going to hit us, sir, Ade said. Jim, McDowell said, his voice suddenly loud over the direct channel he'd opened. We're going down, and there's no way around it. Click twice to acknowledge. Jim clicked his radio twice. Okay, so now we need to think about surviving after the hit. If they're looking to cripple us before boarding, they'll take out our drive and our com array. 
Becca's been broadcasting an SOS ever since the torpedoes were fired, but I'd like you to keep yelling if we stop. If they know you're out there, they are less likely to toss everyone out an airlock. Witnesses, you know, McDowell said. Jim clicked twice again. Turn around, Jim. Hide behind that asteroid. Call for help. Order. Jim clicked twice, then signaled all stop to Alex. In an instant, the giant sitting on his chest disappeared, replaced by weightlessness. The sudden transition would have made him throw up if his veins hadn't been coursing with anti-nausea drugs. What's up? Alex said. New job, Holden said, teeth chattering from the juice. We're calling for help and negotiating a release of prisoners once the bad guys have the cant. Burn back to that asteroid, since it's the closest we can get to cover. Roger that, boss, Alex said. He added in a lower voice, I'd kill for a couple of tubes or a nice keel-mounted railgun right now. I hear you. Wake up the kids downstairs? Let them sleep. Roger that, Alex said, then clicked off. Before the heavy G started up again, Holden turned on the night's SOS. The channel to Ade was still open, and now that McDowell was off the line, you could hear her breathing again. He turned the volume all the way up and lay back in the straps, waiting to be crushed. Alex didn't disappoint him. One minute, Ade said, her voice loud enough to distort through his helmet speakers. Holden didn't turn the volume down. Her voice was admirably calm as she called out the impact countdown. Thirty seconds. Holden wanted desperately to talk, to say something comforting, to make ludicrous and untrue assertions of love. The giant standing on his chest just laughed with the deep rumble of their fusion torch. Ten seconds. Get ready to kill the reactor and play dead after the torpedoes hit. If we're not a threat, they won't hit us again. McDowell said. Five, Ade said. Four, three, two, one. The Canterbury shuddered, and the monitor went white. Ade took one sharp intake of breath, which cut off as the radio broke up. The static squeal almost ruptured Holden's eardrums. He chinned the volume down and clicked his radio at Alex. The thrust suddenly dropped to a tolerable 2G and all the ship's sensors flared into overload. A brilliant light poured through the small airlock porthole. Report, Alex, report, what happened? Holden yelled. My God, they nuked her. They nuked the cant, Alex said, his voice low and dazed. What's her status? Give me a report in the Canterbury. I have zero sensors down here, everything's just gone white. There was a long pause. Then Alex said, I have zero sensors up here too, boss, but I can give you a status on the camp. I can see her. See her? From here? Yeah. She's a cloud of vapor the size of Olympus Mons. She's gone, boss. She's gone. That can't be right, Holden's mind protested. That doesn't happen. Pirates don't nuke water haulers. No one wins. No one gets paid. And if you just want to murder fifty people, walking into a restaurant with a machine gun is a lot easier. He wanted to shout it, scream at Alex that he was wrong. But he had to keep it together. I'm the old man now. All right, new mission, Alex. Now we're witnesses to murder. Get us back to that asteroid. I'll start compiling a broadcast. Wake everyone up, they need to know, Holden said. I'm rebooting the sensor package. He methodically shut down the sensors and their software, waited two minutes, then slowly brought them back online. His hands were shaking. He was nauseated. His body felt like he was operating his flesh from a distance, and he didn't know how much was the juice and how much was shock. The sensors came back up. Like any other ship that flew the space lanes, the night was hardened against radiation. You couldn't get anywhere near Jupiter's massive radiation belt unless you were, 
but Holden doubted the ship's designers had half a dozen nuclear weapons going off nearby in mind when they'd created the specs. They'd gotten lucky. Vacuum might protect them from an electromagnetic pulse, but the blast radiation could still have fried every sensor the ship had. Once the array came back up, he scanned the space where the Canterbury had been. There was nothing larger than a softball. He switched over to the ship that killed it, which was flying off sunward at a leisurely 1G. Heat bloomed in Holden's chest. He wasn't scared. Aneurysm-inducing rage made his temples pound and his fists squeeze until his tendons hurt. He flipped on the comms and aimed a tight beam at the retreating ship. This message is to whoever ordered the destruction of the Canterbury, the civilian ice freighter that you just blew into gas. You don't get to just fly away, you murderous son of a bitch. I don't care what your reasons are, but you just killed fifty friends of mine. You need to know who they were. I am sending to you the name and photograph of everyone who just died in that ship. Take a good look at what you did. Think about that while I work on finding out who you are. He closed the voice channel, pulled up the Canterbury's personnel files, and began transmitting the crew dossiers to the other ship. What are you doing? asked Naomi from behind him, not from his helmet speakers. She was standing there with her helmet off. Sweat plastered her thick black hair to her head and neck. Her face was unreadable. Holden took off his helmet. I'm showing them the Canterbury was a real place where real people lived. People with names and families, he said, the juice making his voice less steady than he would have liked. If there's something resembling a human being giving the orders on that ship, I hope it haunts him right up to the day they put him in the recycler for murder. I don't think they appreciate it, Naomi said, pointing at the panel behind him. The enemy ship was now painting them with its targeting laser. Holden held his breath. No torpedoes launched, and after a few seconds, the stealth ship turned off its laser, and the engine flared as it scooted off at high G. He heard Naomi let out a shuddering breath. So, the Canterbury's gone? Naomi asked. Holden nodded. Fuck me sideways, said Amos. Amos and Shed stood together at the crew ladder. Amos's face was mottled red and white, and his big hands clenched and unclenched. Shed collapsed to his knees, slamming against the deck and the heavy 2G thrust. He didn't cry. He just looked at Holden and said, Cameron's never going to get that arm, I guess then buried his head in his hands and shook. Slow down, Alex. No need to run now, Holden said into the calm. The ship slowly dropped to 1G. What now, Captain? Naomi said, looking at him hard. You're in charge now. Act like it. Blowing them out of the sky would be my first choice, but since we don't have the weapons, follow them. Keep our eyes on them until we know where they're going. Expose them to everyone, Holden replied. Fucking A, said Amos loudly. Amos, Naomi said over her shoulder, take Shed below and get him into a couch. If you need to, give him something to put him to sleep. You got it, boss. Amos put a thick arm around Shed's waist and took him below. When he was gone, Naomi turned back to Holden. No, sir, we are not chasing that ship. We are going to call for help and then go wherever the help tells us to go. I... Holden started. Yes, you're in charge. That makes me XO, and it's the XO's job to tell the captain when he's being an idiot. You're being an idiot, sir. You already tried to goad them into killing us with that broadcast, now you want to chase them? And what will you do if they let you catch them? Broadcast another emotional plea? Naomi said, moving closer to him. You are going to get the remaining four members of your crew to safety, and that's all. When we're safe, you can go on your crusade, sir. Holden unbuckled the straps on his couch and stood up. The juice was starting to burn out, leaving his body spent and sickened. Naomi lifted her chin and didn't back up. Glad you're with me, Naomi, he said. Go see to the crew. 
McDowell gave me one last order. Naomi looked him over critically. He could see her distrust. He didn't defend himself. He just waited until she was done. She nodded at him once and climbed down the ladder to the deck below. Once she was gone, he worked methodically, putting together a broadcast package that included all the sensor data from the Canterbury and the night. Alex climbed down from the cockpit and sat down heavily in the next chair. You know, Captain, I've been thinking, he said. His voice had the same post-juice shakes as Holden's own. Holden bit back his irritation at the interruption and said, What about? That stealth ship. Holden turned away from his work. Tell me. So I don't know any pirates that have shit like that. Go on. In fact, the only time I've seen tech like that was back when I was in the Navy, Alex said. We were working on ships with energy-absorbing skins and internal heat sinks. More of a strategic weapon than a tactical one. You can't hide an active drive. But if you can get into position and shut the drive down, store all your waste heat internally, you can hide yourself pretty good. Add in the energy-absorbing skin, and radar, lidar, and passive sensors don't pick you up. Plus, pretty tough to get nuclear torpedoes outside of the military. You're saying the Martian Navy did this? Alex took a long, shuddering breath. If we had it, you know the Earthers were working on it, too, he said. They looked at each other across the narrow space, the implications heavier than a 10G burn. Holden pulled the transmitter and battery they'd recovered from the scopuli out of the thigh pocket of his suit. He started pulling it apart, looking for a stamp or an insignia. Alex watched, quiet for once. The transmitter was generic. It could have come from the radio room of any ship in the solar system. The battery was a nondescript gray block. Alex reached out, and Holden handed it to him. Alex pried off the gray plastic cover and flipped the metal battery around in his hands. Without saying a word, he held the bottom up to Holden's face. Stamped in the black metal on the bottom of the battery was a serial number that began with the letters MCRN, Martian Congressional Republic Navy. The radio was set to broadcast on full power. The data package was ready to transmit. Holden stood in front of the camera, leaning a little forward. My name is James Holden, he said and my ship, the Canterbury, was just destroyed by a warship with stealth technology and what appeared to be parts stamped with Martian Navy serial numbers. Data stream to follow. Chapter 6 Miller The cart sped through the tunnel, siren masking the whine of motors. Behind them they left curious civilians and the scent of overheated bearings. Miller leaned forward in his seat, willing the cart to go faster. They were three levels and maybe four kilometers from the station house. Okay, Havelock said, I'm sorry, but I'm missing something here. What? Miller said. He meant, what are you yammering about? Havelock took it as, what are you missing? A water hauler millions of clicks from here got vaporized. Why are we going to full alert? Our cisterns will last months without even going on rationing. There are a lot of other haulers out there. Why is this a crisis? Miller turned and looked at his partner straight on. The small, stocky build. The thick bones from a childhood in full G. Just like the asshole in the transmission. They didn't understand. If Havelock had been in this James Holden's place, he might have done the same stupid, irresponsible, idiotic bullshit. For the space of a breath, they weren't security anymore. They weren't partners. They were a belter and an earther. Miller looked away before Havelock could see the change in his eyes. That prick Holden? The one in the broadcast? Miller said. He just declared war on Mars for us. 
The cart swerved and bobbed, its internal computer adjusting for some virtual hiccup in the traffic flow half a kilometer ahead. Havelock shifted, grabbing for the support strut. They hit a ramp up to the next level, civilians on foot making a path for them. You grow up where the waters may be dirty, but it falls out of the sky for you, Miller said. The air's filthy, but it's not going away if your door seals fail. It's not like that out here. But we're not on the hauler. We don't need the ice. We aren't under threat, Havelock said. Miller sighed, rubbing his eyes with thumb and knuckle until ghosts of false color bloomed. When I was homicide, Miller said, there was this guy, property management specialist working a contract out of Luna. Someone burned half his skin off and dropped him out an airlock. Turned out he was responsible for maintenance on sixty holes up on level thirty. Lousy neighborhood. He'd been cutting corners. Hadn't replaced the air filters in three months. There was mold growing in three of the units. And you know what we found after that? What? Havelock asked. Not a goddamn thing. Because we stopped looking. Some people need to die, and he was one. And the next guy that took the job cleaned the ducting and swapped the filters on schedule. That's what it's like in the belt. Anyone who came out here and didn't put environmental systems above everything else died young. All us still out here are the ones that cared. Selective effect? Havelock said. You're seriously arguing in favor of selective effect? I never thought I'd hear that shit coming out of you. What's that? Racist propaganda bullshit, Havelock said. It's the one that says the difference in environment has changed the belters so much that instead of just being a bunch of skinny, obsessive compulsives, they aren't really human anymore. I'm not saying that, Miller said, suspecting that it was exactly what he was saying. It's just that belters don't take the long view when you screw with basic resources. That water was future air, propellant mass, and potables for us. We have no sense of humor about that shit. The cart hit a ramp of metalwork great. The lower level fell away below them. Havelock was silent. This Holden guy didn't say it was Mars. Just that they found a Martian battery. You think people are going to declare war? Havelock said. Just on the basis of this one guy's pictures of a battery? The ones that wait to get the whole story aren't our problem. At least not tonight, he thought. Once the whole story gets out, we'll see where we stand. The station house was somewhere between one half and three quarters full. Security men stood in clumps, nodding to each other, eyes narrow and jaws tight. One of the vice cops laughed at something, his amusement loud, forced, smelling of fear. Miller saw the change in Havelock as they walked across the common area to their desks. Havelock had been able to put Miller's reaction down to one man's being oversensitive. A whole room, though. A whole station house. By the time they reached their chairs, Havelock's eyes were wide. Captain Shadid came in. The bleary look was gone. Her hair was pulled back, her uniform crisp and professional. Her voice as calm as a surgeon in a battlefield hospital. She stepped up on the first desk she came to improvising a pulpit. Ladies and gentlemen, she said, you've seen the transmission. Any questions? Who let that fucking earther near a radio? Someone shouted. Miller saw Havelock laugh along with the crowd, but it didn't reach his eyes. Shadid scowled and the crowd quieted. Here's the situation, she said. No way we can control this information. It was broadcast everywhere. We have five sites on the internal network that have been mirroring it, and we have to assume it's public knowledge starting ten minutes ago. Our job now is to keep the rioting to a minimum and ensure station integrity around the port. Station houses 50 and 213 are helping on it, too. The Port Authority has released all the ships with interplanet registry. That doesn't mean they're all gone. They still have to round up their crews, but it does mean they're going. The government offices... Miller said, loud enough to carry. Not our problem, thank God, Shadid said. They have infrastructure in place. Blast doors are already down and sealed. 
They've broken off from the main environmental system, so we aren't even breathing their air right now. Well, that's a relief, Yevgeny said from the cluster of homicide detectives. Now, the bad news, Shadid said. Miller heard the silence of a hundred and fifty cops holding their breath. We've got eighty known OPA agents on the station. They're all employed and legal. And you know this is the kind of thing they've been waiting for. We have an order from the governor that we're not going to do any proactive detention. No one gets arrested until they do something. Angry voices rose in chorus. Who does he think he is? Someone called from the back. Shadid snapped at the comment like a shark. The governor is the one who contracted with us to keep this station in working order, Shadid said. We'll follow his directives. In his peripheral vision, Miller saw Havelock nod. He wondered what the governor thought of the question of Belter independence. Maybe the OPA weren't the only ones who'd been waiting for something like this to happen. Shadid went on, outlining the security response they were permitted. Miller listened with half an ear, so lost in speculating on the politics behind the situation he almost missed it when Shadid called his name. Miller will take the second team to the port level and cover sectors 13 through 24, Kasagawa, team 3, 25 through 36, and so on. That's 20 men apiece, except for Miller. I can make it with 19, Miller said, then quietly to Havelock. You're sitting this one out, partner. Having an Earther with a gun out there isn't going to make things better. Yeah, Havelock said. Saw that coming. Okay, Shadid said. You all know the drill? Let's move. Miller rounded up his riot squad. All the faces were familiar. All men and women he'd worked with over his years in security. He organized them in his mind with a nearly automatic efficiency. Brown and Gelbfish both had SWAT experience, so they would lead the wings if it came to crowd control. Aberforth had three write-ups for excessive violence since her kid had been busted for drug running on Ganymede, so she was second string. She could work out her anger management issues another time. Around the station house, he heard the other squad commanders making similar decisions. Okay, Miller said. Let's suit up. They moved away in a group, heading for the equipment bay. Miller paused. Havelock remained leaning against his desk, arms folded, eyes locked on the middle distance. Miller was torn between sympathy for the man and impatience. It was hard being on the team, but not on the team. On the other hand, what the hell had he expected? Taking a contract in the belt. Havelock looked up meeting Miller's gaze. They nodded to each other. Miller was the first to turn away. The equipment bay was part warehouse, part bank vault, designed by someone more concerned with conserving space than getting things out efficiently. The lights, recessed white LEDs, gave the gray walls a sterile cast. Bare stone echoed every voice and footfall. Banks of ammunition and firearms, evidence bags and test panels, spare servers and replacement uniforms lined the walls and filled most of the interior space. The riot gear was in a side room, in gray steel lockers with high-security electronic locks. The standard outfit consisted of high-impact plastic shields, electric batons, shin guards, bullet-resistant chest and thigh armor, and helmets with reinforced face guards all of it designed to make a handful of station security into an intimidating, inhuman force. Miller keyed in his access code. The seals released. The lockers opened. Well, Miller said conversationally, fuck me. The lockers were empty. Gray coffins with the corpses all gone. Across the room he heard one of the other squads shouting in outrage. Miller systematically opened every riot control locker he could get to. All of them were the same. Shadid appeared at his side, her face pale with rage. What's plan B? Miller asked. Shadid spat on the floor, then closed her eyes. They shifted under her lids like she was dreaming. Two long breaths later, they opened. 
Check the SWAT lockers. There should be enough in there to outfit two people in each squad. Snipers? Miller said. You have a better idea, detective? Shadid said, leaning on the last word. Miller raised his hands in surrender. Riot gear was meant to intimidate and control. SWAT gear was made to kill with the greatest efficiency possible. Seemed their mandate had just changed. On any given day, a thousand ships might be docked on Ceres Station, and activity there rarely slowed and never stopped. Each sector could accommodate twenty ships, the traffic of humanity and cargo, transport vans, mesocranes, and industrial forklifts, and his squad was responsible for twenty sectors. The air stank of refrigerant and oil. The gravity was slightly above 0.3 g, station spin alone lending the place a sense of oppression and danger. Miller didn't like the port. Having vacuum so close under his feet made him nervous. Passing the dock workers and transport crews, he didn't know whether to scowl or smile. He was here to scare people into behaving, and also to reassure them that everything was under control. After the first three sectors, he settled on the smile. It was the kind of lie he was better at. They had just reached the junction of sectors 19 and 20 when they heard screaming. Miller pulled his hand terminal out of his pocket, connected to the central surveillance network, and called up the security camera array. It took a few seconds to find it. A mob of fifty or sixty civilians stretching almost all the way across the tunnel, traffic blocked on both sides. There were weapons being waved over heads, knives, clubs, at least two pistols, fists pumped in the air. And at the center of the crowd, a huge shirtless man was beating someone to death. Showtime, Miller said, waving his squad forward at a run. He was still a hundred meters from the turn that would take them to the clot of human violence when he saw the shirtless man knock his victim to the ground, then stomp on her neck. The head twisted sideways at an angle that didn't leave any question. Miller slowed his team to a brisk walk. Arresting the murderer while surrounded by a crowd of his friends would be tough enough without being winded. There was blood in the water now. Miller could sense it. The mob was going to turn out, to the station, to the ships. If the people started joining the chaos, what path would it be likely to take? There was a brothel one level up from there and half a kilometer anti-spinward that catered to inner planet types. The tariff inspector for Sector 21 was married to a girl from Luna, and it bragged about it maybe once too often. There were too many targets, Miller thought even as he motioned his snipers to spread out. He was trying to reason with a fire. Stop it here, and no one else got killed. In his imagination, Candace crossed her arms and said, What's plan B? The outer edge of the mob raised the alarm well before Miller reached it. The surge of bodies and threat shifted. Miller tipped back his hat. Men, women. Dark skin, pale, golden brown, and all with the long, thin build of belters, all with the square-mouthed, angry gape of chimpanzees at war. Let me take a couple of them down, sir, Gelbfish said from his terminal. Put the fear of God into them. We'll get there, Miller said, smiling at the angry mob. We'll get there. The face he expected floated to the front, shirtless. The big man, blood covering his hands and splattered on his cheek. The seed crystal of the riot. That one? Gelbfish asked, and Miller knew that a tiny infrared dot was painting Shirtless's forehead, even as he glowered at Miller and the uniforms behind him. No, Miller said. That'll only set the rest of them off. So what do we do? Brown said. It was a hell of a question. Sir... Gelbfish said. The big fucker's got an OPA tattoo on his left shoulder. Well, Miller said, if you do have to shoot him, start there. He stepped forward, tying his terminal into the local system, 
overriding the alert. When he spoke, his voice boomed from the overhead speakers. This is Detective Miller. Unless you all want to be locked up as accessories to murder, I suggest you disperse now. Muting the microphone in his terminal, he said to Shirtless, Not you, big fella. Move a muscle and we shoot you. Someone in the crowd threw a wrench, the silver metal arcing low through the air toward Miller's head. He almost stepped out of the way, but the handle caught him across the ear. His head was filled with the deep sound of bells, and the wet of blood tracked down his neck. Hold fire, Miller shouted. Hold your fire. The crowd laughed, as if he'd been talking to them. Idiots. Shirtless and Bolden strode forward. The steroids had distended his thigh so badly that he waddled. Miller turned the mic on his terminal back on. If the crowd was watching them face each other down, they weren't breaking things. It wasn't spreading. Not yet. So, friend, you only kick helpless people to death, or can anybody join in? Miller asked, his voice conversational but echoing out of the dock speakers like a pronouncement from God. The fuck you barking, Earth Dog? Shirtless said. Earth? Miller said, chuckling. I look like I grew up in a gravity well to you? I was born on this rock. In us kibble, you bitch, Shirtless said. You the dog. You think? Fucking dway, Shirtless said. Fucking true. He flexed his pectorals. Miller suppressed the urge to laugh. So, killing that poor bastard was for the good of the station, Miller said. The good of the belt? Don't be a chump, kid. They're playing you. They want you to act like a bunch of stupid riot boys so they have a reason to shut this place down. Schraubenzizi Weibchen, Shirtless said in belter-inflected gutter German, leaning forward. Okay, second time I've been called a bitch, Miller thought. Kneecap him, Miller said. Shirtless's legs blew out in twin sprays of crimson and he went down howling. Miller walked past his writhing body, stepping toward the mob. You're taking your orders from this pendejo, he said. Listen to me. We all know what's coming. We know dance starting now, like pow, right? They fucked to agua, and we all know the answer. Out an airlock, no? He could see it in their faces. The sudden fear of the snipers. Then the confusion. He pressed on, not giving them time to think. He switched back to the lower-level lingo, the language of education, authority. You know what Mars wants? They want you doing this. They want this piece of shit here to make sure that everyone looks at belters and thinks we're a bunch of psychopaths who tear up their own station. They want to tell themselves we're just like them. Well, we aren't. We're belters, and we take care of our own. He picked a man at the edge of the mob. Not as pumped as shirtless, but big. He had an OPA split circle on his arm. You, Miller said. You want to fight for the belt? Dwe, the man said. I bet you do. He did too, Miller said, jerking a thumb back at shirtless. But now he's a cripple, and he's going down for murder. So we've already lost one, you see? They're turning us against each other. Can't let them do that. Every one of you I have to arrest or cripple or kill, that's one less we have when the day comes. And it's coming. But it's not now, you understand? The OPA man scowled. The mob drew back from him, making space. Miller could feel it like a current against him. It was shifting. Day's coming, hombre, the OPA man said. You know your side? The tone was a threat, but there was no power behind it. Miller took a slow breath. It was over. Always the side of the angels, he said. Why don't you all go back to work? Show's over here, and we've all got plenty that needs doing. Momentum broken, the mob fell apart. First one and two peeling off from the edges, and then the whole knot untying itself at once. Five minutes after Miller had arrived, the only signs that anything had happened were shirtless mewling in a pool of his own blood, the wound on Miller's ear, 
and the body of the woman fifty good citizens had stood by and watched be beaten to death. She was short, and wearing the flight suit of a Martian freight line. Only one dead makes it a good night, Miller thought sourly. He went to the fallen man. The OPA tattoo was smeared red. Miller knelt. Friend, he said. You are under arrest for the murder of that lady over there, whoever the hell she is. You are not required to participate in questioning without the presence of an attorney or union representative, and if you so much as look at me wrong, I'll space you. Do we understand each other? From the look in the man's eyes, Miller knew they did. Chapter 7 Holden Holden could drink coffee at half a G, actually sit and hold a mug under his nose and let the aroma drift up, sip it slowly and not burn his tongue. Drinking coffee was one of the activities that didn't make the transition to microgravity well, but at half a G, it was fine. So he sat and tried very hard to think about coffee and gravity in the silence of the night's tiny galley. Even the normally talkative Alex was quiet. Amos had set his big handgun on the table and was staring at it with frightening concentration. Shed was asleep. Naomi was sitting across the room, drinking tea and keeping one eye on the wall panel next to her. She'd routed ops to it. As long as he kept his mind on his coffee, he didn't have to think about Ade giving one last gasp of fear and then turning into a glowing vapor. Alex ruined it by speaking. At some point, we need to decide where we're going, he said. Holden nodded, took a sip of his coffee, and closed his eyes. His muscles vibrated like plucked strings, and his peripheral vision was dappled with points of imaginary light. The first twinges of the post-juice crash were starting, and it was going to be a bad one. He wanted to enjoy these last few moments before the pain hit. He's right, Jim, Naomi said. We can't just fly in a big circle at half a G forever. Holden didn't open his eyes. The darkness behind his lids was bright and active and mildly nauseating. We aren't waiting forever, he said. We're waiting fifty minutes for Saturn Station to call me back and tell me what to do with their ship. The night is still P&K property. We're still employees. You wanted me to call for help? I called for help. Now we are waiting to see what that looks like. Shouldn't we start flying toward Saturn Station then, boss? Amos asked, directing his question at Naomi. Alex snorted. Not on the night's engine. Even if we had the fuel for that trip, which we don't, I don't want to sit in this can for the next three months, he said. No, if we're going somewhere, it's got to be the belt or Jupiter. We're as close to exactly between them as you can get. I vote we continue on to Ceres, Naomi said. P&K has offices there. We don't know anyone in the Jupiter complex. Without opening his eyes, Holden shook his head. No. We wait for them to call us back. Naomi made an exasperated sound. It was funny, he thought, how you could make someone's voice out from the smallest sounds. A cough or a sigh. Or the little gasp right before she died. Holden sat up and opened his eyes. He placed his coffee mug on the table carefully, with hands that were starting to palsy. I don't want to fly sunward to Ceres because that's the direction the torpedo ship went. And your point about chasing them is well taken, Naomi. I don't want to fly out to Jupiter because we only have the fuel for one trip, and once we fly that direction for a while, we're locked in. We are sitting here and drinking coffee because I need to make a decision, and P&K gets a say in that decision. So we wait for them to answer, and then I decide. Holden got up slowly, carefully, and began moving toward the crew ladder. I'm going to crash for a few minutes. Let the worst of the shakes wear off. If P&K calls, let me know. Holden popped sedative tabs, thin, bitter pills with an aftertaste like bread mold, but he didn't sleep. Over and over, McDowell placed a hand on his arm and called him Jim. 
Becca laughed and cursed like a sailor. Cameron bragged about his prowess on the ice. Ade gasped. Holden had flown the series to Saturn's circuit on the Canterbury nine times. Two round trips a year for almost five years. Most of the crew had been there the entire time. Flying on the cant might be the bottom of the barrel, but that meant there was nowhere else to go. People stayed, made the ship their home. After the near-constant duty transfers of the Navy, he appreciated stability. Made it his home, too. McDowell said something he couldn't quite make out. The cant groaned like she was under a hard burn. Ade smiled and winked at him. The worst leg cramp in history hit every muscle in his body at once. Holden bit down hard on his rubber mouth guard, screaming. The pain brought an oblivion that was almost a relief. His mind shut off, drowned out by the needs of his body. Fortunately or not, the drugs started to kick in. His muscles unknotted. His nerves stopped screaming and consciousness returned like a reluctant schoolboy. His jaw ached as he pulled out the guard. He'd worn tooth marks in the rubber. In the dim blue cabin light, he thought about the kind of man who followed an order to kill a civilian ship. He'd done some things in the Navy that had kept him awake nights. He'd followed some orders he vehemently disagreed with. But to lock on to a civilian ship with fifty people aboard and press the button that launched six nuclear weapons? He would have refused. If his commanding officer had insisted, he'd have declared it an illegal order and demanded that the executive officer take control of the ship and arrest the captain. They'd have had to shoot him to get him away from the weapon post. He'd known the sort of people who would have followed the order, though. He told himself that they were sociopaths and animals, no better than pirates who'd board your ship, strip your engine, and take your air, that they weren't human. But even as he nursed his hatred, drug-hazed rage offering its nihilistic comforts, he couldn't believe they were idiots. The itch at the back of his head was still, why? What does anyone gain from killing an ice hauler? Who gets paid? Someone always gets paid. I'm going to find you. I'm going to find you and end you. But before I do, I'm going to make you explain. The second wave of pharmaceuticals exploded in his bloodstream. He was hot and limp, his veins filled with syrup. Just before the tabs finally knocked him out, Ade smiled and winked and blew away like dust. The calm beeped at him. Naomi's voice said, Jim, the PNK response finally came in. Want me to send it down there? Holden struggled to make sense of the words, blinked. Something was wrong with his bunk, with the ship. Slowly, he remembered. Jim? No, he said. I want to watch it up in ops with you. How long was I out? Three hours, she said. Jesus, they took their sweet time getting back to us, didn't they? Holden rolled out of his couch and wiped off the crust that held his eyelashes together. He'd been weeping in his sleep. He told himself it was from the juice crash. The deep ache in his chest was only stressed cartilage. What were you doing for three hours before you called us back? He wondered. Naomi waited for him at the comm station, a man's face frozen mid-word on the screen in front of her. He seemed familiar. That isn't the operations manager. Nope, it's the P&K legal counsel on Saturn Station. The one who gave that speech after the crackdown on supply pilfering, Naomi said. Stealing from us is stealing from you. That one. Lawyer, Holden said with a grimace. This is going to be bad news, then. Naomi restarted the message. The lawyer sprang into motion. James Holden, this is Wallace Fitz calling from Saturn Station. We've received your request for help and your report of the incident. We've also received your broadcast accusing Mars of destroying the Canterbury. 
This was, to say the least, ill-advised. The Martian representative on Saturn Station was in my office not five minutes after your broadcast was received, and the MCR is quite upset by what they view as unfounded accusations of piracy by their government. To further investigate this matter, and to aid in discovering the true wrongdoers, if any, the MCRN is dispatching one of their ships from the Jupiter system to pick you up. The MCRN Donager is the name of this vessel. Your orders from P&K are as follows. You will fly at best possible speed to the Jupiter system. You will cooperate fully with instructions given you by the MCRN Donager, or by any officer of the Martian Congressional Republic Navy. You will assist the MCRN in their investigation into the destruction of the Canterbury. You will refrain from any further broadcasting except to us or the Donager. If you fail to follow these instructions from the company and from the government of Mars, your contract with P&K will be terminated and you will be considered in illegal possession of a P&K shuttlecraft. We will then prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law. Wallace Fitz, out. Holden frowned at the monitor, then shook his head. I never said Mars did it. You sort of did, Naomi replied. I didn't say anything that wasn't entirely factual and backed up by the data I transmitted, and I engaged in no speculation about those facts. So, Naomi said, what do we do? No fucking way, Amos said. No fucking way. The galley was a small space. The five of them filled it uncomfortably. The gray laminate walls showed whirls of bright scrapes where mold had grown once and been cleaned off with microwaves and steel wool. Shed sat with his back against the wall, Naomi across the table. Alex stood in the doorway. Amos started pacing along the back, two fast paces, then a turn, before the lawyer had finished his first sentence. I'm not happy about it either, but that's the word from the home office. Holden said, pointing at the galley's display screen. Didn't mean to get you guys in trouble. No problem, Holden. I still think you did the right thing, Shed replied, running one hand through his limp blonde hair. So what do you think the Martians will do with us? I'm thinking pull our fucking toes off until Holden goes back on the radio and says it wasn't them, Amos said. What in the holy hell is this? They attacked us and now we're supposed to cooperate? They killed the captain. Amos, Holden said. Sorry, Holden, Captain, Amos said. But Jesus wept. We're getting fucked here and not the nice way. We're not going to do this, are we? I don't want to disappear into some Martian prison ship forever, Holden said. The way I see it, we have two options. Either we go along with this, which is basically throwing ourselves on their mercy, or we run, try to make it to the belt and hide. I'm voting for the belt, Naomi said, her arms crossed. Amos raised a hand, seconding the motion. Shed slowly raised his own. Alex shook his head. I know the Donager, he said. She's not some rock hopper. She's the flagship for the MCRN's Jupiter fleet. Battleship. Quarter million tons of bad news. You ever serve on a ship that size? No, I wasn't on anything bigger than a destroyer, Holden replied. I served on the Bandon with the home fleet. We can't go anywhere that a ship like that can't find us. She's got four main engines, each one bigger than our whole ship. She's designed for long periods at high G with every sailor on board juiced to the gills. We can't run, sir. And even if we did, her sensor package could track a golf ball and hit it with a torpedo from half the solar system away. Oh, fuck that, sir, Amos said, standing up. These Martian needle dicks blew up the cant. I say run. At least make it hard for them. Naomi put one hand on Amos's forearm, and the big mechanic paused, shook his head, and sat down. The galley was silent. Holden wondered if McDowell had ever had to make a call like this, and what the old man would have done. Jim... This is your decision, she said, but her eyes were hard. No, what you are going to do 
is get the remaining four members of your crew to safety, and that's all, she thought. Holden nodded and tapped his fingers against his lips. P&K doesn't have our back on this one. We probably can't get away, but I don't want to disappear either, Holden said. And then, I think we go, but we don't go quietly. Why don't we go disobey the spirit of an order? Naomi finished working on the comm panel, her hair now floating around her like a black cloud in the zero-G. Okay, Jim, I'm dumping every watt into the comm array. They'll be getting this loud and clear all the way out to Titania, she said. Holden reached up to run one hand through his sweat-plastered hair. In the null gravity, that just made it stick straight out in every direction. He zipped up his flight suit and pressed the record button. This is James Holden, formerly of the Canterbury, now on the shuttle night. We are cooperating with an investigation into who destroyed the Canterbury, and as part of that cooperation are agreeing to be taken aboard your ship, the MCRN Doniger. We hope that this cooperation means that we will not be held prisoner or harmed. Any such action would only serve to reinforce the idea that the Canterbury was destroyed by a Martian vessel. James Holden out. Holden leaned back. Naomi, send that out broadband. That's a dirty trick, boss, said Alex. Pretty hard to disappear us now. I believe in the ideal of the transparent society, Mr. Kamal, said Holden. Alex grinned, pushed off, and floated down the gangway. Naomi tapped the comm panel, making a small, satisfied sound in the back of her throat. Naomi, Holden said. She turned, her hair waving lazily like they were both drowning. If this goes badly, I need you... I need you to... Throw you to the wolves, she said. Blame everything on you and get the others back to Saturn Station safely? Yeah, Holden said. Don't play the hero. She let the words hang in the air until the last of the irony leached out of them. Hadn't crossed my mind, sir, she said. Knight, this is Captain Teresa Yao of the MCRN Doniger, said the severe-looking woman on the comm screen. Message received. Please refrain from further general broadcasts. My navigator will be sending course information shortly. Follow that course exactly. Yao out. Alex laughed. I think you pissed her off he said. Got the course info. They'll be picking us up in thirteen days. Give her time to really stew on it. Thirteen days before I'm clapped in irons and have needles shoved under my fingernails. Hold inside, leaning back in his couch. Well, best begin our flight toward imprisonment and torture. You may lock in the transmitted course, Mr. Kamal. Roger that, Cap. Huh, said Alex. A problem? Well, the night just did her pre-burn sweep for collision objects, Alex said, and we have six belt objects on an intercept course. Belt objects? Fast contacts with no transponder signal, Alex replied. Ships, but flying dark. They'll catch us just about two days before the Doniger does. Holden pulled up the display. Six small signatures, yellow-orange shifting toward red. Heavy burn. Well, Holden said to the screen, and who the hell are you? Chapter 8 Miller Aggression against the belt is what Earth and Mars survive on. Our weakness is their strength, the masked woman said from Miller's terminal screen. The split circle of the OPA draped behind her like something painted on a sheet. Don't be afraid of them. Their only power is your fear. Well, that and a hundred or so gunships, Havelock said. From what I hear, Miller said, if you clap your hands and say you believe, they can't shoot you. I have to try that sometime. We must rise up, the woman said, her voice growing shrill. We have to take our destiny before it is taken from us. 
Remember the Canterbury. Miller shut the viewer down and leaned back in his chair. The station was at its change of shift surge. Voices raised one over the other as the previous round of cops brought the incoming ones up to speed. The smell of fresh coffee competed with cigarette smoke. There's maybe a dozen like her, Havelock said, nodding toward the dead terminal screen. She's my favorite, though. There are times I swear she's actually foaming at the mouth. How many more files? Miller asked, and his partner shrugged. Two, three hundred, Havelock said, and took a drag on his cigarette. He'd started smoking again. Every few hours there's a new one. They aren't coming from one place. Sometimes they're broadcast on the radio. Sometimes the files show up on public partitions. Orlan found some guys at a portside bar passing out these little VR squids like they were pamphlets. She bust them? No, Havelock said as if it was no big deal. A week had passed since James Holden, self-appointed martyr, had proudly announced that he and his crew were going to talk to someone from the Martian Navy instead of just slinging shit and implications. The footage of the Canterbury's death was everywhere. Debates raging over every frame. The log files that documented the incident were perfectly legitimate, or they were obviously doctored. The torpedoes that had slaughtered the hauler were nukes, or standard pirate fare that breached the drive by mistake, or it was all artifice lifted from old stock footage to cover up what had really killed the cant. The riots had lasted for three days, on and off like a fire hot enough to reignite every time the air pumped back in. The administrative offices reopened under heavy security, but they reopened. The ports fell behind, but they were catching up. The shirtless bastard who Miller had ordered shot was in the Star Helix detainment infirmary, getting new knees, filling out protests against Miller and preparing for his murder trial. Six hundred cubic meters of nitrogen had gone missing from a warehouse in Sector 15. An unlicensed whore had been beaten up and locked in a storage unit. As soon as she was done giving evidence about her attackers, she'd be arrested. They'd caught the kids who'd been breaking the surveillance cameras on Level 16. Superficially, everything was business as usual. Only superficially. When Miller had started working homicide... One of the things that had struck him was the surreal calm of the victims' families. People who had just lost wives, husbands, children, and lovers. People whose lives had just been branded by violence. More often than not, they were calmly offering drinks and answering questions, making the detectives feel welcome. A civilian coming in unaware might have mistaken them for whole. It was only in the careful way they held themselves and the extra quarter second it took their eyes to focus that Miller could see how deep the damage was. Ceres Station was holding itself carefully. Its eyes were taking a quarter second longer to focus. Middle-class people, storekeepers, maintenance workers, computer techs, were avoiding him on the tube the way petty criminals did. Conversations died when Miller came near. In the station, the sense of being under siege was growing. A month earlier, Miller and Havelock, Cobb and Richter and the rest had been the steadying hand of the law. Now, they were employees of an Earth-based security contractor. The difference was subtle, but it was deep. It made him want to stand taller, to show with his body that he was a belter, that he belonged there. It made him want to win people's good opinion back. Let by a bunch of guys passing out virtual reality propaganda with a warning, maybe. It wasn't a smart impulse. What have we got on the board? Miller asked. Two burglaries that look like that same ring, Havelock said. That domestic dispute from last week still needs the report closed up. There was a pretty good assault over by Nakanesh Import Consortium, but Shadid was talking to Dyson and Patel about that, so it's probably spoken for already. So you want... Havelock looked up and out to cover the fact that he was looking away. It was something he'd been doing more often since things had gone to shit. We've really got to get the reports done, Havelock said. Not just the domestic. 
There are four or five folders that are only still open because they need to be crossed and dotted. Yeah, Miller said. Since the riots, he'd watched everyone in a bar get served before Havelock. He'd seen how the other cops from Shadid down went out of their way to reassure Miller that he was one of the good guys, a tacit apology for saddling him with an earther. And he'd seen Havelock see it, too. It made Miller want to protect the man, to let Havelock spend his days in the safety of paperwork and station house coffee, help the man pretend that he wasn't hated for the gravity he'd grown up in. That wasn't a smart impulse, either. What about your bullshit case? Havelock asked. What? Havelock held up a folder. The Julie Mao case. The kidnap job. The sideshow. Miller nodded and rubbed his eyes. Someone at the front of the station house yelped. Someone else laughed. Yeah, no, Miller said. Haven't touched it. Havelock grinned and held it out to him. Miller accepted the file, flipped it open. The eighteen-year-old grinned out at him with perfect teeth. I don't want to saddle you with all the desk driving, Miller said. Hey, you're not the one that kept me off that one. That was Shadid's call. And anyway, it's just paperwork. Never killed anyone. You feel guilty about it? You can buy me a beer after work. Miller tapped the case against the corner of his desk the small impact settling the contents against the folder's spine. Right, he said. I'll go do some follow-up on the bullshit. I'll be back by lunch. Write something up to keep the boss happy. I'll be here, Havelock said. Then, as Miller rose, Hey, look, I didn't want to say anything until I was sure, but I also don't want you to hear it someplace else. Put in for a transfer? Miller said. Yeah. Talk to some of those protogen contractors that pass through. They say their Ganymede office is looking for a new lead investigator, and I thought... Havelock shrugged. It's a good move, Miller said. Just want to go someplace with a sky, even if you look at it through domes, Havelock said, and all the bluff masculinity of police work couldn't keep the wistfulness out of his voice. It's a good move, Miller said again. Juliet Andromeda Mao's hole was in the ninth level of a fourteen-tiered tunnel near the port. The great inverted V was almost half a kilometer wide at the top and no more than a standard tube width at the bottom, the retrofit of one of a dozen reaction mass chambers from the years before the asteroid had been given its false gravity. Now, thousands of cheap holes burrowed into the walls, hundreds on each level, heading straight back like shotgun shacks. Kids played on the terraced streets, shrieking and laughing at nothing. Someone at the bottom was flying a kite in the constant gentle spin breeze, the bright mylar diamond swerving and bucking in the micro-turbulence. Miller checked his terminal against the numbers painted on the wall. 5151-I. Home sweet home to the poor little rich girl. He keyed his override, and the dirty green door popped its seals and let him pass. The hole canted up into the body of the station. Three small rooms, general living space at the front, then a bedroom hardly larger than the cot it contained, then a stall with shower, toilet, and half-sink, all within elbow distance. It was a standard design. He'd seen it a thousand times. Miller stood for a minute, not looking at anything in particular, listening to the reassuring hiss of air cycling through the ductwork. He reserved judgment, waiting as the back of his head built an impression of the place and, through it, of the girl who'd lived there. Spartan was the wrong word. The place was simple, yes. The only decorations were a small framed watercolor of a slightly abstracted woman's face over the table in the front room, and a cluster of playing-card-sized plaques over the cot in the bedroom. He leaned close to read the small script. A formal award granting Julie Mao, not Juliet, purple belt status by the Series Center for Jiu-Jitsu. Another stepping her up to brown belt. They were two years apart. Tough school, then. He put his fingers on the empty space on the wall where one for black could go. 
There was none of the affectation. No stylized throwing stars or imitation swords. Just a small acknowledgement that Julie Mao had done what she had done. He gave her points for that. The drawers had two changes of clothes, one of heavy canvas and denim and one of blue linen with a silk scarf. One for work, one for play. It was less than Miller owned, and he was hardly a clothes horse. With her socks and underwear was a wide armband with a split circle of the OPA. Not a surprise for a girl who turned her back on wealth and privilege to live in a dump like this. The refrigerator had two takeaway boxes filled with spoiled food and a bottle of local beer. Miller hesitated, then took the beer. He sat at the table and pulled up the hole's built-in terminal. True to Shadid's word, Julie's partition opened to Miller's password. The custom background was a racing pinnace. The interface was customized in small, legible iconography. Communication, entertainment, work, personal. Elegant, that was the word. Not Spartan, but elegant. He paged quickly through her professional files, letting his mind take in an overview, just as he had with the whole living space. There would be time for rigor, and a first impression was usually more useful than an encyclopedia. She had training videos on several different light transport craft. Some political archives, but nothing that raised a flag. A scanned volume of poetry by some of the first settlers in the belt. He shifted to her personal correspondence. It was all kept as neat and controlled as a belter's. All incoming messages were filtered to subfolders. Work, personal, broadcast, shopping. He popped open broadcast. Two or three hundred political news feeds, discussion group digests, bulletins and announcements. A few had been viewed here and there, but nothing with any sort of religious observation. Julie was the kind of woman who would sacrifice for a cause, but not the kind who'd take joy in reading the propaganda. Miller filed that away. Shopping was a long tracking of simple merchant messages. Some receipts, some announcements, some requests for goods and services. A cancellation for a belt-based singles circle caught his eye. Miller resorted for related correspondence. Julie had signed up for the low-G, low-pressure dating service in February of the previous year and canceled in June without having used it. The personal folder was more diverse. At a rough guess, there were sixty or seventy subfolders broken down by name. Some were people. Sasha Lloyd Navarro, Aaron Michaels. Others were private notations. Sparring Circle, OPA. Bullshit guilt trips. Well, this could be interesting, he said to the empty hole. Fifty messages, dating back five years all marked as originating at the Mao Kwiatkowski mercantile stations, in the Belt and on Luna. Unlike the political tracts, all but one had been opened. Miller took a pull from the beer and considered the most recent two messages. The most recent, still unread, was from J.P.M., Jules-Pierre Mao, at a guess. The one immediately before it showed three drafted replies. None of them sent. It was from Ariadne, the mother. There was always an element of voyeurism in being a detective. It was legal for him to be here, poking through the private life of a woman he'd never met. It was part of his legitimate investigation to know that she was lonely, that the only toiletries in her bathroom were her own, that she was proud. No one would have any complaints to make, or at least any that carried repercussions for his job, if he read every private message on her partition. Drinking her beer was the most ethically suspect thing he'd done since he'd come in. And still, he hesitated for a few seconds before opening the second-to-last message. The screen shifted. On better equipment, it would have been indistinguishable from ink on paper, but Julie's cheap system shuddered at the thinnest lines and leaked a soft glow at the left edge. The handwriting was delicate and legible, either done with a calligraphic software good enough to vary letter shape and line width, or else handwritten. 
sweetheart. I hope everything's going well for you. I wish you would write to me on your own sometimes. I feel like I have to put in a request in triplicate just to hear how my own daughter is doing. I know this adventure of yours is all about freedom and self-reliance, but surely there's still room in there to be considerate. I wanted to get in touch with you especially because your father is going through one of his consolidation phases again, and we're thinking of selling the Razorback. I know it was important to you once, but I suppose we've all given up on your racing again. It's just racking up storage fees now, and there's no call to be sentimental. It was signed with the flowing initials, A.M. Miller considered the words. Somehow he'd expected the paternal exhortations of the very rich to be more subtle. If you don't do as we say, we'll get rid of your toys. If you don't write, if you don't come home, if you don't love us. Miller opened the first incomplete draft. Mother, if that's what you call yourself. Thank you so much for dropping yet another turd onto my day. I can't believe how selfish and petty and crude you are. I can't believe you sleep at night, or that you ever thought I could... Miller skimmed the rest. The tone seemed consistent. The second draft reply was dated two days later. He skipped to it. Mom, I'm sorry we've been so estranged these last few years. I know it's been hard for you and for Daddy. I hope you can see that the decisions I've made were never meant to hurt either of you. About the Razorback... I wish you'd reconsider. She's my first boat, and I... It stopped there. Miller leaned back. Steady on, kid, he said to the imaginary Julie, then opened the last draft. Ariadne, do what you have to do. Julie. Miller laughed and raised his bottle to the screen in toast. They'd known how to hit her where it hurt, and Julie had taken the blow. If he ever caught her and shipped her back, it was going to be a bad day for both of them. All of them. He finished the beer, dropped the bottle into the recycling chute, and opened the last message. He more than half dreaded learning the final fate of the Razorback, but it was his job to know as much as he could. Julie, this is not a joke. This is not one of your mother's drama fits. I have solid information that the belt is about to be a very unsafe place. Whatever differences we have, we can work out later. For your own safety, come home now. Miller frowned. The air recycler hummed. Outside, the local kids whistled high and loud. He tapped the screen, closing the last bullshit guilt trip message, then opened it again. It had been sent from Luna, two weeks before James Holden and the Canterbury raised the specter of war between Mars and the Belt. This sideshow was getting interesting. Chapter 9 Holden The ships are still not responding, Naomi said, punching a key sequence on the comm panel. I didn't think they would, but I want to show the Dunninger that we're worried about being followed. It's all covering our asses at this point, Holden said. Naomi's spine popped as she stretched. Holden pulled a protein bar out of the box in his lap and threw it at her. Eat. She peeled the wrapping off while Amos clambered up the ladder and threw himself into the couch next to her. His coverall was so filthy it shined. Just as with the others... Three days on the cramped shuttle hadn't helped his personal hygiene. Holden reached up and scratched his own greasy hair with distaste. The night was too small for showers, and the zero-G sinks were too small to stick your head in. Amos had solved the hair-washing problem by shaving all of his off. Now he just had a ring of stubble around his bald spot. Somehow, Naomi's hair stayed shiny and mostly oil-free. Holden wondered how she did that. Toss me some chow, Ixo, Amos said. Captain, Naomi corrected. Holden threw a protein bar at him, too. Amos snatched it from the air, then considered the long, thin package with distaste. 
God damn, boss, I get my left nut for food that didn't look like a dildo, Amos said, then tapped his food against Naomi's in mock toast. Tell me about our water, Holden said. Well, I've been crawling around between hulls all day. I've tightened everything that can be tightened and slapped epoxy on anything that can't, so we aren't dripping anywhere. It'll still be right down to the wire, Jim, Naomi said. The night's recycling systems are crap. She was never intended to process five people's worth of waste back into potables for two weeks. Down to the wire I can handle. We'll just learn to live with each other's stink. I was worried about nowhere near enough. Speaking of which, I'm going to head up to my rack and spray in some more deodorant, Amos said. After all day crawling in the ship's guts, my stink's even keeping me awake tonight. Amos swallowed the last of his food and smacked his lips with mock relish, then climbed out of his couch and headed down the crew ladder. Holden took a bite of his own bar. It tasted like greased cardboard. What's Shed up to? he asked. He's been pretty quiet. Naomi, frowning, put her half-eaten bar down on the comm panel. I wanted to talk to you about that. He's not doing well, Jim. Out of all of us, he's having the hardest time with... What's happened? You and Alex were both Navy men. They train you to deal with losing shipmates. Amos has been flying so long, this is actually the third ship that's gone down under him, if you can believe that. And you are made entirely of cast iron and titanium, Holden said, only pretending to joke. Not entirely. Eighty, ninety percent tops, Naomi said with a half-smile. Seriously, though, I think you should talk to him. And say what? I'm no psychiatrist. The Navy version of this speech involves duty and honorable sacrifice and avenging fallen comrades. It doesn't work as well when your friends have been murdered for no apparent reason and there's essentially no chance you can do anything about it. I didn't say you had to fix him. I said you needed to talk to him. Holden got up from his couch with a salute. Yes, sir, he said. At the latter, he paused. Again. Thank you, Naomi. And really, I know. Go be the captain, she said, turning back to her panel and calling up the ship op screen. I'll keep waving at the neighbors. Holden found Shed in the night's tiny sick bay, really more of a sick closet. Other than a reinforced cot, the cabinets of supplies, and a half dozen pieces of wall mounted equipment, there was just enough room for one stool stuck to the floor on magnetic feet. Shed was sitting on it. Hey, buddy, mind if I come in? Holden asked. Did I actually say, hey, buddy? He thought. Shed shrugged and pulled up an inventory screen on the wall panel, opening various drawers and staring at the contents, pretending he'd been in the middle of something. Look, Shed... This thing with the Canterbury has really hit everyone hard, and you've... Holden said. Shed turned, holding up a white squeeze tube. Three percent acetic acid solution. Didn't realize we had this out here. The can'ts run out, and I've got three people with GW who could really use it. Why'd they put it on the night, I wonder? Shed said. GW? Was all Holden could think to reply. Genital warts. Acetic acid solution is the treatment for any visible warts. Burns them off. Hurts like hell, but it does the job. No reason to keep it on the shuttle. Medical inventory is always so messed up. Holden opened his mouth to speak, found nothing to say, and closed it again. We've got acetic acid cream, Shed said, his voice increasingly shrill, but no alum set for pain. Which do you think you'd need more on a rescue shuttle? If we'd found anyone on that wreck with a bad case of GW, we'd have been set. A broken bone, you're out of luck. Just suck it up. Look, Shed, Holden said, trying to break in. Oh, and look at this. No coagulant booster. What the hell? Hey, no chance anyone on a rescue mission could, you know, start bleeding. Catch a case of red bumps on your crank, sure, but bleeding? No way. I mean, we've got four cases of syphilis on the cant right now. One of the oldest diseases in the book, and we still can't get rid of it. I tell those guys, the hookers on Saturn Station are banging every ice bucker on the circuit, so put the glove on. But do they listen? No. So here we are with syphilis and not enough ciprofloxacin. Holden felt his jaw slide forward. 
he gripped the side of the hatch and leaned into the room. Everyone on the cant is dead, Holden said, making each word clear and strong and brutal. Everyone is dead. No one needs the antibiotics. No one needs wart cream. Shed stopped talking, and all the air went out of him like he'd been gut-punched. He closed the drawers in the supply cabinet and turned off the inventory screen with small, precise movements. I know, he said in a quiet voice. I'm not stupid. I just need some time. We all do. But we're stuck in this tiny can together. I'll be honest, I came down here because Naomi is worried about you. But now that I'm here, you're freaking me the hell out. It's okay because I'm the captain now and it's my job, but I can't have you freaking Alex or Amos out. We're ten days from being grabbed by a Martian battleship and that's scary enough without the doctor falling apart. I'm not a doctor. I'm just a tech, Shed said, his voice very small. You're our doctor, okay? To the four of us here with you on this ship, you're our doctor. If Alex starts having post-traumatic stress episodes and needs meds to keep it together, he'll come to you. If you're down here jabbering about warts, he'll turn around and go back up to the cockpit and just do a really bad job of flying. You want to cry? Do it with all of us. We'll sit together in the galley and get drunk and cry like babies, but we'll do it together where it's safe. No more hiding down here. Shed nodded. Can we do that? He said. Do what? Holden asked. Get drunk and cry like babies? Hell yes. That is officially on the schedule for tonight. Report to the galley at twenty hundred hours, Mr. Garvey. Bring a cup. Shed started to reply when the general calm clicked on and Naomi said, Jim, come back up to Ops. Holden gripped Shed's shoulder for a minute, then left. In Ops... Naomi had the comm screen up again and was speaking to Alex in low tones. The pilot was shaking his head and frowning. A map glowed on her screen. What's up? Holden asked. We're getting a tight beam, Jim. It locked on and started transmitting just a couple minutes ago, Naomi replied. From the Donager? The Martian battleship was the only thing he could think of that might be inside laser communications range. No. From the belt, Naomi said. And not from Ceres or Eros or Pallas, either. None of the big stations. She pointed at a small dot on her display. It's coming from here. That's empty space, Holden said. Nope, Alex checked. It's the site of a big construction project Tycho is working on. Not a lot of detail on it, but radar returns are pretty strong. Something out there has a comma ray that'll put a dot the size of Uranus on us from over three AU away, Alex said. Okay, wow, that's impressive. What is our anus-sized dot saying? Holden asked. You'll never believe this, Naomi said and turned on the playback. A dark-skinned man with the heavy facial bones of an earther appeared on the screen. His hair was graying and his neck was ropey with old muscle. He smiled and said, Hello, James Holden. My name is Fred Johnson. Holden hit the pause button. This guy looks familiar. Search the ship's database for that name, he said. Naomi didn't move. She just stared at him with a puzzled look on her face. What? he said. That's Frederick Johnson, she said. Okay. Colonel Frederick Lucius Johnson. The pause might have been a second. It might have been an hour. Jesus, was all Holden could think to say. The man on the screen had once been among the most decorated officers in the UN military and ended up one of its most embarrassing failures. To Belters, he was the Earther Sheriff of Nottingham who turned into Robin Hood. To Earth, he was the hero who'd fallen from grace. Fred Johnson started his rise to fame with a series of high-profile captures of belt pirates during one of the periods of tension between Earth and Mars that seemed to ramp up every few decades and then fade away again. 
Whenever the system's two superpowers rattled their sabers at each other, crime in the belt rose. Colonel Johnson, Captain Johnson at the time, and his small wing of three missile frigates destroyed a dozen pirate ships and two major bases in a two-year span. By the time the coalition had stopped bickering, piracy was actually down in the belt, and Fred Johnson was the name on everyone's lips. He was promoted and given command over the Coalition Marine Division tasked with policing the belt, where he continued to serve with distinction. Until Anderson Station. A tiny shipping depot almost on the opposite side of the belt from the major port series. Most people, including most belters, would not have been able to find Anderson Station on a map. Its only importance was as a minor distribution station for water and air in one of the sparsest stretches of the belt. Fewer than a million belters got their air from Anderson. Gustav Marconi, a career coalition bureaucrat on the station, decided to implement a 3% handling surcharge on shipments passing through the station in hopes of raising the bottom line. Less than 5% of the belters buying their air from Anderson were living bottle to mouth, so just under 50,000 belters might have to spend one day of each month not breathing. Only a small percentage of those 50,000 lacked the leeway in their recycling systems to cover this minor shortfall. Of those, only a small portion felt that armed revolt was the correct course. Which was why, of the million affected, only 170 armed belters came to the station, took over, and threw Marconi out an airlock. They demanded a government guarantee that no further handling surcharges would be added to the price of air and water coming through the station. The coalition sent Colonel Johnson. During the massacre of Anderson Station, the belters kept the station cameras rolling, broadcasting to the solar system the entire time. Everyone watched as coalition marines fought a long, gruesome, corridor-to-corridor -corridor battle against men with nothing to lose and no reason to surrender. The coalition won, it was a foregone conclusion, but it took three days of broadcast slaughter. The iconic image of the video was not one of the fighting, but the last image the station cameras caught before they were cut off. Colonel Johnson in station ops, surrounded by the corpses of the belters who'd made their last stand there, surveying the carnage with a flat stare and hands limp at his sides. The UN tried to keep Colonel Johnson's resignation quiet, but he was too much a public figure. The video of the battle dominated the nets for weeks, only displaced when the former Colonel Johnson made a public statement apologizing for the massacre and announcing that the relationship between the belt and the inner planets was untenable and heading toward ever greater tragedy. Then he vanished. He was almost forgotten, a footnote in the history of human carnage until the palace colony revolt four years later. This time, refinery metal workers kicked the coalition governor off station. Instead of a tiny way station with 170 rebels, it was a major belt rock with more than 150,000 people on it. When the coalition ordered in the Marines, everyone expected a bloodbath. Colonel Johnson came out of nowhere and talked the metal workers down. He talked the coalition commanders into holding back the Marines until the station could be handed over peacefully. He spent more than a year negotiating with the coalition governor to improve working conditions in the refineries. And suddenly, the butcher of Anderson Station was a belt hero and an icon. An icon who was beaming private messages to the night. Holden hit the play button, and that, Fred Johnson said, Mr. Holden, I think you're being played. Let me say straight out that I am speaking to you as an official representative of the Outer Planets Alliance. I don't know what you've heard, but we aren't all a bunch of cowboys itching for a chance to shoot our way to freedom. I've spent the last ten years working to make life for the Belters better without anyone getting shot. I believe in this idea so deeply that I gave up my Earth citizenship when I came out here. I tell you that so you'll know how invested I am. I may be the one person in the solar system who wants war the least, and my voice is loud in OPA councils. 
You may have heard some of the broadcasts beating on the war drums and calling for revenge against Mars for what happened to your ship. I've talked to every OPA cell leader I know, and no one's claiming responsibility. Someone is working very hard to start a war. If it's Mars, then when you get on that ship, you'll never say another word in public that isn't fed to you by Martian handlers. I don't want to think it is Mars. I can't see how they would get anything out of a war. So my hope is that even after the Donager picks you up, you can still be a player in what follows. I am sending you a keyword. Next time you broadcast publicly, use the word ubiquitous within the first sentence of the broadcast to signal that you're not being coerced. Don't use it, and I'll assume you are. Either way, I want you to know you have allies in the belt. I don't know who or what you were before, but your voice matters now. If you want to use that voice to make things better, I will do anything I can to help you do it. If you get free, contact me at the address that follows. I think maybe you and I have a lot to talk about. Johnson out. The crew sat in the galley, drinking a bottle of Erzat's tequila Amos had scrounged from somewhere. Shed was politely sipping from a small cup of it and trying to hide his grimace each time. Alex and Amos drank like sailors, a finger full in the bottom of the cup tossed back all at once. Alex had a habit of saying, Who boy? after each shot. Amos just used a different profanity each time. He was up to his eleventh shot and so far hadn't repeated himself. Holden stared at Naomi. She swirled the tequila in her cup and stared back. He found himself wondering what sort of genetic mashup had produced her features. Definitely some African and South American in there. Her last name hinted at Japanese ancestry, which was only barely visible as a slight epicanthic fold. She'd never been conventionally pretty, but from the right angle she was actually fairly striking. Shit, I'm drunker than I thought. To cover, he said, So, so Colonel Johnson is calling you now. Quite the important man you've become, sir, Naomi replied. Amos put down his cup with exaggerated care. Been meaning to ask about that, sir. Any chance we might take up his offer of help and just head back to the belt? He said. Don't know about you, but with a Martian battleship in front and the half-dozen mystery ships behind, it's starting to feel pretty fucking crowded out here. Alex snorted. Are you kidding? If we flipped now, we'd be just about stopped by the time the Donager caught up to us. She's burning the furniture to catch us before the belter ships do. If we start heading their direction, the Donnie might take that as a sign we've switched teams, frag the whole lot of us. I agree with Mr. Kamal, Holden said. We've picked our course, and we're going to see it through. I won't be losing Fred's contact information any time soon. Speaking of which, have you deleted his message yet, Naomi? Yes, sir. Scrubbed it from the ship's memory with steel wool. The Martians will never know he talked to us. Holden nodded and unzipped his jumpsuit a little further. The galley was starting to feel very hot with five drunk people in it. Naomi raised an eyebrow at his days-old T-shirt. Embarrassed, he zipped back up. Those ships don't make any sense to me, boss, Alex said. A half-dozen ships flying kamikaze missions with nukes strapped to their hulls might make a dent in a battle wagon like the Donnie, but not much else would. She opens up with her point defense network and rail guns, she can create a no-fly zone a thousand clicks across. They could be killing those six ships with torpedoes already, except I think they're as confused about who they are as we are. They'll know they can't catch us before the Donager picks us up, Holden said, and they can't take her in a fight, so I don't know what they're up to. Amos poured the last of the tequila into everyone's cups and held his up in a toast. I guess we'll fucking find out. Chapter 10 Miller Captain Shadid tapped the tip of her middle finger against her thumb when she started getting annoyed. It was a small sound, soft as a cat's paws but ever since Miller first noticed her habit, it had seemed louder. Quiet as it was, it could fill her office. Miller, she said, smiling as if she meant it. 
We're all on edge these days. These have been hard, hard times. Yes, sir, Miller said, lowering his head like a fullback determined to muscle his way through all defenders. But I think this is important enough to deserve closer. It's a favor for a shareholder, Shadid said. Her father got jumpy. There's no reason to think he meant Mars blasting the Canterbury. Tariffs are going up again. There was a mine blowout on one of the Red Moon operations. Eros is having trouble with their yeast farm. We don't go through a day without something happening in the belt that would make a daddy scared for his precious little flower. Yes, sir, but the timing... Her fingers up-tempo. Miller bit his lips. The cause was lost. Don't go chasing conspiracies, Shadid said. We've got a full board of crimes we know are real. Politics, war, system-wide cabals of interplanet bad guys searching for ways to screw us over? Not our mandate. Just get me a report that says you're looking. I'll send it back up the line and we can get back to our jobs. Yes, sir. Anything else? No, sir. Shadid nodded and turned back to her terminal. Miller plucked his hat from the corner of her desk and headed out. One of the station house air filters had gone bad over the weekend, and the replacement gave the rooms a reassuring smell of new plastic and ozone. Miller sat at his desk, fingers laced behind his head, and stared at the light fixture above him. The knot that had tied itself in his gut hadn't loosened up. That was too bad. Not so good, then? Havelock asked. Could have gone better. She pulled the job? Miller shook his head. No, it's still mine. She just wants me to do it half-assed. Could be worse. At least you get to find out what happened. And if you maybe spend a little time after hours digging into it just for practice, you know. Yeah, Miller said. Practice. Their desks were unnaturally clean, his and Havelock's both. The barrier of paperwork Havelock had created between himself and the station had eroded away, and Miller could tell from his partner's eyes and the way his hands moved that the cop and Havelock wanted to get back into the tunnels. He couldn't tell if it was to prove himself before his transfer went through, or just to break a few heads. Maybe those were two ways of saying the same thing. Just don't get yourself killed before you get out of here, Miller thought. Aloud, he said, what have we got? Hardware shop, Sector 8, third level in, Havelock said. Extortion complaint. Miller sat for a moment, considering his own reluctance as if it belonged to someone else. It was like Shadid had given a dog just one bite of fresh meat, then pointed it back toward Kibble. The temptation to blow off the hardware shop bloomed, and for a moment he almost gave in. Then he sighed swung his feet down to the decking and stood. All right, then, he said. Let's go make the station safe for commerce. Words to live by, Havelock said, checking his gun. He'd been doing that a lot more recently. The shop was an entertainment franchise. Clean, white fixtures offering up custom rigs for interactive environments, battle simulations, exploration games, sex... A woman's voice ululated on the sound system, somewhere between an Islamic call to prayer and orgasm, with a drumbeat. Half the titles were in Hindi with Chinese and Spanish translations. The other half were English with Hindi as the second language. The clerk was hardly more than a boy, sixteen, seventeen years old, with a weedy black beard he wore like a badge. Can I help you? the boy said eyeing Havelock with disdain just short of contempt. Havelock pulled his ID, making sure the kid got a good long look at his gun when he did it. We'd like to talk to... Miller glanced at the complaint form on his terminal screen. Asher Kamamatsu, you hear? The manager was a fat man for a belter. Taller than Havelock, the man carried fat around his belly and thick muscles through the shoulders, arms, and neck. If Miller squinted, he could see the seventeen-year-old boy he had been under the layers of time and disappointment, and it looked a lot like the clerk out front. The office was almost too small for the three of them and stacked with boxes of pornographic software. You'll catch them? The manager said. 
No, Miller said. Still trying to figure out who they are. Damn it, I already told you. There's pictures of them off the store camera. I gave you his fucking name. Miller looked at his terminal. The suspect was named Matteo Judd, a dock worker with an unspectacular criminal record. You think it's just him, then? Miller said. All right, we'll just go pick him up, throw him in the can. No reason for us to find out who he's working for. Probably no one who'll take it wrong, anyway. My experience with these protection rackets, the purse boys get replaced when everyone goes down. But since you're sure this guy's the whole problem... The manager's sour expression told Miller he'd made his point. Havelock, leaning against a stack of boxes marked Siret Livia Dvushki, smiled. Why don't you tell me what he wanted? Miller said. I already told the last cop, the manager said. Tell me. He was selling us a private insurance plan. Hundred a month, same as the last guy. Last guy? Havelock said. So this happened before? Sure, the manager said. Everyone has to pay some, you know. Price of doing business. Miller closed his terminal, frowning. Philosophical, but if it's the price of doing business, what are we here for? Because I thought you, you people had this shit under control. Ever since we stopped paying the loca, I've been able to turn a decent profit. Now it's all starting up again. Hold on, Miller said. You're telling me the loca Grega stopped charging protection? Sure, not just here. Half the guys I know in the bow just stopped showing up. We figured the cops had actually done something for once. Now we've got these new bastards, and it's the same damn thing all over again. A crawling feeling made its way up Miller's neck. He looked up at Havelock, who shook his head. He hadn't heard of it either. The Golden Bow Society, Sohiro's Crew, the Loca Grega, all the organized crime on Ceres suffering the same ecological collapse. And now someone new moving into the evacuated niche. Might be opportunism might be something else. He almost didn't want to ask the next questions. Havelock was going to think he was paranoid. How long has it been since the old guys called on you for protection? Miller asked. I don't know. Long time? Before or after Mars killed that water hauler? The manager folded his thick arms. His eyes narrowed. Before, he said. Maybe a month or two. What's that got to do with anything? Just trying to get the time scale right, Miller said. The new guy, Matteo, he tell you who was backing his new insurance plan? That's your job figuring it, right? The manager's expression had closed down so hard Miller imagined he could hear the click. Yes, Asher Kamamatsu knew who was shaking him down. He had balls enough to squeak about it, but not to point the finger. Interesting. Well, thanks for that, Miller said, standing up. We'll let you know what we find. Glad you're on the case, the manager said, matching sarcasm for sarcasm. In the exterior tunnel, Miller stopped. The neighborhood was at the friction point between sleazy and respectable. White marks showed where graffiti had been painted over. Men on bicycles swerved and weaved, foam wheels humming on the polished stone. Miller walked slowly, his eyes on the ceiling high above them until he found the security camera. He pulled up his terminal, navigated to the logs that matched the camera code and cross-referenced the time code from the store's still frames. For a moment, he thumbed the controls, speeding people back and forth. And there was Matteo, coming out of the shop. A smug grin deformed the man's face. Miller froze the image and enhanced it. Havelock, watching over his shoulder, whistled low. The split circle of the OPA was perfectly clear on the thug's armband. The same kind of armband he'd found in Julie Mao's hole. What kind of company have you been keeping, kid? Miller thought. You're better than this. You have to know you're better than this. Hey, partner, he said aloud. Think you can write up the report on that interview? I've got something I'd like to do. Might not be too smart to have you there. No offense. Havelock's eyebrows crawled toward his hairline. 
You're going to question the OPA? Shake some trees is all, Miller said. Miller would have thought that just being a security contractor in a known OPA convivial bar would be enough to get him noticed. In the event, half the faces he recognized in the dim light of John Rock Gentleman's Club were normal citizens. More than one of those were Star Helix, just like him, when they were on duty. The music was pure belter, soft chimes accompanied by zither and guitar with lyrics in half a dozen languages. He was on his fourth beer, two hours past the end of his shift and on the edge of giving up his plan as a losing scheme, when a tall, thin man sat down at the bar next to him. Acne-pocked cheeks gave a sense of damage to a face that otherwise seemed on the verge of laughter. It wasn't the first OPA armband he'd seen that night, but it was worn with an air of defiance and authority. Miller nodded. I heard you've been asking about the OPA, the man said. Interested in joining up? Miller smiled and lifted his glass, an intentionally noncommittal gesture. You who I'd talk to if I did? He asked, his tone light. Might be able to help. Maybe you could tell me about a couple other things then, he said, taking out his terminal and putting it on the fake bamboo bar with an audible click. Mateo Judd's picture glowed on the screen. The OPA man frowned, turning the screen to see it better. I'm a realist, Miller said. When Chucky Snails was running protection, I wasn't above talking to his men. When the hand took over, and then the Golden Bough Society after them. My job isn't to stop people from bending the rules. It's to keep series stable. You understand what I'm saying? I can't say I do, the pockmarked man said. His accent made him sound more educated than Miller had expected. Who is this man? His name's Matteo Judd. He's been starting a protection business in Sector 8. Says it's backed by the OPA. People say things, Detective. It is, Detective, isn't it? But you are discussing realism. If the OPA is making a move on the series' black economy, it's going to be better all around if we can talk to each other. Communicate. The man chuckled and pushed the terminal back. The bartender paced by a question in his eyes that wasn't asking if they needed anything. It wasn't meant for Miller. I had heard that there was a certain level of corruption in Star Helix, the man said. I admit I'm impressed by your straightforward manner. I'll clarify. The OPA isn't a criminal organization. Really? My mistake. I figured from the way it killed a lot of people. You're baiting me. We defend ourselves against people who are perpetrating economic terrorism against the belt. Earthers. Martians. We are in the business of protecting belters, the man said. Even you, detective. Economic terrorism, Miller said. That seems a little overheated. You think so? The inner planets look on us as their labor force. They tax us. They direct what we do. They enforce their laws and ignore ours in the name of stability. In the last year, they've doubled the tariffs to Titania. Five thousand people on an ice ball orbiting Neptune, months from anywhere. The sun's just a bright star to them. Do you think they're in a position to get redress? They've blocked any Belter freighters from taking Europa contracts. They charge us twice as much to dock at Ganymede. The science station on Phoebe? We aren't even allowed to orbit it. There isn't a belter in the place. Whatever they do there, we won't find out until they sell the technology back to us ten years from now. Miller sipped his beer and nodded toward his terminal. So, this one isn't yours? No, he isn't. Miller nodded and put the terminal back in his pocket. Oddly, he believed the man. He didn't hold himself like a thug. The bravado wasn't there. The sense of trying to impress the world. No, this man was certain and amused and, underneath it all, profoundly tired. Miller had known soldiers like that, but not criminals. 
One other thing, Miller said. I'm looking for someone. Another investigation? Not exactly, no. Juliet Andromeda Mao goes by Julie. Should I know the name? She's OPA, Miller said with a shrug. Do you know everyone in Star Helix? The man said. And when Miller didn't answer, he added, We are considerably larger than your corporation. Fair point, Miller said. But if you could keep an ear out, I'd appreciate it. I don't know that you're in a position to expect favors. No harm asking. The pock-faced man chuckled, put a hand on Miller's shoulder. Don't come back here, detective, he said, and walked away into the crowd. Miller took another drink of his beer, frowning. An uncomfortable feeling of having made the wrong step fidgeted in the back of his mind. He'd been sure that the OPA was making a move on Ceres, capitalizing on the death of the water hauler and the belt's uptick in fear and hatred of the inner planets. But how did that fit with Julie Mao's father and his suspiciously well-timed anxiety? Or the disappearance of Ceres station supply of usual suspects in the first place? Thinking about it was like watching a video that was just out of focus. The sense of it was almost there, but only almost. Too many dots, Miller said. Not enough lines. Excuse me, the bartender said. Nothing, Miller said, pushing the half-empty bottle across the bar. Thanks. In his hole, Miller turned on some music. The lyrical chants that Candace had liked, back when they were young and, if not hopeful, at least more joyful in their fatalism. He set the lights to half power, hoping that if he relaxed, if for just a few minutes he let go of the gnawing sense that he had missed some critical detail, the missing piece might arrive on its own. He'd half expected Candace to appear in his mind, sighing and looking crossly at him the way she had in life. Instead, he found himself talking with Julie Mao. In the half-sleep of alcohol and exhaustion, he imagined her sitting at Havelock's desk. She was the wrong age, younger than the real woman would be. She was the age of the smiling kid in her picture, the girl who had raced in the Razorback and won. He had the sense of asking her questions, and her answers had the power of revelation. Everything made sense. Not only the change in the Golden Bow Society and her own abduction case, but Havelock's transfer, the dead ice hauler, Miller's own life and work. He dreamed of Julia Mao laughing, and he woke up late with a headache. Havelock was waiting at his desk. His broad, short, earther face seemed strangely alien, but Miller tried to shake it off. You look like crap, Havelock said. Busy night? Just getting old and drinking cheap beer, Miller said. One of the vice squad shouted something angry about her files being locked again, and a computer tech scuttled across the station house like a nervous cockroach. Havelock leaned closer, his expression grave. Seriously, Miller, Havelock said. We're still partners, and, honest to God, I think you may be the only friend I've got on this rock. You can trust me. If there's anything you want to tell me, I'm good. That's great, Miller said. But I don't know what you're talking about. Last night was a bust. No OPA? Sure OPA. Any more, you swing a dead cat in this station, you'll hit three OPA guys. Just no good information. Havelock leaned back, lips pressed thin and bloodless. Miller's shrug asked a question, and the earther nodded toward the board. A new homicide topped the list. At three in the morning, while Miller had been having inchoate dream conversations, someone had opened Mateo Judd's hole and fired a shotgun cartridge full of ballistic gel into his left eye. Well, Miller said, called that one wrong. Which one? Havelock said. OPA's not moving in on the criminals, Miller said. They're moving in on the cops.
Chapter 11 Holden The Donager was ugly. Holden had seen pictures and videos of the old ocean-going navies of Earth, and even in the Age of Steel there had always been something beautiful about them. Long and sleek, they had the appearance of something leaning into the wind, a creature barely held on the leash. The Donager had none of that. Like all long-flight spacecraft, it was built in the office tower configuration. Each deck one floor of the building, ladders or elevators running down the axis. Constant thrust took the place of gravity. But the Donager actually looked like an office building on its side. Square and blocky, with small bulbous projections and seemingly random places. At nearly 500 meters long, it was the size of a 130-story building. Alex had said it was 250,000 tons dry weight, and it looked heavier. Holden reflected, not for the first time, on how so much of the human sense of aesthetics had been formed in a time when sleek objects cut through the air. The Donager would never move through anything thicker than interstellar gas, so curves and angles were a waste of space. The result was ugly. It was also intimidating. As Holden watched from his seat next to Alex in the cockpit of the night, the massive battleship matched course with them, looming close and then seeming to stop above them. A docking bay opened, breaking up the Donager's flat black belly with a square of dim red light. The night beeped insistently, reminding him of the targeting lasers painting their hull. Holden looked for the point defense cannons aimed at him. He couldn't find them. When Alex spoke, Holden jumped. Roger that, Donager, the pilot said. We've got steering lock, I'm killing thrust. The last shreds of weight vanished. Both ships were still moving at hundreds of kilometers a minute, but their matched courses felt like stillness. Got docking permission, Cap. Take her in. It seems late to make a run for it, Mr. Kamal. Holden said. He imagined Alex making a mistake that the Donager interpreted as threatening and the point defense cannons throwing a couple hundred thousand Teflon-coated chunks of steel through them. Go slowly, Alex, he said. They say one of those can kill a planet, Naomi said over the comm. She was at the op station a deck below. Anyone can kill a planet from orbit, Holden replied. You don't even need bombs. Just push anvils out the airlock. That thing out there could kill... shit, anything. Tiny touches shifted them as the maneuvering rockets fired. Holden knew that Alex was guiding them in, but he couldn't shake the feeling that the Donager was swallowing them. Docking took nearly an hour. Once the night was inside the bay... A massive manipulator arm grabbed her and put it down in an empty section of the deck. Clamps grabbed the ship, the night's hull reverberating with a metallic bang that reminded Holden of a brig cell's maglocks. The Martians ran a docking tube from one wall and made it up to the night's airlock. Holden gathered the crew at the inner door. No guns, no knives, no anything that might look like a weapon, he said. They'll probably be okay with hand terminals, but keep them turned off just in case. If they ask for it, hand it over without complaint. Our survival here may rest on them thinking we're very compliant. Yeah, Amos said. Fuckers killed McDowell, but we have to act nice. Alex started to respond, but Holden cut him off. Alex, you did twenty flying with AMCRN. Anything else we should know? Same stuff you said, boss. Alex replied. Yes, sir, no, sir, and snap to when given an order. The enlisted guys will be okay, but the officers get the sense of humor trained out of them. Holden looked at his tiny crew, hoping he hadn't killed them all by bringing them here. He cycled open the lock, and they drifted down the short docking tube in the zero-G. When they reached the airlock at the end, flat gray composites and immaculately clean, Everyone pushed down to the floor. Their magnetic boots grabbed on. 
The airlock closed and hissed at them for several seconds before opening into a larger room with about a dozen people standing in it. Holden recognized Captain Teresa Yao. There were several others in naval officer's dress who were part of her staff. One man in an enlisted uniform with a look of thinly veiled impatience, and six marines in heavy combat armor carrying assault rifles. The rifles were pointed at him, so Holden put up his hands. We're not armed, he said, smiling and trying to look harmless. The rifles didn't waver, but Captain Yao stepped forward. Welcome aboard the Donager, she said. Chief, check them. The enlisted man clumped toward them and quickly and professionally patted them all down. He gave the thumbs up to one of the Marines. The rifles went down and Holden worked hard not to sigh with relief. What now, Captain? Holden asked, keeping his voice light. Yao looked Holden over critically for several seconds before answering. Her hair was pulled tightly back, the few strands of gray making straight lines. In person, he could see the softening of age at her jaw and the corners of her eyes. Her stony expression had the same quiet arrogance that all the naval captains he'd known shared. He wondered what she saw, looking at him. He resisted the urge to straighten his greasy hair. Chief Gunderson will take you down to your rooms and get you settled in, she replied. Someone will be along shortly to debrief you. Chief Gunderson started to lead them from the room when Yao spoke again, her voice suddenly hard. Mr. Holden, if you know anything about the six ships that are following you, speak now, she said. We gave them a two-hour deadline to change course about an hour ago. So far, they haven't. In one hour, I'm going to order a torpedo launch. If they're friends of yours, you could save them a great deal of pain. Holden shook his head emphatically. All I know is they came out of the belt when you started out to meet us, Captain, Holden said. They haven't talked to us. Our best guess is they're concerned citizens of the belt coming to watch what happens. Yao nodded. If she found the thought of witnesses disconcerting, it didn't show. Take them below, Chief, she said, then turned away. Chief Gunderson gave a soft whistle and pointed at one of the two doors. Holden's crew followed him out, the Marines bringing up the rear. As they moved through the Donager, Holden took his first really up-close look at a Martian capital ship. He'd never served on a battleship in the UN Navy, and he'd stepped foot on them maybe three times in seven years, always in dock, and usually for a party. Every inch of the Donager was just a little sharper than any UN vessel he'd served on. Mars really does build them better than we do. God damn, Exo, they sure do keep their shit squeaky clean, Amos said behind him. Ain't much to do on a long flight for most of the crew, Amos, Alex said. So when you aren't doing something else, you're clean. See, that's why I work haulers, Amos said. Clean decks or get drunk and screw, and I've got a preference. As they walked through a maze of corridors, the ship started a slight vibration, and gravity slowly reappeared. They were under thrust. Holden used his heels to touch his boot slide controls, turning the magnets off. They saw almost no one, and the few they did see moved fast and said little, barely sparing them a glance. With six ships closing on them, everyone would be at their duty stations. When Captain Yao had said she'd fire her torpedoes in an hour, there hadn't been a hint of threat in her voice. It was just a flat statement of fact. For most of the young sailors on this ship, it would probably be the first time they'd ever been in a live combat situation, if it came to that. Holden didn't believe it would. He wondered what to make of the fact that Yao was prepared to take out a handful of belt ships just because they were running quiet and close. It didn't suggest that they'd hesitate to kill a water hauler like the Cant if they thought there was reason to. Gunderson brought them to a stop in front of a hatch with OQ-117 printed on it. He slid a card through the lock and gestured everyone inside. Better than I'd expected, Shed said, sounding impressed. The compartment was large by ship standards. 
It had six high-G couches and a small table with four chairs stuck to the deck with magnetic feet. An open door in one bulkhead showed a smaller compartment with a toilet and sink. Gunderson and the Marine Lieutenant followed the crew inside. This is your rack for the time being, the Chief said. There's a comm panel on the wall. Two of Lieutenant Kelly's people will be stationed outside. Buzz them, and they'll send for anything you need. How about some chow? Amos said. We'll have some set up. You are to remain here until called for, Gunderson said. Lieutenant Kelly, you have anything to add, sir? The Marine Lieutenant looked them over. The men outside are there for your protection, but they will react unpleasantly if you make any trouble, he said. You read me? Loud and clear, Lieutenant, Holden said. Don't worry, my people will be the easiest house guests you've ever had. Kelly nodded at Holden with what seemed like genuine gratitude. He was a professional doing an unpleasant job. Holden sympathized. Also, he'd known enough Marines to know how unpleasant it could get if they felt challenged. Gunderson said, Can you take Mr. Holden here to his appointment on your way out, LT? I'd like to get these folks squared away. Kelly nodded and took Holden's elbow. Come with me, sir, he said. Where am I going, Lieutenant? Lieutenant Lopez asked to see you as soon as you landed. I'm taking you to him. Shed looked nervously from the Marine to Holden and back. Naomi nodded. They'd all see each other again, Holden told himself. He even thought it was likely to be true. Kelly led Holden at a brisk pace through the ship. His rifle was no longer at the ready, but hanging from his shoulder loosely. Either he decided Holden wasn't going to cause trouble, or that he could take him down easily if he did. Can I ask who Lieutenant Lopez is? He's the guy who asked to see you, Kelly said. Kelly stopped at a plain gray door, rapped once, then took Holden inside a small compartment with a table and two uncomfortable-looking chairs. A dark-haired man was setting up a recorder. He waved one hand vaguely in the direction of a chair. Holden sat. The chair was even less comfortable than it looked. You can go, Mr. Kelly, the man Holden assumed was Lopez said. Kelly left and closed the door. When Lopez had finished, he sat down across the table from Holden and reached out one hand. Holden shook it. I'm Lieutenant Lopez. Kelly probably told you that. I work for Naval Intelligence, which he almost certainly didn't tell you. My job isn't secret, but they train jarheads to be tight-lipped. Lopez reached into his pocket, took out a small packet of white lozenges, and popped one into his mouth. He didn't offer one to hold him. Lopez's pupils contracted to tiny points as he sucked the lozenge. Focus drugs. He'd be watching every tick of Holden's face during questioning. Tough to lie to. First Lieutenant James R. Holden of Montana, he said. It wasn't a question. Yes, sir, Holden said anyway. Seven years in the UNN, last posting on the destroyer Zhang Fei. That's me. Your file says you were busted out for assaulting a superior officer, Lopez said. That's pretty cliché, Holden. You punched the old man? Seriously? No, I missed. Broke my hand on a bulkhead. How'd that happen? He was quicker than I expected, Holden replied. Why'd you try? I was projecting my self-loathing onto him. It's just a stroke of luck that I actually wound up hurting the right person, Holden said. Sounds like you've thought about it some since then, Lopez said, his pinprick pupils never moving from Holden's face. Therapy? Lots of time to think on the Canterbury, Holden replied. Lopez ignored the obvious opening and said, What did you come up with during all that thinking? The Coalition has been stepping on the necks of the people out here for a hundred years now. I didn't like being the boot. An OPA sympathizer, then, Lopez said, his expression not changing at all. No, I didn't switch sides. I stopped playing. I didn't renounce my citizenship. I like Montana. I'm out here because I like flying. And only a belt or rust trap like the Canterbury will hire me. Lopez smiled for the first time. 
You're an exceedingly honest man, Mr. Holden. Yes. Why did you claim that a Martian military vessel destroyed your ship? I didn't. I explained all that in the broadcast. It had technology only available to interplanet fleets, and I found a piece of MCRN hardware in the device that tricked us into stopping. We'll want to see that. You're welcome to it. Your file says you were the only child of a family co-op, Lopez said, acting as though they'd never stop talking about Holden's past. Yes, five fathers, three mothers. So many parents for only one child, Lopez said, slowly unwrapping another lozenge. The Martians had lots of space for traditional families. The tax break for eight adults only having one child allowed them to own 22 acres of decent farmland. There are over 30 billion people on Earth. 22 acres is a national park, Holden said. Also, the DNA mix is legit. They aren't parents in name only. How did they decide who carried you? Mother Elise had the widest hips. Lopez popped the second lozenge into his mouth and sucked on it a few moments. Before he could speak again, the deck shook. The video recorder jiggled on its arm. Torpedo launches? Holden said. Guess those belt ships didn't change course. Any thoughts about that, Mr. Holden? Just that you seem pretty willing to kill belt ships. You've put us in a position where we can't afford to seem weak. After your accusations, there are a lot of people who don't think much of us. Holden shrugged. If the man was watching for guilt or remorse from Holden, he was out of luck. The belt ships had known what they were going toward. They hadn't turned away. But still, something bothered him. They might hate your living guts, Holden said, but it's hard to find enough suicidal people to crew six ships. Maybe they think they can outrun torpedoes. Lopez didn't move his whole body preternaturally still with the focus drugs pouring through him. We, Lopez began, and the general quarters klaxon sounded. It was deafening in the small metal compartment. Holy shit, did they shoot back? Holden asked. Lopez shook himself, like a man waking up from a daydream. He got up and hit the comm button by the door. A marine came through seconds later. Take Mr. Holden back to his quarters, Lopez said, then left the room at a run. The Marine gestured at the corridor with the barrel of his rifle. His expression was hard. It's all fun and games till someone shoots back, Holden thought. Naomi patted the empty couch next to her and smiled. Did they put slivers under your fingernails? she asked. No, actually, he was surprisingly human for a naval intelligence wonk, Holden replied. Of course, he was just getting warmed up. Have you guys heard anything about the other ships? Alex said, Nope, but that alarm means they're taking them seriously all of a sudden. It's insane, Shed said quietly. Flying around in these metal bubbles and then trying to poke holes in each other? You ever seen what long-term decompression and cold exposure does? Breaks all the capillaries in your eyes and skin. Tissue damage to the lungs can cause massive pneumonia followed by emphysema-like scarring. I mean, if you don't just die. Well, that's awful fucking cheerful, Doc. Thanks for that, Amos said. The ship suddenly vibrated in a syncopated but ultra-high-speed rhythm. Alex looked at Holden, his eyes wide. That's the point defense network opening up. That means incoming torpedoes he said. Better strap in tight, kids. The ship might start doing some violent maneuvering. Everyone but Holden was already belted into the couches. He fastened his restraints, too. This sucks. All the real action is happening thousands of clicks from here, and we got no instruments to look at, Alex said. We won't know if something slipped through the flak screen till it rips the hull open. Boy, everybody is just a fucking pile of fun right now. Amos said loudly. Shed's eyes were wide, his face too pale. Holden shook his head. Not going to happen, he said. This thing is unkillable. Whoever those ships are, they can put on a good show, but that's it. All respect, Captain, Naomi said. 
But whoever those ships are, they should be dead already. And they aren't. The distant noises of faraway combat kept up. The occasional rumble of a torpedo firing. The near-constant vibration of the high-speed point defense guns. Holden didn't realize he'd fallen asleep until he was jerked awake by an ear-splitting roar. Amos and Alex were yelling. Shed was screaming. What happened? Holden yelled over the noise. We're hit, Cap, Alex said. That was a torpedo hit. The gravity suddenly dropped away. The Donager had stopped its engines, or they'd been destroyed. Amos was still yelling, shit, 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 over everything. But at least Shed had stopped screaming. He was staring wide-eyed out of his couch, his face white. Holden unbuckled his straps and pushed off toward the comm panel. Jim, Naomi called out, what are you doing? We need to find out what's going on, Holden said over his shoulder. When he reached the bulkhead by the hatch, he punched the comm panel call button. There was no reply. He hit it again, then started pounding on the hatch. No one came. Where are our damn marines, he said. The lights dimmed, came back up. Then again and again in a slow cadence. Gauss turrets firing. Shit. It's CQB, Alex said in awe. In the history of the Coalition, no capital ship had ever gotten into a close-quarters battle. But here they were, firing the ship's big cannons, which meant that the range was sufficiently short that a non-guided weapon was viable. Hundreds or even dozens of kilometers, not thousands. Somehow, the belt ships had survived Doniger's torpedo barrage. Anyone else think this is desperate fucking queer? Amos asked, a touch of panic in his voice. The Donager began to ring like a gong struck over and over again by a massive hammer. Return fire. The Gauss round that killed Shed didn't even make a noise. Like a magic trick, two perfectly round holes appeared on either side of the room in a line that intersected Shed's couch. One moment, the medic was there. The next, his head was gone from the Adam's apple up. Arterial blood pumped out in a red cloud, pulled into two thin lines and whirled to the holes in the walls of the room as the air rushed out. Chapter 12 Miller For thirty years, Miller had worked security. Violence and death were familiar companions to him. Men, women... Animals, kids. Once, he'd held a woman's hand while she bled to death. He'd killed two people. Could still see them die if he closed his eyes and thought about it. If anyone had asked him, he'd have said there wasn't much left that would shake him. But he'd never watched a war start before. The distinguished Hyacinth Lounge was in the shift change rush. Men and women in security uniforms, mostly from Star Helix, but a few smaller companies too, were either drinking their after-work liquor and winding down, or making trips to the breakfast buffet for coffee, textured fungi and sugar sauce. Sausage with meat may be one part in a thousand. Miller chewed the sausage and watched the display monitor on the wall. A Star Helix external relations head looked sincerely out his demeanor radiating calm and certainty as he explained how everything was going to hell. Preliminary scans suggest that the explosion was the result of a failed attempt to connect a nuclear device to the docking station. Officials from the Martian government have referred to the incident only as an alleged terrorist action and refused comment pending further investigation. Another one, Havelock said from behind him. You know, eventually one of those assholes is going to get it right. Miller turned in his seat, then nodded to the chair beside him. Havelock sat. That'll be an interesting day, Miller said. I was about to call you. Yeah, sorry, his partner said. I was up kind of late. Any word on the transfer? No, Havelock said. Figure my paperwork's hung on a desk someplace in Olympus. What about you? Any word on your special project, girl? Not yet. Miller said. 
Look, the reason I wanted to meet up before we went in, I need to take a couple days, try to run down some leads on Julie. With all this other shit going on, Shadid doesn't want me doing much more than phoning this one in. But you're ignoring that, Havelock said. It wasn't a question. I've got a feeling about this one. So how can I help? I need you to cover for me. How am I going to do that? Havelock asked. It's not like I can tell them you're sick. They've got access to your medical records, same as everyone else's. Tell him I've been getting drunk a lot, Miller said. That Candace came by. She's my ex-wife. Havelock chewed his sausage, brow furrowed. The earther shook his head slowly. Not a refusal, but the prelude to a question. Miller waited. You're telling me you'd rather have the boss think that you're missing work because you're on a dysfunctional, heartbroken bender than that you're doing the work she assigned you? I don't get it. Miller licked his lips and leaned forward, elbows on the smooth, off-white table. Someone had scratched a design into the plastic. A split circle. And this was a cop bar. I don't know what I'm looking at, Miller said. There's a bunch of things that belong together somehow, and I'm not sure yet what it is. Until I know more, I need to stay low. A guy has a fling with his ex, hits the bottle for a few days. That's not going to light up anyone's panels. Havelock shook his head again, this time in mild disbelief. If he'd been a belter, he'd have made the gesture with his hands, so you could see it when he had an environment suit on. Another of the hundred small ways someone who hadn't grown up on the belt betrayed himself. The wall monitor cut to the image of a blonde woman in a severe uniform. The external relations head was talking about the Martian Navy's tactical response and whether the OPA was behind the increased vandalism. That was what he called fumbling an overloaded fusion reactor while setting up a ship-killing booby trap. Vandalism. That shit just doesn't follow. Havelock said, and for a moment Miller didn't know if he meant the belter guerrilla actions, the Martian response, or the favor he'd asked. Seriously, where's Earth? All this shit's going on and we don't hear a damn thing from them. Why would we? Miller asked. It's Mars and the belt going at it. When was the last time Earth let anything major happen without them in the middle of it? Havelock said, then sighed. Okay, you're too drunk to come in. Your love life's a mess. I'm trying to cover for you. Just for a couple days. Make sure you get back before someone decides it's the perfect chance for a random shooting to take out the Earther cop. I'll do that, Miller said, rising from the table. You watch your back. Don't need to tell me twice, Havelock said. The series center for jiu-jitsu was down near the port where the spin gravity was strongest. The hole was a converted storage space from before the big spin. A cylinder flattened where flooring had been set in about a third of the way from the bottom. Racks bearing various lengths of staffs, bamboo swords, and dull plastic practice knives hung from the vaulted ceiling. The polished stone echoed with the grunting of men working a line of resistance machines and the soft thud of a woman at the back punishing a heavy bag. Three students stood on the central mat speaking in low voices. Pictures filled the front wall on either side of the door. Soldiers in uniform. Security agents for half a dozen belter corporations. Not many inner planet types, but a few. Plaques commemorating placements and competitions. A page of small type outlining the history of the studio. One of the students shouted and collapsed, carrying one of the others to the mat with her. The one still standing applauded and helped them back up. Miller searched through the wall of pictures, hoping to find Julie. Can I help you? The man was half a head shorter than Miller and easily twice as broad. It should have made him look like an earther, but everything else about him said belt. He wore pale sweats that made his skin seem even darker. His smile was curious and as serene as a well-fed predator. Miller nodded. Detective Miller, he said. I'm with Station Security. There's one of your students I wanted to get some background on. 
This is an official investigation? The man asked. Yeah, Miller said. I'm afraid it is. Then you'll have a warrant. Miller smiled. The man smiled back. We don't give out any information on our students without a warrant, he said. Studio policy. I respect that, Miller said. No, I really do. It's just that parts of this particular investigation are maybe a little more official than others. The girl's not in trouble. She didn't do anything. But she has a family on Luna who want her found. A kidnap job, the man said, folding his arms. The serene face had gone cool without any apparent movement. Only the official part, Miller said. I can get a warrant and we can do the whole thing through channels, but then I have to tell my boss. The more she knows, the less room I have to move. The man didn't react. His stillness was unnerving. Miller struggled not to fidget. The woman working the heavy bag at the far end of the studio went through a flurry of strikes, shouting out with each one. Who? the man asked. Julie Mao, Miller said. He could have said he was looking for the Buddha's mother for all the reaction he got. I think she's in trouble. Why do you care if she is? I don't know the answer to that one, Miller said. I just do. If you don't want to help me, then you don't. And you'll go get your warrant, do this through channels. Miller took off his hat, rubbed a long, thin hand across his head, and put the hat back in place. Probably not he said. Let me see your ID, the man said. Miller pulled up his terminal and let the man confirm who he was. The man handed it back and pointed to a small door behind the heavy bags. Miller did as he was told. The office was cramped, a small laminate desk with a soft sphere behind it in lieu of a chair. Two stools that looked like they'd come out of a bar a filing cabinet with a small fabricator that stank of ozone and oil and was probably where the plaques and certificates were made. Why does the family want her? The man asked, lowering himself onto the sphere. It acted like a chair but required constant balance, a place to rest without actually resting. They think she's in harm's way. At least, that's what they're saying, and I don't have reason to disbelieve them yet. What kind of harm? Don't know, Miller said. I know she was on station, I know she slipped out for Tycho, and after that, I've got nothing. Her family want her back on their station? The man knew who her family was. Miller filed the information away without missing a beat. I don't think so, Miller said. The last message she got from them routed through Luna. Down the well. The way he said it made it sound like a disease. I'm looking for anyone who knows who she was shipping with, if she's on a run, where she was going, and when she was planning to get there, if she's in range of a tight beam. I don't know any of that, the man said. You know anyone I should ask? There was a pause. Maybe. I'll find what I can for you. Anything else you can tell me about her? She started at the studio five years ago. She was angry when she first came, undisciplined. She got better, Miller said. Brown belt, right? The man's eyebrows rose. I'm a cop, Miller said. I find things out. She improved, her teacher said. She'd been attacked, just after she came to the belt. She was seeing that it didn't happen twice. Attacked? Miller said, parsing the man's tone of voice. Raped? I didn't ask. She trained hard, even when she was off station. You can tell when people let it slide. They come back weaker. She never did. Tough girl, Miller said. Good for her. Did she have friends? People she sparred with? A few. No lovers that I know of, since that's the next question. That's strange, girl like that. Like what, detective? Pretty girl, Miller said. Competent, smart, dedicated. Who wouldn't want to be with someone like that? Perhaps she hadn't met the right person. 
Something in the way he said it hinted at amusement. Miller shrugged, uncomfortable in his skin. What kind of work did she do? He asked. Light freighter. I don't know of any particular cargo. I had the impression that she shipped wherever there was a need. Not a regular route, then. That was my impression. Whose ships did she work? One particular freighter or whatever came to hand? A particular company? I'll find what I can for you, the man said. Courier for the OPA? I'll find out, the man said, what I can. The news that afternoon was all about Phoebe. The science station there, the one that belters weren't allowed even to dock at, had been hit. The official report stated that half the inhabitants of the base were dead, the other half missing. No one had claimed responsibility yet, but the common wisdom was that some belter group, maybe the OPA, maybe someone else, had finally managed an act of vandalism with a body count. Miller sat in his hole, watching the broadcast feed and drinking. It was all going to hell. The pirate casts from the OPA calling for war. The burgeoning guerrilla actions. All of it. The time was coming that Mars wasn't going to ignore them anymore. And when Mars took action, it wouldn't matter if Earth followed suit. It would be the first real war in the belt. The catastrophe was coming, and neither side seemed to understand how vulnerable they were. And there was nothing, not one single goddamn thing that he could do to stop it. He couldn't even slow it down. Julie Mao grinned at him from the still frame, her pinnace behind her. Attacked the man had said. There was nothing about it in her record. Might have been a mugging. Might have been something worse. Miller had known a lot of victims, and he put them into three categories. First, there were the ones who pretended nothing had happened, or that whatever it was didn't really matter. That was well over half the people he talked to. Then there were the professionals, people who took their victimization as permission to act out any way they saw fit. That ate most of the rest. Maybe five percent, maybe less, were the ones who sucked it up, learned the lesson, and moved on. The Julies. The good ones. His door chimed three hours after his official shift was over. Miller stood up, less steady on his feet than he'd expected. He counted the bottles on the table. There were more than he'd thought. He hesitated for a moment torn between answering the door and throwing the bottles into the recycler. The door chimed again. He went to open it. If it was someone from the station, they expected him to be drunk anyway. No reason to disappoint. The face was familiar. Acne pocked. Controlled. The OPA armband from the bar. The one who'd had Mateo Judd killed. The cop. Evening, Miller said. Detective Miller, the pocked man said. I think we've gotten off on the wrong foot. I was hoping we could try again. Right. May I come in? I try not to take strange men home, Miller said. I don't even know your name. Anderson Dawes, the pocked man said. I'm the series liaison for the Outer Planets Alliance. I think we can help each other. May I come in? Miller stood back, and the pocked man, Dawes, stepped inside. Dawes took in the hole for the space of two slow breaths, then sat as if the bottles and the stink of old beer were nothing to comment on. Silently cursing himself and willing a sobriety he didn't feel, Miller sat across from him. I need a favor from you, Dawes said. I'm willing to pay for it. Not money, of course. Information. What do you want? Miller asked. Stop looking for Juliet Mao. No sale. I'm trying to keep the peace, Detective, Dawes said. You should hear me out. Miller leaned forward, elbows on the table. Mr. Serene Jiu-Jitsu instructor was working for the OPA. The timing of Dawes' visit seemed to be saying so. Miller filed that possibility away, but said nothing. 
Mao worked for us, Dawes said. But you'd guess that. More or less. You know where she is? We don't. We are looking for her. And we need to be the ones to find her. Not you. Miller shook his head. There was a response, the right thing to say. It was rattling in the back of his head, and if he just didn't feel quite so fuzzy... You're one of them, detective. You may have lived your whole life out here, but your salary is paid by an inner planet corporation. No, wait, I don't blame you. I understand how it is. They were hiring and you needed the work. But we're walking on a bubble right now. The Canterbury. The fringe elements in the belt calling for war. Phoebe Station. Yes, they'll blame us for that, too. Add a Luna Corporation's prodigal daughter. You think something's happened to her? She was on the scopuli, Dawes said. And when Miller didn't immediately respond, he added, The freighter that Mars used as bait when they killed the Canterbury. Miller thought about that for a long moment, then whistled low. We don't know what happened, Dawes said. Until we do, I can't have you stirring up the water. It's muddy enough now. And what information are you offering? Miller asked. That's the trade, right? I'll tell you what we find. After we find her, Dawes said. Miller chuckled, and the OPA man went on. It's a generous offer, considering who you are. Employee of Earth. Partner of an Earther. Some people will think that was enough to make you the enemy, too. But not you, Miller said. I think we've got the same basic goals, you and I. Stability. Safety. Strange times make for strange alliances. Two questions. Dawes spread his arms, welcoming them. Who took the riot gear? Miller asked. Riot gear? Before the Canterbury died, someone took our riot gear. Maybe they wanted to arm soldiers for crowd control. Maybe they didn't want our crowds controlled. Who took it? Why? It wasn't us, Dawes said. That's not an answer. Try this one. What happened to the Golden Bow Society? Dawes looked blank. Loca Grega? Miller asked. So hero? Dawes opened his mouth, closed it. Miller dropped his beer bottle into the recycler. Nothing personal, friend, he said. But your investigative techniques aren't impressing me. What makes you think you can find her? It's not a fair test, Dawes said. Give me a few days. I'll get answers for you. Talk to me, then. I'll try not to start an all-out war while you do, but I'm not letting go of Julie. You can go now. Dawes rose. He looked sour. You're making a mistake, he said. Won't be my first. After the man left, Miller sat at his table. He'd been stupid. Worse, he'd been self-indulgent. Drinking himself into a stupor instead of doing the work. Instead of finding Julie. But he knew more now. The scopuli. The Canterbury. More lines between the dots. He cleaned away his bottles, took a shower, and pulled up his terminal, searching what there was about Julie's ship. After an hour, a new thought occurred to him, a small fear that grew the more he looked at it. Near midnight, he put a call through to Havelock's hole. His partner took two full minutes to answer. When he did, his image was wild-haired and bleary-eyed. Miller? Havelock. You have any vacation time saved up? A little. Sick leave? Sure, Havelock said. Take it, Miller said. Take it now. Get off station. Someplace safe if you can find it. Someplace they're not going to start killing Earthers for shits and giggles if things go pear-shaped. I don't understand. What are you talking about? I had a little visit with an OPA agent tonight. He was trying to talk me into dropping my kidnap job. I think... I think he's nervous. I think he's scared. 
Havelock was silent for a moment, while the words filtered into his sleep-drunk mind. Jesus, he said. What scares the OPA? Chapter 13 Holden Holden froze, watching the blood pump from Shed's neck, then whip away like smoke into an exhaust fan. The sounds of combat began to fade as the air was sucked out of the room. His ears throbbed and then hurt like someone had put ice picks in them. As he fought with his couch restraints, he glanced over at Alex. The pilot was yelling something, but it didn't carry through the thin air. Naomi and Amos had gotten out of their couches already, kicked off, and were flying across the room to the two holes. Amos had a plastic dinner tray in one hand, Naomi a white three-ring binder. Holden stared at them for the half-second it took to understand what they were doing. The world narrowed, his peripheral vision all stars and darkness. By the time he'd gotten free, Amos and Naomi had already covered the holes with their makeshift patches. The room was filled with a high-pitched whistle as the air tried to force its way out through the imperfect seals. Holden's sight began to return as the air pressure started to rise. He was panting hard, gasping for breath. Someone slowly turned the room's volume knob back up, and Naomi's yells for help became audible. Jim! Open the emergency locker, she screamed. She was pointing at a small red and yellow panel on the bulkhead near his crash couch. Years of shipboard training made a path through the anoxia and depressurization, and he yanked the tab on the locker's seal and pulled the door open. Inside were a white first aid kit marked with the ancient Red Cross symbol, half a dozen oxygen masks, and a sealed bag of hardened plastic discs attached to a glue gun. The emergency seal kit. He snatched it. Just the gun, Naomi yelled at him. He wasn't sure if her voice sounded distant because of the thin air or because the pressure drop had blown his eardrums. Holden yanked the gun free from the bag of patches and threw it at her. She ran a bead of instant sealing glue around the edge of her three-ring binder. She tossed the gun to Amos, who caught it with an effortless backhand motion and put a seal around his dinner tray. The whistling stopped, replaced by the hiss of the atmosphere system as it labored to bring the pressure back up to normal. Fifteen seconds. Everyone looked at Shed. Without the vacuum, his blood was pouring out into a floating red sphere just above his neck, like a hideous cartoon replacement for his head. Jesus Christ, boss, Amos said, looking away from Shed to Naomi. He snapped his teeth closed with an audible click and shook his head. What? Gas round, Alex said. Those ships have rail guns. Belt ships with rail guns? Amos said. Did they get a fucking navy and no one told me? Jim, the hallway outside and the cabin on the other side are both in vacuum, Naomi said. The ship's compromised. Holden started to respond, then caught a good look at the binder Naomi had glued over the breach. The white cover was stamped with black letters that read, MCRN Emergency Procedures. He had to suppress a laugh that would almost certainly go manic on him. Jim, Naomi said, her voice worried. I'm okay, Naomi, Holden replied, then took a deep breath. How long do those patches hold? Naomi shrugged with her hands, then started pulling her hair behind her head and tying it up with a red elastic band. Longer than the air will last. If everything around us is in vacuum, that means the cabin's running on emergency bottles. No recycling. I don't know how much each room has, but it won't be more than a couple hours. Kinda makes you wish we'd worn our fucking suits, don't it? Amos asked. Wouldn't have mattered, Alex said. We'd come over here in our enviro suits, they'd just have taken them away. Could have tried, Amos said. Well, if you'd like to go back in time and do it over, be my guest, partner. Naomi sharply said, Hey, but then nothing more. No one was talking about Shed. They were working hard not to look at the body.
Holden cleared his throat to get everyone's attention, then floated to Shed's couch, drawing their eyes with him. He paused a moment, letting everyone get a good look at the decapitated body, then pulled a blanket from the storage drawer beneath the couch and strapped it down over Shed's body with the couch's restraints. Shed's been killed. We're in deep peril. Arguing won't extend our lives one second, Holden said, looking at each member of his crew in turn. What will? No one spoke. Holden turned to Naomi first. Naomi, what will keep us alive longer that we can do right now? He asked. I'll see if I can find the emergency air. The room's built for six, and there are only... There are four of us. I might be able to turn the flow down and stretch it longer. Good. Thank you. Alex? If there's anyone other than us, they'll be looking for survivors. I'll start pounding on the bulkhead. They won't hear it in the vacuum, but if there's cabins with air, the sound will travel down the metal. Good plan. I refuse to believe we're the only ones left on this ship, Holden said. Then turned to Amos. Amos? Let me check on that comm panel. Might be able to get the bridge or damage control or shit something, Amos replied. Thanks. I'd love to let someone know we're still here, Holden said. People moved off to work while Holden floated in the air next to Shed. Naomi began yanking access panels off the bulkheads. Alex, hands pressed against a couch for leverage, lay on the deck and began to kick the bulkhead with his boots. The room vibrated slightly with each booming kick. Amos pulled a multi-tool out of his pocket and began taking the comm panel apart. When Holden was sure everyone was busy... He put one hand on Shed's shoulder, just below the blanket's spreading red stain. I'm sorry, he whispered to the body. His eyes burned, and he pressed them into the back of his thumbs. The comm unit was hanging out of the bulkhead on wires when it buzzed once loudly. Amos yelped and pushed off hard enough to fly across the room. Holden caught him wrenching his shoulder by trying to arrest the momentum of 120 kilos of earther mechanic. The comm buzzed again. Holden let Amos go and floated to it. A yellow LED glowed next to the unit's white button. Holden pressed the button. The comm crackled to life with Lieutenant Kelly's voice. Move away from the hatch, we're coming in, he said. Grab something. Holden yelled to the crew, then grabbed a couch restraint and wrapped it around his hand and forearm. When the hatch opened, Holden expected all the air to rush out. Instead, there was a loud crack, and the pressure dropped slightly for a second. Outside in the corridor, thick sheets of plastic had been sealed to the walls, creating an ad hoc airlock. The walls of the new chamber bowed out dangerously with the air pressure, but they held. Inside the newly created lock, Lieutenant Kelly and three of his Marines wore heavy vacuum-rated armor and carried enough weaponry to fight several minor wars. The Marines moved quickly into the room, weapons ready, and then sealed the hatch behind them. One of them tossed a large bag at Holden. Five vac suits, get them on, Kelly said. His eyes moved to the bloody blanket covering Shed, then to the two improvised patches. Casualty? Our medic, Shed Garvey, Holden replied. Yeah, what the fuck? Amos said loudly. Who's out there shooting the shit out of your fancy boat? Naomi and Alex said nothing, but started pulling the suits from the bag and handing them out. I don't know, Kelly said, but we're leaving right now. I've been ordered to get you off this ship in an escape craft. We've got less than ten minutes to make it to the hangar bay, take possession of a ship, and get out of this combat area. Dress fast. Holden put on his suit, the implications of their evacuation racing through his mind. Lieutenant, is the ship coming apart? He asked. Not yet, but we're being boarded. Then why are we leaving? We're losing. Kelly didn't tap his foot while waiting for them to seal into their suits. Holden guessed this was only because the Marines had their magnetic boots turned on. As soon as everyone had given the thumbs up, Kelly did a quick radio check on each suit, then headed back into the corridor. With eight people in it, four of them in powered armor, the mini airlock was tight. 
Kelly pulled a heavy knife from a sheath on his chest and slashed the plastic barrier open in one quick movement. The hatch behind them slammed shut, and the air in the corridor vanished in a soundless ripple of plastic flaps. Kelly charged into the corridor with the crew scrambling to keep up. We are moving with all speed to the keel elevator banks, Kelly said through the radio link. They're locked down because of the boarding alarm, but I can get the doors open on one and we'll float down the shaft to the hangar bay. Everything is on the double. If you see boarders, do not stop. Keep moving at all times. We'll handle the hostiles. Roger that? Roger, Lieutenant. Holden gasped out. Why board you? The Command Information Center, Alex said. It's the Holy Grail. Codes, deployments, computer cores, the works. Taking a flagship CIC is a strategist's wet dream. Got the chatter, Kelly said. Holden ignored him. That means they'll blow the core rather than let that happen, right? Yep, Alex replied. Standard ops for boarders. Marines hold the bridge, CIC, and engineering. If any of the three is breached, the other two flip the switch. The ship turns into a star for a few seconds. Standard ops, Kelly growled. Those are my friends. Sorry, LT, Alex replied. I served on the Bandon. Don't mean to make light. They turned a corner and the elevator bank came into view. All eight elevators were closed and sealed. The heavy pressure doors had slammed shut when the ship was holed. Gomez, run the bypass, Kelly said. Mole, Dookie, watch those corridors. Two of the Marines spread out, watching the hallways through their gun sights. The third moved to one of the elevator doors and started doing something complicated to the controls. Holden motioned his crew to the wall, out of the firing lines. The deck vibrated slightly from time to time beneath his feet. The enemy ships wouldn't still be firing, not with their borders inside. It must be small arms fire and light explosives. But as they stood there in the perfect quiet of vacuum, everything that was happening took on a distant and surreal feeling. Holden recognized that his mind wasn't working the way it should be. Trauma reaction. The destruction of the Canterbury, the deaths of Ade and McDowell, and now someone had killed Shed in his bunk. It was too much. He couldn't process it. He felt the scene around him grow more and more distant. Holden looked behind him at Naomi, Alex, and Amos, his crew. They stared back, faces ashen and ghostly in the green light of their suit displays. Gomez pumped his fist in triumph as the outer pressure door slid open, revealing the elevator doors. Kelly gestured to his men. The one called Mole turned around and started to walk to the elevator, when his face disintegrated in a spray of pebble-shaped bits of armored glass and blood. His armored torso and the corridor bulkhead beside him bloomed in a hundred small detonations and puffs of smoke. His body jerked and swayed, attached to the floor by magnetic boots. Holden's sense of unreality washed away in adrenaline. The fire spraying across the wall and Mole's body was high explosive rounds from a rapid-fire weapon. The comm channel filled with yelling from the Marines and Holden's own crew. To Holden's left, Gomez yanked the elevator doors open using the augmented strength of his powered armor, exposing the empty shaft behind them. Inside, Kelly shouted. Everybody inside. Holden held back, pushing Naomi in and then Alex. The last Marine, the one Kelly had called Dookie, fired his rifle on full auto at some target around the corner from Holden. When the weapon ran dry, the Marine dropped to one knee and ejected the clip in the same motion. Almost faster than Holden could follow, he pulled a new magazine from his harness and slapped it into his weapon. He was firing again less than two seconds after he'd run out. Naomi yelled at Holden to get into the elevator shaft, and then a vice-like hand grabbed his shoulder yanked him off his magnetic grip on the floor and hurled him through the open elevator doors. Get killed when I'm not babysitting, Lieutenant Kelly barked. They shoved off the walls of the elevator shaft and flew down the long tunnel toward the aft of the ship. Holden kept looking back at the open door, 
receding into the distance behind them. Dookie isn't following us, he said. He's covering our exit, Kelly replied. So we better get away, Gomez added. Make it mean something. Kelly, at the head of the group, grabbed at a rung on the wall of the shaft and came to a jerking stop. Everyone else followed suit. Here's our exit. Gomez, go check it out, Kelly said. Holden, here's the plan. We'll be taking one of the Corvettes from the hangar bay. That made sense to Holden. The Corvette class was a light frigate. A fleet escort vessel, it was the smallest naval ship equipped with an Epstein drive. It would be fast enough to travel anywhere in the system and outrun most threats. Its secondary role was as a torpedo bomber, so it would also have teeth. Holden nodded inside his helmet at Kelly, then gestured for him to continue. Kelly waited until Gomez had finished opening the elevator doors and gone into the hangar bay. Okay, I've got the key card and activation code to get us inside and the ship fired up. I'll be heading straight for it so all of you stick right on my ass. Make sure your boot mags are off. We're going to push off the wall and fly to it so aim straight or you miss your ride. Everyone with me? Affirmative replies all around. Outstanding. Gomez, what's it look like out there? Trouble, LT. Half a dozen boarders looking over the ships in the hangar. Powered armor, zero-G maneuvering packs and heavy weapons. Loaded for bear. Gomez whispered back. People always whispered when they were hiding. Wrapped in a spacesuit and surrounded by vacuum, Gomez could have been lighting fireworks inside his armor and no one would have heard it. But he whispered. We run for the ship and shoot our way through, Kelly said. Gomez, I'm bringing the civvies in ten seconds. You're covering fire. Shoot and displace. Try and make them think you're a small platoon. You calling me small, sir? Gomez said. Six dead assholes coming up. Holden, Amos, Alex, and Naomi followed Kelly out of the elevator shaft and into the hangar bay and stopped behind a stack of military green crates. Holden peeked over them spotting the boarders immediately. They were in two groups of three near the night, one group walking on top of it and the other on the deck below it. Their armor was flat black. Holden hadn't seen the design before. Kelly pointed at them and looked at Holden. Holden nodded back. Kelly pointed across the hangar at a squat black frigate about twenty-five meters away, halfway between them and the night. He held up his left hand and began counting down from five on his fingers. At two, the room strobed like a disco. Gomez opening fire from a position ten meters from their own. The first barrage hit two of the boarders on top of the night and hurled them spinning off. A heartbeat later, a second burst was fired five meters from where Holden had seen the first. He would have sworn it was two different men. Kelly folded up the last finger on his hand, planted his feet on the wall, and pushed off toward their corvette. Holden waited for Alex, Amos, and Naomi, then shoved off last. By the time he was in motion, Gomez was firing from a new location. One of the boarders on the deck pointed a large weapon toward the muzzle flash from Gomez's gun. Gomez, and the crate he'd been taking cover behind, disappeared in fire and shrapnel. They were halfway to the ship, and Holden was starting to think they might make it, when a line of smoke crossed the room and intersected with Kelly, and the lieutenant disappeared in a flash of light. Chapter 14 Miller The Xing Lung died stupid. Afterward, Everyone knew she was one of thousands of small-time, rock-hopping prospector ships. The belt was lousy with them. Five or six family operations that had scraped together enough for a down payment and set up operations. When it happened, they'd been three payments behind, and their bank, Consolidated Holdings and Investments, had put a lien on the ship, which, common wisdom had it, was why they had disabled her transponder. Just honest folks with a rust bucket to call their own, trying to keep flying. If you were going to make a poster of the Belter's dream, it would have been the Xinglung. The Scipio Africanus, 
a patrol destroyer, was due to head back down toward Mars at the end of its two-year tour of the belt. They both headed for a captured cometary body a few hundred thousand kilometers from Chiron to top off their water. When the prospecting ship first came in range, the Scipio saw a fast-moving ship running dark and headed more or less in their direction. The official Martian press releases all said that the Scipio had tried repeatedly to hail her. The OPA pirate casts all said it was crap, and that no listening station in the belt had heard anything like that. Everyone agreed that the Scipio had opened its point defense cannons and turned the prospecting ship into glowing slag. The reaction had been as predictable as elementary physics. The Martians were diverting another couple dozen ships to help maintain order. The OPA's shriller talking heads called for open war, and fewer and fewer of the independent sites and castes were disagreeing with them. The great, implacable clockwork of war ticked one step closer to open fighting. And someone on Ceres had put a Martian-born citizen named Enrique dos Santos through eight or nine hours of torture, and nailed the remains to a wall near Sector 11's water reclamation works. They identified him by the terminal that had been left on the floor along with the man's wedding ring, and a thin, faux-leather wallet with his credit access data and 30,000 Europa script new yen. The dead Martian had been affixed to the wall with a single-charge prospector's spike. Five hours afterward, the air recyclers were still laboring to get the acid smell out. The forensics team had taken their samples. They were about ready to cut the poor bastard down. It always surprised Miller how peaceful dead people looked. However god-awful the circumstances, the slack calm that came at the end looked like sleep. It made him wonder if when his turn came, he'd actually feel that last relaxation. Surveillance cameras, he said. Been out for three days, his new partner said. Kids busted him. Octavia Muss was originally from Crimes Against Persons, back before Star Helix split violence up into smaller specialties. From there, she'd been on the rape squad, then a couple of months of Crimes Against Children. If the woman still had a soul, it had been pressed thin enough to see through. Her eyes never registered anything more than mild surprise. We know which kids? Some punks from upstairs, she said. Booked, fined, released into the wild. We should round them back up, Miller said. It'd be interesting to know whether someone paid them to take out these particular cameras. I'd bet against it. Then whoever did this had to know that these cameras were busted. Someone in maintenance? Or a cop? Muss smacked her lips and shrugged. She'd come from three generations in the belt. She had family on ships like the one the Scipio had killed. The skin and bone and gristle hanging in front of them were no surprise to her. You dropped a hammer under thrust, and it fell to the deck. Your government slaughtered six families of ethnic Chinese prospectors. Someone pinned you to the living rock of Ceres with a three-foot titanium alloy spike. Same, same. There's going to be consequences, Miller said, meaning, this isn't a corpse, it's a billboard. It's a call to war. There ain't. Muss said. The war is here anyway, banner or no, she thought. Yeah, Miller said. You're right. There ain't. You want to do next of kin? I'll go take a look at outlying video. They didn't burn his fingers off here in the corridor, so they had to haul him in from somewhere. Yeah, Miller said. I've got a sympathy form letter I can fire off. Wife? Don't know, she said. Haven't looked. Back at the station house, Miller sat alone at his desk. Muss already had her own desk, two cubicles over and customized the way she liked it. Havelock's desk was empty and cleaned twice over, as if the custodial services had wanted the smell of earth off their good belter chair. Miller pulled up the dead man's file, found the next of kin, Jun Yi Dos Santos, working on Ganymede. Married six years. No kids. Well, there was something to be glad of, at least. 
If you were going to die, at least you shouldn't leave a mark. He navigated to the form letter, dropped in the new widow's name and contact address. Dear Mrs. Dos Santos, I am very sorry to have to tell you, blah, 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 your, he spun through the menu, husband was a valued and respected member of the series community, and I assure you that everything possible will be done to see that her, Miller toggled that, his killer or killers will be brought to answer for this. Yours? It was inhuman. It was impersonal and cold and as empty as vacuum. The hunk of flesh on that corridor wall had been a real man with passions and fears, just like anyone else. Miller wanted to wonder what it said about him that he could ignore the facts so easily. But the truth was, he knew. He sent the message and tried not to dwell on the pain it was about to cause. The board was thick. The incident count was twice what it should have been. This is what it looks like, he thought. No riots, no hole-by-hole -hole military action or marines in the corridors. Just a lot of unsolved homicides. Then he corrected himself. This is what it looks like so far. It didn't make his next task any easier. Shadid was in her office. What can I do for you? she asked. I need to make some requisitions for interrogation transcripts, he said. But it's a little irregular. I was thinking it might be better if it came through you. Shadid sat back in her chair. I'll look at it, she said. What are we trying to get? Miller nodded as if by signaling yes himself he could get her to say the same. Jim Holden, the earther from the Canterbury. Mars should be picking his people up around now, and I need to petition for the debriefing transcripts. You have a case that goes back to the Canterbury? Yeah, he said. Seems like I do. Tell me, she said. Tell me now. It's the side job, Julie Mao. I've been looking into it. I saw your report. So you know she's associated with the OPA. From what I found, it looks like she was on a freighter that was doing courier runs for them. You have proof of that? I have an OPA guy that said as much. On the record? No, Miller said. It was informal. And it tied into the Martian Navy killing the Canterbury how? She was on the scopuli. Miller said. It was used as bait to stop the Canterbury. The thing is, you look at the broadcasts Holden makes, he talks about finding it with a Mars Navy beacon and no crew. And you think there's something in there that'll help you? Won't know until I see it, Miller said. But if Julie wasn't on that freighter, then someone had to take her off. Shadid's smile didn't reach her eyes. And you would like to ask the Martian Navy to please hand over whatever they got from Holden. If he saw something on that boat, something that'll give us an idea what happened to Julie and the other... You aren't thinking this through, Shadid said. The Mars Navy killed the Canterbury. They did it to provoke a reaction from the belt so they'd have an excuse to roll in and take us over. The only reason they're debriefing the survivors is so that no one could get to the poor bastards first. Holden and his crew are either dead or getting their minds cored out by Martian interrogation specialists right now. We can't be sure, and even if I could get a full record of what they said as each toenail got ripped off, it would do you exactly no good, Miller. The Martian Navy isn't going to ask about the scopuli. They know good and well what happened to the crew. They planted the scopuli. Is that Star Helix's official stand? Miller asked. The words were barely out of his mouth before he saw they'd been a mistake. Shadid's face closed down like a light going out. Now that he'd said it, he saw the implied threat he'd just made. I'm just pointing out the source reliability issue, Shadid said. You don't go to the suspect and ask where they think you should look next and the Juliet Mao retrieval isn't your first priority. I'm not saying it is, Miller said, chagrined to hear the defensiveness in his voice. We have a board out there that's full and getting fuller. 
Our first priorities are safety and continuity of services. If what you're doing isn't directly related to that, there are better things for you to be doing. This war isn't our job, Shadid said. Our job is series. Get me a final report on Juliet Mao. I'll send it through channels. We've done what we could. I don't think I do, Shadid said. We've done what we could. Now stop being a pussy, get your ass out there, and catch bad guys, detective. Yes, Captain, Miller said. Muss was sitting at Miller's desk when he got back to it, a cup in her hand that was either strong tea or weak coffee. She nodded toward his desktop monitor. On it, three belters, two men and one woman, were coming out of a warehouse door, an orange plastic shipping container carried between them. Miller raised his eyebrows. Employed by an independent gas hauling company. Nitrogen, oxygen, basic atmospherics, nothing exotic. Looks like they had the poor bastard in one of the company warehouses. I've sent forensics over to see if we can get any blood splatters for confirmation. Good work, Miller said. Moss shrugged. Adequate work, she seemed to say. Where are the perps? Miller asked. Shipped out yesterday, she said. Flight plan logs them as headed for Io. Io? Earth-Mars Coalition Central, Mus said. Want to put any money on whether they actually show up there? Sure, Miller said. I'll lay you fifty that they don't. Mus actually laughed. I've put them on the alert system, she said. Any place they land, the locals will have a heads up and a tracking number for the Dos Santos thing. So case closed, Miller said. Chalk another one up for the good guys, Muss agreed. The rest of the day was hectic. Three assaults, two of them overtly political and one domestic. Muss and Miller cleared all three from the board before the end of shift. There would be more by tomorrow. After he clocked out, Miller stopped at a food cart near one of the tube stations for a bowl of vat rice and textured protein that approximated teriyaki chicken. All around him on the tube, normal citizens of Ceres read their news feeds and listened to music. A young couple, half a car up from him, leaned close to each other, murmuring and giggling. They might have been sixteen, seventeen. He saw the boy's wrist snake up under the girl's shirt. She didn't protest. An old woman directly across from Miller slept, her head lolling against the wall of the car, her snores almost delicate. These people were what it was all about, Miller told himself. Normal people living small lives in a bubble of rock surrounded by hard vacuum. If they let the station turn into a riot zone, let order fail, all these lives would get turned into kibble like a kitten in a meat grinder. Making sure it didn't happen was for people like him, Mus, even Shadid. So, a small voice said in the back of his mind, why isn't it your job to stop Mars from dropping a nuke and cracking Ceres like an egg? What's the bigger threat to that guy standing over there? A few unlicensed tours, or a belt at war with Mars? What was the harm that could come from knowing what happened to the Scopuli? But of course, he knew the answer to that. He couldn't judge how dangerous the truth was until he knew it, which was itself a fine reason to keep going. The OPA man, Anderson Dawes, was sitting on a cloth folding chair outside Miller's hole, reading a book. It was a real book, onion skin pages bound in what might have been actual leather. Miller had seen pictures of them before. The idea of that much weight for a single megabyte of data struck him as decadent. Detective. Mr. Dawes? I was hoping we could talk. Miller was glad, as they went inside together, that he'd cleaned up a little. All the beer bottles had gone to the recycler. The tables and cabinets were dusted. The cushions on the chairs had all been mended or replaced. As Dawes took his seat... Miller realized he'd done the housework in anticipation of this meeting. 
he hadn't realized it until now. Dawes put his book on the table, dug in his jacket pocket, and slid a thin black film drive across the table. Miller picked it up. What am I going to see on this? he asked. Nothing you can't confirm in the records, Dawes answered. Anything fabricated? Yes, Dawes said. His grin did nothing to improve his appearance. But not by us. You asked about the police riot gear. It was signed for by a Sergeant Pauline Trikolowski for transfer to Special Services Unit 23. Special Services 23? Yes, Dawes said. It doesn't exist. Nor does Trikolowski. The equipment was all boxed up, signed for, and delivered to a dock. The freighter in the berth at the time was registered to a corporal sound du gatu preto. Black cat? You know them? Import-export, same as everyone else, Miller said with a shrug. We investigated them as a possible front for the loca grega. Never tie them down, though. You were right. You prove it? Not my job, Dawes said. But this might interest you. Automated docking logs for the ship when she left here and when she arrived at Ganymede. She's three tons lighter, not even counting reaction mass consumption. And the transit time is longer than the orbital mechanics projections. Someone met her, Miller said. Transferred the gear to another ship. There's your answer, Dawes said. Both of them. The riot gear was taken off the station by local organized crime. There aren't records to support it, but I think it's safe to assume that they also shipped out the personnel to use that gear. Where to? Dawes lifted his hands. Miller nodded. They were off station. Case closed. Another one for the good guys. Damn. I've kept my part of the bargain, Dawes said. You asked for information. I've gotten it. Now, are you going to keep your end? Drop the Mao investigation, Miller said. It wasn't a question, and Dawes didn't act as if it were. Miller leaned back in his chair. Juliet Andromeda Mao, inner system heiress turned OPA courier, pinnace racer, brown belt aiming for black. Sure, what the hell, he said. It's not like I would have shipped her back home if I'd found her. No? Miller shifted his hands in a gesture that meant, of course not. She's a good kid, Miller said. How would you feel if you were all grown up and Mommy could still pull you back home by your ear? It was a bullshit job from the start. Dawes smiled again. This time it actually did help a little. I'm glad to hear you say that, Detective. And I won't forget the rest of our agreement. When we find her, I will tell you. You've got my word on it. I appreciate that, Miller said. There was a moment of silence. Miller couldn't decide if it was companionable or awkward. Maybe there was room for both. Dawes rose, put out his hand. Miller shook it. Dawes left. Two cops, working for different sides. Maybe they had something in common. Didn't mean Miller was uncomfortable lying to the man. He opened his terminal's encryption program, routed it to his communication suite, and started talking into the camera. We haven't met, sir, but I hope you'll find a few minutes to help me out. I'm Detective Miller with Star Helix Security. I'm on the series security contract, and I've been tasked with finding your daughter. I've got a couple questions. Chapter 15 Holden Holden grabbed for Naomi. He struggled to orient himself as the two of them spun across the bay, with nothing to push off of and nothing to arrest their flight. They were in the middle of the room, with no cover. The blast had hurled Kelly five meters through the air and into the side of a packing crate, where he was floating now, one magnetic boot connected to the side of the container, the other struggling to connect with the deck. 
Amos had been blown down and lay flat on the floor. His lower leg stuck out in an impossible angle. Alex crouched at his side. Holden craned his neck, looking toward the attackers. There was the border with the grenade launcher who had blasted Kelly, lining up on them for the killing shot. We're dead, Holden thought. Naomi made an obscene gesture. The man with the grenade launcher shuddered and dissolved in a spray of blood and small detonations. Get to the ship! Gomez screamed from the radio. His voice was grating and high, half shrieking pain and half battle ecstasy. Holden pulled the tether line off Naomi's suit. What are you? She began. Trust me, he said. Then put his feet into her stomach and shoved off hard. He hit the deck while she spun toward the ceiling. He kicked on his boot mags and then yanked the tether to pull her down to him. The room strobed with sustained machine gun fire. Holden said, Stay low, and ran as quickly as his magnetic boots would allow toward Alex and Amos. The mechanic moved his limbs feebly so he was still alive. Holden realized he still had the end of Naomi's tether in his hand, so he clipped it onto a loop on his suit. No more getting separated. Holden lifted Amos off the deck, then checked the inertia. The mechanic grunted and muttered something obscene. Holden attached Amos's tether to his suit, too. He'd carry the whole crew, if that was what it took. Without saying a word, Alex clipped his tether to Holden and gave him a weary thumbs up. That was, I mean, fuck, Alex said. Yeah, Holden said. Jim, Naomi said, look. Holden followed her gaze. Kelly was staggering toward them. His armor was visibly crushed on the left side of his torso, and hydraulic fluid leaked from his suit into a trail of droplets floating behind him. But he was moving. Toward the frigate. Okay, Holden said. Let's go. The five of them moved as a group to the ship. The air around them filled with pieces of packing crates blown apart by the ongoing battle. A wasp stung Holden's arm and his suit's head-up display informed him that it had sealed a minor breach. He felt something warm trickle down his bicep. Gomez shouted like a madman over the radio as he dashed around the outer edge of the bay, firing wildly. The return fire was constant. Holden saw the Marine hit again and again, small explosions and ablative clouds coming off his suit until Holden could hardly believe that there could be anything inside it still living. But Gomez kept the enemy's attention, and Holden and the crew were able to limp up to the half-cover of the Corvette's airlock. Kelly pulled a small metal card from a pocket on his armor. A swipe of the card opened the outer door, and Holden pulled Amos's floating body inside. Naomi, Alex, and the wounded Marine came in after, staring at each other in shocked disbelief as the airlock cycled and the inner doors opened. I can't believe we... Alex said. Then his voice trailed off. Talk about it later, Kelly barked. Alex Kamal, you served on MCRN ships. Can you fly this thing? Sure, LT, Alex replied, then visibly straightened. Why me? Our other pilots outside getting killed. Take this, Kelly said, handing him the metal card. The rest of you get strapped in. We've lost a lot of time. Up close, the damage to Kelly's armor was even more apparent. He had to have severe injuries to his chest. And not all the liquid coming out of the suit was hydraulic fluid. There was definitely blood as well. Let me help you, Holden said, reaching for him. Don't touch me, Kelly said, with an anger that took Holden by surprise. You get strapped in and you shut the fuck up now. Holden didn't argue. He unhooked the tethers from his suit and helped Naomi maneuver Amos to the crash couches and strap him in. Kelly stayed on the deck above, but his voice came over the ship's calm. Mr. Kamal, are we ready to fly? He said. Roger that, LT. The reactor was already hot when we got here. The Tachi was the ready standby. That's why we're taking her. Now go. As soon as we clear the hangar, full throttle. Roger, Alex said. 
Gravity returned in tiny bursts at random directions as Alex lifted the ship off the deck and spun it toward the hangar door. Holden finished putting on his straps and checked to see that Naomi and Amos were squared away. The mechanic was moaning and holding onto the edge of the couch with a death grip. You still with us, Amos? Holden said. Fan-fucking-tastic, Cap. Oh, shit, I can see Gomez, Alex said over the comm. He's down. Oh, you goddamn bastards. They're shooting him while he's down, son of a bitch. The ship stopped moving, and Alex said in a quiet voice, Suck on this, asshole. The ship vibrated for half a second, then paused before continuing toward the dock. Point defense cannons? Holden asked. Summary roadside justice, Alex grunted back. Holden was imagining what several hundred rounds of Teflon-coated tungsten steel going 5,000 meters per second would do to human bodies when Alex threw down the throttle and a room full of elephants swan-dived onto his chest. Holden woke in zero-G. His eye sockets and testicles ached, so they'd been at high thrust for a while. The wall terminal next to him said it had been almost half an hour. Naomi was moving in her couch, but Amos was unconscious, and blood was coming out of a hole in his suit at an alarming rate. Naomi, check Amos, Holden croaked, his throat aching with the effort. Alex, report. The Donnie went up behind us, Cap. Guess the Marines didn't hold. She's gone, Alex said in a subdued voice. The six attacking ships? I haven't seen any sign of them since the explosion. I guess they're toast. Holden nodded to himself. Summary roadside justice indeed. Boarding a ship was one of the riskiest maneuvers in naval combat. It was basically a race between the boarders rushing to the engine room and the collective will of those who had their fingers on the self-destruct button. After even one look at Captain Yao, Holden could have told them who'd lose that race. Still, someone had thought it was worth the risk. Holden pulled his straps off and floated over to Amos. Naomi had opened an emergency kit and was cutting the mechanic's suit off with a pair of heavy scissors. The hole had been punched out by a jagged end of Amos's broken tibia when the suit had pushed against it at 12G. When she'd finished cutting the suit away, Naomi blanched at the mass of blood and gore that Amos's lower leg had turned into. What do we do? Holden asked. Naomi just stared at him, then barked out a harsh laugh. I have no idea, she said. But you? Holden started. She talked right over him. If he were made of metal, I'd just hammer him straight and then weld everything into place, she said. I... But he isn't made out of ship parts, she continued, her voice rising into a yell. So why are you asking me what to do? Holden held up his hands in a placating gesture. Okay, got it. Let's just stop the bleeding for now, all right? If Alex gets killed, are you going to ask me to fly the ship, too? Holden started to answer and then stopped. She was right. Whenever he didn't know what to do, he handed off to Naomi. He'd been doing it for years. She was smart, capable, usually unflappable. She'd become a crutch, and she'd been through all the same trauma he had. If he didn't start paying attention, he'd break her, and he needed not to do that. You're right. I'll take care of Amos, he said. You go up and check on Kelly. I'll be there in a few minutes. Naomi stared at him until her breathing slowed, then said, Okay, and headed to the crew ladder. Holden sprayed Amos's leg with coagulant booster and wrapped it in gauze from the first aid kit. Then he called up the ship's database on the wall terminal and did a search on compound fractures. He was reading it with growing dismay when Naomi called. Kelly's dead, she said, her voice flat. Holden's stomach dropped, and he gave himself three breaths to get the panic out of his voice. Okay. I'll need your help setting this bone. Come on back down. Alex, give me half a G of thrust while we work on Amos. Any particular direction, Cap? 
Alex asked. I don't care, just give me half a G and stay off the radio till I say so. Naomi dropped back down the ladder well as the gravity started to come up. It looks like every rib on the left side of Kelly's body was broken, she said. Thrust G probably punctured all his organs. He had to know that was going to happen, Holden said. Yeah. It was easy to make fun of the Marines when they weren't listening. In Holden's Navy days, making fun of jarheads was as natural as cussing. But four Marines had died getting him off the Donager, and three of them had made a conscious decision to do so. Holden promised himself that he'd never make fun of them again. We need to pull the bone straight before we set it. Hold him still and I'll pull on his foot. Let me know when the bone is retracted and lined up again. Naomi started to protest. I know you're not a doctor, just best guess, Holden said. It was one of the most horrible things Holden had ever done. Amos woke up screaming during the procedure. He had to pull the leg out twice, because the first time the bones didn't line up and when he let go, the jagged end of the tibia popped back out the hole in a spray of blood. Fortunately, Amos passed out after that, and they were able to make the second attempt without the screaming. It seemed to work. Holden sprayed the wound down with antiseptics and coagulants. He stapled the hole closed and slapped a growth-stimulating bandage over it, then finished up with a quick-form air cast and an antibiotic patch on the mechanic's thigh. Afterward, he collapsed onto the deck and gave in to the shakes. Naomi climbed into her couch and sobbed. It was the first time Holden had ever seen her cry. Holden, Alex, and Naomi floated in a loose triangle around the crash couch where Lieutenant Kelly's body lay. Below, Amos was in a heavily sedated sleep. The Tachi drifted through space toward no particular destination. For the first time in a long time, no one followed. Holden knew the other two were waiting for him, waiting to hear how he was going to save them. They looked at him expectantly. He tried to appear calm and thoughtful. Inside, he panicked. He had no idea where to go, no idea what to do. Ever since they'd found the scopuli, everywhere that should have been safe had turned into a death trap the Canterbury, the Donager. Holden was terrified of going anywhere for fear that it would be blown up moments later. Do something, a mentor of a decade earlier said to his young officers. It doesn't have to be right, it just has to be something. Someone is going to investigate what happened to the Donager, Holden said. Martian ships are speeding to that spot as we speak. They'll already know the Tachi got away because our transponder is blabbing our survival to the solar system at large. No, it ain't, Alex said. Explain that, Mr. Kamal. This is a torpedo bomber. You think they want a nice transponder signal to lock onto when they're making runs on an enemy capital ship? No, there's a handy switch up in the cockpit that says transponder off. I flipped it before we flew out. We're just another moving object out of a million like us. Holden was silent for two long breaths. Alex, that may be the single greatest thing anyone has ever done in the history of the universe, he said. But we can't land, Jim, Naomi said. One, no port is going to let a ship with no transponder signal anywhere near them. And two, as soon as they make us out visually, the fact that we're a Martian warship will be hard to hide. Yep, that's the downside, Alex agreed. Fred Johnson, Holden said, gave us the network address to get in touch with him. I'm thinking that the OPA might be the one group that would let us land our stolen Martian warship somewhere. It ain't stolen, Alex said. It's legitimate salvage now. Yeah, you make that argument to the MCRN if they catch us. But let's try and make sure they don't. So we just wait here till Colonel Johnson gets back to us? Alex asked. No, I wait. You two prep Lieutenant Kelly for burial. Alex, you are MCRN. You know the traditions. Do it with full honors and record it in the log. He died to get us off that ship, and we're going to accord him every respect. 
As soon as we land anywhere, we'll bounce the full record to MCRN command so they can do it officially. Alex nodded. We'll do it right, sir. Fred Johnson replied to his message so fast that Holden wondered if he'd been sitting at his terminal waiting for it. Johnson's message consisted only of coordinates and the word tight beam. Holden aimed the laser array at the specified location. It was the same one Fred had beamed his first message from. Then turned on his mic and said, Fred? The coordinates given were more than eleven light minutes away. Holden prepared to wait twenty-two minutes for his answer. Just to have something to do, he fed the location up to the cockpit and told Alex to fly in that direction at 1G as soon as they'd finished with Lieutenant Kelly. Twenty minutes later, the thrust came up and Naomi climbed the ladder. She'd stripped off her vacuum suit and was wearing a red Martian jumpsuit that was half a foot too short for her and three times too big around. Her hair and face looked clean. The ship has a head with a shower. Can we keep it? She said. How'd it go? We took care of him. There's a decent-sized cargo bay down by engineering. We put him there until we can find some way to send him home. I turned off the environment in there so he'll stay preserved. She held out her hand and dropped a small black cube into his lap. That was in a pocket under his armor, she said. Holden held up the object. It looked like some sort of data storage device. Can you find out what's on it? He asked. Sure, give me some time. And Amos? Blood pressure's steady, Naomi said. That's got to be a good thing. The comm console beeped at them, and Holden started the playback. Jim, news of the Donager has just started hitting the net. I admit I'm extremely surprised to be hearing from you, said Fred's voice. What can I do for you? Holden paused a moment while he mentally prepared his response. Fred's suspicion was palpable, but he'd sent Holden a keyword to use for exactly that reason. Fred, while our enemies have become ubiquitous, our list of friends has grown kind of short. In fact, you're pretty much it. I'm in a stolen... Alex cleared his throat. A salvaged MCRN gunboat, Holden went on. I need a way to hide that fact. I need somewhere to go where they won't just shoot me down for showing up. Help me do that. It was half an hour before the reply came. I've attached a data file on a subchannel, Fred said. It's got your new transponder code and directions on how to install it. The code will check out in all the registries. It's legitimate. It's also got coordinates that will get you to a safe harbor. I'll meet you there. We have a lot to talk about. New transponder code, Naomi said. How does the OPA get new transponder codes? Hack the Earth-Mars Coalition security protocols or get a mole in the registry office, Holden said. Either way, I think we're playing in the big league now. Chapter 16 Miller Miller watched the feed from Mars along with the rest of the station. The podium was draped in black, which was a bad sign. The single star and thirty stripes of the Martian Congressional Republic hung in the background not once, but eight times. That was worse. This cannot happen without careful planning, the Martian president said. The information they sought to steal would have compromised Martian fleet security in a profound and fundamental way. They failed, but at the price of 2,086 Martian lives. This aggression is something the Belt has been preparing for years at the least. The Belt, Miller noticed. Not the OPA. The Belt. In the week since first news of that attack... We have seen thirty incursions into the security radius of Martian ships and bases, including Palace Station. If those refineries were to be lost, the economy of Mars could suffer irreversible damage. In the face of an armed, organized guerrilla force, we have no choice but to enforce a military cordon on the stations, bases, and ships of the Belt. 
Congress has delivered new orders to all naval elements not presently involved in active coalition duty, and it is our hope that our brothers and sisters of Earth will approve joint coalition maneuvers with the greatest possible speed. The new mandate of the Martian Navy is to secure the safety of all honest citizens, to dismantle the infrastructures of evil presently hiding in the belt, and bring to justice those responsible for these attacks. I am pleased to say that our initial actions have resulted in the destruction of eighteen illegal warships and... Miller turned off the feed. That was it, then. The secret war was out of the closet. Papa Mao had been right to want Julie out, but it was too late. His darling daughter was going to have to take her chances, just like everyone else. At the very least, it was going to mean curfews and personnel tracking all through Ceres Station. Officially, the station was neutral. The OPA didn't own it or anything else. And Star Helix was an Earth corporation, not under contractual or treaty obligation to Mars. At best, Mars and the OPA would keep their fight outside the station. At worst, there would be more riots on Ceres. More death. No, that wasn't true. At worst, Mars or the OPA would make a statement by throwing a rock or a handful of nuclear warheads at the station or by blowing a fusion drive on a docked ship. If things got out of hand, it would mean six or seven million dead people, and the end of everything Miller had ever known. Odd that it should feel almost like relief. For weeks, Miller had known. Everyone had known. But it hadn't actually happened. So every conversation, every joke, every chance interaction and semi-anonymous nod and polite moment of light banter on the tube had seemed like an evasion. He couldn't fix the cancer of war, couldn't even slow down the spread, but at least he could admit it was happening. He stretched, ate his last bite of fungal curds, drank the dregs of something not entirely unlike coffee, and headed out to keep peace in wartime. Moss greeted him with a vague nod when he got to the station house. The board was filled with cases, crimes to be investigated, documented, and dismissed. Twice as many entries as the day before. Bad night, Miller said. Could be worse, Moss said. Yeah? Star Helix could be a Mars corporation. As long as Earth stays neutral, we don't have to actually be the Gestapo. And how long you figure that'll last? What time is it? She asked. Tell you what, though, when it does come down, I need to make a stop up toward the core. There was this one guy back when I was rape squad we could never quite nail. Why wait? Miller asked. We could go up, put a bullet in him, be back by lunch. Yeah, but you know how it is, she said, trying to stay professional. Anyway, if we did that, we'd have to investigate it, and there's no room on the board. Miller sat at his desk. It was just shop talk. The kind of over-the-top deadpan you did when your day was filled with underage whores and tainted drugs. And still there was a tension in the station. It was in the way people laughed, the way they held themselves. There were more holsters visible than usual, as if by showing their weapons they might be made safe. You think it's the OPA? Moss asked. Her voice was lower now. That killed the Donager, you mean? Who else could? Plus which, they're taking credit for it. Some of them are. From what I heard, there's more than one OPA these days. The old school guys don't know a goddamn thing about any of this, all shitting their pants and trying to track down the pirate casts that are claiming credit. So they can do what? Miller asked. You can shut down every loudmouth caster in the belt, it won't change a thing. If there's a schism in the OPA, though, Moss looked at the board. If there was a schism within the OPA, the board, as they saw it, was nothing. Miller had lived through two major gang wars. First, when the Loka Grega displaced and destroyed the Aryan Flyers, and then when the Golden Bow split. The OPA was bigger and meaner and more professional than any of them. That would be civil war in the belt. Might not happen, Miller said. Shadid stepped out of her office, 
her gaze sweeping the station house. Conversations dimmed. Shadid caught Miller's eye. She made a sharp gesture. Get in the office. Busted, Mus said. In the office, Anderson Dawes sat at ease on one of the chairs. Miller felt his body twitch as that information fell into place. Mars and the Belt in open, armed conflict. The OPA's face on Ceres, sitting with the captain of the security force. So that's how it is, he thought. You're working the Mao job, Shadid said as she took her seat. Miller hadn't been offered the option of sitting, so he clasped his hands behind him. You assigned it to me, he said. And I told you it wasn't a priority, she said. I disagreed, Miller said. Dawes smiled. It was a surprisingly warm expression, especially compared to Shadid's. Detective Miller, Dawes said. You don't understand what's happening here. We're sitting on a pressure vessel, and you keep swinging a pickaxe at it. You need to stop that. You're off the Mao case, Shadid said. Do you understand that? I am officially removing you from that investigation as of right now. Any further investigation you do, I will have you disciplined for working outside your caseload and misappropriating Star Helix resources. You will return any material on the case to me. You will wipe any data you have in your personal partition, and you'll do it before the end of shift. Miller's brain spun, but he kept his face impassive. She was taking Julie away. He wasn't going to let her. That was a given. But it wasn't the first issue. I have some inquiries in process, he began. No, you don't, Shadid said. Your little letter to the parents was a breach of policy. Any contact with the shareholders should have come through me. You're telling me it didn't go out, Miller said, meaning you've been monitoring me. It did not, Shadid said. Yes, I have. What are you going to do about it? And there wasn't anything he could do. And the transcripts of the James Holden interrogation, Miller said. Did those get out before? Before the Doniger was destroyed? taking with it the only living witness to the scopuli and plunging the system into war? Miller knew the question sounded like a whine. Shadid's jaw tensed. He wouldn't have been surprised to hear teeth cracking. Dawes broke the silence. I think we can make this a little easier, he said. Detective, if I'm hearing you right, you think we're burying the issue. We aren't. But it's not in anyone's interests that Star Helix be the one to find the answers you're looking for. Think about it. You may be a belter, but you're working for an Earth corporation. Right now, Earth is the only major power without an oar in the water. The only one who can possibly negotiate with all sides. And so why wouldn't they want to know the truth? Miller said. That isn't the problem, Dawes said. The problem is that Star Helix and Earth can't appear to be involved one way or the other. Their hands need to stay clean. And this issue leads outside your contract. Juliet Mao isn't on series. And maybe there was a time you could have jumped a ship to wherever you found her and done the abduction, extradition, extraction, whatever you want to call it. But that time has passed. Star Helix is series part of Ganymede and a few dozen warehouse asteroids. If you leave that, you're going into enemy territory. But the OPA isn't, Miller said. We have the resources to do this right, Dawes said with a nod. Mao is one of ours. The Scopuli was one of ours. And the Scopuli was the bait that killed the Canterbury, Miller said. And the Canterbury was the bait that killed the Donager. So why exactly would anyone be better off having you be the only ones looking into something you might have done? You think we nuked the Canterbury, Dawes said. The OPA with its state-of-the-art Martian warships? It got the Donager out where it could be attacked. As long as it was with a fleet, it couldn't have been boarded. Dawes looked sour. Conspiracy theories, Mr. Miller, he said. If we had cloaked Martian warships, 
we wouldn't be losing. You had enough to kill the Donager with just six ships. No, we didn't. Our version of blowing up the Donager is a whole bunch of tramp prospectors loaded with nukes going on a suicide mission. We have many, many resources. What happened to the Donager wasn't part of them. The silence was broken only by the hum of the air recycler. Miller crossed his arms. But I don't understand, he said. If the OPA didn't start this, who did? That is what Juliet Mao and the crew of the Scopuli can tell us, Shadid said. Those are the stakes, Miller. Who and why, and please Christ, some idea of how to stop it. And you don't want to find them? Miller said. I don't want you to, Dawes said. Not when someone else can do it better. Miller shook his head. It was going too far, and he knew it. On the other hand, sometimes going too far could tell you something, too. I'm not sold, he said. You don't have to be sold, Shadid said. This isn't a negotiation. We aren't bringing you in to ask you for a goddamn favor. I am your boss. I am telling you. Do you know those words? Telling you. We have holding, Dawes said. What? Miller said, at the same time Shadid said, You're not supposed to talk about that. Dawes raised an arm toward Shadid and the belt's physical idiom of telling someone to be quiet. To Miller's surprise, she did as the OPA man said. We have Holden. He and his crew didn't die, and they are, or are about to be, in OPA custody. Do you understand what I'm saying, detective? Do you see my point? I can do this investigation because I have the resources to do it. You can't even find out what happened to your own riot gear. It was a slap. Miller looked at his shoes. He'd broken his word to Dawes about dropping the case, and the man hadn't brought it up until now. He had to give the OPA operative points for that. Added to that, if Dawes really did have James Holden, there was no chance of Miller's getting access to the interrogation. When Shadid spoke, her voice was surprisingly gentle. There were three murders yesterday. Eight warehouses got broken into, probably by the same bunch of people. We've got six people in hospital wards around the station with their nerves falling apart from a bad batch of bathtub pseudo-heroin. The whole station's jumpy, she said. There's a lot of good you can do out there, Miller. Go catch some bad guys. Sure, Captain, Miller said. You bet. Moss leaned against his desk, waiting for him. Her arms were crossed her eyes as bored looking at him as they had been looking at the corpse of Dos Santos, pinned to the corridor wall. New asshole? she asked. Yeah. It'll grow closed. Give it time. I got us one of the murders. Mid-level accountant for Naobi Shears got his head blown off outside a bar. It looked fun. Miller pulled up his hand terminal and took in the basics. His heart wasn't in it. Hey, Muss he said. I got a question. Fire away. You've got a case you don't want solved. What do you do? His new partner frowned, tilted her head and shrugged. I hand it to a fish, she said. There was a guy back in crimes against children. If we knew the perp was one of our informants, we'd always give it to him. None of our guys ever got in trouble. Yeah. Miller said. For that matter, I need someone to take the shitty partner. I do the same thing, Moss went on. You know, someone no one else wants to work with, got bad breath or a shitty personality or whatever, but he needs a partner. So I picked the guy who maybe he used to be good, but then he got a divorce, started hitting the bottle. Guy still thinks he's a hotshot, acts like it. Only his numbers aren't better than anyone else's. Give him the shit cases, the shit partner. Miller closed his eyes. His stomach felt uneasy. What did you do? He asked. To get assigned to you? Moss said. 
One of the seniors made the moves on me, and I shot him down. So you got stuck? Pretty much. Come on, Miller. You aren't stupid, Mus said. You had to know. He'd had to know that he was the station house joke. The guy who used to be good. The one who'd lost it. No. Actually, he hadn't known that. He opened his eyes. Mus didn't look happy or sad, pleased at his pain or particularly distressed by it. It was just work to her. The dead, the wounded, the injured. She didn't care. Not caring was how she got through the day. Maybe you shouldn't have turned him down, Miller said. Ah, uh, you're not that bad, Mus said. And he had black hair. I hate black hair. Glad to hear it, Miller said. Let's go make some justice. You're drunk, the asshole said. I'm a cop, Miller said, stabbing the air with his finger. Don't fuck with me. I know you're a cop. You've been coming to my bar for three years. It's me, Hassini. And you're drunk, my friend. Seriously, dangerously drunk. Miller looked around him. He was indeed at the Blue Frog. He didn't remember having come here, and yet here he was. And the asshole was Hassini after all. I, Miller began, then lost his train of thought. Come on, Hassini said, looping an arm around him. It's not that far. I'll get you home. What time is it? Miller asked. Late. The word had a depth to it. Late. It was late. All the chances to make things right had somehow passed him. The system was at war, and no one was even sure why. Miller himself was turning fifty years old the next June. It was late. Late to start again. Late to realize how many years he'd spent running down the wrong road. Hassini steered him toward an electric cart the bar kept for occasions like this one. The smell of hot grease came out of the kitchen. Hold on, Miller said. You're going to puke? Hassini asked. Miller considered for a moment. No, it was too late to puke. He stumbled forward. Hassini laid him back in the cart and engaged the motors, and with a whine they steered out into the corridor. The lights high above them were dimmed. The cart vibrated as they passed intersection after intersection. Or maybe it didn't. Maybe that was just his body. I thought I was good, he said. You know, all this time I thought I was at least good. You'll do fine, Hassini said. You've just got a shitty job. That I was good at. You'll do fine, Hassini repeated, as if saying it would make it true. Miller lay on the bed of the cart. The formed plastic arch of the wheel well dug into his side. It ached, but moving was too much effort. Thinking was too much effort. He'd made it through his day. Moss at his side. He'd turned in the data and materials on Julie. He had nothing worth going back to his hole for, and no place else to be. The light shifted into and out of his field of view. He wondered if that was what it would be like to look at stars. He'd never looked up at a sky. The thought inspired a certain vertigo, a sense of terror of the infinite that was almost pleasant. There anyone who can take care of you? Hassini said when they reached Miller's hole. I'll be fine. I just... I had a bad day. Julie, Hassini said, nodding. How do you know about Julie? Miller asked. You've been talking about her all night, Hassini said. She's a girl you fell for, right? Frowning, Miller kept a hand on the cart. Julie. He'd been talking about Julie. That was what this was about. Not his job. Not his reputation. They'd taken away Julie. The special case. The one that mattered. You're in love with her, Hassini said. Yeah, sort of, Miller said. 
something like revelation forcing its way through the alcohol. I think I am. Too bad for you, Hassini said. Chapter 17 Holden The Tachi's galley had a full kitchen and a table with room for twelve. It also had a full-size coffee pot that could brew forty cups of coffee in less than five minutes whether the ship was in zero-G or under a five-G burn. Holden said a silent prayer of thanks for bloated military budgets and pressed the brew button. He had to restrain himself from stroking the stainless steel cover while it made gentle percolating noises. The aroma of coffee began to fill the air, competing with the baking bread smell of whatever Alex had put in the oven. Amos was thumping around the table in his new cast, laying out plastic plates and actual honest-to-God metal silverware. In a bowl, Naomi was mixing something that had the garlic scent of good hummus. Watching the crew work at these domestic tasks, Holden had a sense of peace and safety deep enough to leave him lightheaded. They'd been on the run for weeks now, pursued the entire time by one mysterious ship or another. For the first time since the Canterbury was destroyed, no one knew where they were. No one was demanding anything of them. As far as the solar system was concerned, they were a few casualties out of thousands on the Donager. A brief vision of Shed's head disappearing like a grisly magic trick reminded him that at least one of his crew was a casualty. And still, it felt so good to once again be master of his own destiny that even regret couldn't entirely rob him of it. A timer rang, and Alex pulled out a tray covered with thin, flat bread. He began cutting it into slices, onto which Naomi slathered a paste that did in fact look like hummus. Amos put them on plates around the table. Holden drew fresh coffee into mugs that had the ship's name on the side. He passed them around. There was an awkward moment when everyone stared at the neatly set table without moving, as if afraid to destroy the perfection of the scene. Amos solved this by saying, I'm hungry as a fucking bear, and then sitting down with a thump. Somebody pass me that pepper, would you? For several minutes, no one spoke. They only ate. Holden took a small bite of the flatbread and hummus, the strong flavors making him dizzy after weeks of tasteless protein bars. Then he was stuffing it into his mouth so fast it made his salivary glands flare with exquisite agony. He looked around the table, embarrassed, but everyone else was eating just as fast, so he gave up on propriety and concentrated on food. When he'd finished off the last scraps from his plate, he leaned back with a sigh, hoping to make the contentment last as long as possible. Alex sipped coffee with his eyes closed. Amos ate the last bits of the hummus right out of the serving bowl with his spoon. Naomi gave Holden a sleepy look through half-lidded eyes that was suddenly sexy as hell. Holden quashed that thought and raised his mug. To Kelly's Marines. Heroes to the last, may they rest in peace, he said. To the Marines, everyone at the table echoed, then clinked mugs and drank. Alex raised his mug and said, To Shed. Yeah, to Shed, and to the assholes who killed him roasting in hell, Amos said in a quiet voice. Right beside the fuck who killed the cant. The mood at the table got somber. Holden felt the peaceful moment slipping away as quietly as it had come. So, he said, tell me about our new ship, Alex. She's a beaut, Cap. I ran her at 12G for most of half an hour when we left the Donnie, and she purred like a kitten the whole time. The pilot's chair is comfy, too. Holden nodded. Amos, get a chance to look at her engine room yet? He asked. Yep, clean as a whistle. This is going to be a boring gig for a grease monkey like me, the mechanic replied. Boring would be nice, Holden said. Naomi, what do you think? She smiled. I love it. It's got the nicest showers I've ever seen on a ship this size. 
Plus, there's a truly amazing medical bay with a computerized expert system that knows how to fix broken marines. We should have found it rather than fix Amos on our own. Amos thumped his cast with one knuckle. You guys did a good job, boss. Holden looked around at his clean crew and ran a hand through his own hair, not pulling it away covered in grease for the first time in weeks. Yeah, a shower and not having to fix broken legs sounds good. Anything else? Naomi tilted her head back, her eyes moving as though she was running through a mental checklist. We've got a full tank of water, the injectors have enough fuel pellets to run the reactor for about thirty years, and the galley is fully stocked. You'll have to tie me up if you plan to give her back to the Navy. I love her. She is a cunning little boat, Holden said with a smile. Have a chance to look at the weapons? Two tubes and twenty long-range torpedoes with high-yield plasma warheads, Naomi said. Or at least that's what the manifest says. They load those from the outside, so I can't physically verify without climbing around on the hull. The weapons panel is saying the same thing, Cap, Alex said. And full loads in all the point defense cannons. You know, except... Except the burst you fired into the man who killed Gomez, he thought. Oh, and Captain, when we put Kelly in the cargo hold, I found a big crate with the letters M.A.P. on the side. According to the manifest, it stands for a mobile assault package. Apparently Navy speak for a big box of guns, Naomi said. Yeah, Alex said. It's full kit for eight Marines. Okay, Holden said. So, with the fleet quality Epstein, we've got legs, and if you guys are right about the weapons loadout, we've also got teeth. The next question is, what do we do with it? I'm inclined to take Colonel Johnson's offer of refuge. Any thoughts? I'm all for that, Captain, Amos said. I always did think the Belters were getting the short end of the stick. I'll go be a revolutionary for a while, I guess. Earthman's burden, Amos? Naomi asked with a grin. What the fuck does that even mean? Nothing, just teasing, she said. I know you like our side because you just want to steal our women. Amos grinned back, suddenly in on the joke. Well, you ladies do have the legs that go all the way up, he said. Okay, enough, Holden said, raising his hand. So, two votes for Fred. Anyone else? Naomi raised her hand. I vote for Fred, she said. Alex, what do you think? Holden asked. The Martian pilot leaned back in his chair and scratched his head. I got nowhere particular to be, so I'll stick with you guys, I guess, he said. But I hope this don't turn into another round of being told what to do. It won't, Holden replied. I have a ship with guns on it now, and the next time someone orders me to do something, I'm using them. After dinner, Holden took a long, slow tour of his new ship. He opened every door, looked in every closet, turned on every panel, and read every readout. He stood in engineering next to the fusion reactor and closed his eyes, getting used to the almost subliminal vibration she made. If something ever went wrong with it, he wanted to feel it in his bones before any warning ever sounded. He stopped and touched all the tools in the well-stocked machine shop, and he climbed up to the personnel deck and wandered through the cabins until he found one he liked, and messed up the bed to show it was taken. He found a bunch of jumpsuits in what looked like his size, then moved them to the closet in his new room. He took a second shower, and let the hot water massage knots in his back that were three weeks old. As he wandered back to his cabin, he trailed his fingers along the wall feeling the soft give of the fire-retardant foam and anti-spalling webbing over the top of the armored steel bulkheads. When he arrived at his cabin, Alex and Amos were both getting settled into theirs. Which cabin did Naomi take? he asked. Amos shrugged. She's still up in ops, fiddling with something. Holden decided to put off sleep for a while and rode the keel ladder lift. We have a lift, he thought up to the operations deck. Naomi was sitting on the floor, an open bulkhead panel in front of her and what looked like a hundred small parts and wires laid out around her in precise patterns. She was staring at something inside the open compartment. 
Hey, Naomi, you should really get some sleep. What are you working on? She gestured vaguely at the compartment. Transponder, she said. Holden moved over and sat down on the floor next to her. Tell me how to help. She handed him her handheld terminal. Fred's instructions for changing the transponder signal were open on the screen. It's ready to go. I've got the console hooked up to the transponder's data port, just like he says. I've got the computer program set up to run the override, he describes. The new transponder code and ship registry data are ready to be entered. I put in the new name. Did Fred pick it? No, that was me. Oh, all right then. But... Her voice trailed off, and she waved at the transponder again. What's the problem? Holden asked. Jim, they make these things not to be fiddled with. The civilian version of this device fuses itself into a solid lump of silicon if it thinks it's being tampered with. Who knows what the military version of the failsafe is? Drop the magnetic bottle in the reactor? Turn us into a supernova? Naomi turned to look at him. I've got it all set up and ready to go, but now I don't think we should throw the switch, she said. We don't know the consequences of failure. Holden got up off the floor and moved over to the computer console. A program Naomi had named Trans-01 was waiting to be run. He hesitated for one second, then pressed the button to execute. The ship failed to vaporize. I guess Fred wants us alive, then, he said. Naomi slumped down with a noisy, extended exhale. See, this is why I can't ever be in command, she said. Don't like making tough calls with incomplete information? More, I'm not suicidally irresponsible, she replied, and began slowly reassembling the transponder housing. Holden punched the comm system on the wall. Well, crew, welcome aboard the gas freighter Rocinante. What does that name even mean? Naomi said after he let go of the comm button. It means we need to go find some windmills. Holden said over his shoulder as he headed to the lift. Tyco Manufacturing and Engineering Concern was one of the first major corporations to move into the belt. In the early days of expansion, Tyco engineers and a fleet of ships had captured a small comet and parked it in stable orbit as a water resupply point decades before ships like the Canterbury began bringing ice in from the nearly limitless fields in Saturn's rings. It had been the most complex, difficult feat of mass-scale engineering humanity had ever accomplished until the next thing they did. As an encore, Tycho had built the massive reaction drives into the rock of Ceres and Eros and spent more than a decade teaching the asteroids to spin. They had been slated to create a network of high-atmosphere floating cities above Venus before the development rights fell into a labyrinth of lawsuits now entering its eighth decade. There was some discussion of space elevators for Mars and Earth, but nothing solid had come of it yet. If you had an impossible engineering job that needed to be done in the belt, and you could afford it, you hired Tycho. Tycho Station, the belt headquarters of the company, was a massive ring station built around a sphere half a kilometer across, with more than 65 million cubic meters of manufacturing and storage space inside. The two counter-rotating habitation rings that circled the sphere had enough space for 15,000 workers and their families. The top of the manufacturing sphere was festooned with half a dozen massive construction waldos that looked like they could rip a heavy freighter in half. The bottom of the sphere had a bulbous projection 50 meters across, which housed a capital ship-class fusion reactor and drive system, making Tycho Station the largest mobile construction platform in the solar system. Each compartment within the massive rings was built on a swivel system that allowed the chambers to reorient to thrust gravity when the rings stopped spinning and the station flew to its next work location. Holden knew all this, and his first sight of the station still took his breath away. It wasn't just the size of it. It was the idea that four generations of the smartest people in the solar system had been living and working here as they helped drag humanity into the outer planets almost through sheer force of will. Amos said, It looks like a big bug. 
Holden started to protest, but it did resemble some kind of giant spider. Fat, bulbous body and all its legs sprouting from the top of its head. Alex said, Forget the station. Look at that monster. The vessel it was constructing dwarfed the station. Ladar returns told Holden the ship was just over two kilometers long and half a kilometer wide. Round and stubby, it looked like a cigarette butt made of steel. Framework girders exposed internal compartments and machinery at various stages of construction, but the engines looked complete, and the hull had been assembled over the bow. The name Nauvoo was painted in massive white letters across it. So, the Mormons are going to ride that thing all the way to Tausitai, huh? Amos asked, following it up with a long whistle. Ballsy bastards. No guarantee there's even a planet worth a damn on the other end of that hundred-year trip. They seem pretty sure, Holden replied. And you don't make the money to build a ship like that by being stupid. I, for one, wish them nothing but luck. They'll get the stars, Naomi said. How can you not envy them that? Their great-grandkids will get maybe a star, if they don't all starve to death orbiting a rock they can't use, Amos said. Let's not get grandiose here. He pointed at the impressively large calm array jutting from the Nauvoo's flank. Want to bet that's what threw our anus-sized tight beam message? Amos said. Alex nodded. If you want to send private messages home from a couple light years away, you need serious beam coherence. They probably had the volume turned down to avoid cutting a hole in us. Holden got up from the co-pilot's couch and pushed past Amos. Alex, see if they'll let us land. Landing was surprisingly easy. The station control directed them to a docking port on the side of the sphere and stayed on the line, guiding them in, until Alex had married the docking tube to the airlock door. The tower control never pointed out that they had a lot of armaments for a transport and no tanks for carrying compressed gas. She got them docked, then wished them a pleasant day. Holden put on his atmosphere suit and made a quick trip to the cargo bay, then met the others just inside the Rosinante's inner airlock door with a large duffel. Put your suits on. That's now standard ops for this crew any time we go someplace new. And take one of these, he said, pulling handguns and cartridge magazines from the bag. Hide it in a pocket or your bag if you like, but I'll be wearing mine openly. Naomi frowned at him. It seems a bit confrontational, doesn't it? I'm tired of being kicked around, Holden said. The Rosie's a good start toward independence, and I'm taking a little piece of her with me. Call it a good luck charm. Fucking A, said Amos, and strapped one of the guns to his thigh. Alex stuffed his into the pocket of his flight suit. Naomi wrinkled her nose and waved off the last gun. Holden put it back into his duffel, led the crew into the Rosinante's airlock, and cycled it. An older, dark-skinned man with a heavy build waited for them on the other side. As they came in, he smiled. Welcome to Tycho Station, said the butcher of Anderson Station. Call me Fred. Chapter 18 Miller The death of the Donager hit Ceres like a hammer striking a gong. News feeds clogged themselves with high-power telescopic footage of the battle, most, if not all, of it faked. The belt chatter swam with speculation about a secret OPA fleet. The six ships that had taken down the Martian flagship were hailed as heroes and martyrs. Slogans like, We did it once, and we can do it again, and Drop some rocks, cropped up even in apparently innocuous settings. The Canterbury had stripped away the complacency of the belt, but the Donager had done something worse. It had taken away the fear. The Belters had gotten a sudden, decisive, and unexpected win. Anything seemed possible, and the hope seduced them. It would have scared Miller more if he'd been sober. Miller's alarm had been going off for the past ten minutes. The grating buzz took on subtones and overtones when he listened to it long enough. A constant rising tone fluttering percussion throbbing under it, even soft music hiding underneath the blare. Illusions. Oral hallucinations. 
the voice of the whirlwind. The previous night's bottle of fungal faux bourbon sat on the bedside table where a carafe of water usually waited. It still had a couple fingers at the bottom. Miller considered the soft brown of the liquid, thought about how it would feel on his tongue. The beautiful thing about losing your illusions, he thought, was that you got to stop pretending. All the years he'd told himself that he was respected, that he was good at his job, that all his sacrifices had been made for a reason, fell away, and left him with the clear, unmuddied knowledge that he was a functional alcoholic who had pared away everything good in his own life to make room for anesthetic. Shadid thought he was a joke. Mus thought he was the price she paid not to sleep with someone she didn't like. The only one who might have any respect for him at all was Havelock, an earther. It was peaceful, in its way. He could stop making the effort to keep up appearances. If he stayed in bed listening to the alarm drone, he was just living up to expectations. No shame in that. And still, there was work to be done. He reached over and turned off the alarm. Just before it cut off, he heard a voice in it, soft but insistent, a woman's voice. He didn't know what she'd been saying, but since she was just in his head, she'd get another chance later. He levered himself out of bed, sucked down some painkillers and rehydration goo, stalked to the shower and burned a day and a half's ration of hot water just standing there watching his legs get pink. He dressed in his last set of clean clothes. Breakfast was a bar of pressed yeast and grape sweetener. He dropped the bourbon from the bedside table into the recycler without finishing it, just to prove to himself that he still could. Mus was waiting at the desk. She looked up when he sat. Still waiting for the labs on the rape up on 18, she said. They promised them by lunch. We'll see, Miller said. I've got a possible witness. Girl who was with the Vic earlier in the evening. Her deposition said she left before anything happened, but the security cameras aren't backing her up. Want me in the questioning? Miller asked. Not yet, but if I need some theater, I'll pull you in. Fair enough. Miller didn't watch her walk away. After a long moment staring at nothing, he pulled up his disc partition, reviewed what still needed doing, and started cleaning the place up. As he worked, his mind replayed for the millionth time the slow, humiliating interview with Shadid and Dawes. We have Holden, Dawes said. You can't even find out what happened to your own riot gear. Miller poked at the words like a tongue at the gap of a missing tooth. It rang true, again. Still, it might have been bullshit. It might have been a story concocted just to make him feel small. There wasn't any proof, after all, that Holden and his crew had survived. What proof could there be? The Donager was gone, and all its logs along with it. There would have to have been a ship that made it out, either a rescue vessel or one of the Martian escort ships. There was no way a ship could have gotten out and not been the singular darling of every news feed and pirate cast since. You couldn't keep something like that quiet. Or sure you could. It just wouldn't be easy. He squinted at the empty air of the station house. Now, how would you cover up a surviving ship? Miller pulled up a cheap navigation plotter he'd bought five years before, transit times had figured in a smuggling case, and plotted the date and position of the Donager's demise. Anything running under non-Epstein thrust would still have been out there, and Martian warships would have either picked it up or blasted it into background radiation by now. So if Dawes wasn't just handing him bullshit, that meant an Epstein drive. He ran a couple of quick calculations. With a good drive, someone could have made series in just less than a month. Call it three weeks to be safe. He looked at the data for almost ten minutes, but the next step didn't come to him. So he stepped away, got some coffee, and pulled up the interview he and Moss had done with a Belter ground crew grunt. The man's face was long and cadaverous and subtly cruel. The recorder hadn't had a good fix on him, so the picture kept bouncing around. Moss asked the man what he'd seen, and Miller leaned forward to read the transcribed answers, checking for incorrectly recognized words. Thirty seconds later, the grunt said, Clip whore, 
and the transcript read, Clipper. Miller corrected it, but the back of his mind kept churning. Probably eight or nine hundred ships came into Ceres in a given day. Call it a thousand to be safe. Give it a couple days on either side of the three-week mark, that was only four thousand entries. Pain in the ass, sure, but not impossible. Ganymede would be the other real bitch. With its agriculture, there would be hundreds of transports a day there. Still, it wouldn't double the workload. Eros, Tycho, Pallas. How many ships docked on Pallas every day? He'd missed almost two minutes of the recording. He started again, forcing himself to pay attention this time. And half an hour later, he gave up. The ten busiest ports, with two days to either side of an estimated arrival of an Epstein Drive ship that originated when and where the Doniger died, totaled 28,000 docking records, more or less. But he could cut that down to 17,000 if he excluded stations and ports explicitly run by Martian military and research stations with all or nearly all interplanet inhabitants. So, how long would it take him to check all the porting records by hand, pretending for a minute that he was stupid enough to do it? Call it 118 days, if he didn't eat or sleep. Just working ten-hour days, doing nothing else, he could almost get through it in less than a year. A little less. Except no, because there were ways to narrow it. He was only looking for Epstein drive ships. Most of the traffic at any of the ports would be local. Torch drive ships flown by prospectors and short-hop couriers. The economics of spaceflight made relatively few and relatively large ships the right answer for long flights, so take it down by conservatively three-quarters, and he was back in the close to 4,000 range again. Still hundreds of hours of work, but if he could think of some other filter that would just feed him the likely suspects, for instance, if the ship couldn't have filed a flight plan before the Doniger got killed. The request interface for the port logs was ancient, uncomfortable and subtly different from Eros to Ganymede to Pallas, and on and on. Miller tacked the information requests onto seven different cases, including a month-old cold case on which he was only a consultant. Port logs were public and open, so he didn't particularly need his detective status to hide his actions. With any luck, Shadid's monitoring of him wouldn't extend to low-level public record poking around, and even if it did, he might get the replies before she caught on. Never knew if you had any luck left, unless you pushed it. Besides, there wasn't a lot to lose. When the connection from the lab opened on his terminal, he almost jumped. The technician was a gray-haired woman with an unnaturally young face. Miller? Muss with you? Nope, Miller said. She's got an interrogation. He was pretty sure that was what she'd said. The tech shrugged. Well, her system's not answering. I wanted to tell you we got a match off the rape you sent us. It wasn't the boyfriend. Her boss did it. Miller nodded. You put in for the warrant? He asked. Yep, she said. It's already in the file. Miller pulled it up. Star Helix, on behalf of Ceres Station, authorizes and mandates the detention of Emmanuel Corvus Dowd pending adjudication of security incident CCS-4949-231. The judge's digital signature was listed in green. He felt a slow smile on his lips. Thanks, he said. On the way out of the station, one of the vice squads asked him where he was headed. He said lunch. The Aranya Accountancy Group had their offices in the nice part of the governmental quarter in Sector 7. It wasn't Miller's usual stomping grounds, but the warrant was good in the whole station. Miller went to the secretary at the front desk, a good-looking belter with a starburst pattern embroidered on his vest, and explained that he needed to speak with Emmanuel Corvus Dowd. The secretary's deep brown skin took on an ashy tone. Miller stood back, not blocking the exit, but keeping close. Twenty minutes later, an older man in a good suit came through the front door, stopped in front of Miller and looked him up and down. Detective Miller? The man said. You'd be Dowd's lawyer, Miller said cheerfully. I am, and I would like to... Really, Miller said. We should do this now. 
The office was clean and spare, with light blue walls that lit themselves from within. Dowd sat at the table. He was young enough that he still looked arrogant, but old enough to be scared. Miller nodded to him. You're Emmanuel Corvus Dowd, he said. Before you continue, detective, the lawyer said, my client is involved with very high-level negotiations. His client base includes some of the most important people in the war effort. Before you make any accusations, you should be aware that I can and will have everything you've done reviewed, and if there is one mistake, you will be held responsible. Mr. Dowd, Miller said, what I am about to do to you is literally the only bright spot in my day. If you could see your way clear to resisting arrest, I'd really appreciate it. Harry, Dowd said, looking to his lawyer. His voice cracked a little. The lawyer shook his head. Back at the police cart, Miller took a long moment. Dowd, handcuffed in the back, where everyone walking by could see him, was silent. Miller pulled up his hand terminal, noted the time of arrest, the objections of the lawyer, and a few other minor comments. A young woman in professional dress of cream-colored linen hesitated at the door of the accountancy. Miller didn't recognize her. She was no one involved with the rape case, or at least not the one he was working. Her face had the expressionless calm of a fighter. He turned, craning his neck to look at Dowd, humiliated and not looking back. The woman shifted her gaze to Miller. She nodded once. Thank you. He nodded back. Just doing my job. She went through the door. Two hours later, Miller finished the last of the paperwork and sent Dowd off to the cells. Three and a half hours later, the first of his docking log requests came in. Five hours later, the government of Ceres collapsed. Despite being full, the station house was silent. Detectives and junior investigators, patrolmen and desk workers, the high and the low, they all gathered before Shadid. She stood at her podium, her hair pulled back tight. She wore her star helix uniform, but the insignia had been removed. Her voice was shaky. You've all heard this by now, but starting now, it's official. The United Nations, responding to requests from Mars, is withdrawing from its oversight and protection of Ceres Station. This is a peaceful transition. This is not a coup. I'm going to say that again. This isn't a coup. Earth is pulling out of here. We aren't pushing. That's bullshit, sir, someone shouted. Shadid raised her hand. There's a lot of loose talk, Shadid said. I don't want to hear any of it from you. The governor's going to make the formal announcement at the start of the next shift, and we'll get more details then. Until we hear otherwise, the Star Helix contract is still in place. A provisional government is being formed with members drawn from local businesses and union representation. We are still the law on Ceres, and I expect you to behave appropriately. You will all be here for your shifts. You will be here on time. You will act professionally and within the scope of standard practice. Miller looked over at Muss. His partner's hair was still unkempt from the pillow. It was pushing midnight for them both. Any questions? Shadid said in a voice that implied there ought not be. Who's going to pay Star Helix? Miller thought. What laws are we enforcing? What does Earth know that makes walking away from the biggest port in the belt the smart move? Who's going to negotiate your peace treaty now? Mus, seeing Miller's gaze, smiled. Guess we're hosed, Miller said. Had to happen, Mus agreed. I better go. Got a stop to make. Up at the core? Mus didn't answer, because she didn't have to. Ceres didn't have laws. It had police. Miller headed back to his hole. The station hummed, the stone beneath him vibrating from the countless docking clamps and reactor cores, tubes and recyclers and pneumatics. The stone was alive and he'd forgotten the small signs that proved it. Six million people lived here, breathed this air, fewer than in a middle-sized city on Earth. He wondered if they were expendable. 
Had it really gone so far that the inner planets would be willing to lose a major station? It seemed like it had if Earth was abandoning Ceres. The OPA would step in, whether it wanted to or not. The power vacuum was too great. Then Mars would call it an OPA coup. Then... Then what? Board it and put it under martial law? That was the good answer. Nuke it into dust? He couldn't quite bring himself to believe that, either. There was just too much money involved. Docking fees alone would fuel a small national economy. And Shadid and Dawes, much as he hated it, were right. Ceres, under Earth contract, had been the best hope for a negotiated peace. Was there someone on Earth who didn't want that peace? Someone or something powerful enough to move the glacial bureaucracy of the United Nations to take action? What am I looking at, Julie? He said to the empty air. What did you see out there that's worth Mars and the belt killing each other? The station hummed to itself. A quiet, constant sound, too soft for him to hear the voices within it. Muss didn't come to work in the morning, but there was a message on his system telling him she'd be in late. Clean up was her only explanation. To look at it, nothing about the station house had changed. The same people coming to the same place to do the same thing. No, that wasn't true. The energy was high. People were smiling, laughing, clowning around. It was a manic high. Panic pressed through a cheesecloth mask of normalcy. It wasn't going to last. They were all that separated Ceres from anarchy. They were the law, and the difference between the survival of six million people and some mad bastard forcing open all the airlocks or poisoning the recyclers rested on maybe thirty thousand people. People like him. Maybe he should have rallied, risen to the occasion like the rest of them. The truth was, the thought made him tired. Shadid marched by and tapped him on the shoulder. He sighed, rose from his chair, and followed her. Dawes was in her office again, looking shaken and sleep-deprived. Miller nodded to him. Shadid crossed her arms, her eyes softer and less accusing than he'd become used to. This is going to be tough, she said. We're facing something harder than anything we've had to do before. I need a team I can trust with my life. Extraordinary circumstances. You understand that? Yeah, he said. I got it. I'll stop drinking, get myself together. Miller, you're not a bad person at heart. There was a time you were a pretty good cop. But I don't trust you. And we don't have time to start over, Shadid said her voice as near to gentle as he had ever heard it. You're fired. Chapter 19 Holden Fred stood alone, hand outstretched, a warm and open smile on his broad face. There were no guards with assault rifles behind him. Holden shook Fred's hand and then started laughing. Fred smiled and looked confused, but let Holden keep a grip on his hand, waiting for Holden to explain what was so funny. I'm sorry, but you have no idea how pleasant this is, Holden said. This is literally the first time in over a month that I have gotten off a ship without it blowing up behind me. Fred laughed with him now, an honest laugh that seemed to originate somewhere in his belly. After a moment, the man said, You're quite safe here. We are the most protected station in the Outer Planets. Because you're OPA? Holden asked. Fred shook his head. No. We make campaign contributions to Earth and Mars politicians in amounts that would make a Hilton blush, he said. If anyone blows us up, half the UN Assembly and all of the Martian Congress will be howling for blood. It's the problem with politics. Your enemies are often your allies, and vice versa. Fred gestured to a doorway behind him and motioned for everyone to follow. The ride was short, but halfway through, gravity reappeared, shifting in a disorienting swoop. Holden stumbled. Fred looked chagrined. I'm sorry, I should have warned you about that. 
the central hub's null G. Moving into the ring's rotational gravity can be awkward the first time. I'm fine, Holden said. Naomi's brief smile might only have been his imagination. A moment later, the elevator door opened onto a wide carpeted corridor with walls of pale green. It had the reassuring smell of air scrubbers and fresh carpet glue. Holden wouldn't have been surprised to find they were piping new space station scent into the air. The doors that led off the corridor were made of faux wood, distinguishable from the real thing only because nobody had that much money. Of all his crew, Holden was almost certainly the only one who had grown up in a house with real wooden furniture and fixtures. Amos had grown up in Baltimore. They hadn't seen a tree there in more than a century. Holden pulled off his helmet and turned around to tell his crew to do the same, but theirs were already off. Amos looked up and down the corridor and whistled. Nice digs, Fred, he said. Follow me. I'll get you settled in, Fred replied, leading them down the corridor. As he walked, he spoke. Tycho Station has undergone a number of refurbishments over the last hundred years, as you might guess, but the basics haven't changed much. It was a brilliant design to begin with. Malthus Tycho was an engineering genius. His grandson, Breeden, runs the company now. He isn't on the station at the moment, down the well at Luna negotiating the next big deal. Holden said, Seems like you have a lot on your plate already with that monster parked outside. And, you know, a war going on. A group of people in jumpsuits of various colors walked past, talking animatedly. The corridor was so wide that no one had to give way. Fred gestured at them as they went by. First shift's just ending, so this is rush hour, he said. It's actually time to start drumming up new work. The Nauvoo is almost done. They'll be loading colonists on her in six months. Always have to have the next project lined up. The Tycho spends eleven million UN dollars every day she's in operation, whether we make money that day or not. It's a big nut to cover. And the war, well, we're hoping that's temporary. And now you're taking in refugees. That won't help, Holden said. Fred just laughed and said, Four more people won't put us in the poorhouse any time soon. Holden stopped, forcing the others to pull up short behind him. It was several steps before Fred noticed, then turned around with a confused look. You're dodging, Holden said. Other than a couple billion dollars worth of stolen Martian warship, we haven't got anything of value. Everyone thinks we're dead. Any access of our accounts ruins that, and I just don't live in a universe where Daddy Warbuck swoops in and makes everything okay out of the goodness of his heart. So either tell us why you're taking the risk of putting us up, or we go get back on a ship and try our hand at piracy. Scourge of the Martian Merchant Fleet, they'll call us, Amos growled from somewhere behind him. He sounded pleased. Fred held up his hands. There was a hardness in his eyes, but also an amused respect. Nothing underhanded. You have my word, he said. You're armed, and station security will allow you to carry guns whenever you like. That alone should reassure you that I'm not planning foul play. But let me get you settled in before we do much more talking, okay? Holden didn't move. Another group of returning workers was going by in the corridor, and they watched the scene curiously as they passed. Someone from the knot of people called out, Everything okay, Fred? Fred nodded and waved them by impatiently. Let's get out of the corridor, at least. We aren't unpacking until we get some answers, Holden replied. Fine, we're almost there, Fred said, and then led them off again at a somewhat faster pace. He stopped at a small inset in the corridor wall with two doors in it. Opening one with a swipe of a card, he led the four of them into a large residential suite with a roomy living space and lots of seating. Bathroom is that door back there on the left. The bedroom is the one on the right. There's even a small kitchen space over here, Fred said, pointing to each thing as he spoke. Holden sat down in a large brown faux leather recliner and leaned it back. A remote control was in a pocket of the armrest. He assumed it controlled the impressively large screen that took up most of one wall. Naomi and Amos sat on a couch that matched his chair, and Alex draped himself over a love seat in a nice contrasting cream color. Comfortable? Fred asked, 
pulling a chair away from the six-seat dining area and sitting down across from Holden. It's all right, Holden said defensively. My ship has a really nice coffee maker. I suppose bribes won't work. You're all comfortable, though? We have two seats set aside for you, both this basic layout, though the other suite has two rooms. I wasn't sure of the, uh, sleeping arrangements. Fred trailed off uncomfortably. Don't worry, boss, you can bunk with me, Amos said with a wink at Naomi. Naomi just smiled faintly. Okay, Fred, we're off the street, she said. Now answer the captain's questions. Fred nodded, then stood up and cleared his throat. He seemed to review something. When he spoke, the conversational facade was gone. His voice carried a grim authority. War between the Belt and Mars is suicide. Even if every rock hopper in the Belt were armed, we still couldn't compete with the Martian Navy. We might kill a few with tricks and suicide runs. Mars might feel forced to nuke one of our stations to prove a point. But we can strap chemical rockets onto a couple hundred rocks the size of bunk beds and rain Armageddon down on Martian dome cities. Fred paused, as if looking for words, then sat back down on his chair. All of the war drums ignore that. It's the elephant in the room. Anyone who doesn't live on a spaceship is structurally vulnerable. Tycho, Eros, Pallas, Ceres. Stations can't evade incoming missiles. And with all of the enemy citizens living at the bottom of huge gravity wells, we don't have to aim particularly well. Einstein was right. We will be fighting the next war with rocks. But the belt has rocks that will turn the surface of Mars into a molten sea. Right now, everyone is still playing nice, and only shooting at ships. Very gentlemanly. But sooner or later, one side or the other will be pressed to do something desperate. Holden leaned forward, the slick surface of his environment suit making an embarrassing squeak on the leather-textured chair. No one laughed. I agree. What does that have to do with us? he asked. Too much blood has already been shed, Fred said. Shed. Holden winced at the bleak, unintentional pun, but said nothing. The Canterbury, Fred continued, the Donager. People aren't just going to forget about those ships and those thousands of innocent people. Seems like you just crossed off the only two options, Chief, Alex said. No war, no peace. There's a third alternative. Civilized society has another way of dealing with things like this, Fred said. A criminal trial. Amos's snort shook the air. Holden had to fight not to smile himself. Are you fucking serious? Amos asked. And how do you put a goddamn Martian stealth ship on trial? Do we go question all the stealth ships about their whereabouts, double-check their alibis? Fred held up a hand. Stop thinking of the Canterbury's destruction as an act of war, he said. It was a crime. Right now people are overreacting. But once the situation sinks in, heads will cool. People on both sides will see where this road goes and look for another way out. There's a window where the saner elements can investigate events, negotiate jurisdiction, and assign blame to some party or parties that both sides can agree to. A trial. It's the only outcome that doesn't involve millions of deaths and the collapse of human infrastructure. Holden shrugged, a gesture barely visible in his heavy environment suit. So it goes to a trial. You still aren't answering my question. Fred pointed at Holden, then at each of the crew in turn. You're the ace in the hole. You four people are the only eyewitnesses to the destruction of both ships. When the trial comes, I need you and your depositions. I have influence already through our political contacts, but you can buy me a seat at the table. It will be a whole new set of treaties between the Belt and the Inner Planets. We can do in months what I dreamed of doing in decades. And you want to use our value as witnesses to force your way into the process so you can make those treaties look the way you want them to, Holden said. Yes, and I'm willing to give you protection, shelter, and run of my station for as long as it takes to get there. Holden took a long, deep breath, got up, and started unzipping his suit. 
Yeah, okay. That's just self-serving enough, I believe it, he said. Let's get settled in. Naomi was singing karaoke. Just thinking about it made Holden's head spin. Naomi. Karaoke. Even considering everything that had happened to them over the past month, Naomi up on stage with a mic in one hand and some sort of fuchsia martini in the other, screaming out an angry belt-punk anthem by the moldy filters, was the strangest thing he'd ever seen. She finished to scattered applause and a few catcalls, then staggered off the stage and collapsed across from him in the booth. She held up her drink, sloshing a good half of it onto the table, then threw the other half back all at once. What'd you think? Naomi asked, waving at the bartender for another. It was terrible, Holden replied. No, really. It was truly one of the most awful renditions of one of the most awful songs I've ever heard. Naomi shook her head, blowing an exasperated raspberry at him. Her dark hair fell across her face, and when the bartender brought her a second brightly colored martini, foiled all her attempts at drinking. She finally grabbed her hair and held it above her head in a clump while she drank. You don't get it, she said. It's supposed to be awful. That's the point. Then it was the best version of that song I've ever heard, Holden said. Damn straight. Naomi looked around the bar. Where are Amos and Alex? Amos found what I'm pretty sure was the most expensive hooker I've ever seen. Alex is in the back playing darts. He made some claims about the superiority of Martian darts players. I assume they're going to kill him and throw him out an airlock. A second singer was on stage, crooning out some sort of Vietnamese power ballad. Naomi watched the singer for a while, sipping her drink, then said, Maybe we should go save him. Which one? Alex. Why would Amos need saving? Because I'm pretty sure he told the expensive hooker he was on Fred's expense account. Let's mount a rescue mission. We can save them both, Naomi said, then drank the rest of her cocktail. I need more rescue fuel, though. She started waving at the bartender again, but Holden reached out and grabbed her hand and held it on the table. Maybe we should take a breather instead, he said. A flush of anger as intense as it was brief lit her face. She pulled back her hand. You take a breather. I've just had two ships and a bunch of friends shot out from underneath me and spent three weeks of dead time flying to get here. So no, I'm getting another drink and then doing another set. The crowd loves me, Naomi said. What about our rescue mission? Lost cause. Amos will be murdered by space hookers, but at least he'll die the way he lived. Naomi pushed her way up from the table, grabbed her martini off the bar, and headed toward the karaoke stage. Holden watched her go, then finished off the scotch he'd been nursing for the past two hours and got up. For a moment there, he'd had a vision of the two of them staggering back to the room together, then falling into bed. He'd have hated himself in the morning for taking advantage, but he'd still have done it. Naomi was looking at him from the stage, and he realized he'd been staring. He gave a little wave, then headed out the door with only ghosts, Ade, Captain McDowell, Gomez and Kelly, and Shed, to keep him company. The suite was comfortable, and huge, and depressing. He'd lain on the bed less than five minutes before he was up and out the door again. He walked the corridor for half an hour, finding the big intersections that led to other parts of the ring. He found an electronic store and a tea house and what on closer inspection turned out to be a very expensive brothel. He declined the video menu of services the desk clerk offered and wandered out again, wondering if Amos was somewhere inside. He was halfway down a corridor he hadn't seen before when a small knot of teenage girls passed him. Their faces looked no older than fourteen, but they were already as tall as he was. They got quiet as he walked by then burst out laughing when he was behind them and hurried away. Tycho was a city, and he suddenly felt very much like a foreigner, unsure of where to go or what to do. It was no surprise to him when he looked up from his wanderings and discovered he'd come to the elevator to the docking area. He punched the button and climbed inside, 
remembering to turn on his boot mags just in time to avoid being flung off his feet when the gravity twisted sideways and vanished. Even though he'd only had possession of the ship for three weeks, climbing back onto the Rocinante felt like going home. Using gentle touches on the keel ladder, he made his way up to the cockpit. He pulled himself into the co-pilot's couch, strapped in and closed his eyes. The ship was silent. With the reactor offline and no one aboard, nothing was moving at all. The flexible docking tube that connected the Rossi to the station transmitted very little vibration to the ship. Holden could close his eyes and drift in the straps and disconnect from everything around him. It would have been peaceful, except that every time he'd closed his eyes for the past month, the fading ghost lights behind his eyelids had been Ade winking and blowing away like dust. The voice at the back of his head was McDowell's as he tried to save his ship right up to the very last second. He wondered if he'd have them for the rest of his life, coming out to haunt him every time he found a moment of quiet. He remembered the old-timers from his Navy days, grizzled lifers who could soundly sleep while two meters away their shipmates played a raucous game of poker or watched the vids with the volume all the way up. Back then, he'd assumed it was just learned behavior the body adapting so it could get enough rest in an environment that never really had downtime. Now he wondered if those vets found the constant noise preferable, a way to keep their lost shipmates away. They probably went home after their twenty and never slept again. He opened his eyes and watched a small green telltale blink on the pilot's console. It was the only light in the room, and it illuminated nothing but its slow fade in and out was somehow comforting, a quiet heartbeat for the ship. He told himself that Fred was right. A trial was the right thing to hope for. But he wanted that stealth ship and Alex's gun sights. He wanted that unknown crew to live through the terrifying moment when all the countermeasures have failed, the torpedoes are seconds from impact, and absolutely nothing can stop them. He wanted them to have that same last gasp of fear he'd heard through Ade's mic. For a time, he displaced the ghosts in his head with violent vengeance fantasies. When they stopped working, he floated down to the personnel deck, strapped into his cot, and tried to sleep. The Rosinante sang him a lullaby of air recyclers and silence. Chapter 20 Miller Miller sat at an open cafe, the tunnel wide above him. Grass grew tall and pale in the public commons, and the ceiling glowed full-spectrum white. Ceres Station had come unmoored. Orbital mechanics and inertia kept it physically where it had always been, but the stories about it had changed. The point defenses were the same. The tensile strength of the port blast doors was the same. The ephemeral shield of political status was all they'd lost, and it was everything. Miller leaned forward and sipped his coffee. There were children playing on the commons. He thought of them as children, though he remembered thinking of himself as an adult at that age, fifteen, sixteen years old. They wore OPA armbands. The boys spoke in loud, angry voices about tyranny and freedom. The girls watched the boys strut. The ancient animal story, the same whether it was on a spinning rock surrounded by hard vacuum or the stamp-sized chimpanzee preserves on Earth. Even in the belt, youth brought invulnerability, immortality, the unshakable conviction that for you things would be different. The laws of physics would cut you a break. The missiles would never hit. The air would never hiss out into nothing. Maybe for other people the patched-together fighting ships of the OPA, the water haulers, the Martian gunships, the Scopuli, the Canterbury, the Doniger, the hundred other ships that had died in small actions since the system had turned itself into a battlefield. But not you. And when youth was lucky enough to survive its optimism, all Miller had left was a little fear, a little envy, and the overwhelming sense of life's fragility. But he had three months' worth of company script in his account, and a lot of free time, and the coffee wasn't bad. 
You need anything, sir? The waiter asked. He didn't look any older than the kids on the grass. Miller shook his head. Five days had passed since Star Helix pulled its contract. The governor of Ceres was gone, smuggled out on a transport before the news had gone wide. The Outer Planets Alliance had announced the inclusion of Ceres among official OPA-held real estate, and no one had said otherwise. Miller had spent the first day of his unemployment drunk, but his bender had an oddly pro forma feel. He descended into the bottle because it was familiar, because it was what you did when you'd lost the career that defined you. The second day, he'd gotten through the hangover. The third, he'd gotten bored. All through the station, security forces were making the kind of display he'd expected, preemptive peacekeeping. The few political rallies and protests ended fast and hard, and the citizens of Ceres didn't much care. Their eyes were on their monitors, on the war. A few locals with busted heads getting thrown into prison without charges were beneath notice, and Miller was personally responsible for none of it. The fourth day, he'd checked his terminal and discovered that eighty percent of his docking log requests had come through before Shadid had shut his access down. Over a thousand entries, any one of which could be the only remaining lead to Julie Mao. So far, no Martian nukes were on their way to crack Ceres. No demands of surrender. No boarding forces. It could all change in a moment. But until it did, Miller was drinking coffee and auditing ship's records about one every fifteen minutes. Miller figured that if Holden was the last ship in the log, he'd find him in about six weeks. The Adrianople, a third-gen prospector, had docked at Palace within the arrival window. Miller checked the open registration, frustrated again at how little information was there compared to the security databases. Owned by Strigo Anthony Abramowitz. Eight citations for substandard maintenance, banned from Eros and Ceres as a danger to the port. An idiot in an accident waiting to happen. But the flight plan seemed legitimate and the history of the ship was deep enough not to smell new minted. Miller deleted the entry. The badass motherfucker, a freight hauler doing a triangle between Luna, Ganymede, and the Belt, owned by MYOFB Corporation out of Luna. A query to the public bases at Ganymede showed it had left the port there at the listed time and just hadn't bothered to file a flight plan. Miller tapped the screen with a fingernail. Not exactly how he'd fly under the radar. Anyone with authority would rouse that ship just for the joy of doing it. He deleted the entry. His terminal chimed. An incoming message. Miller flipped over to it. One of the girls on the common shrieked and the others laughed. A sparrow flew past, its wings humming in the constant recycler-driven breeze. Havelock looked better than when he'd been on Ceres. Happier. The dark circles were gone from his eyes and the shape of his face had subtly softened, as if the need to prove himself in the belt had changed his bones and now he was falling back into his natural form. Miller, the recording said. I heard about Earth cutting series just before I got your message. Bad luck. I'm sorry to hear Shadid fired you. Between the two of us, she's a pompous idiot. The rumor I've heard is Earth is doing everything it can to stay out of the war including giving up any station that it's expecting to be a point of contention. You know how it is. You've got a pit bull on one side of you and a Rottweiler on the other. First thing you do is drop your stake. Miller chuckled. I've signed on with Protogen Security. Big company, private army bullshit. But the pay is worth putting up with their delusions of grandeur. The contract's supposed to be on Ganymede, but with the crap going on right now, who knows how it'll really play out. Turns out Protogen's got a training base in the belt. I'd never heard about it, but it's supposed to be quite the gymnasium. I know they're hiring on, and I'd be happy to put in a word for you. Just let me know, and I'll get you together with the induction recruiter. Get you off that damned rock. Havelock smiled. Take care of yourself, partner, the Earther said. Keep in touch. Protogen. Pinkwater. A la beak. Small corporate security forces that the big transorbital companies used as private armies and mercenary forces to rent out as needed. Anansek had the palace security contract and had for years, 
but it was Mars-based. The OPA was probably hiring, but probably not him. It had been years since he'd tried to find work. He'd assumed that particular struggle was behind him, that he was going to die working the series station security contract. Now that events had thrown him out, everything had an odd, floating feeling, like the gap between getting hit and feeling the pain. He needed to find another job. He needed to do more than send a couple messages out to his old partners. There were employment firms. There were bars on series that would hire an ex-cop for a bouncer. There were gray markets that would take anyone capable of giving them a veneer of legality. The last thing that made sense was to sit around, ogling girls in the park and chasing down leads on a case that he hadn't been meant to follow up on in the first place. The Dagon had come into series just a little ahead of the arrival window. Owned by the Glapian Collective, who were, he was pretty sure, an OPA front. That made it a good fit. Except the flight plan had been put in just a few hours after the Doniger blew, and the exit record from Io looked solid. Miller shifted it into a file he was keeping for ships that earned a second look. The Rosinante, owned by Silencieux Courant Holdings out of Luna, was a gas hauler that had landed at Tycho just hours before the end of the arrival window. Silencieux Courant was a medium-sized corporate entity with no obvious ties to the OPA, and the flight plan from Palace was plausible. Miller put his fingertip over the delete key, then paused. He sat back. Why was a gas hauler going between Palace and Tycho? Both stations were gas consumers. Flying from consumer to consumer without hitting a supply in the middle was a good way to not cover your docking fees. He put in a request for the flight plan that had taken the Rosinante to Palace from wherever it had been before, then sat back to wait. If the records were cached in the series servers, the request shouldn't take more than a minute or two. The notification bar estimated an hour and a half, so that meant the request was getting forwarded to the docking systems at Palace. It hadn't been in the local backup. Miller stroked his chin. Five days of stubble had almost reached the beginning of a beard. He felt a smile starting. He did a definition search on Rosinante, literally meaning no longer a workhorse. Its first entry was as the name of Don Quixote's horse. That you, Holden? Miller said to the screen. You out tilting at windmills? sir, the waiter said, but Miller waved him away. There were hundreds of entries still to be looked at, and dozens at least in his second look folder. Miller ignored them, staring at the entry from Tycho, as if by sheer force of will he could make more information appear on the screen. Then, slowly, he pulled up the message from Havelock, hit the respond key, and looked into the tiny black pinprick of the terminal's camera. Hey, partner he said. Thanks for the offer. I may take you up on it, but I've got some kinks I need to work out before I jump. You know how it is. If you can do me a favor, though, I need to keep track of a ship, and I've only got the public databases to work from. Plus which, Ceres may be at war with Mars by now. Who knows, you know? Anyway, if you can put a level one watch on any flight plans for her, drop me a note if anything comes up. I'd buy you a drink sometime. He paused. There had to be something more to say. Take care of yourself, partner. He reviewed the message. On screen, he looked tired, the smile a little fake, the voice a little higher than it sounded in his head. But it said what it needed to say. He sent it. This was what he'd been reduced to. Access gone, service gun confiscated, though he still had a couple of drops in his hole, Money running out. He had to play the angles, call in favors for things that should have been routine, outthink the system for any scrap. He'd been a cop, and they'd turned him into a mouse. Still, he thought, sitting back in the chair. Pretty good work for a mouse. The sound of detonation came from Spinward. Then voices raised in anger. The kids on the common stopped their games of touch me, touch you, and stared. Miller stood up. There was smoke, but he couldn't see flames. 
The breeze picked up as the station air cleaners raised the flow to suck away particulates so the sensors didn't think there was a risk of fanning a fire. Three gunshots rang out in fast succession, and the voices came together in a rough chant. Miller couldn't make words out of it, but the rhythm told him all he needed to know. Not a disaster, not a fire, not a breach. Just a riot. The kids were walking toward the commotion. Miller caught one by the elbow. She couldn't have been more than sixteen, her eyes near black, her face a perfect heart shape. Don't go over there, he said. Get your friends together and walk the other way. The girl looked at him, his hand on her arm, the distant commotion. You can't help, he said. She pulled her arm free. Got to try, yeah, she said. Podria intentar, you know. You could too, she thought. Just did, Miller said as he put his terminal in its case and walked away. Behind him, the sounds of the riot grew, but he figured the police could take care of it. Over the next fourteen hours, the system net reported five riots on the station, some minor structural damage. Someone he'd never heard of announced a tri-phase curfew. People out of their holes more than two hours before or after their work shifts would be subject to arrest. Whoever was running the show now thought they could lock down six million people and create stability and peace. He wondered what Shadid thought about that. Outside series, things were getting worse. The deep astronomy labs on Triton had been occupied by a band of prospectors sympathetic to the OPA. They'd turned the array in system, and had been broadcasting the location of every Martian ship in the system, along with high-definition images of the surface of Mars, down to the topless sunbathers in the dome parks. The story was that a volley of nukes was on its way to the station, and the array would be bright dust within a week. Earth's imitation of a snail was picking up the pace as Earth and Luna-based companies pulled back down the gravity well. Not all of them, not even half— but enough to send the Terran message, count us out. Mars appealed for solidarity. The belt appealed for justice, or, more often, told the birthplace of humanity to go fuck itself. It wasn't out of control yet, but it was ramping up. Another few incidents, and it wouldn't matter how it had started. It wouldn't matter what the stakes were. Mars knew the belt couldn't win, and the belt knew it had nothing to lose. It was a recipe for death on a scale humanity had never seen. And, like Ceres, there wasn't much Miller could do about that, either. But he could find James Holden, find out what had happened to the scopuli, follow the leads back to Julie Mao. He was a detective. It was what he did. As he packed up his hole, throwing out the collected detritus that grew over decades like a crust, he talked to her. He tried to explain why he'd given up everything to find her. After his discovery of the Rocinante, he could hardly avoid the word quixotic. His imaginary Julie laughed, or was touched. She thought he was a sad, pathetic little man, since just tracking her down was the nearest to a purpose in life he could find. She dressed him down as being a tool of her parents. She wept and put her arms around him. She sat with him in some almost unimaginable observation lounge and watched the stars. He fed everything he had into a shoulder bag. Two changes of clothes, his papers, his hand terminal. A picture of Candace from back in better days. All the hard copy of Julie's case he'd made before Shadid wiped his partition, including three pictures of Julie. He thought that everything he'd lived through should have added up to more and then changed his mind. It was probably about right. He spent one last day ignoring the curfew, making his rounds of the station, saying goodbye to the few people he felt he might miss, or might miss him. To his surprise, Muss, who he found at a tense and uncomfortable police bar, actually teared up and hugged him until his ribs ached from it. He booked passage on a transport to Tycho. His bunk ran him a quarter of his remaining funds. It occurred to him, not for the first time, that he had to find Julie pretty damn quick or find a job to support him through the investigation. But it hadn't happened yet, 
and the universe wasn't stable enough anymore to make long-range planning more than a sour joke. As if to prove the point, his terminal chimed as he was in the line to board the transport. Hey, partner, Havelock said. That favor you needed? I got a bite. Your package just put in a flight plan for Eros. I'm sending the public access data attached. I'd get you the good stuff, but these protogen guys are tight. I mentioned you to the recruiter, and she seemed interested. So let me know, right? Talk to you soon. Eros. Great. Miller nodded at the woman behind him, stepped out of line, and walked to the kiosk. By the time a screen was open, they were calling final boarding for the Tycho transport. Miller turned in his ticket, got a nominal refund, and spent a third of what he still had in his account for a ticket to Eros. Still, it could have been worse. He could have been on the way before he got word. He had to start thinking about it as good luck, not bad. The passage confirmation came through with a chime like a gently struck triangle. I hope I'm right about this, he said to Julie. If Holden's not there, I'm going to feel pretty stupid. In his mind, she smiled ruefully. Life is risk, she said. Chapter 21 Holden Ships were small. Space was always at a premium, and even on a monster like the Donager, the corridors and compartments were cramped and uncomfortable. On the Rosinante, the only rooms where Holden could spread out his arms without touching two walls were the galley and the cargo bay. No one who flew for a living was claustrophobic, but even the most hardened belt prospector could recognize the rising tension of being shipbound. It was the ancient stress response of the trapped animal, the subconscious knowledge that there was literally nowhere to go that you couldn't see from where you were already standing. Getting off the ship at port was a sudden and sometimes giddying release of tension. It often took the form of a drinking game. Like all professional sailors, Holden had sometimes ended long flights by drinking himself into a stupor. More than once, he'd wandered into a brothel and left only when they threw him out, with an emptied account, a sore groin, and a prostate as dry as the Sahara Desert. So when Amos staggered into his room after three days on station— Holden knew exactly what the big mechanic felt like. Holden and Alex were sharing the couch and watching a news feed. Two talking heads were discussing the Belter actions with words like criminal, terrorist, and sabotage. The Martians were peacekeepers. It was a Martian news channel. Amos snorted and collapsed on the couch. Holden muted the screen. Having a good shore leave, sailor? Holden asked with a grin. I'll never drink again, Amos groaned. Naomi's coming over with some chow she got at that sushi place, Alex said. Nice raw fish wrapped in fake seaweed. Amos groaned again. That's not nice, Alex, Holden said. Let the man's liver die in peace. The door to the suite slid open again, and Naomi came in carrying a tall stack of white boxes. Food's here, she said. Alex opened all the boxes and started handing around small disposable plates. Every time it's your turn to get food, you get salmon rolls. Shows a lack of imagination, Holden said as he began putting food on his plate. I like salmon, Naomi replied. The room got quiet as people ate. The only sounds were the clack of plastic chopsticks and the wet squish of things being dipped in wasabi and soy. When the food was gone... Holden wiped his eyes, made runny by the heat in his sinuses, and leaned his chair all the way back. Amos used one of his chopsticks to scratch under the cast on his leg. You guys did a pretty good job setting this, he said. It's the thing on my body that hurts the least right now. Naomi grabbed the remote off Holden's armrest and turned the volume back on. She began spooling through the different feeds. Alex closed his eyes and slid down on the love seat lacing his fingers across his belly and sighing contentedly. Holden felt a sudden and irrational annoyance at his crew for being so comfortable. Everyone had enough of sucking on Fred's teat yet? He said. I know I have. What the fuck are you talking about? Amos said, shaking his head. I'm just getting started. 
I mean, Holden said, how long are we going to hang around on Tycho, drinking and whoring and eating sushi on Fred's expense account? As long as I can, Alex said. You have a better plan, then? Naomi said. I don't have a plan, but I want to get back in the game. We were full of righteous anger and dreams of vengeance when we got here, and a couple of blowjobs and hangovers later, it's like nothing ever happened. Uh, vengeance kind of requires someone to avenge a pawn, Cap, Alex said. In case you ain't noticed, we're lacking in that department. That ship is still out there somewhere. The people who ordered it to shoot are, too, Holden said. So, Alex replied slowly, we take off and start flying in a spiral until we run into it? Naomi laughed and threw a soy packet at him. I don't know what we do, Holden said. But sitting here while the people who killed our ship keep doing whatever it is they're doing is making me nuts. We've been here three days, Naomi said. We deserve some comfortable beds and decent food and a chance to blow off steam. Don't try to make us feel bad for taking it. Besides, Fred said we'll get those bastards at the trial, Amos said. If there's a trial, Holden replied. If. It won't happen for months or maybe even years, and even then Fred's looking at those treaties. Amnesty might be another bargaining chip, right? You were quick enough to agree to his terms, Jim, Naomi said. Changed your mind? If Fred wants depositions in exchange for letting us patch up and rest, the price was cheap. That doesn't mean I think a trial will fix everything or that I want to be sidelined until it happens. He gestured at the faux leather couch and huge wall screen around them. Besides, this can be a prison. It's a nice one, but as long as Fred controls the purse strings, he owns us. Make no mistake. Naomi's brow crinkled. Her eyes grew serious. What's the option, sir? She asked. Leave? Holden folded his arms, his mind turning over everything he'd said as if he was hearing it for the first time. Saying things out loud actually made them clearer. I'm thinking we look for work, he said. We've got a good ship. More importantly, we have a sneaky ship. It's fast. We can run without a transponder if we need to. Lots of people need things moved from place to place with a war on. Gives us something to do while we wait for Fred's trial and a way to put money in our pockets so we can get off the dole. And as we fly from place to place, we can keep our ears and eyes open. Never know what we'll find. And seriously, how long can you three stand to be station rats? There was a moment's silence. I could station rat for another week, Amos said. It ain't a bad idea, Cap, Alex said with a nod. It's your decision, Captain, Naomi said. I'll stick with you, and I like the idea of getting my own money again. But I hope you're not in a hurry. I could really use a few more days off. Holden clapped his hands and jumped to his feet. Nope, he said. Having a plan makes all the difference. Downtime's easier to enjoy when I know it'll end. Alex and Amos got up together and headed for the door. Alex had won a few dollars playing darts, and now he and Amos were in the process of turning it into even more money at the card tables. Don't wait up, boss, Amos said to Naomi. I'm feeling lucky today. They left, and Holden went to the small kitchen nook to make coffee. Naomi followed him in. One other thing, she said. Holden tore open the sealed coffee packet, the strong odor filling the room. Chew, he said. Fred is taking care of all the arrangements for Kelly's body. He'll hold it here in state until we go public with our survival. Then he'll ship it back to Mars. Holden filled the coffee maker with water from the tap and started the machine. It made soft, gurgling sounds. Good. Lieutenant Kelly deserves all the respect and dignity we can give him. It got me thinking about that data cube he had. I haven't been able to hack it. It's some kind of military Uber encryption that makes my head hurt, so... Just say it, Holden said with a frown. I want to give it to Fred. I know it's a risk. We have no idea what's on it, and for all his charm and hospitality, Fred's still OPA. But he was also high-ranking UN military, and he's got a serious brain trust here on the station. He might be able to open it up. Holden thought for a moment, 
then nodded. Okay, let me sit with that. I want to know what Yao was trying to get off the ship, but... Yeah. They shared a companionable silence as the coffee brewed. When it was finished, Holden poured two mugs and handed one to Naomi. Captain, she said, then paused. Jim, I've been a pain in the ass XO so far. I've been stressed out and scared shitless about 80% of the time. You do an amazing job of hiding that fact, Holden replied. Naomi nodded the compliment away. Anyway, I've been pushy about some things that I probably shouldn't have been. Not a big deal. Okay, let me finish, she said. I want you to know I think you've done a great job of keeping us alive. You keep us focused on the problems we can solve instead of feeling sorry for ourselves. You keep everyone in orbit around you. Not everyone can do that. I couldn't do it. And we've needed that stability. Holden felt a glow of pride. He hadn't expected it, and he didn't trust it. But it felt good all the same. Thank you, Holden said. I can't speak for Amos and Alex, but I plan to stick it out. You're not just the captain because McDowell is dead. You're our captain, as far as I'm concerned. Just so you know. She looked down, blushing as if she'd just confessed something. Maybe she had. I'll try not to blow it, he said. I'd appreciate that, sir. Fred Johnson's office was like its occupant. Big, intimidating, and overflowing with things that needed to be done. The room was easily two and a half square meters, making it larger than any single compartment on the Rosinante. His desk was made of actual wood, looked at least a hundred years old, and smelled of lemon oil. Holden sat in a chair that was just a little lower than Fred's, and looked at the mounds of file folders and papers covering every flat surface. Fred had sent for him and then spent the first ten minutes after he'd arrived speaking on the phone. Whatever he was talking about, it sounded technical. Holden assumed it was related to the giant generation ship outside. It didn't bother him to be ignored for a few minutes, since the wall behind Fred was entirely covered by a bleedingly high-definition screen pretending to be a window. It was showing a spectacular view of the Nauvoo moving past as the station spun. Fred spoiled the scene by putting the phone down. Sorry about that, he said. The atmosphere processing system has been a nightmare from day one. When you're going a hundred plus years on only the air you can bring with you, the loss tolerances are stricter than usual. Sometimes it's difficult to impress the importance of fine details on the contractors. I was enjoying the view, Holden said, gesturing at the screen. I'm starting to wonder if we'll be able to get it done on schedule. Why? Fred sighed and leaned his chair back with a squeak. It's the war between Mars and the Belt. Material shortages, then? Not just that. Pirate casts claiming to speak for the OPA are working into a frenzy. Belt prospectors with homemade torpedo launchers are firing on Martian warships. They get wiped out in response, but every now and then one of those torpedoes hits and kills a few Martians. Which means Mars starts shooting first. Fred nodded, and then got up and started pacing the room. And then even honest citizens on legitimate business start getting worried about going out of the house, he said. We've had over a dozen late shipments so far this month, and I'm worried it will stop being delays and start being cancellations. You know, I've been thinking about the same thing, Holden said. Fred acted as though he hadn't heard. I've been on that bridge, Fred said. Unidentified ship coming on you, and a decision to make? No one wants to press the button. I've watched a ship get bigger and bigger on the scope while my finger was on the trigger. I remember begging them to stop. Holden said nothing. He'd seen it, too. There was nothing to say. Fred let silence hang in the air for a moment, then shook his head and straightened up. I need to ask you a favor, Fred said. You can always ask, Fred. You've paid for that much, Holden replied. I need to borrow your ship. The Rossi? Holden said. Why? I need to have something picked up and delivered here, and I need a ship that can stay quiet and run past Martian picket ships if it needs to. 
The Rosinante is definitely the right ship, then, but that didn't answer my question. Why? Fred turned his back to Holden and looked at the view screen. The nose of the Nauvoo was just vanishing from sight. The view turned to the flat, star-speckled black of forever. I need to pick someone up on Eros, he said. Someone important. I've got people who can do it, but the only ships we've got are light freighters and a couple of small shuttles. Nothing that can make the trip quickly enough or have a hope of running away if trouble starts. Does this person have a name? I mean, you keep saying you don't want to fight, but the other unique thing about my ship is that it's the only one here with guns. I'm sure the OPA has a whole list of things they'd like blown up. You don't trust me? Nope. Fred turned back around and gripped the back of his chair. His knuckles were white. Holden wondered if he'd gone too far. Look, Holden said, you talk a good game about peace and trials and all that. You disavow the pirate castes. You have a nice station filled with nice people. I have every reason to believe you are what you say you are. But we've been here three days, and the first time you tell me about your plans, you ask to borrow my ship for a secret mission. Sorry. If I'm part of this, I get full access. No secrets. Even if I knew for a fact, which I don't, that you had nothing but good intentions, I still wouldn't go along with the cloak and dagger bullshit. Fred stared at him for a few seconds then came around his chair and sat down. Holden found he was tapping his fingers on his thigh nervously and forced himself to stop. Fred's eyes flicked down at Holden's hand and then back up. He continued to stare. Holden cleared his throat. Look, you're the big dog here. Even if I didn't know who you used to be, you'd scare the shit out of me. So don't feel the need to prove it. But no matter how scared I am, I'm not backing down on this. Fred's hoped-for laughter didn't come. Holden tried to swallow without gulping. I bet every captain you ever flew under thought you were a gigantic pain in the ass, Fred said finally. I believe my record reflects that, Holden said, trying to hide his relief. I need to fly to Eros and find a man named Lionel Polanski, and then bring him back to Tycho. That's only a week out if we push, Holden said, doing the math in his head. The fact that Lionel doesn't actually exist complicates the mission. Yeah, okay, now I'm confused, Holden agreed. You want it in? Fred said, the words taking on a quiet ferocity. Now you're in. Lionel Polanski exists only on paper and owns things that Mr. Tycho doesn't want to own, including a courier ship called the Scopuli. Holden leaned forward in his chair his face intense. You now have my undivided attention, he said. The non-existent owner of the Scopuli checked into a flop house on one of the shit levels of Eros. We only just got the message. We have to work on the assumption that whoever got the room knows our operations intimately, needs help, and can't ask for it openly. We can leave in an hour, Holden said breathlessly. Fred held up his hands in a gesture that was surprisingly belter for an Earthman. When, Fred asked, did this turn into you leaving? I won't loan my ship, but I'll definitely rent it out. My crew and I were talking about getting jobs, actually. Hire us. Deduct whatever's fair for services you've already rendered. No, Fred said. I need you. You don't, Holden replied. You need our depositions. And we're not going to sit here waiting a year or two for sanity to reign. We'll all do video depositions, sign whatever affidavits you want us to as to their authenticity, but we're leaving to find work one way or the other. You might as well make use of it. No, Fred said. You're too valuable to take risks with your lives. What if I throw in the data cube the captain of the Donager was trying to liberate? The silence was back, but it had a different feel to it. Look, Holden said, pressing on, you need a ship like the Rossi. I've got one. You need a crew for her. I've got that, too. And you're as hungry to know what's on that cube as I am. I don't like the risk. Your other option is to throw us in the brig and commandeer the ship. There's some risks in that, too. Fred laughed. Holden felt himself relax. You'll still have the same problem that brought you here, Fred said. 
Your ship looks like a gunship, no matter what its transponder is saying. Holden jumped up and grabbed a piece of paper from Fred's desk. He started writing on it with a pen snatched from a decorative pen set. I've been thinking about that. You've got full manufacturing facilities here, and we're supposed to be a light gas freighter. So, he said as he sketched a rough outline of the ship, we weld on a bunch of empty compressed gas storage tanks in two bands around the hull. Use them to hide the tubes. Repaint the whole thing. Weld on a few projections to break up the hull profile and hide us from ship recognition software. It'll look like shit and screw up the aerodynamics, but we won't be near Atmo anytime soon. It'll look exactly like what it is, something a bunch of belters slap together in a hurry. He handed the paper to Fred. Fred began laughing in earnest, either at the terrible drawing or at the absurdity of the whole thing. You could give a pirate a hell of a surprise, he said. If I do this, you and your crew will record my depositions and hire on as an independent contractor for errands like the Eros run and appear on my behalf when the peace negotiations start. Yes. I want the right to outbid anyone else who tries to hire you. No contracts without my counteroffer. Holden held out his hand, and Fred shook it. Nice doing business with you, Fred. As Holden left the office, Fred was already on the comm with his machine shop people. Holden pulled out his portable terminal and called up Naomi. Yeah, she said. Pack up the kids. We're going to Eros. Chapter 22 Miller The people mover to Eros was small, cheap, and overcrowded. The air recyclers had the plastic and resin smell of long-life industrial models that Miller associated with warehouses and fuel depots. The lights were cheap LEDs, tinted a false pink that was supposed to flatter the complexion, but instead made everyone look like undercooked beef. There were no cabins. Only row after row of formed laminate seating and two long walls with five stacks of bunks that the passengers could hot swap. Miller had never been on a cheap jack transport before, but he knew how they worked. If there was a fight, the ship's crew would pump riot gas into the cabin, knock everyone out, and put anyone who'd been in the scuffle under restraint. It was a draconian system, but it did tend to keep passengers polite. The bar was always open, and drinks were cheap. Not long ago, Miller would have found that enticing. Instead, he sat on one of the long seats, his hand terminal open. Julie's case file, what he had reconstructed of it, glowed before him. The picture of her, proud and smiling in front of the Razorback, the dates and records, her jiu-jitsu training. It seemed like very little, considering how large the woman had grown in his life. A small news feed crawled down the terminal's left side. The war between Mars and the Belt escalated, incident after incident, but the secession of Ceres Station was the top news. Earth was taken to task by Martian commentators for failing to stand united with its fellow inner planet, or at least for not handing over the Ceres security contract to Mars. The scattershot reaction of the Belt ran the gamut from pleasure at seeing Earth's influence fall back down the gravity well to strident near panic at the loss of Ceres's neutrality, to conspiracy theories that Earth was fomenting the war for its own ends. Miller reserved judgment. I always think of pews. Miller looked over. The man sitting next to him was about Miller's age, the fringe of gray hair, the soft belly. The man's smile told Miller the guy was a missionary, out in the vacuum saving souls. Or maybe it was the name tag and Bible. The seats, I mean, the missionary said. They always make me think of going to church, the way they're all lined up row after row. Only instead of a pulpit, we have bunk beds. Our Lady of Sleeping Through It, Miller said, knowing he was getting drawn into conversation but unable to stop himself. The missionary laughed. Something like that, he said. Do you attend church? Haven't in years, Miller said. I was a Methodist when I was anything. What flavor are you selling? The missionary lifted his hands in a gesture of harmlessness that went back to the African plains of the Pleistocene. I have no weapon, 
I seek no fight. I'm just going back to Eros from a conference on Luna, he said. My proselytizing days are long behind me. I didn't think those ever ended, Miller said. They don't, not officially. But after a few decades, you come to a place where you realize that there's really no difference between trying and not trying. I still travel. I still talk to people. Sometimes we talk about Jesus Christ. Sometimes we talk about cooking. If someone is ready to accept Christ, it doesn't take much effort on my part to help them. If they aren't, no amount of hectoring them does any good. So why try? Do people talk about the war? Miller asked. Often, the missionary said. Anyone make sense of it? No, I don't believe war ever does. It's a madness that's in our nature. Sometimes it recurs, sometimes it subsides. Sounds like a disease. The herpes simplex of the species? The missionary said with a laugh. I suppose there are worse ways to think of it. I'm afraid that as long as we're human, it will be with us. Miller looked over at the wide, moon-round face. As long as we're human, he said. Some of us believe that we shall all eventually become angels, the missionary said. Not the Methodists. Even them, eventually, the man said. But they probably won't go first. And what brings you to Our Lady of sleeping through it? Miller sighed, sitting back against the unyielding chair. Two rows down, a young woman shouted at two boys to stop jumping on the seats and was ignored. A man behind them coughed. Miller took a long breath and let it out slowly. I was a cop on Ceres, he said. Ah, the change of contract. That, Miller said. Taking up work on Eros, then? More looking up an old friend, Miller said. Then, to his own surprise, he went on. I was born on Ceres. Lived there my whole life. This is the fifth? Yeah, fifth time I've been off station. Do you plan to go back? No, Miller said. He sounded more certain than he'd known. No, I think that part of my life is pretty much over. That must be painful, the missionary said. Miller paused, letting the comments settle. The man was right. It should have been painful. Everything he'd ever had was gone. His job, his community. He wasn't even a cop anymore, his checked-in luggage handgun notwithstanding. He would never eat at the little East Indian cart at the edge of Sector 9 again. The receptionist at the station would never nod her greeting to him as he headed in for his desk again. No more nights at the bar with the other cops. No more off-color stories about busts gone weird. No more kids flying kites in the high tunnels. He probed himself like a doctor, searching for inflammation. Did it hurt here? Did he feel the loss there? He didn't. There was only a sense of relief so profound it approached giddiness. I'm sorry, the missionary said, confused. Did I say something funny? Eros supported a population of one and a half million, a little more than Ceres had in visitors at any given time. Roughly the shape of a potato, it had been much more difficult to spin up, and its surface velocity was considerably higher than Ceres's, for the same internal G. The old shipyards protruded from the asteroid, Great spider webs of steel and carbon mesh studded with warning lights and sensor arrays to wave off any ships that might come in too tight. The internal caverns of Eros had been the birthplace of the belt. From raw ore to smelting furnace to annealing platform, and then into the spines of water haulers and gas harvesters and prospecting ships. Eros had been a port of call in the first generation of humanity's expansion. From there... The sun itself was only a bright star among billions. The economics of the belt had moved on. Ceres Station had spun up with newer docks, more industrial backing, more people. The commerce of shipping moved to Ceres, while Eros remained a center of ship manufacture and repair. The results were as predictable as physics. On Ceres, a longer time in dock meant lost money, and the berth fee structure reflected that. On Eros, a ship might wait for weeks or months without impeding the flow of traffic. If a crew wanted a place to relax, to stretch, to get away from one another for a while, 
Eros was the port of call. And with the lower docking fees, Eros Station found other ways to soak money from its visitors. Casinos, brothels, shooting galleries. Vice in all its commercial forms found a home in Eros, its local economy blooming like a fungus fed by the desires of belters. A happy accident of orbital mechanics put Miller there half a day ahead of the Rosinante. He walked through the cheap casinos, the opioid bars and sex clubs, the show-fight areas where men or women pretended to beat one another senseless for the pleasure of the crowds. Miller imagined Julie walking with him, her sly smile matching his own as he read the great animated displays. Randolph Mack holder of the belt free fight championship for six years against Martian Kivrin Carmichael in a fight to the death. Surely not fixed, Julie said dryly in his mind. Wonder which one's going to win, he thought, and imagined her laughing. He'd stopped at a noodle cart, two new yen's worth of egg noodles and black sauce steaming in their cone, when a hand clapped on his shoulder. Detective Miller, a familiar voice said. I think you're outside your jurisdiction. Why, Inspector Semitimba, Miller said, as I live and breathe. You'd give a girl the shakes sneaking up like that. Semitimba laughed. He was a tall man, even among belters, with the darkest skin Miller had ever seen. Years before, Semitimba and Miller had coordinated on a particularly ugly case. A smuggler with a cargo of designer euphorics had broken with his supplier. Three people on Ceres had been caught in the crossfire, and the smuggler had shipped out for Eros. The traditional competitiveness and insularity of the station's respective security forces had almost let the perp slip away. Only Miller and Semitimba had been willing to coordinate outside the corporate channels. What brings you? Semitimba said, leaning against a thin steel railing and gesturing at the tunnel, to the navel of the belt, the glory and power that is Eros. Following up on a lead, Miller said. There's nothing good here, Semitimba said. Ever since Protogen pulled out, things have been going from bad to worse. Miller sucked up a noodle. Who's the new contract? he asked. CPM, Semitimba said. Never heard of them. Carne pa la máquina, Semitimba said, and pulled a face. Exaggerated bluff masculinity. He thumped his breast and growled and then let the imitation go and shook his head. New corporation out of Luna. Mostly belters on the ground. Make themselves out to be all hardcore, but they're mostly amateurs. All bluster, no balls. Protogen was inner planets, and that was a problem, but they were serious as hell. They broke heads, but they kept the peace. These new assholes? Most corrupt bunch of thugs I've ever worked for. I don't think the Board of Governors is going to renew when the contract's up. I didn't say that, but it's true. I've got an old partner signed up with Protogen, Miller said. They're not bad, Semitimba said. Almost wish I picked them in the divorce, you know. Why didn't you? Miller asked. You know how it is. I'm from here. Yeah, Miller said. So, you didn't know who was running the playhouse? You aren't here looking for work? Nope, Miller said. I'm on sabbatical doing some travel for myself these days. You've got money for that? Not really, but I don't mind going on the cheap. For a while, you know. You heard anything about a Juliet Mao? Goes by Julie? Semitimber shook his head. Mao Kukowski Mercantile, Miller said. Came up the well and went native. OPA. It was an abduction case. Was? Miller leaned back. His imagined Julie raised her eyebrows. It's changed a little since I got it, Miller said. Maybe connected to something. Kind of big. How big are we talking about? Semitimba said. All trace of jocularity had vanished from his expression. He was all cop now. Anyone but Miller would have found the man's empty, almost angry face intimidating. The war, Miller said. Semitimba folded his arms. Bad joke, he said. Not joking. I consider us friends, old man, Semitimba said. But I don't want any trouble around here. Things are unsettled as it stands. 
I'll try to stay low profile. Sematimba nodded. Down the tunnel, an alarm blared. Only security, not the ear-splitting ditone of an environmental alert. Sematimba looked down the tunnel as if squinting would let him see through the press of people, bicycles, and food carts. I'd better go look, he said with an air of resignation. Probably some of my fellow officers of the peace breaking windows for the fun of it. Great to be part of a team like that, Miller said. How would you know? Sematimba said with a smile. If you need something, likewise, Miller said, and watched the cop wade into the sea of chaos and humanity. He was a large man, but something about the passing crowd's universal deafness to the alarm's blare made him seem smaller. A stone in the ocean, the phrase went. One star among millions. Miller checked the time, then pulled up the public docking records. The Rocinante showed as on schedule. The docking berth was listed. Miller sucked down the last of his noodles, tossed the foam cone with a thin smear of black sauce into a public recycler, found the nearest men's room, and, when he was done there, trotted toward the casino level. The architecture of Eros had changed since its birth. Where once it had been like Ceres, webwork tunnels leading along the path of widest connection, Eros had learned from the flow of money. All paths led to the casino level. If you wanted to go anywhere, you passed through the wide whale belly of lights and displays. Poker, blackjack, roulette, tall fish tanks filled with prized trout to be caught and gutted, mechanical slots, electronic slots, cricket races, craps, rig tests of skill. Flashing lights, dancing neon clowns, and video screen advertisements blasted the eyes. Loud artificial laughter and merry whistles and bells assured you that you were having the time of your life. All while the smell of thousands of people packed into too small a space competed with the scent of heavily spiced vat-grown meat being hawked from carts rolling down the corridor. Greed and casino design had turned Eros into an architectural cattle run which was exactly what Miller needed. The tube station that arrived from the port had six wide doors which emptied to the casino floor. Miller accepted a drink from a tired-looking woman in a G-string and bared breasts and found a screen to stand at that afforded him a view of all six doors. The crew of the Rocinante had no choice but to come through one of those. He checked his hand terminal. The docking log showed the ship had arrived ten minutes earlier. Miller pretended to sip his drink and settled in to wait. Chapter 23 Holden The casino level of Eros was an all-out assault on the senses. Holden hated it. I love this place, Amos said, grinning. Holden pushed his way through a knot of drunk middle-aged gamblers who were laughing and yelling to a small open space near a row of pay-by-the-minute wall terminals. Amos, he said, we'll be going to a less touristy level, so watch our backs. The flophouse we're looking for is in a rough neighborhood. Amos nodded. Gotcha, Cap. While Naomi, Alex, and Amos blocked him from view, Holden reached behind his back to adjust the pistol that pulled uncomfortably on his waistband. The cops on Eros were pretty uptight about people walking around with guns, but there was no way he was going to Lionel Polanski unarmed. Amos and Alex were both carrying, too, though Amos kept his in the right pocket of his jacket, and his hand never left it. Only Naomi flatly refused to carry a gun. Holden led the group toward the nearest escalators, with Amos casting the occasional glance behind in the rear. The casinos of Eros stretched for three seemingly endless levels, and even though they moved as quickly as possible, it took half an hour to get away from the noise and crowds. The first level above was a residential neighborhood and disorientingly quiet and neat after the casino's chaos and noise. Holden sat down on the edge of a planter with a nice array of ferns in it and caught his breath. I'm with you, Captain. Five minutes in that place gives me a headache. Naomi said and sat down next to him. You kidding me? Amos said. I wish we had more time. 
Alex and I took almost a grand off those fish at the Tycho card tables. We'd probably walk out of here fucking millionaires. You know it, Alex said and punched the big mechanic on the shoulder. Well, if this Polanski thing turns out to be nothing, you have my permission to go make us a million dollars at the card tables. I'll wait for you on the ship, Holden said. The tube system ended at the first casino level, and didn't start again until the level they were on. You could choose not to spend your money at the tables, but they made sure you were punished for doing so. Once the crew had climbed into a car and started the ride to Lionel's hotel, Amos sat down next to Holden. Somebody's following us, Cap, he said conversationally. Wasn't sure till he climbed on a couple of cars down. Behind us all through the casinos, too. Holden sighed and put his face in his hands. Okay, what's he look like, he said. Belter, fifties or maybe forties with a lot of mileage. White shirt and dark pants, goofy hat. Cop? Oh, yeah. But no holster I can see, Amos said. All right, keep an eye on him, but no need to get too worried. Nothing we're doing here is illegal, Holden said. You mean other than arriving in our stolen Martian warship, sir? Naomi asked. You mean our perfectly legitimate gas freighter that all the paperwork and registry data says is perfectly legitimate? Holden replied with a thin smile. Yeah, well, if they'd seen through that, they would have stopped us at the dock, not followed us around. An advertising screen on the wall displayed a stunning view of multicolored clouds rippling with flashes of lightning, and encouraged Holden to take a trip to the amazing dome resorts on Titan. He'd never been to Titan. Suddenly he wanted to go there very much. A few weeks of sleeping late, eating in fine restaurants, and lying on a hammock, watching Titan's colorful atmosphere storm above him sounded like heaven. Hell, as long as he was fantasizing... He threw in Naomi walking over to his hammock with a couple of fruity-looking drinks in her hands. She ruined it by talking. This is our stop, she said. Amos, watch our friend, see if he gets off the train with us, Holden said as he got up and headed to the door. After they got off and walked a dozen steps down the corridor, Amos whispered, Yep, at his back. Shit. Well, definitely a tale but there wasn't really any reason not to go ahead and check up on Lionel. Fred hadn't asked them to do anything with whoever was pretending to be the Scopuli's owner. They couldn't very well be arrested for knocking on a door. Holden whistled a loud and jaunty tune as he walked, to let his crew and whoever was following them know he wasn't worried about a thing. He stopped when he saw the flophouse. It was dark and dingy, and exactly the sort of place where people got mugged or worse. Broken lights created dark corners, and there wasn't a tourist in sight. He turned to give Alex and Amos meaningful looks, and Amos shifted his hand in his pocket. Alex reached under his coat. The lobby was mostly empty space, with a pair of couches at one end next to a table covered with magazines. A sleepy-looking older woman sat reading one. Elevators were recessed into the wall at the far end, next to a door marked stairs. In the middle was the check-in desk, where, in lieu of a human clerk, a touch-screen terminal let guests pay for their rooms. Holden stopped next to the desk and turned around to look at the woman sitting on the couch. Graying hair, but good features and an athletic build. In a flophouse like this, that probably meant a prostitute reaching the end of her shelf life. She pointedly ignored his stare. Is our tale still with us? Holden asked in a quiet voice. Stopped outside somewhere. Probably just watching the door now, Amos replied. Holden nodded and hit the inquiry button on the check-in screen. A simple menu would let him send a message to Lionel Polanski's room, but Holden exited the system. They knew Lionel was still checked in, and Fred had given them the room number. If it was someone playing games, no reason to give him a heads up before Holden knocked on the door. Okay, he's still here, so let's... Holden said, and then stopped when he saw the woman from the couch standing right behind Alex. He hadn't heard or seen her approach. You need to come with me, she said in a hard voice. Walk to the stairwell slowly, stay at least three meters ahead of me the entire time. Do it now. Are you a cop? Holden asked, not moving. I'm the person with the gun, she said, 
a small weapon appearing like magic in her right hand. She pointed it at Alex's head. So do what I say. Her weapon was small and plastic and had some kind of battery pack. Amos pulled his heavy slug thrower out and aimed it at her face. Mine's bigger, he said. Amos, don't, was all Naomi had time to say before the stairwell door burst open and half a dozen men and women armed with compact automatic weapons came into the room, yelling at them to drop their guns. Holden started to put his hands up when one of them opened fire the weapon coughing out rounds so fast it sounded like someone ripping construction paper. It was impossible to hear separate shots. Amos threw himself to the floor. A line of bullet holes stitched across the chest of the woman with the taser, and she fell backward with a soft, final sound. Holden grabbed Naomi by one hand and dragged her behind the check-in desk. Someone in the other group was yelling, Cease fire! Cease fire! But Amos was already shooting back from his position prone on the floor. A yelp of pain and a curse told Holden he'd probably hit someone. Amos rolled sideways to the desk, just in time to avoid a hail of slugs that tore up the floor and wall and made the desk shudder. Holden reached for his gun, but the front sight caught in his waistband. He yanked it out, tearing his underwear, then crawled on his knees to the edge of the desk and looked out. Alex was lying on the floor on the other side of one of the couches, gun drawn and face white. As Holden looked... A burst of gunfire hit the couch, blowing stuffing into the air and making a line of holes in the back of the couch not more than twenty centimeters above Alex's head. The pilot reached his pistol around the corner of the couch and blindly fired off half a dozen shots, yelling at the same time. Fucking assholes, Amos yelled, then rolled out and fired a couple more shots and rolled back before the return fire started. Where are they? Holden yelled at him. Two are down, the rest in the stairwell. Amos yelled back over the sound of return fire. Out of nowhere, a burst of rounds bounced off the floor past Holden's knee. Shit, someone's flanking us, Amos cried out, then moved farther behind the desk and away from the shots. Holden crawled to the other side of the desk and peeked out. Someone was moving low and fast toward the hotel entrance. Holden leaned out and took a couple shots at him but three guns opened up in the stairwell doorway and forced him back behind the desk. Alex, someone's moving to the entrance, Holden screamed at the top of his lungs, hoping the pilot might be able to get off a shot before they were all chopped to pieces by crossfire. A pistol barked three times by the entrance. Holden risked a look. Their tail with the goofy hat crouched by the door, a gun in his hand, the machine gun toting flanker lying still at his feet. Instead of looking at them, the tail was pointing his gun toward the stairwell. No one shoot the guy with a hat, Holden yelled, then moved back to the edge of the desk. Amos put his back to the desk and popped the magazine from his gun. As he fumbled around in his pocket for another, he said, Guy's probably a cop. Extra especially do not shoot any cops, Holden said, then fired a few shots at the stairwell door. Naomi, who'd spent the entire gunfight so far on the floor with her arms over her head, said, They might all be cops. Holden squeezed off a few more shots and shook his head. Cops don't carry small, easily concealable machine guns and ambush people from stairwells. We call those death squads, he said, though most of his words were drowned out by a barrage of gunfire from the stairwell. Afterward came a few seconds of silence. Holden leaned back out in time to see the door swing shut. I think they're bugging out, he said, keeping his gun trained on the door anyway. Must have another exit somewhere. Amos, keep your eye on that door. If it opens, start shooting. He patted Naomi on the shoulder. Stay down. Holden rose from behind the now ruined check-in kiosk. The desk facade had splintered and the underlying stone showed through. Holden held his gun barrel up, his hands open. The man in the hat stood, considering the corpse at his feet, then looked up as Holden came near. Thanks. My name is Jim Holden. You are... The man didn't speak for a second. When he did, his voice was calm, almost weary. Cops will be here soon. I need to make a call or we're all going to jail. Aren't you the cops? Holden asked. The other man laughed. 
It was a bitter, short sound, but with some real humor behind it. Apparently, Holden had said something funny. Nope. Name's Miller. Chapter 24 Miller Miller looked at the dead man, the man he just killed, and tried to feel something. There was the trailing adrenaline rush still ramping up his heartbeat. There was a sense of surprise that came from walking into an unexpected firefight. Past that, though, his mind had already fallen into the long habit of analysis. One plant in the main room so Holden and his crew wouldn't see anything too threatening. A bunch of trigger-happy yahoos in the stairwell to back her up. That had gone well. It was a slapdash effort. The ambush had been set by people who either didn't know what they were doing or didn't have the time or resources to do it right. If it hadn't been improvised, Holden and his three buddies would have been taken or killed and him along with them. The four survivors of the Canterbury stood in the remains of the firefight like rookies at their first bust. Miller felt his mind shift back half a step as he watched everything without watching anything in particular. Holden was smaller than he'd expected from the video feeds. It shouldn't have been surprising. He was an earther. The man had the kind of face that was bad at hiding things. Thanks. My name is Jim Holden. You are? Miller thought of six different answers and turned them all aside. One of the others, a big man, solid with a bare scalp, was pacing out the room, his eyes unfocused the same way Miller's were. Of Holden's four, that was the only guy who'd seen serious gunplay before. Cops will be here soon, Miller said. I need to make a call or we're all going to jail. The other man, thinner, taller, East Indian by the look of him, had been hiding behind a couch. He was sitting on his haunches now, his eyes wide and panicky. Holden had some of the same look, but he was doing a better job of keeping control. The burdens, Miller thought, of leadership. Aren't you the cops? Miller laughed. Nope, he said. Name's Miller. Okay, the woman said. Those people just tried to kill us. Why do they do that? Holden took a half-step toward her voice even before he turned to look at her. Her face was flushed, full lips pressed thin and pale. Her features showed a far-flung racial mix that was unusual even in the melting pot of the belt. Her hands weren't shaking. The big one had the most experience, but Miller put the woman down as having the best instincts. Yeah, Miller said. I noticed. He pulled out his hand terminal and opened a link to Semitimba. The cop accepted a few seconds later. Semi, Miller said. I'm really sorry about this, but you know how I was going to stay low profile? Yes, the local cop said, drawing the word out to three syllables. Didn't work out. I was heading to a meeting with a friend. A meeting with a friend, Semitimba echoed. Miller could imagine the man's crossed arms even though they didn't show in the frame. And I happened to see a bunch of tourists in the wrong place at the wrong time. It got out of hand. Where are you? Semitimba asked. Miller gave him the station level and address. There was a long pause while Semitimba consulted with some internal communication software that would have been part of Miller's toolset once. The man's sigh was percussive. I don't see anything. Were their shots fired? Miller looked at the chaos and ruin around them. About a thousand different alerts should have gone out with the first weapon fired. Security should have been swarming toward them. A few, he said. Strange, Semitimba said. Stay put, I'll be there. Will do, Miller said, and dropped the connection. Okay, Holden said. Who was that? The real cops, Miller said. They'll be here soon. It'll be fine. I think it'll be fine, he thought. It occurred to him that he was treating the situation like he was still on the inside, a part of the machine. That wasn't true anymore, and pretending it was might have consequences. He was following us, the woman said to Holden, and then to Miller she said, You were following us. I was, Miller said. 
He didn't think he sounded rueful, but the big guy shook his head. It was the hat, the big one said. Stood out some. Miller swept off his pork pie and considered it. Of course, the big one had been the one to make him. The other three were competent amateurs, and Miller knew that Holden had done some time in the UN Navy. But Miller gave it better than even money that the big one's background check would be interesting reading. Why were you following us? Holden asked. I mean, I appreciate the part where you shot the people who were shooting at us, but I'd still like to know that first part. I wanted to talk to you, Miller said. I'm looking for someone. There was a pause. Holden smiled. Anyone in particular? He asked. A crew member of the Scopuli, Miller said. The Scopuli? Holden said. He started to glance at the woman and stopped himself. There was something there. The scopuli meant something to him beyond what Miller had seen on the news. There was nobody on her when we got there, the woman said. Holy shit, the shaky one behind the couch said. It was the first thing he'd said since the firefight ended, and he repeated it five or six more times in quick succession. What about you? Miller asked. Donager blew you to Tycho, and now here. What's that about? How did you know that? Holden said. It's my job, Miller said. Well, it used to be. The answer didn't appear to satisfy the earther. The big guy had fallen in behind Holden, his face a friendly cipher. No trouble unless there was trouble, and then maybe a whole lot of trouble. Miller nodded, half to the big guy, half to himself. I had a contact in the OPA who told me you didn't die on the Donager, Miller said. They just told you that? The woman asked, banked outrage in her voice. He was making a point at the time, Miller said. Anyway, he said it, and I took it from there. And in about ten minutes, I'm going to make sure Eero's security doesn't throw all of you in a hole, and me with you. So, if there's anything at all you want to tell me, like what you're doing here, for instance, this would be the right time. The silence was broken only by the sound of recyclers laboring to clear the smoke and particulate dust of gunfire. The shaky one stood. Something about the way he held himself looked military. X something, Miller assumed, but not a ground pounder. Navy, maybe. Martian, at a guess. He had the vocal twang some of them affected. Ah, oh, fuck it, Captain, the big one said. He shot the flank guy for us. He may be an asshole, but he's okay by me. Thank you, Amos, Holden said. Miller filed that. The big one was Amos. Holden put his hands behind his back, returning his gun to his waistband. We're here to look for someone, too, he said. Probably someone from the Scopuli. We were just double-checking the room when everyone decided to start shooting at us. Here, Miller said. Something like emotion trickled into his veins. Not hope but dread. Someone off the scopuli is in this flop right now? We think so, Holden said. Miller looked out the flophouse lobby's front doors. A small, curious crowd had started to gather in the tunnel. Crossed arms, nervous glances. He knew how they felt. Sematimba and his police were on the way. The gunmen who'd attacked Holden and his crew weren't mounting another attack, but that didn't mean they were gone. There might be another wave. They could have fallen back to a better position to wait for Holden to advance. But what if Julie was here right now? How could he come this far and stop in the lobby? To his surprise, he still had his gun drawn. That was unprofessional. He should have holstered it. The only other one still drawn was the Martians. Miller shook his head. Sloppy. He needed to stop that. Still... He had more than half a magazine left in the pistol. What room? he asked. The flophouse corridors were thin and cramped. The walls had the impervious gloss of warehouse paint, and the carpet was carbon silicate weave that would wear out more slowly than bare stone. Miller and Holden went first, then the woman and the Martian. Naomi and Alex, their names were. Then Amos, trailing and looking back over his shoulder. Miller wondered if anyone but he and Amos understood how they were keeping the others safe. 
Holden seemed to know and be irritated by it. He kept edging ahead. The doors of the rooms were identical fiberglass laminates, thin enough to be churned out by the thousands. Miller had kicked in a hundred like them in his career. A few here and there were decorated by long-time residents, with a painting of improbably red flowers, a whiteboard with a string where a pen had once been attached, a cheap reproduction of an obscene cartoon acting out its punchline in a dimly glowing infinite loop. Tactically, it was a nightmare. If the ambushing forces stepped out of the doors in front of and behind them, all five could be slaughtered in seconds. But no slugs flew, and the only door that opened disgorged an emaciated, long-bearded man with imperfect eyes and a slack mouth. Miller nodded at the man as they passed, and he nodded back, possibly more surprised by someone's acknowledging his presence than by the drawn pistols. Holden stopped. This is it, he murmured. This is the room. Miller nodded. The others came up in a clump, Amos casually hanging back, his eyes on the corridor retreating behind them. Miller considered the door. It would be easy to kick in. One strong blow just above the latch mechanism. Then he could go in low and to the left, Amos high and to the right. He wished Havelock were there. Tactics were simpler for people who trained together. He motioned Amos to come up close. Holden knocked on the door. What are you? Miller whispered fiercely, but Holden ignored him. Hello? Holden called. Anyone there? Miller tensed. Nothing happened. No voice, no gunfire. Nothing. Holden seemed perfectly at ease with the risk he'd just taken. From the expression on Naomi's face, Miller took it this wasn't the first time he'd done things this way. You want that open? Amos said. Kinda do, Miller said at the same moment Holden said, Yeah, kick it down. Amos looked from one to the other, not moving until Holden nodded at him. Then Amos shifted past them, kicked the door open in one blow, and staggered back, cussing. You okay? Miller asked. The big man nodded once through a pale grimace. Yeah, busted my leg a while back. Cast just came off. Keep forgetting about that, he said. Miller turned back to the room. Inside, it was as black as a cave. No lights came on not even the dim glow of monitors and sensory devices. Miller stepped in, pistol drawn. Holden was close behind him. The floor made the crunching sound of gravel under their feet, and there was an odd astringent smell that Miller associated with broken screens. Behind it was another smell, much less pleasant. He chose not to think about that one. Hello? Miller said. Anyone here? Turn on the lights, Naomi said from behind them. Miller heard Holden patting the wall panel, but no light came up. They're not working, Holden said. The dim spill from the corridor gave almost nothing. Miller kept his gun steady in his right hand, ready to empty it toward muzzle flash if anyone opened fire from the darkness. With his left, he took out his hand terminal, thumbed on the backlight, and opened a blank white writing tablet. The room came into monochrome. Beside him, Holden did the same. A thin bed pressed against one wall, a narrow tray beside it. The bedding was knotted like the remnant of a bad night's sleep. A closet stood open, empty. The hulking form of an empty vacuum suit lay on the floor like a mannequin with a misplaced head. An old entertainment console hung on the wall across from the cot, its screen shattered by half a dozen blows. The wall was dimpled where blows intended to break the LED sconces had missed. Another hand terminal added its glow, and another. Hints of color started to come into the room. The cheap gold of the walls, the green of the blankets and sheet. Under the cot, something glimmered. An older model hand terminal. Miller crouched as the others stepped in. Shit, Amos said. Okay, Holden said. Nobody touches anything, period, nothing. It was the most sensible thing Miller had heard the man say. Someone put up a bitch of a fight, Amos muttered. No, Miller said. 
It had been vandalism, maybe. It hadn't been a struggle. He pulled a thin film evidence bag out of his pocket and turned it inside out over his hand like a glove before picking up the terminal, flipping the plastic over it and setting off the ceiling charge. Is that blood? Naomi asked, pointing to the cheap foam mattress. Wet streaks pooled on the sheet and pillow, not more than a finger's width, but dark. Too dark even for blood. No, Miller said, shoving the terminal into his pocket. The fluid marked a thin path toward the bathroom. Miller raised a hand, pushing the others back as he crept toward the half-open door. Inside the bathroom, the nasty background smell was much stronger. Something deep, organic, and intimate. Manure in a hothouse, or the aftermath of sex, or a slaughterhouse. All of them. The toilet was brushed steel, the same model they used in prisons. The sink matched. The LED above it and the one in the ceiling had both been destroyed. In the light of his terminal, like the glow of a single candle, black tendrils reached from the shower stall toward the ruined lights, bent and branching like skeletal leaves. In the shower stall, Juliet Andromeda Mao lay dead. Her eyes were closed, and that was a mercy. She'd cut her hair differently since she'd taken the pictures Miller had seen, and it changed the shape of her face. But she was unmistakable. She was nude, and barely human. Coils of complex growth spilled from her mouth, ears, and vulva. Her ribs and spine had grown spurs like knives that stretched pale skin, ready to cut themselves free of her. Tubes stretched from her back and throat, crawling up the walls behind her. A deep brown slush had leaked from her, filling the shower pan almost three centimeters high. He sat silently, willing the thing before him not to be true, trying to force himself awake. What did they do to you? he thought. Oh, kid, what did they do? Oh, my God, Naomi said behind him. Don't touch anything, he said. Get out of the room, into the hall, do it now. The light in the next room faded as the hand terminals retreated. The twisting shadows momentarily gave her body the illusion of movement. Miller waited, but no breath lifted the bent ribcage. No flicker touched her eyelids. There was nothing. He rose, carefully checking his cuffs and shoes, and walked out to the corridor. They'd all seen it. He could tell from the expressions they'd all seen. And they didn't know any better than he did what it was. Gently, he pulled the splintered door closed and waited for Semitimba. It wasn't long. Five men in police riot armor with shotguns made their way down the hall. Miller walked forward to meet them, his posture better than a badge. He could see them relax. Semitimba came up behind them. Miller? he said. The hell is this? I thought you said you were staying put. I didn't leave, he said. Those are the civilians back there. The dead guys downstairs jumped them in the lobby. Why? Semitimba demanded. Who knows, Miller said. Roll them for spare change? That's not the problem. Semitimba's eyebrows rose. I've got four corpses down there, and they're not the problem. Miller nodded down the corridor. Fifth one's up here, he said. It's the girl I was looking for. Semitimba's expression softened. I'm sorry, he said. Nah, Miller said. He couldn't accept sympathy. He couldn't accept comfort. A gentle touch would shatter him, so he stayed hard instead. But you're going to want the coroner on this one. It's bad, then? You've got no idea, Miller said. Listen, Semi. I'm in over my head here. Seriously. Those boys down there with the guns? If they weren't hooked in with your security force, there would have been alarms as soon as the first shot was fired. You know this was a setup. They were waiting for these four. And the squat fellow with the dark hair? That's James Holden. He's not even supposed to be alive. Holden that started the war? Semitimba said. That's the one, Miller said. This is deep. 
drowning deep. And you know what they say about going in after a drowning man, right? Sematimba looked down the corridor. He nodded. Let me help you, Sematimba said, but Miller shook his head. I'm too far gone. Forget me. What happened was you got a call. You found the place. You don't know me. You don't know them. You've got no clue what happened. Or you come along and drown with me. Your pick. You don't leave the station without telling me? Okay, Miller said. I can live with that, Sematimba said. Then, a moment later, That's really Holden? Call the coroner, Miller said. Trust me. Chapter 25 Holden Miller gestured at Holden and headed for the elevator without waiting to see if he was following. The presumption irritated him, but he went anyway. So, Holden said, we were just in a gunfight where we killed at least three people and now we're just leaving? No getting questioned or giving a statement? How exactly does that happen? Holden asked. Professional courtesy, Miller said, and Holden couldn't tell if he was joking. The elevator door opened with a muffled ding, and Holden and the others followed Miller inside. Naomi was closest to the panel, so she stretched out to press the lobby button, but her hand was shaking so badly that she had to stop and clench it into a fist. After a deep breath, she reached out a now steady finger and pressed the button. This is bullshit. Being an ex-cop doesn't give you a license to get in gunfights, Holden said to Miller's back. Miller didn't move but he seemed to shrink a little bit. His sigh was heavy and unforced. His skin seemed grayer than before. Semitimba knows the score. Half the job is knowing when to look the other way. Besides, I promised we wouldn't leave the station without letting him know. Fuck that, Amos said. You don't make promises for us, pal. The elevator came to a stop and opened onto the bloody scene of the gunfight. A dozen cops were in the room. Miller nodded at them, and they nodded back. He led the crew out of the lobby to the corridor, then turned around. We can work that out later, Miller said. Right now, let's get someplace we can talk. Holden agreed with a shrug. Okay, but you're paying. Miller headed off down the corridor toward the tube station. As they followed, Naomi put a hand on Holden's arm and slowed him down a bit so that Miller could get ahead. When he was far enough away, she said, He knew her. Who knew who? He, Naomi said, nodding at Miller, knew her. She jerked her head back toward the crime scene behind them. How do you know? Holden said. He wasn't expecting to find her there, but he knew who she was. Seeing her like that was a shock. Huh, I didn't get that at all. He seemed like Mr. Cool all through this. No, they were friends or something. He's having trouble dealing with it. So maybe don't push him too hard, she said. We might need him. The hotel room Miller got was only slightly better than the one they'd found the body in. Alex immediately headed for the bathroom and locked the door. The sound of water running in the sink wasn't quite loud enough to cover the pilot's retching. Holden plopped down on the small bed's dingy comforter, forcing Miller to take the room's one uncomfortable-looking chair. Naomi sat next to Holden on the bed, but Amos stayed on his feet, prowling around the room like a nervous animal. So talk, Holden said to Miller. Let's wait for the rest of the gang to finish up, Miller replied with a nod toward the bathroom. Alex came out a few moments later, his face still white, but now freshly washed. Are you all right, Alex? Naomi asked in a soft voice. Five by five, Exo, Alex said, then sat down on the floor and put his head in his hands. Holden stared at Miller and waited. The older man sat and played with his hat for a minute, then tossed it onto the cheap plastic desk that cantilevered out from the wall. You knew Julie was in that room. How? Miller said. We didn't even know her name was Julie, Holden replied. We just knew that it was someone from the Scopuli. 
You should tell me how you knew that, Miller said, a frightening intensity in his eyes. Holden paused a moment. Miller had killed someone who had been trying to kill them, and that certainly helped make the case that he was a friend. But Holden wasn't about to sell out Fred and his group on a hunch. He hesitated, then went halfway. The fictional owner of the Scopuli had checked into that flophouse, he said. It made sense that it was a member of the crew raising a flag. Miller nodded. Who told you, he said. I'm not comfortable telling you that. We believed the information was accurate, Holden replied. The Scopuli was the bait that someone used to kill the Canterbury. We thought someone from the Scopuli might know why everyone keeps trying to kill us. Miller said, Shit. And then leaned back in his chair and stared at the ceiling. You've been looking for Julie. You hoped we were looking for her, too. That we knew something, Naomi said, not making it a question. Yeah, Miller said. It was Holden's turn to ask why. Parents set a contract to Ceres looking for her to be sent home. It was my case, Miller said. So you work for Ceres Security? Not anymore. So what are you doing here? Holden asked. Her family was connected to something, Miller replied. I just naturally hate a mystery. And how did you know it was bigger than just a missing girl? Talking to Miller felt like digging through granite with a rubber chisel. Miller grinned humorlessly. They fired me for looking too hard. Holden consciously decided not to be annoyed by Miller's non-answer. So, let's talk about the death squad in the hotel. Yeah, seriously, what the fuck? Amos said, finally pausing in his pacing. Alex took his head out of his hands and looked up with interest for the first time. Even Naomi leaned forward on the edge of the bed. No idea, Miller replied. But someone knew you were coming. Yeah, thanks for the brilliant police work. Amos said with a snort. No way we would have figured that out on our own. Holden ignored him. But they didn't know why, or they would have already gone up to Julie's room and gotten whatever they wanted. Does that mean Fred's been compromised? Naomi said. Fred? Miller asked. Or maybe someone figured out the Polanski thing too, but didn't have a room number. Holden said. But why come out guns blazing like that? Amos said. Doesn't make any sense to shoot us. That was a mistake, Miller said. I saw it happen. Amos here drew his gun. Somebody overreacted. They were yelling cease fire right up until you folks started shooting back. Holden began ticking off points on his fingers. So, someone finds out we're headed to Eros, and that it is related to the Scopuli. They even know the hotel, but not the room. They don't know it's Lionel Polanski, either, Naomi said. They could have looked it up at the desk, just like we did. Right. So they wait for us to show, and have a squad of gunmen ready to take us in. But that goes to shit, and it turns into a gunfight in the lobby. They absolutely don't see you coming, detective, so they aren't omniscient. Right, Miller said. The whole thing screams last minute. Grab you guys and find out what you're looking for. If they'd had more time, they could have just searched the hotel. Might have taken two or three days, but it could have been done. They didn't, so that means grabbing you was easier. Holden nodded. Yes, he said. But that means that they already had teams here. Those didn't seem like locals to me. Miller paused, looking disconcerted. Now you say it, me either, he agreed. So, whoever it is... They already have teams of gunmen on Eros, and they can redeploy them to come at a moment's notice to pick us up, Holden said. And enough pull with security that they could have a firefight and nobody came, Miller said. Police didn't know anything was happening until I called them. Holden cocked his head to one side, then said, Shit, we really need to get out of here. Wait a minute, Alex said loudly. Just wait a goddamn minute here. How come no one is talking about the mutant horror show in that room? Was I the only one that saw that? Yeah, Jesus, what was that all about? Amos said quietly. Miller reached into his coat pocket and took out the evidence bag with Julie's hand terminal in it. 
Any of you guys a techie? he asked. Maybe we could find out. I could probably hack it, Naomi said. But there's no way I'm touching that thing until we know what did that to her and that it isn't catching. I'm not pushing my luck by handling anything she's touched. You don't have to touch it. Keep the bag sealed. Just use it right through the plastic. The touch screen should still work. Naomi paused for a second, then reached out and took the bag. Okay, give me a minute, she said, then set to work on it. Miller leaned back in his chair again, letting out another heavy sigh. So, Holden said, did you know Julie before this? Naomi seems to think finding her dead like that really knocked you for a loop. Miller shook his head slowly. You get a case like that, you look into whoever it is. You know, personal stuff. Read their email, talk to the people they know. You get a picture. Miller stopped talking and rubbed his eyes with his thumbs. Holden didn't push him, but he started talking again anyway. Julie was a good kid, Miller said as if he were confessing something. She flew a mean racing ship. I just... I wanted to get her back alive. It's got a password, Naomi said, holding up the terminal. I could hack the hardware, but I'd have to open the case. Miller reached out and said, Let me give it a try. Naomi handed the terminal to him, and he tapped a few characters on the screen and handed it back. Razorback, Naomi said. What's that? It's a sled, Miller replied. Is he talking to us? Amos said, pointing his chin at Miller. Cause there's no one else here, but I swear half the time I don't know what the fuck he's on about. Sorry, Miller said. I've been working more or less solo. Makes for bad habits. Naomi shrugged and went back to work, with Holden and Miller now looking over her shoulders. She's got a lot of stuff here, Naomi said. Where to start? Miller pointed at a text file simply labeled Notes sitting on the terminal's desktop. Start there, he said. She's a fanatic about putting things in the right folders. If she left that on the desktop, it means she wasn't sure where it went. Naomi tapped on the document to open it up. It expanded into a loosely organized collection of text that read like someone's diary. First off, get your shit together. Panic doesn't help. It never helps. Deep breaths. Figure this out. Make the right moves. Fear is the mind killer. Ha, geek. Shuttle pros. No reactor, just batteries. Very low radiation. Supplies for eight. Lots of reaction mass. Shuttle cons. No Epstein, no torch. Calm not just disabled, but physically removed. Feeling a little paranoid about leaks, guys? Closest transit is Eros. Is that where we're going? Maybe go someplace else? On just tea kettle, this is going to be a slow boat. Another transit adds seven more weeks. Eros, then. I've got the Phoebe bug. No way around it. Not sure how, but that brown shit was everywhere. It's anaerobic. Must have touched some. Doesn't matter how, just work the problem. I just slept for three weeks. Didn't even get up to pee. What does that? I'm so fucked. Things you need to remember. BA-8340241112. Radiation kills. No reactor on this shuttle, but keep the lights off, keep the e-suit on. Video asset said this thing eats radiation. Don't feed it. Send up a flag. Get some help. You work for the smartest people in the system. They'll figure something out. Stay away from people. Don't spread the bug. Not coughing up the brown goo yet. No idea when that starts. Keep away from bad guys. As if you know who they are. Fine, so keep away from everyone. Incognito is my name. Hmm. Polanski? Damn. I can feel it. I'm hot all the time and I'm starving. Don't eat. Don't feed it. Feed a cold, 
starve a flu? Other way around? Eros is a day out, and then help is on the way. Keep fighting. Safe on Eros. Set up the flag. Hope the home office is watching. Head hurts. Something's happening on my back. Lump over my kidneys. Darren turned into goo. Am I going to be a suit full of jelly? Sick now. Things coming out of my back and leaking that brown stuff everywhere. Have to take the suit off. If you read this, don't let anyone touch the brown stuff. Burn me. I'm burning up. Naomi put the terminal down, but no one spoke for a moment. Finally, Holden said, Phoebe bug. Anyone have an idea? There was a science station on Phoebe, Miller said. Inner planet's place. No belters allowed. It got hit. Lots of dead people, but... She talks about being on a shuttle, Naomi said. The Scopuli didn't have a shuttle. There had to be another ship, Alex said. Maybe she got the shuttle off it. Right, Holden said. They got on another ship, they got infected with this Phoebe bug, and the rest of the crew, I don't know, dies? She gets out, not realizing she's infected till she's on the shuttle, Naomi continued. She comes here, she sends up the flag to Fred, and she dies in that hotel room of the infection. Not, however, turned to goo, Holden said. Just really badly, I don't know, those tubes and bone spurs. What kind of disease does that? The question hung in the air. Again, no one spoke. Holden knew they were all thinking the same thing. They hadn't touched anything in the flophouse room. Did that mean they were safe from it? Or did they have the Phoebe bug, whatever the hell it was? But she'd said anaerobic. Holden was pretty sure that meant you couldn't get it by breathing it in the air. Pretty sure. Where do we go from here, Jim? Naomi asked. How about Venus? Holden said, his voice higher and tighter than he'd expected. Nothing interesting happening on Venus. Seriously, Naomi said. Okay. Seriously, I think Miller there lets his cop friend know the story, and then we get the hell off of this rock. It's got to be a bioweapon, right? Someone steals it off a Martian science lab, sees this shit in a dome, a month later, every human being in the city is dead. Amos interrupted with a grunt. There's some holes in that, Captain, Amos said. Like, what the fuck does that have to do with taking down the Cant and the Doninger? Holden looked Naomi in the eye and said, We have a place to look now, don't we? Yeah, we do, she said. BA-8340241112. That's a rock designation. What do you think is out there? Alex asked. If I was a betting man, I'd say it's whatever ship she stole that shuttle from, Holden replied. Makes sense, Naomi said. Every rock in the belt is mapped. You want to hide something? Put it in a stable orbit next to one, and you can always find it later. Miller turned toward Holden, his face even more drawn. If you're going there, I want in, he said. Why? Holden asked. No offense, but you found your girl. Your job's over, right? Miller looked at him, his lips a thin line. Different case, Miller said. Now, it's about who killed her. Chapter 26 Miller Your police friend put a lockdown order on my ship, Holden said. He sounded outraged. Around them, the hotel restaurant was busy. Last shift's prostitutes mixed with the next shift's tourists and businessmen at the cheap, pink-lit buffet. The pilot and the big guy, Alex and Amos, were vying for the last bagel. Naomi sat at Holden's side, her arms crossed, a cup of bad coffee cooling before her. We did kill some people, Miller said gently. I thought you got us out of that with your secret police handshake, Holden said. 
So why is my ship in lockdown? You remember when Simitimba said we shouldn't leave the station without telling him? Miller said. I remember you making some kind of deal, Holden said. I don't remember agreeing to it. Look, he's going to keep us here until he's sure he won't get fired for letting us go. Once he knows his ass is covered, the lock goes down. So, let's talk about the part where I rent a berth on your ship. Jim Holden and his XO exchanged a glance. One of those tiny human burst communications that said more than words could have. Miller didn't know either of them well enough to decode all of it, but he guessed they were skeptical. They had reason to be. Miller had checked his credit balance before he called them. He had enough left for another night in the hotel, or a good dinner, but not both. He was spending it on a cheap breakfast that Holden and his crew didn't need and probably wouldn't enjoy, buying goodwill. I need to make very, very sure I understand what you're saying, Holden said as the big one, Amos, returned and sat at his other side holding the bagel. Are you saying that unless I let you on my ship, your friend is going to keep us here? Because that's blackmail. Extortion, Amos said. What? Holden said. It's not blackmail, Naomi said. That would be if he threatened to expose information we didn't want known. If it's just a threat, that's extortion. And it's not what I'm talking about, Miller said. Freedom of the station while the investigation rolls, that's no trouble. Leaving jurisdictions another thing. I can't hold you here any more than I can cut you loose. I'm just looking for a ride when you go. Why? Holden said. Because you're going to Julie's asteroid, Miller said. I'm willing to bet there's no port there, Holden said. Did you plan on going anyplace after that? I'm kind of low on solid plans. Haven't had one yet that actually happened. I hear that, Amos said. We've been fucked eighteen different ways since we got into this. Holden folded his hands on the table, one finger tapping a complicated rhythm on the wood-textured concrete top. It wasn't a good sign. You seem like a... well, like an angry, bitter old man, actually. But I've been working water haulers for the past five years. That just means you'd fit in. But... Miller said, and let the word hang there. But I've been shot at a lot recently, and the machine guns yesterday were the least lethal thing I've had to deal with, Holden said. I'm not letting anyone on my ship that I wouldn't trust with my life, and I don't actually know you. I can get the money, Miller said, his belly sinking. If it's money, I can cover it. It's not about negotiating a price, Holden said. Get the money? Naomi said, her eyes narrowing. Get the money? As in, you don't have it now? I'm a little short, Miller said. It's temporary. You have an income? Naomi said. More like a strategy, Miller said. There's some independent rackets down on the docks. There always are in any port. Side games, fights, things like that. Most of them, the fix is in. It's how you bribe cops without actually bribing cops. That's your plan? Holden said, incredulity in his voice. Go collect some police bribes? Across the restaurant, a prostitute in a red nightgown yawned prodigiously. The john across the table from her frowned. No, Miller said reluctantly. I play the side bets. A cop goes in, I make a side bet that he's going to win. I know who the cops are, mostly. The house, they know because they're bribing them. The side bets are with fish looking to feel edgy because they're playing unlicensed. Even as he said it, Miller knew how weak it sounded. Alex, the pilot, came and sat beside Miller. His coffee smelled bright and acidic. What's the deal? Alex asked. There isn't one, Holden said. There wasn't one before and there still isn't. It works better than you think, Miller said gamely, and four hand terminals chimed at once. Holden and Naomi exchanged another, less complicit glance and pulled up their terminals. Amos and Alex already had theirs up. Miller caught the red and green border that meant either a priority message or an early Christmas card. 
There was a moment's silence as they all read something. Then Amos whistled low. Stage three, Naomi said. Can't say as I like the sound of that, Alex said. You mind if I ask? Miller said. Holden slid his terminal across the table. The message was plain text, encoded from Tycho. Caught mole in Tycho comm station. Your presence and destination leaked to unknown persons on Eros. Be careful. Little late on that, Miller said. Keep reading, Holden said. Mole's encryption code allowed intercept of subsignal broadcast from Eros five hours ago. Intercepted message follows. Holden escaped, but payload sample recovered. Repeat, sample recovered. Proceeding to stage three. Any idea what that means? Holden asked. I don't, Miller said, pushing the terminal back. Except if the payload sample is Julie's body. Which I think we can assume it is, Holden said. Miller tapped his fingertips on the tabletop, unconsciously copying Holden's rhythm, his mind working through the combinations. This thing, Miller said, the bioweapon or whatever, they were shipping it here. So now it's here. Okay. There's no reason to take out Eros. It's not particularly important to the war when you hold it up to Ceres or Ganymede or the shipyard at Callisto. And if you wanted it dead, there are easier ways. Blow a big fusion bomb on the surface and crack it like an egg. It's not a military base, but it is a shipping hub, Naomi said. And unlike Ceres, it's not under OPA control. They're shipping her out then, Holden said. They're taking their sample out to infect whatever their original target was, and once they're off the station, there's no way we're going to stop it. Miller shook his head. Something about the chain of logic felt wrong. He was missing something. His imaginary Julie appeared across the room, but her eyes were dark, black filaments pouring down her cheeks like tears. What am I looking at here, Julie? he thought. I'm seeing something here, but I don't know what it is. The vibration was a slight, small thing, less than a transport tube's breaking stutter. A few plates rattled. The coffee in Naomi's cup danced in a series of concentric circles. Everyone in the hotel went silent, with a sudden shared dread of thousands of people made aware of their fragility in the same moment. Okay, Amos said. The fuck was that? And the emergency klaxons started blaring. Or possibly stage three is something else, Miller said over the noise. The public address system was muddy by its nature. The same voice spoke from consoles and speakers that might have been as close as a meter from each other or as far out as earshot would take them. It made every word reverberate, a false echo. Because of that, the voice of the emergency broadcast system enunciated very carefully each word bitten off separately. Attention, please. Eros Station is in emergency lockdown. Proceed immediately to the casino level for radiological safety confinement. Cooperate with all emergency personnel. Attention, please. Eros Station is in emergency lockdown. And on in a loop that would continue if no one coded in the override, until every man, woman, child, animal, and insect on the station had been reduced to dust and humidity. It was the nightmare scenario, and Miller did what a lifetime on pressurized rocks had trained him to do. He was up from the table, in the corridor, and heading down toward the wider passages already clogged with bodies. Holden and his crew were on his heels. That was an explosion, Alex said. Ship drive at the least, maybe a nuke. They're going to kill the station, Holden said. There was a kind of awe in his voice. I never thought I'd miss the part where they just blew up the ships I was on, but now it's stations. They didn't crack it, Miller said. You sure of that? Naomi asked. I can hear you talking, Miller said. That tells me there's air. There are airlocks, Holden said. If the station got hold and the locks closed down... A woman pushed hard against Miller's shoulder 
forcing her way forward. If they weren't damn careful, there was going to be a stampede. There was too much fear, and not enough space. It hadn't happened yet, but the impatient movement of the crowd, vibrating like molecules in water just shy of boiling, made Miller very uncomfortable. This isn't a ship, Miller said. It's a station. This is a rock we're on. Anything big enough to get the parts of the station with atmosphere would crack the place like an egg. A great big pressurized egg. The crowd was stopped, the tunnel full. They were going to need crowd control, and they were going to need it fast. For the first time since he'd left Ceres, Miller wished he had a badge. Someone pushed into Amos's side, then backed away through the press when the big guy growled. Besides, Miller said, it's a rad hazard. You don't need air loss to kill everyone in the station. Just burn a few quadrillion spare neutrons through the place at sea, and there won't be any trouble with the oxygen supply. Cheerful fucker, Amos said. They build stations inside of rocks for a reason, Naomi said. Not so easy to force radiation through this many meters of rock. I spent a month in a rad shelter once, Alex said as they pushed through the thickening crowd. Ship I was on had magnetic containment drop. Automatic cutoffs failed and the reactor kept running for almost a second. Melted the engine room. Killed five of the crew on the next deck up before they knew we had a problem. And it took them three days to carve the bodies free of the melted decking for burial. The rest of us wound up eighteen to a shelter for thirty-six days while a tug flew to get us. Sounds great, Holden said. End of it? Six of them got married and the rest of us never spoke to each other again, Alex said. Ahead of them, someone shouted. It wasn't an alarm or even anger, really. Frustration. Fear. Exactly the things Miller didn't want to hear. That may be our big problem, Miller said. But before he could explain, a new voice cut in, drowning out the emergency response loop. Okay, everybody, we're Eero Security, okay, no? We got an emergency, so you do what we tell you and nobody gets hurt. About time. Miller thought. So here's the rule, the new voice said. Next asshole who pushes anyone, I'm going to shoot them. Move in an orderly fashion. First priority, orderly. Second priority is move. Go, go, go. At first, nothing happened. The knot of human bodies was tied too tightly for even the most heavy-handed crowd control to free quickly. But a minute later, Miller saw some heads far ahead of him in the tunnel start to shift then move away. The air in the tunnel was thickening, and the hot plastic smell of overloaded recyclers reached him just as the clot came free. Miller's breath started coming easier. Do they have hard shelters? A woman behind them asked her companion, and then was swept away by the currents. Naomi plucked Miller's sleeve. Do they? she asked. They should, yes, Miller said. Enough for maybe a quarter million and essential personnel and medical crews who get first crack at them. And everyone else? Amos said. If they survive the event, Holden said, station personnel will save as many people as they can. Ah, Amos said. Then, well, fuck that. We're going for the Rossi, right? Oh, hell yes, Holden said. Ahead of them, the fast shuffling crowd in their tunnel was merging with another flow of people from a lower level. Five thick-necked men in riot gear were waving people on. Two of them were pointing guns at the crowd. Miller was more than half tempted to go up and slap the little idiots. Pointing guns at people was a lousy way to avoid panic. One of the security men was also far too wide for his gear, the Velcro fasteners at his belly reaching out for each other like lovers at the moment of separation. Miller looked down at the floor and slowed his steps the back of his mind suddenly and powerfully busy. One of the cops swung his gun out over the crowd. Another one, the fat guy, laughed and said something in Korean. What had Semitimba said about the new security force? All bluster, no balls? A new corporation out of Luna. Belters on the ground. Corrupt. The name. They had a name. CPM. Carne for la machina. Meat for the machine. One of the gun-wielding cops lowered his weapon, swept off his helmet, and scratched violently behind one ear. 
He had wild black hair, a tattooed neck, and a scar that went from one eyelid down almost to the joint of his jaw. Miller knew him. A year and a half ago, he had arrested him for assault and racketeering. And the equipment, armor, batons, riot guns, also looked hauntingly familiar. Dawes had been wrong. Miller had been able to find his own missing equipment after all. Whatever this was, it had been going on a long time before the Canterbury had picked up a distress call from the Scopuli. A long time before Julie had vanished. And putting a bunch of Ceres station thugs in charge of Eros crowd control using stolen Ceres station equipment had been part of the plan. The third phase. Ah, he thought. Well, that can't be good. Miller slid to the side, letting as many bodies as he plausibly could fill the space between him and the gunman dressed as police. Get down to the casino level, one of the gunmen shouted over the crowd. We'll get you into the radiation shelters from there, but you've got to get to the casino level. Holden and his crew hadn't noticed anything odd. They were talking among themselves, strategizing about how to get to their ship and what to do once they got there, speculating about who might have attacked the station and where Julie Mao's twisted, infected corpse might be headed. Miller fought the impulse to interrupt them. He needed to stay calm, to think things through. They couldn't attract attention. He needed the right moment. The corridor turned and widened. The press of bodies lightened a little bit. Miller waited for a dead zone in the crowd control, a space where none of the fake security men could see them. He took Holden by the elbow. Don't go, he said. Chapter 27 Holden What do you mean, don't go? Holden asked, yanking his elbow out of Miller's grasp. Somebody just nuked the station. This has escalated beyond our capacity to respond. If we can't get to the Rossi, we're doing whatever they tell us to until we can. Miller took a step back and put up his hands. He was clearly doing his best to look non-threatening, which just pissed Holden off even more. Behind him, the riot cops were motioning the people milling in the corridors toward the casinos. The air echoed with the electronically amplified voices of the police directing the crowds and the buzz of anxious citizens. Over it all, the public address system told everyone to remain calm and cooperate with emergency personnel. See that bruiser over there in the police riot gear? Miller said. His name is Gabby Smalls. He supervises a chunk of the Golden Bow protection racket on Ceres. He also runs a little dust on the side, and I suspect he's tossed more than a few people out airlocks. Holden looked at the guy. Wide shoulders, thick gut. Now that Miller pointed him out, there was something about him that didn't seem right for a cop. I don't get it, Holden said. A couple months ago, when you started a bunch of riots by saying Mars blew up your water hauler, we found out, I never said found out, that most of the police riot gear on Ceres was missing. A few months before that, a bunch of our underworld muscle went missing. I just found out where both of them are. Miller pointed at the riot gear equipped Gabby Smalls. I wouldn't go wherever he's sending people, he said. I really wouldn't. A thin stream of people bumped past. Then where? Naomi asked. Yeah, I mean, if the choice is radiation or mobsters, I gotta go with the mobsters, Alex said, nodding emphatically at Naomi. Miller pulled out his hand terminal and held it up so everyone could see the screen. I've got no radiation warnings, he said. Whatever happened outside isn't a danger on this level. Not right now. So let's just calm down and make the smart move. Holden turned his back on Miller and motioned to Naomi. He pulled her aside and said in a quiet voice, I still think we go back to the ship and get out of here. Take our chances getting past these mobsters. If there's no radiation danger, then I agree, she said with a nod. I disagree, Miller said, not even pretending he hadn't been eavesdropping. To do that, we have to walk through three levels of casino filled with riot gear and thugs. They're going to tell us to get in one of those casinos for our own protection. When we don't, they'll beat us unconscious and throw us in anyway. For our own protection. 
Another crowd of people poured out of a branch corridor, heading for the reassuring presence of the police and the bright casino lights. Holden found it difficult not to be swept along with the crowd. A man with two enormous suitcases bumped into Naomi, almost knocking her down. Holden grabbed her hand. What's the alternative? he asked Miller. Miller glanced up and down the corridor, seeming to measure the flow of people. He nodded at a yellow and black striped hatch down a small maintenance corridor. That one, he said. It's marked high voltage, so the guys sweeping for stragglers won't bother with it. It's not the kind of place citizens hide. Can you get that door open quickly? Holden said, looking at Amos. Can I break it? If you need to? Then sure, Amos said, and began pushing his way through the crowd toward the maintenance hatch. At the door, he pulled out his multi-tool and popped off the cheap plastic housing for the card reader. After he twisted a couple of wires together, the hatch slid open with a hydraulic hiss. Ta-da, Amos said. The reader won't work anymore, so anyone who wants in comes in. Let's worry about that if it happens, Miller replied, then led them into the dimly lit passageway beyond. The service corridor was filled with electrical cable held together with plastic ties. It stretched through the dim red light for thirty or forty feet before falling into gloom. The light came from LEDs mounted on the metal bracing that sprouted from the wall every five feet or so to hold the cable up. Naomi had to duck to enter, her frame about four centimeters too tall for the ceiling. She put her back to the wall and slid down onto her haunches. You'd think they'd make the maintenance corridors tall enough for belters to work in, she said irritably. Holden touched the wall almost reverently, tracing a corridor identification number carved right into the stone. The belters who built this place weren't tall, he said. These are some of the main power lines. This tunnel goes back to the first belt colony. The people who carved it grew up in gravity. Miller, who also had to duck his head, sat on the floor with a grunt and popping knees. History lesson later, he said. Let's figure a way off this rock. Amos, studying the bundles of cable intently, said over his shoulder, If you see a frayed spot, don't touch it. This thick fucker right here is a couple million volts. That'd melt your shit down real good. Alex sat down next to Naomi, grimacing when his butt hit the cold stone floor. You know, he said, if they decide to seal up the station, they might pump all the air out of these maintenance corridors. I get it, Holden said loudly. It's a shitty and uncomfortable hiding spot. You have my permission to now shut up about that. He squatted down across the corridor from Miller and said, Okay, detective, now what? Now, Miller said, we wait for the sweep to pass us by and get behind it. Try to get to the docks. The folks in the shelters are easy to avoid. Shelters are up deep. Trick's gonna be getting through the casino levels. Can't we just use these maintenance passages to move around? Alex asked. Amos shook his head. Not without a map, we won't. You get lost in here, you're in trouble, he said. Ignoring them, Holden said, Okay, so we wait for everyone to move to the radiation shelters and then we leave. Miller nodded at him, and then the two men sat staring at each other for a moment. The air between them seemed to thicken, the silence taking on a meaning of its own. Miller shrugged like his jacket itched. Why do you think a bunch of series mobsters are moving everyone to radiation shelters when there's no actual radiation danger? Holden finally said. And why are the Eros cops letting them? Good questions, Miller said. If they were using these yahoos, it helps explain why their attempted kidnapping at the hotel went so poorly. They don't seem like pros. Nope, Miller said. That's not their usual area of expertise. Would you two be quiet? Naomi said. For almost a minute they were. It'd be really stupid, Holden said, to go take a look at what's going on, wouldn't it? Yes. Whatever's going on at those shelters, you know that's where all the guards and patrols will be, Miller said. Yeah, Holden said. Captain, Naomi said, a warning in her voice. Still, Holden said, talking to Miller, you hate a mystery. I do at that, Miller replied with a nod and a faint smile. And you, my friend, are a damn busybody. It's been said? 
God damn it, Naomi said quietly. What is it, boss? Amos asked. These two just broke our getaway plan, Naomi replied. Then she said to Holden, You guys are going to be very bad for each other and, by extension, us. No, Holden replied. You aren't coming along. You stay here with Amos and Alex. Give us... He looked at his terminal. Three hours to go look and come back. If we aren't here, we leave you to the gangsters and the three of us get jobs on Tycho and live happily ever after, Naomi said. Yeah, Holden said with a grin. Don't be a hero. Wouldn't even consider it, sir. Holden crouched in the shadows outside the maintenance hatch and watched as Ceres mobsters dressed in police riot gear led the citizens of Eros away in small groups. The PA system continued to declare the possibility of radiological danger and exhorted the citizens and guests of Eros to cooperate fully with emergency personnel. Holden had selected a group to follow and was getting ready to move when Miller placed a hand on his shoulder. Wait, Miller said. I want to make a call. He quickly dialed up a number on his hand terminal, and after a few moments, a flat, gray, network-not-available message appeared. Phone is down? Holden asked. That's the first thing I'd do, too, Miller replied. I see, Holden said, even though he really didn't. Well, I guess it's just you and me, Miller said, then took the magazine out of his gun and began reloading it with cartridges he pulled out of his coat pocket. Even though he'd had enough of gunfights to last him the rest of his life, Holden took out his gun and checked the magazine as well. He'd replaced it after the shootout in the hotel, and it was full. He racked it and put it back in the waistband of his pants. Miller, he noticed, kept his out, holding it close to his thigh where his coat mostly covered it. It wasn't difficult following the groups up through the station toward the intersections where the radiation shelters were. As long as they kept moving in the same direction as the crowds, no one gave them a second look. Holden made a mental note of the many corridor intersections where men in riot gear stood guard. It would be much tougher coming back down. When the group they were following eventually stopped outside a large metal door marked with the ancient radiation symbol, Holden and Miller slipped off to the side and hid behind a large planter filled with ferns and a couple of stunted trees. Holden watched the fake riot cops order everyone into the shelter and then seal the door behind them with a swipe of a card. All but one of them left, the remaining one standing guard outside the door. Miller whispered, Let's ask him to let us in. Follow my lead, Holden replied, then stood up and began walking toward the guard. Hey, shithead, you're supposed to be in a shelter or in the casino, so get the fuck back to your group, the guard said, his hand on the butt of his gun. Holden held up his hands placatingly, smiled, and kept walking. Hey, I lost my group. Got mixed up somehow. I'm not from here, you know, he said. The guard pointed down the corridor with the stun baton in his left hand. Go that way till you hit the ramps down, he said. Miller seemed to appear out of nowhere in the dimly lit corridor, his gun already out and pointed at the guard's head. He thumbed off the safety with an audible click. How about we just join the group already inside, he said. Open it up. The guard looked at Miller out of the corners of his eyes, not turning his head at all. His hands went up, and he dropped the baton. You don't want to do that, man, the fake cop said. I kind of think he does, Holden said. You should do what he says. He's not a very nice person. Miller pushed the barrel of his gun against the guard's head and said, You know what we used to call a no-brainer back at the station house? It's when a shot to the head actually blows the entire brain out of someone's skull. It usually happens when a gun is pressed to the victim's head right about here. The gas has got nowhere to go. Pops the brain right out through the exit wound. They said not to open these up once they've been sealed, man, the guard said, speaking so fast he ran all the words together. They were pretty serious about that. This is the last time I ask, Miller said. Next time... I just used the card I took off your body. Holden turned the guard around to face the door and pulled the handgun out of the man's belt holster. 
He hoped all Miller's threats were just threats. He suspected they weren't. Just open the door and we'll let you go, I promise, Holden said to the guard. The guard nodded and moved up to the door, then slid his card through it and punched in a number on the keypad. The heavy blast door slid open. Beyond it, the room was even darker than the corridor outside. A few emergency LEDs glowed a sullen red. In the faint illumination, Holden could see dozens, hundreds of bodies scattered across the floor, unmoving. Are they dead? Holden asked. I don't know nothing about, the guard said, but Miller cut him off. You go in first, Miller said, and pushed the guard forward. Hold on, Holden said. I don't think it's a good idea to just charge in here. Three things happened at once. The guard took four steps forward and then collapsed on the floor. Miller sneezed once, loudly, and then started to sway drunkenly, and both Holden's and Miller's hand terminals began an angry electric buzzing. Miller staggered back and said, The door. Holden hit the button and the door slid shut again. Gas, Miller said, then coughed. There's gas in there. While the ex-cop leaned against the corridor wall and coughed, Holden took out his terminal to shut off the buzzing. But the alarm flashing on its screen wasn't an air contamination alert. It was the venerable three wedge shapes pointing inward. Radiation. As he watched, the symbol, which should have been white, shifted through an angry orange color to dark red. Miller was looking at his, too, his expression unreadable. We've been dosed, Holden said. I've never actually seen the detector activate, Miller said, his voice rough and faint after his coughing fit. What does it mean when the thing is red? It means we'll be bleeding from our rectums in about six hours, Holden said. We have to get to the ship. It'll have the meds we need. What? Miller said. The fuck is going on? Holden grabbed Miller by the arm and led him back down the corridor toward the ramps. Holden's skin felt warm and itchy. He didn't know if it was radiation burn or psychosomatic. With the amount of radiation he'd just taken, it was a good thing he had sperm tucked away in Montana and on Europa. Thinking that made his balls itch. They nuke the station, Holden said. Hell, maybe they just pretend to nuke it. Then they drag everyone down here and toss them into radiation shelters that are only radioactive on the inside. Gas them to keep them quiet. There are easier ways to kill people, Miller said, his breathing coming in ragged gasps as they ran down the corridor. So it has to be more than that, Holden said. The bug, right? The one that killed that girl. It fed on radiation. Incubators, Miller said, nodding in agreement. They arrived at one of the ramps to the lower levels, but a group of citizens led by two fake riot cops were coming up. Holden grabbed Miller and pulled him to one side where they could hide in the shadow of a closed noodle shop. So they infected them, right? Holden said in a whisper, waiting for the group to pass. Maybe fake radiation meds with a bug in it. Maybe that brown goo just spread around on the floor. Then whatever was in the girl, Julie. He stopped when Miller walked away from him, straight at the group that had just come up the ramp. Officer, said Miller to one of the fake cops. They both stopped, and one of them said, You supposed to be... Miller shot him in the throat, right below his helmet's faceplate. Then he swiveled smoothly and shot the other guard in the inside of the thigh, just below the groin. When the man fell backward, yelling in pain, Miller walked up and shot him again, this time in the neck. A couple of the citizens started screaming. Miller pointed his gun at them, and they got quiet. Go down a level or two and find some place to hide, he said. Do not cooperate with these men, even though they're dressed like police. They do not have your best interests at heart. Go. The citizens hesitated, then ran. Miller took a few cartridges out of his pocket and began replacing the three he'd fired. Holden started to speak, but Miller cut him off. Take the throat shot if you can. Most people, the faceplate and chest armor don't quite cover that gap. If the neck is covered, then shoot the inside of the thigh. Very thin armor there. Mobility issue. 
takes most people down in one shot. Holden nodded as though that all made sense. Okay, Holden said. Say, let's get back to the ship before we bleed to death, right? No more shooting people if we can help it. His voice sounded calmer than he felt. Miller slapped the magazine back into his gun and chambered around. I'm guessing there's a lot more people need to be shot before this is over, he said. But sure. First things first. Chapter 28 Miller The first time Miller killed anyone was in his third year working security. He'd been twenty-two, just married, talking about having kids. As the new guy on the contract, he'd gotten the shit jobs, patrolling levels so high the Coriolis made him seasick, taking domestic disturbance calls in holes no wider than a storage bin, standing guard on the drunk tank to keep predators from raping the unconscious. The normal hazing. He'd known to expect it. He thought he could take it. The call had been from an illegal restaurant almost at the mass center. At less than a tenth of a G, gravity had been little more than a suggestion, and his inner ear had been confused and angered by the change in spin. If he thought about it, he could still remember the sound of raised voices, too fast and slurred for words, the smell of bathtub cheese, the thin haze of smoke from the cheap electric griddle. It had happened fast. The perp had come out of the hole with a gun in one hand, dragging a woman by the hair with the other. Miller's partner, a ten-year veteran named Carson, had shouted out the warning. The perp had turned, swinging the gun out at arm's length like a stuntman in a video. All through training, the instructors had said that you couldn't know what you'd do until the moment came. Killing another human being was hard. Some people couldn't. The perp's gun came around. The gunman dropped the woman and shouted. It turned out that, for Miller at least, it wasn't all that hard. Afterward, he'd been through mandatory counseling. He'd cried. He'd suffered the nightmares and the shakes and all the things that cops suffered quietly and didn't talk about. But even then, it seemed to be happening at a distance. Like he'd gotten too drunk and was watching himself throw up. It was just a physical reaction. It would pass. The important thing was he knew the answer to the question. Yes, if he needed to, he could take a life. It wasn't until now, walking through the corridors of Eros, that he'd taken joy in it. Even taking down the poor bastard in that first firefight had felt like the sad necessity of work. Pleasure in killing hadn't come until after Julie. And it wasn't really pleasure as much as a brief secession of pain. He held the gun low. Holden started down the ramp and Miller followed, letting the earther take point. Holden walked faster than he did and with the uncommented athleticism of someone who lived in a wide variety of gravities. Miller had the feeling he'd made Holden nervous, and he regretted that a little. He hadn't intended to, and he really needed to get aboard Holden's ship if he was going to find Julie's secrets. Or, for that matter, not die of radiation sickness in the next few hours. That seemed a finer point than it probably was. Okay, Holden said at the bottom of the ramp. We need to get back down, and there are a lot of guards between us and Naomi that are going to be really confused by two guys walking the wrong direction. That's a problem, Miller agreed. Any thoughts? Miller frowned and considered the flooring. The Eros floors were different than Ceres's. Laminate with flecks of gold. Tubes aren't going to be running, he said. If they are, it'll be in lockdown mode, where it only stops at the holding pen down in the casino. So that's out. Maintenance corridor again? If we can find one that goes between levels, Miller said. Might be a little tricky, but it seems like a better shot than shooting our way past a couple dozen assholes in armor. How long have we got before your friend takes off? Holden looked at his hand terminal. The radiation alarm was still deep red. Miller wondered how long those took to reset. A little more than two hours, Holden said. Shouldn't be a problem. Let's see what we can find, Miller said. The corridors nearest the radiation shelters, the death traps, the incubators, had been emptied. 
wide passages built to accommodate the ancient construction equipment that had carved Eros into a human habitation were eerie with only Holden's and Miller's footsteps and the hum of the air recyclers. Miller hadn't noticed when the emergency announcements had stopped, but the absence of them now seemed ominous. If it had been Ceres, he would have known where to go, where everything led, how to move gracefully from one stage to another. On Eros, all he had was an educated guess. That wasn't so bad. But he could tell it was taking too long, and worse than that, they weren't talking about it. Neither one spoke. They were walking more slowly than normal. It wasn't up to the threshold of consciousness, but Miller knew that both of their bodies were starting to feel the radiation damage. It wasn't going to get better. Okay, Holden said. Somewhere around here there has to be a maintenance shaft. Could also try the tube station, Miller said. The cars run in vacuum, but there might be some service tunnels running parallel. Don't you think they'd have shut those down as part of the big roundup? Probably, Miller said. Hey, you two. What the fuck you think you're doing up here? Miller looked back over his shoulder. Two men in riot gear were waving at them menacingly. Holden said something sharp under his breath. Miller narrowed his eyes. The thing was, these men were amateurs. The beginning of an idea moved in the back of Miller's mind as he watched the two approach. Killing them and taking their gear wouldn't work. There was nothing like scorch marks and blood to make it clear something had happened. But... Miller, Holden said, a warning in his voice. Yeah, Miller said, I know. I said, what the fuck are you two doing here? One of the security men said. The station's on lockdown. Everyone goes down to the casino level or up to the radiation shelters. We were just looking for a way to, uh, get down to the casino level, Holden said, smiling and being non-threatening. We're not from around here, and... The closer of the two guards jabbed the butt of his rifle neatly into Holden's leg. The earther staggered and Miller shot the guard just below the faceplate, then turned to the one still standing, mouth agape. You're Mikey Co, right? Miller said. The man's face went even paler, but he nodded. Holden groaned and stood. Detective Miller, Miller said. Busted you on series about four years ago. You got a little happy in a bar. Tappins, I think. Hit a girl with a pool cue? Oh, hey. The man said with a frightened smile. Yeah, I remember you. How you been doing? Good and bad, Miller said. You know how it is. Give the earther your gun. Co looked from Miller to Holden and back, licking his lips and judging his chances. Miller shook his head. Seriously, Miller said. Give him the gun. Sure, yeah, no problem. This was the kind of man who'd killed Julie, Miller thought. Stupid, short-sighted, a man born with a sense for raw opportunity where his soul should have been. Miller's mental Julie shook her head in disgust and sorrow, and Miller found himself wondering if she meant the thug now handing his rifle to Holden, or himself. Maybe both. What's the deal here, Mikey? Miller asked. What do you mean? The guard said, playing stupid like they were in an interrogation cell, stalling for time walking through the old script of cop and criminal as if it still made sense, as if everything hadn't changed. Miller was surprised by a tightness in his throat. He didn't know what it was there for. The job, he said. What's the job? I don't know. Hey, Miller said gently. I just killed your buddy. And that's his third today, Holden said. I saw him. Miller could see it in the man's eyes, the cunning, the shift, the move from one strategy to another. It was old and familiar and as predictable as water moving down. Hey, Co said, it's just a job. They told us about a year ago how we were making a big move, right? But no one knows what it is. So a few months back, they start moving guys over, training us up like we're cops, you know? Who was training you? Miller said. The last guys. The ones who were working the contract before us, Co said. Protogen? 
Something like that, yeah, he said. Then they took off and we took over. Just muscle, you know, some smuggling. Smuggling what? All kinds of shit, Co said. He was starting to feel safe, and it showed in the way he held himself and the way he spoke. Surveillance equipment, communication arrays, serious as fuck servers with their own little gel software wonks already built in. Scientific equipment, too. Stuff for checking the water and the air and shit. And these ancient remote access robots like you'd use in a vacuum dig. All sorts of shit. Where was it going to? Holden asked. Here, Co said, gesturing to the air, the stone, the station. It's all here. They were like months installing it all. And then for weeks, nothing. What do you mean, nothing? Miller asked. Nothing, nothing. All this build-up, and then we sat around with our thumbs up our butts. Something had gone wrong. The Phoebe bug hadn't made its rendezvous, but then Julie had come, Miller thought, and the game had turned back on. He saw her again as if he were in her apartment. The long, spreading tendrils of whatever the hell it was, the bone spurs pressing out against her skin, the black froth of filament pouring from her eyes. The pay's good, though, Co said philosophically, and it was kind of nice taking some time off. Miller nodded in agreement, leaned close, tucking the barrel of his gun through the interleaving of armor at Coe's belly, and shot him. What the fuck? Holden said as Miller put his gun into his jacket pocket. What did you think was going to happen? Miller said, squatting down beside the gutshot man. It's not like he was going to let us go. Yeah, okay, Holden said, but... Help me get him up, Miller said, hooking an arm behind Coe's shoulder. Co shrieked when Miller lifted him. What? Get his other side, Miller said. Man needs medical attention, right? Um, yes, Holden said. So get his other side. It wasn't as far back to the radiation shelters as Miller had expected, which had its good points and its bad ones. On the upside, Co was still alive and screaming. The chances were better that he'd be lucid, which wasn't what Miller had intended. But as they came near the first group of guards, Coe's babbling seemed scattered enough to work. Hey, Miller shouted. Some help over here. At the head of the ramp, four of the guards looked at one another and then started moving toward them, curiosity winning out over basic operating procedures. Holden was breathing hard. Miller was, too. Coe wasn't that heavy. It was a bad sign. What the hell is this? one of the guards said. There's a bunch of people holed up back there, Miller said. Resistance. I thought you people swept this level. That wasn't our job, the guy said. We were just making sure the groups from the casino get to the shelters. Well, someone screwed up, Miller snapped. You have transport? The guards looked at each other again. We can call for one, a guy at the back said. Never mind, Miller said. You boys go find the shooters. Wait a minute, the first guy said. Exactly who the hell are you? The installers from Protogen, Holden said. We're replacing the sensors that failed. This guy was supposed to help us. I didn't hear about that, the leader said. Miller dug a finger under Coe's armor and squeezed. Coe shrieked and tried to writhe away from him. Talk to your boss about it in your own time, Miller said. Come on, let's get this asshole to a medic. Hold on, the first guard said, and Miller sighed. Four of them. If he dropped Co and jumped for cover, but there wasn't much cover. And who the hell knew what Holden would do? Where are the shooters? The guard asked. Miller kept himself from smiling. There's a hole about a quarter click at his spinward, Miller said. The other one's body's still there, you can't miss it. Miller turned down the ramp. Behind him, the guards were talking among themselves, debating what to do, who to call, who to send. You're completely insane, Holden said over Coe's semi-conscious weeping. Maybe he was right. When, Miller wondered, does someone stop being human? There had to be a moment, some decision that you made, and before it, 
you were one person, and after it someone else. Walking down to the levels of Eros, Ko's bleeding body slung between him and Holden, Miller reflected. He was probably dying of radiation damage. He was lying his way past half a dozen men who were only letting him by because they were used to people being scared of them, and he wasn't. He had killed three people in the last two hours. Four, if he counted Ko. Probably safer to say four, then. The analytical part of his mind, the small, still voice he had cultivated for years, watched him move and replayed all his decisions. Everything he'd done had made perfect sense at the time. Shooting Ko, shooting the other three, leaving the safety of the crew's hideout to investigate the evacuation. Emotionally, it had all been obvious at the time. It was only when he considered it from outside that it seemed dangerous. If he'd seen it in someone else, Mus, Havelock, Simitimba, he wouldn't have taken more than a minute to realize they'd gone off the rails. Since it was him, he had taken longer to notice. But Holden was right. Somewhere along the line, he'd lost himself. He wanted to think it had been finding Julie, seeing what had happened to her body, knowing he hadn't been able to save her, but that was only because it seemed like the sentimental moment. The truth was, his decisions before then, leaving Ceres to go on a wild hunt for Julie, drinking himself out of a career, remaining a cop for even a day after that first kill all those years earlier, none of them seemed to make sense, viewed objectively. He'd lost a marriage to a woman he'd loved once. He'd lived hip-deep in the worst humanity had to offer. He'd learned firsthand that he was capable of killing another human being. And nowhere along the line could he say that there, at that moment, he had been a sane, whole man. And that afterward, he hadn't. Maybe it was a cumulative process, like smoking cigarettes. One didn't do much. Five didn't do much more. Every emotion he'd shut down, every human contact he'd spurned, every love and friendship and moment of compassion from which he'd turned, had taken him a degree away from himself. Until now, he'd been able to kill men with impunity. To face his impending death with a denial that let him make plans and take action. In his mind, Julie Mao tilted her head, listening to his thoughts. In his mind, she held him her body against his in a way that was more comforting than erotic, consoling, forgiving. This was why he had searched for her. Julie had become the part of him that was capable of human feeling, the symbol of what he could have been if he hadn't been this. There was no reason to think his imagined Julie had anything in common with the real woman. Meeting her would have been a disappointment for them both. He had to believe that, the same way he'd had to believe everything that had cut him off from love before. Holden stopped, the body, corpse now, of Ko tugging Miller back to himself. What? Miller said. Holden nodded at the access panel in front of them. Miller looked at it, uncomprehending, and then recognized it. They'd made it. They were back at the hideout. Are you all right? Holden said. Yeah, Miller said. Just wool gathering, sorry. He dropped Ko and the thug slid to the floor with a sad thud. Miller's arm had fallen asleep. He shook it, but the tingling didn't go away. A wave of vertigo and nausea passed through him. Symptoms, he thought. How'd we do for time? Miller asked. We're a little past deadline. Five minutes. It'll be fine. Holden said and slid the door open. The space beyond, where Naomi and Alex and Amos had been, was empty. Fuck me, Holden said. Chapter 29 Holden Fuck me, Holden said, and a moment later, they'd left us. No. She had left him. Naomi had said she would. But confronted with the reality of it, Holden realized that he hadn't really believed her. But here it was. The proof. 
the empty space where she used to be. His heart hammered and his throat tightened, breath coming in gasps. The sick feeling in his gut was either despair or his colon sloughing off its lining. He was going to die sitting outside a cheap hotel on Eros because Naomi had done exactly what she'd said she would, what he himself had ordered her to do. His resentment refused to listen to reason. We're dead, he said, and sat down on the edge of a fern-filled planter. How long do we have? Miller asked, looking up and down the corridor while he fidgeted with his gun. No idea, Holden replied, gesturing vaguely at his terminal's flashing red radiation symbol. Hours before we really start to feel it, I think, but I don't know. God, I wish Shed was still here. Shed? Friend of mine, Holden said, not feeling up to elaborating. Good med tech. Call her, Miller said. Holden looked at his terminal and tapped the screen a few times. Network's still down, he said. All right, Miller said. Let's go to your ship. See if it's still in dock. They'll be gone. Naomi's keeping the crew alive. She warned me, but I... So let's go anyway, Miller said. He was shifting from one foot to the other and looking down the corridor as he spoke. Miller, Holden said then stopped. Miller was clearly on edge, and he'd shot four people. Holden was increasingly frightened of the former cop. As if reading his mind, Miller stepped close, the two-meter man towering over him where he sat. Miller smiled ruefully, his eyes unnervingly gentle. Holden would almost have preferred they be threatening. The way I see it, there's three ways this can go, Miller said. One, we find your ship still in dock, get the meds we need, and maybe we live. Two, we try to get to the ship, and along the way we run into a bunch of mafia thugs, die gloriously in a hail of bullets. Three, we sit here and leak out of our eyes and assholes. Holden said nothing. He just stared up at the cop and frowned. I'm liking the first two better than the last one, Miller said. His voice made it sound like an apology. How about you come with? Holden laughed before he could catch himself, but Miller didn't look like he was taking offense. Sure, Holden said. I just needed to feel sorry for myself for a minute. Let's go get killed by the Mafia. He said it with much more bravado than he felt. The truth was, he didn't want to die. Even during his time in the Navy, the idea of dying in the line of duty had always seemed distant and unreal. His ship would never be destroyed, and if it was, he would make it to the escape shuttle. The universe without him in it didn't make any sense at all. He'd taken risks. He'd seen other people die, even people he loved. Now, for the first time, his own death was a real thing. He looked at the cop. He'd known the man less than a day, didn't trust him, and wasn't sure he much liked him. And this was who he'd die with. Holden shuddered and stood up, pulling his gun out of his waistband. Under the panic and fear, there was a deep feeling of calm. He hoped it would last. After you, Holden said. If we make it, remind me to call my mother's. The casinos were a powder keg waiting for a match. If the evacuation sweeps had been even moderately successful, there were probably a million or more people crammed into three levels of the station. Hard-looking men in riot gear moved through the crowds, telling everyone to stay put until they were taken to the radiation shelters, keeping the crowd frightened. Every now and then, a small group of citizens would be led away. Knowing where they were going made Holden's stomach burn. He wanted to yell out that the cops were fake, that they were killing people. But a riot with this many people in such a confined space would be a meat grinder. Maybe that was inevitable. But he wasn't going to be the one to start it. Someone else did. Holden could hear raised voices, the angry rumble of the mob, followed by the electronically amplified voice of someone in a riot helmet yelling for people to get back. And then a gunshot, a brief pause, then a fusillade. 
people screamed. The entire crowd around Holden and Miller surged in two opposing directions, some of the people rushing toward the sound of the conflict, but many more of them running away from it. Holden spun in the current of bodies. Miller reached out and grabbed the back of his shirt, gripping it in his fist and yelling for Holden to stay close. About a dozen meters down the corridor, in a coffee shop seating area separated by a waist-high black iron fence, one of the mafia thugs had been cut off from his group by a dozen citizens. Gun drawn, he was backing up and yelling at them to move aside. They kept advancing, their faces wild with the drunken frenzy of mob violence. The mafia thug fired once, and one small body staggered forward, then fell to the ground at the thug's feet. Holden couldn't tell if it was a boy or a girl, but they couldn't be more than thirteen or fourteen years old. The thug moved forward, looking down at the small, thin figure at his feet, and pointed his gun at them again. It was too much. Holden found himself running down the corridor toward the thug, gun drawn and screaming for people to get out of the way. When he was about seven meters away, the crowd split apart enough for him to begin firing. Half his shots went wild, hitting the coffee shop counter and walls, one round blowing a stack of ceramic plates into the air. But a few of them hit the thug, staggering him back. Holden vaulted the waist-high metal fence and came to a sliding halt about three meters from the fake cop and his victim. Holden's gun fired one last time, and then the slide locked in the open position to let him know it was empty. The thug didn't fall down. He straightened up, looked down at his torso, and then looked up and pointed his gun at Holden's face. Holden had time to count the three bullets that were smashed against the heavy chest armor of the thug's riot gear. Die gloriously in a hail of bullets, he thought. The thug said, Stupid mother fuck, and his head snapped back in a spray of red. He slumped to the floor. Gap at the neck, remember? Miller said from behind him. Chest armor's too thick for a pistol. Suddenly dizzy, Holden bent over at the waist, gasping for air. He tasted lemon at the back of his throat and swallowed twice to stop himself from throwing up. He was afraid it would be full of blood and stomach lining. He didn't need to see that. Thanks, he gasped out, turning his head toward Miller. Miller just nodded vaguely in his direction, then walked over to the guard and nudged him with one foot. Holden stood up and looked around the corridor, waiting for the inevitable wave of vengeful mafia enforcers to come crashing down on them. He didn't see any. He and Miller were standing in a quiet island of calm in the midst of Armageddon. All around them, tendrils of violence were whipping into high gear. People were running in every direction. The Mafia goons were yelling in booming amplified voices and punctuating the threats with periodic gunfire. But there were only hundreds of them, and there were many thousands of angry and panicked civilians. Miller gestured at the chaos. This is what happens, he said. Give a bunch of yahoos the equipment and they think they know what they're doing. Holden crouched beside the fallen child. It was a boy, maybe thirteen with Asian features and dark hair. His chest had a gaping wound in it, blood trickling out instead of gushing. He didn't have a pulse that Holden could find. Holden picked him up anyway, looking around for some place to take him. He's dead, Miller said as he replaced the cartridge he'd fired. Go to hell, we don't know. If we can get him to the ship, maybe... Miller shook his head a sad but distant expression on his face as he looked at the child in Holden's arms. He took high-caliber round to the center of mass, Miller said. He's gone. Fuck me, Holden said. You keep saying that. A bright neon sign flashed above the corridor that led out of the casino levels and onto the ramps down to the docks. Thank you for playing, it read, and... You're always a winner on Eros. Below it, two ranks of men in heavy combat armor blocked the way. They might have given up on crowd control in the casinos, but they weren't letting anyone go. 
Holden and Miller crouch behind an overturned coffee cart a hundred meters from the soldiers. As they watched, a dozen or so people made a dash toward the guards and were summarily mowed down by machine gun fire, then fell to the deck beside those who had tried before. I count thirty-four of them, Miller said. How many can you handle? Holden spun to look at him in surprise, but Miller's face told him the former cop was joking. Kidding aside, how do we get past that? Holden said. Thirty men with machine guns and a clear line of sight. No cover to speak of for the last twenty meters or so, Miller said. We don't get past that. Chapter 30 Miller They sat on the floor with their backs to a bank of pachinko machines no one was playing, watching the ebb and flow of the violence around them like it was a soccer game. Miller's hat was perched on his bent knee. He felt the vibration against his back when one of the displays cycled through its dupe call. The lights glittered and glowed. Holden beside him was breathing hard, like he'd run a race. Out beyond them, like something from Hieronymus Bosch, the casino levels of Eros prepared for death. The riot's momentum had spent itself for now. Men and women gathered together in small groups. Guards strode through, threatening and scattering any bunch that got too large or unruly. Something was burning fast enough that the air scrubbers couldn't get out the smell of melting plastic. The Bangra Muzak mixed with weeping and screaming and wails of despair. Some idiot was shouting at one of the so-called cops. He was a lawyer. He was getting all of this on video. Whoever was responsible was going to be in big trouble. Miller watched a bunch of people start to gather around the confrontation. The guy in the riot gear listened, nodded, and shot the lawyer once in the kneecap. The crowd dispersed, except for one woman, the lawyer's wife or girlfriend, bent down over him screaming. And in the privacy of Miller's skull, everything slowly fell apart. He was aware of having two different minds. One was the Miller he was used to, familiar with the one who was thinking about what was going to happen when he got out, what the next step would be in connecting the dots between Phoebe Station, Ceres, Eros, and Juliet Mao, how to work the case. That version of him was scanning the crowd the way he might have watched the line at a crime scene, waiting for some detail, some change to catch his attention, send him in the right direction to solve the mystery. It was the short-sighted, idiotic part of him that couldn't conceive of his own personal extinction, and it thought surely, surely there was going to be an after. The other Miller was different. Quieter. Sad, maybe, but at peace. He'd read a poem many years before called The Death Self, and he hadn't understood the term until now. A knot at the middle of his psyche was untying. All the energy he'd put into holding things together, Ceres, his marriage, his career, himself, was coming free. He'd shot and killed more men in the past day than in his whole career as a cop. He'd started, only started to realize that he'd actually fallen in love with the object of his search, after he knew for certain that he'd lost her. He'd seen unequivocally that the chaos he'd dedicated his life to holding at bay was stronger and wider and more powerful than he would ever be. No compromise he could make would be enough. His death self was unfolding in him, and the dark blooming took no effort. It was a relief, a relaxation, a long, slow exhale after decades of holding it in. He was in ruins, but it was okay, because he was dying. Hey, Holden said. His voice was stronger than Miller had expected it might be. Yeah? Did you ever watch Misko and Marisco when you were a kid? Miller frowned. The kid show? He asked. The one with the five dinosaurs and the evil guy in the big pink hat, Holden said, then started humming a bright, boppy tune. Miller closed his eyes and then started singing along. The music had had words once. Now it was only a series of rises and falls, runs up and down a major scale with every dissonance resolved in the note that followed. 
Guess I must have, Miller said when they reached the end. I loved that show. I must have been eight or nine last time I saw it, Holden said. Funny how that stuff stays with you. Yeah, Miller said. He coughed, turned his head, and spat out something red. How are you holding together? I think I'm okay, Holden said. Then, a moment later, he added, As long as I don't stand up. Nauseated? Yeah, some. Me too. What is this? Holden asked. I mean, what the hell is this all about? Why are they doing this? It was a fair question. Slaughtering heroes, slaughtering any station in the belt, was a pretty easy job. Anyone with first-year orbital mechanics skills could find a way to sling a rock big enough and fast enough to crack the station open. With the effort Protogen had put in, they could have killed the air supply or drugged it or whatever the hell they wanted to do. This wasn't a murder. This wasn't even a genocide. And then there was all the observation equipment. Cameras, communications arrays, air and water sensors. There were only two reasons for that kind of shit. Either the mad bastards at Protogen got off on watching people die, or... They don't know, Miller said. What? He turned to look at Holden. The first Miller, the detective, the optimist, the one who needed to know, was driving now. His death self didn't fight. Because, of course, it didn't. It didn't fight anything. Miller raised his hand like he was giving a lecture to a rookie. They don't know what it's about. Or, you know, at least they don't know what's going to happen. This isn't even built like a torture chamber. It's all being watched, right? Water and air sensors. It's a Petri dish. They don't know what that shit that killed Julie does. And this is how they're finding out. Holden frowned. Don't they have laboratories? Places where you could maybe put that crap on some animals or something? Because as experimental design goes, this seems a little messed up. Maybe they need a really big sample size, Miller said. Or maybe it's not about the people. Maybe it's about what happens to the station. There's a cheery thought, Holden said. The Julie Mao in Miller's mind brushed a lock of hair out of her eyes. She was frowning, looking thoughtful, interested, concerned. It all had to make sense. It was like one of those basic orbital mechanics problems where every hitch and veer seemed random until all the variables slipped into place. What had been inexplicable became inevitable. Julie smiled at him. Julie, as she had been. As he imagined she had been. The miller who hadn't resigned himself to death smiled back. And then she was gone, his mind shifting to the noise from the pachinko machines and the low, demonic wailing of the crowds. Another group... Twenty men hunkered low like linebackers made a rush toward the mercenaries guarding the opening to the port. The gunmen mowed them down. If we had enough people, Holden said after the sound of machine guns fell away, we could make it. They couldn't kill all of us. That's what the patrol goons are for, Miller said. Make sure no one can organize a big enough push. Keep stirring the pot. But if it was a mob, I mean a really big mob, it could... Maybe, Miller agreed. Something in his chest clicked in a way it hadn't a minute before. He took a slow, deep breath, and the click happened again. He could feel it deep in his left lung. At least Naomi got away, Holden said. That is good. She's amazing. She'd never put Amos and Alex in danger if she could help it. I mean, she's serious. Professional. Strong, you know? I mean, she's really, really... Pretty, too, Miller said. Great hair. Love the eyes. No, that wasn't what I meant, Holden said. You don't think she's a good-looking woman? She's my XO, Holden said. She's, you know, off limits. Holden sighed. She got away, didn't she? Holden asked. Almost for sure. They were silent. One of the linebackers coughed, stood up, and limped back into the casino, 
trailing blood from a hole in his ribs. The Bhangra gave way to an Afropop medley with a low, sultry voice singing in languages Miller didn't know. She'd wait for us, Holden said. Don't you think she'd wait for us? Almost for sure, Miller's death self said, not particularly caring if it was a lie. He thought about it for a long moment, then turned to face Holden again. Hey, just so you know it, I'm not exactly at my best right now. Okay? All right. The glowing orange lockdown lights on the tube station across the level clicked to green. Miller sat forward, interested. His back felt sticky, but it was probably just sweat. Other people had noticed the change, too. Like a current in a water tank, the attention of the nearby crowds shifted from the mercenaries blocking the way to the port to the brushed steel doors of the tube station. The doors opened, and the first zombies appeared. Men and women, their eyes glassy and their muscles slack, stumbled out through the open doors. Miller had seen a documentary feed about hemorrhagic fevers as part of his training on Ceres Station. Their movements were the same. Listless, driven, autonomic, like rabid dogs whose minds had already been given over to their disease. Hey, Miller said, his hand on Holden's shoulder. Hey, it's happening. An older man and a pair of emergency services scrubs approached the shambling newcomers. His hands were out before him, as if he could corral them by simple force of will. The first zombie in the pack turned empty eyes toward him and vomited up a spray of very familiar brown goo. Look, Holden said. I saw. No, look. All down the casino level, tube station lights were going off lockdown. Doors were opening. The people were pulsing toward the open tubes and the implicit, empty promise of escape, and away from the dead men and women walking out from them. Vomit, zombies, Miller said. From the rad shelters, Holden said. The thing, the organism. It goes faster on radiation, right? That's why What's-Her-Name was so freaky about the lights and the vac suit. Her name's Julie. And yeah, those incubators were for this. Right here. Miller said and sighed. He thought about standing up. Well, we may not die of radiation poisoning after all. Why not just pump that shit into the air? Holden asked. Anaerobic, remember? Miller said. Too much oxygen kills him. The vomit-covered emergency medicine guy was still trying to treat the shambling zombies like they were patients, like they were still humans. There were smears of the brown goo on people's clothes, on the walls. The tube doors opened again, and Miller saw half a dozen people dodge into a tube car coated in brown. The mob churned, unsure what to do. The group mind stretched past its breaking point. A riot cop jumped forward and started spraying down the zombies with gunfire. The entrance and exit wounds spilled out fine loops of black filament and the zombies went down. Miller chuckled even before he knew what was funny. Holden looked at him. They didn't know, Miller said. The bully boys in riot gear? They aren't gonna get pulled out. Meet for the machine, just like the rest of us. Holden made a small, approving sound. Miller nodded, but something was niggling at the back of his mind. The thugs from Ceres and their stolen armor were being sacrificed. That didn't mean everyone was. He leaned forward. The archway leading to the port was still manned. Mercenary fighters in formation, guns at the ready. If anything, they looked more disciplined now than they had before. Miller watched as the guy in the back with extra insignia on his armor barked into a mic. This would sustain life indefinitely. You want a beer? Amos asked. You're having beer for breakfast? Figure it's dinner for you, Amos said. The man was right. Miller needed sleep. He hadn't managed more than a catnap since they'd scuttled the stealth ship, and that had been plagued by strange dreams. He yawned at the thought of yawning, but the tension in his gut said he was more likely to spend the day watching news feeds than resting. 
It's probably breakfast again, Miller said. Want some beer for breakfast? Amos asked. Sure. Walking through the Rosinante felt surreal. The quiet hum of the air recyclers, the softness of the air. The journey out to Julie's ship was a haze of pain medication and sickness. The time on Eros before that was a nightmare that wouldn't fade. To walk through the spare, functional corridors, thrust gravity holding him gently to the floor, with very little chance of anyone trying to kill him, felt suspicious. When he imagined Julie walking with him, it wasn't so bad. As he ate, his terminal chimed, the automatic reminder for another blood flush. He stood, adjusted his hat, and headed off to let the needles and pressure injectors do their worst. The captain was already there and hooked into a station when Miller arrived. Holden looked like he'd slept, but not well. There weren't the bruised dark marks under his eyes that Miller had, but his shoulders were tense, his brow on the edge of furrowed. Miller wondered whether he'd been a little too hard on the guy. I told you so could be an important message, but the burden of innocent death, of the chaos of a failing civilization, might also be too much for one man to carry. Or maybe he was still mooning over Naomi. Holden raised the hand that wasn't encased in medical equipment. Morning, Miller said. Hey, decided where we're going yet? Not yet. Getting harder and harder to get to Mars, Miller said, easing himself into the familiar embrace of the medical station. If that's what you're aiming for, you'd better do it soon. While there's still a Mars, you mean? For instance, Miller agreed. The needles snaked out on gently articulated armatures. Miller looked at the ceiling, trying not to tense up as the lines forced their way into his veins. There was a moment stinging, then a low, dull ache, and then numbness. The display above him announced the state of his body to doctors who were watching young soldiers die miles above Olympus Mons. Do you think they'd stop? Holden asked. I mean, Earth has got to be doing this because Protogen owns some generals or senators or something, right? It's all because they want to be the only ones who have this thing. If Mars has it too... Protogen doesn't have a reason to fight. Miller blinked. Before he could pick his answer, they'd try to annihilate Mars completely, or it's gone too far for that, or exactly how naive are you, Captain? Holden went on. Screw it. We've got the data files. I'm going to broadcast them. Miller's reply was as easy as reflex. No, you aren't. Holden propped himself up. Storm clouds in his expression. I appreciate that you might have a reasonable difference of opinion, he said, but this is still my ship. You're a passenger. True, Miller said. But you have a hard time shooting people, and you're going to have to shoot me before you send that thing out. I'm what? The new blood flowed into Miller's system like a tickle of ice water crawling toward his heart. The medical monitor shifted to a new pattern counting up the anomalous cells as they hit its filters. You are going to have to shoot me, Miller said, slowly this time. Twice now you've had the choice of whether or not to break the solar system, and both times you've screwed it up. I don't want to see you strike out. I think you may have an exaggerated idea of how much influence the second-in-command of a long-distance water hauler actually has. Yes, there's a war, and yes, I was there when it started up. But the Belt has hated the inner planets since a long time before the Cant was attacked. You've got the inner planets divided up too, Miller said. Holden tilted his head. Earth has always hated Mars, Holden said like he was reporting that water was wet. When I was in the Navy, we ran projections for this. Battle plans if Earth and Mars ever really got into it. Earth loses. Unless they hit first, hit hard, and don't let up. Earth just plain loses. Maybe it was distance. Maybe it was a failure of imagination. Miller had never seen the inner planets as divided. Seriously? he asked. They're the colony, but they have all the best toys and everyone knows it, Holden said. 
Everything that's happening out there right now has been building up for a hundred years. If it hadn't been there to start with, this couldn't have happened. That's your defense? Not my powder keg? I just brought the match? I'm not making a defense, Holden said. His blood pressure and heart rate were spiking. We've been through this, Miller said. So let me just ask, why is it you think this time will be different? The needles in Miller's arm seemed to heat up almost to the point of being painful. He wondered if that was normal, if every blood flush he had was going to feel the same way. This time is different, Holden said. All the crap that's going on out there is what happens when you have imperfect information. Mars and the Belt wouldn't have been going after each other in the first place if they'd known what we know now. Earth and Mars wouldn't be shooting each other if everyone knew the fight was being engineered. The problem isn't that people know too much. It's that they don't know enough. Something hissed, and Miller felt a wave of chemical relaxation swim through him. He resented it, but there was no calling the drugs back. You can't just throw information at people, Miller said. You have to know what it means, what it's going to do. There was a case back on Ceres. Little girl got killed. For the first eighteen hours, we were all sure Daddy did it. He was a felon, a drunk. He was the last one who saw her breathing. All the classic signs. Hour nineteen, we get a tip. Turned out Daddy owed a lot of money to one of the local syndicates. All of a sudden, things are more complicated. We have more suspects. Do you think if I'd been broadcasting everything I knew, Daddy would still have been alive when the tip came? Or would someone have put it all together and done the obvious thing? Miller's medical station chimed. Another new cancer. He ignored it. Holden's cycle was just finishing, the redness of his cheek speaking as much to the fresh, healthy blood in his body as to his emotional state. That's the same ethos they have, Holden said. Who? Protogen. You may be on different sides, but you're playing the same game. If everyone said what they knew, none of this would have happened. If the first lab tech on Phoebe who saw something weird had gotten on his system and said, Hey, everyone, look, this is weird, none of this would have happened. Yeah, Miller said. Because telling everyone there's an alien virus that wants to kill them all is a great way to maintain calm and order. Miller, Holden said. I don't mean to panic you, but there's an alien virus, and it wants to kill everyone. Miller shook his head and smiled like Holden had said something funny. So look, maybe I can't point a gun at you and make you do the right thing. But let me ask you something, okay? Fine, Holden said. Miller leaned back. The drugs were making his eyelids heavy. What happens? Miller said. There was a long pause. Another chime from the medical system. Another rush of cold through Miller's abused veins. What happens? Holden repeated. It occurred to Miller he could have been more specific. He forced his eyes open again. You broadcast everything we've got. What happens? The war stops. People go after Protogen. There's some holes in that, but let it go. What happens after that? Holden was quiet for a few heartbeats. People start going after the Phoebe bug, he said. They start experimenting. They start fighting for it. If that little bastard's as valuable as Protogen thinks, you can't stop the war. All you can do now is change it. Holden frowned, angry lines at the corners of his mouth and eyes. Miller watched a little piece of the man's idealism die and was sorry that it gave him joy. So what happens if we get to Mars? Miller went on, his voice low. We trade out the protomolecule for more money than any of us have ever seen. Or maybe they just shoot you. Mars just wins against Earth. And the belt. Or you go to the OPA, who are the best hope the belt has of independence, and they're a bunch of crazy zealots half of them thinking they can actually sustain out there without Earth. And trust me, they'll probably shoot you too. 
Or you just tell everyone everything and pretend that however it comes down, you kept your hands clean. There's a right thing to do, Holden said. You don't have a right thing, friend, Miller said. You've got a whole plate full of maybe a little less wrong. Holden's blood flush finished. The captain pulled the needles out of his arm and let the thin metallic tentacles retract. As he rolled down his sleeve, the frown softened. People have a right to know what's going on, Holden said. Your argument boils down to you not thinking people are smart enough to figure out the right way to use it. Has anyone used anything you've broadcast as something besides an excuse to shoot someone they already didn't like? Giving them a new reason won't stop them killing each other, Miller said. You started these wars, Captain. Doesn't mean you can stop them. But you have to try. And how am I supposed to do that? Holden said. The distress in his voice could have been anger. It could have been prayer. Something in Miller's belly shifted, some inflamed organ calming enough to slip back into place. He hadn't been aware he'd felt wrong until he suddenly felt right again. You ask yourself, what happens? Miller said. Ask yourself, what Naomi'd do? Holden barked out a laugh. Is that how you make your decisions? Miller let his eyes close. Juliet Mao was there, sitting on the couch at her old apartment on Ceres, fighting the crew of the stealth ship to a standstill, burst open by the alien virus on the floor of her shower stall. Something like it, Miller said. The report from Ceres, a break from the usual competing press releases, came that night. The governing council of the OPA announced that a ring of Martian spies had been rooted out. The video feed showed the bodies floating out in industrial airlock in what looked like the old docks in Sector 6. At a distance, the victim seemed almost peaceful. The feed cut to the head of security. Captain Shadid looked older, harder. We regret the necessity of this action, she said to everyone everywhere. But in the cause of freedom, there can be no compromise. That's what it's come to, Miller thought, rubbing a hand across his chin. Pogroms, after all. Cut off just a hundred more heads, just a thousand more heads, just ten thousand more heads, and then we'll be free. A soft alert sounded, and a moment later... Gravity shifted a few degrees to Miller's left. Course change. Holden had made a decision. He found the captain sitting alone and staring at a monitor in ops. The glow lit his face from below, casting shadows up into his eyes. The captain looked older, too. You make the broadcast? Miller asked. Nope. We're just one ship. We tell everyone what this thing is and that we've got it, we'll be dead before Protogen. Probably true, Miller said, sitting at an empty station with a grunt. The gimbaled seat shifted silently. We're going someplace. I don't trust them with it, Holden said. I don't trust any of them with that safe. Probably smart. I'm going to Tycho Station. There's someone there I... trust. Trust? Don't actively distrust. Naomi think it's the right thing? I don't know. I didn't ask her. But I think so. Close enough, Miller said. Holden looked up from the monitor for the first time. You know the right thing? Holden said. Yeah. What is it? Throw that safe into a long collision course with the sun and find a way to make sure no one ever ever goes to Eros or Phoebe again, Miller said. Pretend none of this ever happened. So why aren't we doing that? Miller nodded slowly. How do you throw away the Holy Grail? Chapter 37 Holden Alex had the Rosinante running at three-quarters of a G for two hours while the crew prepared and ate dinner. He would run it back up to three when the break was over, 
but in the meantime, Holden enjoyed standing on his own two legs at something not too far off from Earth gravity. It was a little heavy for Naomi and Miller, but neither of them complained. They both understood the need for haste. Once the gravity had dropped from the crush of high acceleration, the whole crew quietly gathered in the galley and started making dinner. Naomi blended together fake eggs and fake cheese. Amos cooked tomato paste and the last of their fresh mushrooms into a red sauce that actually smelled like the real thing. Alex, who had the duty watch, had forwarded ship ops down to a panel in the galley and sat at a table next to it, spreading the fake cheese paste and red sauce onto flat noodles, in hopes that the end result would approximate lasagna. Holden had oven duty, and had spent the lasagna prep time baking frozen lumps of dough into bread. The smell in the galley was not entirely unlike actual food. Miller had followed the crew into the galley, but seemed uncomfortable asking for something to do. Instead, he set the table, and then sat down at it and watched. He wasn't exactly avoiding Holden's eyes, but he wasn't going out of his way to catch his attention. By unspoken mutual agreement, no one had any of the news channels on. Holden was sure everyone would rush back to check the current state of the war as soon as dinner was over, but for now, they all worked in companionable silence. When the prep was done, Holden switched off bread duty and on to moving lasagna-filled cookware into and out of the oven. Naomi sat down next to Alex and began a quiet conversation with him about something she'd seen on the op screen. Holden split his time between watching her and watching the lasagna. She laughed at something Alex said, and unconsciously twisted one finger into her hair. Holden felt his belly tighten a notch. Out of the corner of his eye, he thought he saw Miller staring at him. When he looked, the detective had turned away, a hint of a smile on his face. Naomi laughed again. She had one hand on Alex's arm, and the pilot was blushing and talking as fast as his silly Martian drawl would let him. They looked like friends. That both made Holden happy and filled him with jealousy. He wondered if Naomi would ever be his friend again. She caught him looking and gave him a conspiratorial wink that probably would have made a lot of sense if he'd been able to hear what Alex was saying. He smiled and winked back, grateful just to be included in the moment. A sizzling sound from inside the oven called his attention back. The lasagna was beginning to bubble and run over the sides of the dishes. He pulled on his oven mitts and opened the door. Soup's on, he said, pulling the first of the dishes and putting it on the table. That's mighty ugly-looking soup, Amos said. Uh, yeah, Holden said. It's just something Mother Tamara used to say when she'd finished cooking. Not sure where it comes from. One of your three mothers did the cooking. How traditional, Naomi said with a smirk. Well, she split it pretty evenly with Caesar, one of my father's. Naomi smiled at him, a genuine smile now. It sounds really nice, she said. Big family like that. Yeah, it really was, he replied. A vision in his head of nuclear fire tearing apart the Montana farmhouse he'd grown up in, his family blowing into ash. If it happened, he was sure Miller would be there to let him know it was his fault. He wasn't sure he'd be able to argue anymore. As they ate, Holden felt a slow release of tension in the room. Amos belched loudly, then reacted to the chorus of protests by doing it again even more loudly. Alex retold the joke that had made Naomi laugh. Even Miller got into the mood and told a long and increasingly improbable story about hunting down a black market cheese operation that ended in a gunfight with nine naked Australians in an illegal brothel. By the finish of the story, Naomi was laughing so hard she drooled on her shirt and Amos kept repeating, No fucking way, like a mantra. The story was amusing enough, and the detective's dry delivery suited it well, but Holden only half listened. He watched his crew, saw the tension falling from their faces and shoulders. He and Amos were both from Earth, though if he had to guess, he'd say Amos had forgotten about his home world the first time he'd shipped out. Alex was from Mars, and clearly still loved it. 
One bad mistake on either side, and both planets might be radioactive rubble by the end of dinner. But right now, they were just friends having a meal together. It was right. It was what Holden had to keep fighting for. I actually remember that cheese shortage, Naomi said once Miller had stopped talking. Belt wide. That was your fault? Yeah, well, if they'd only been sneaking cheese past the government auditors, we wouldn't have had a problem, Miller said. But they had this habit of shooting the other cheese smugglers. Makes the cops notice. Bad business. Over fucking cheese? Amos said, tossing his fork onto his plate with a clack. Are you serious? I mean, drugs or gambling or something, but cheese? Gambling's legal most places, Miller said and a chemistry class dropout can cook up just about any drug you like in his bathroom. No way to control supply. Real cheese comes from Earth or Mars, Naomi added. And after they tack on shipping costs and the Coalition's 50% in taxes, it costs more than fuel pellets. We wound up with 130 kilos of Vermont cheddar in the evidence lockup, Miller said. Street value, that would have probably bought someone their own ship. It had disappeared by the end of the day. We wrote it up as lost to spoilage. No one said a word as long as everyone went home with a brick. The detective leaned back in his chair with a distant look on his face. My God, that was good cheese, he said with a smile. Yeah, well, this fake stuff does taste like shit, Amos said, then added in a hurry. No offense, boss, you did a real good job whipping it up. But that's still weird to me. Fighting over cheese. It's why they killed Eros, Naomi said. Miller nodded but said nothing. How do you figure that? Amos said. How long have you been flying? Naomi asked. I don't know, Amos replied, his lips compressing as he did the mental math. Twenty-five years, maybe? Fly with a lot of belters, right? Yeah, Amos said. Can't get better shipmates than belters, except me, of course. You've flown with us for twenty-five years. You like us. You've learned the patois. I bet you can order a beer and a hooker on any station in the belt. Heck, if you were a little taller and a lot skinnier, you could pass for one of us by now. Amos smiled, taking it as a compliment. But you still don't get us, Naomi said. Not really. No one who grew up with free air ever will. And that's why they can kill a million and a half of us to figure out what their bug really does. Hey now, Alex interjected. You serious about that? You think the inners and outers see themselves as that different? Of course they do, Miller said. We're too tall, too skinny, our heads look too big, and our joints too knobby. Holden noticed Naomi glancing across the table at him, a speculative look on her face. I like your head, Holden thought at her, but the radiation hadn't given him telepathy either because her expression didn't change. We've practically got our own language now, Miller said. Ever see an Earther try to get directions in the deep dig? Turan spin pao schlag tu a man ido, Naomi said with a heavy belter accent. Go spinward to the tube station, which will take you back to the docks, Amos said. The fuck's so hard about that? I had a partner wouldn't have known that after two years on series, Miller said. And Havelock wasn't stupid. He just wasn't from there. Holden listened to them talk and pushed cold pasta around on his plate with a chunk of bread. Okay, we get it, he said. You're weird. But to kill a million and a half people over some skeletal differences in slang? People have been getting tossed into ovens for less than that ever since they invented ovens, Miller said. If it makes you feel better, most of us think you're squat and microcephalic. Alex shook his head. Don't make a lick of sense to me turning that bug loose, even if you hated every single human on Eros personally. Who knows what that thing'll do? Naomi walked to the galley sink and washed her hands, the running water drawing everyone's attention. I've been thinking about that, she said, then turned around, wiping her hands on a towel. The point of it, I mean. Miller started to speak, but Holden hushed him with a quick gesture and waited for Naomi to continue. So, she said, I've been thinking of it as a computing problem. 
If the virus or nanomachine or protomolecule or whatever was designed, it has a purpose, right? Definitely, Holden said. And it seems like it's trying to do something, something complex. It doesn't make sense to go to all that trouble just to kill people. Those changes it makes look intentional, just not complete to me. I can see that, Holden said. Alex and Amos nodded along with him, but stayed quiet. So maybe the issue is that the protomolecule isn't smart enough yet. You can compress a lot of data down pretty small, but unless it's a quantum computer, processing takes space. The easiest way to get that processing in tiny machines is through distribution. Maybe the protomolecule isn't finishing its job because it just isn't smart enough to. Yet. Not enough of them. Alex said. Right, Naomi said, dropping the towel into a bin under the sink. So, you give them a lot of biomass to work with, and see what it is they are ultimately made to do. According to that guy in the video, they were made to hijack life on Earth and wipe us out, Miller said. And that, Holden said, is why Eros is perfect. Lots of biomass in a vacuum-sealed test tube. And if it gets out of hand, there's already a war going on. A lot of ships and missiles can be used for nuking Eros into glass if the threat seems real. Nothing to make us forget our differences like a new player butting in. Wow, Amos said. That is really, really fucked up. Okay, but even though that's probably what's happened, Holden said, I still can't believe that there are enough evil people all in one place to do it. This isn't a one-man operation. This is the work of dozens, maybe hundreds of very smart people. Does Protogen just go around recruiting every potential Stalin and Jack the Ripper it runs across? I'll make sure to ask Mr. Dresden, Miller said, an unreadable expression on his face, when we finally meet. Tycho's habitat ring spun serenely around the bloated zero-G factory globe in the center. The massive construction waldos that sprouted from the top were maneuvering an enormous piece of hull plating onto the side of the Nauvoo, looking at the station on the op screens while Alex finished up docking procedures. Holden felt something like relief. So far, Tycho was the one place no one had tried to shoot them, or blow them up, or vomit goo on them, and that practically made it home. Holden looked at the research safe, clamped securely to the deck, and hoped that he hadn't just killed everyone on the station by bringing it there. As if on cue, Miller pulled himself through the deck hatch and drifted over to the safe. He gave Holden a meaningful look. Don't say it. I'm already thinking it, Holden said. Miller shrugged and drifted over to the op station. Big, he said nodding at the Nauvoo on Holden's screen. Generation ship, Holden said. Something like that will give us the stars. Or a lonely death on a long trip to nowhere, Miller replied. You know, Holden said, some species' version of the great galactic adventure is shooting virus-filled bullets at their neighbors. I think ours is pretty damn noble in comparison. Miller seemed to consider that, nodded, and watch Tycho Station swell on the monitor as Alex brought them closer. The detective kept one hand on the console, making the micro-adjustments necessary to remain still, even as the pilot's maneuvers threw unexpected bursts of gravity at them from every direction. Holden was strapped into his chair. Even concentrating, he couldn't handle zero-g and intermittent thrust half that well. His brain just couldn't be trained out of the twenty-odd years he'd spent with gravity as a constant. Naomi was right. It would be so easy to see belters as alien. Hell, if you gave them time to develop some really efficient implantable oxygen storage and recycling and kept trimming the environment suits down to the minimum necessary for heat, you might wind up with belters who spent more time outside their ships and stations than in. Maybe that was why they were taxed to subsistence level. The bird was out of the cage, but you couldn't let it stretch its wings too far or it might forget it belonged to you. You trust this Fred? Miller asked. Sort of, Holden said. 
He treated us well last time when everyone else wanted us dead or locked up. Miller grunted as if that proved nothing. He's OPA, right? Yeah, Holden said. But I think maybe the real OPA. Not the cowboys who want to shoot it out with the inners. And not those nuts on the radio calling for war. Fred's a politician. What about the ones keeping Ceres in line? I don't know, Holden said. I don't know about them. But Fred's the best shot we have. Least wrong. Fair enough, Miller said. We won't find a political solution to Protogen, you know. Yeah, Holden said, then began unbuckling his harness as the Rosie slid into its berth with a series of metallic bangs. But Fred isn't just a politician. Fred sat behind his large wooden desk, reading the notes Holden had written about Eros, the search for Julie, and the discovery of the stealth ship. Miller sat across from him, watching Fred like an entomologist might watch a new species of bug, guessing if it was likely to sting. Holden was a little farther away on Fred's right, trying not to keep looking at the clock on his hand terminal. On the huge screen behind the desk, the Nauvoo drifted by like the metal bones of some dead and decaying leviathan. Holden could see the tiny spots of brilliant blue light where workers used welding torches on the hull and frame. To occupy himself, he started counting them. He'd reached forty-three when a small shuttle appeared in his field of view, a load of steel beams clutched in a pair of heavy manipulator arms, and flew toward the half-built generation ship. The shuttle shrank to a point no larger than the tip of a pen before it stopped. The Nauvoo suddenly shifted in Holden's mind from a large ship relatively nearby to a gigantic ship farther away. It gave him a short rush of vertigo. His hand terminal beeped at almost the same instant that Miller's did. He didn't even look at it. He just tapped the face to shut it up. He knew this routine by now. He pulled out a small bottle took out two blue pills and swallowed them dry. He could hear Miller pouring pills out of his bottle as well. The ship's expert medical system dispensed them for him every week with a warning that failing to take them on schedule would lead to horrific death. He took them. He would for the rest of his life. Missing a few would just mean that wasn't very long. Fred finished reading and threw his hand terminal down on the desk then rubbed his eyes with the heels of his hands for several seconds. To Holden, he looked older than the last time they'd seen each other. I have to tell you, Jim, I have no idea what to make of this, he finally said. Miller looked at Holden and mouthed Jim at him with a question on his face. Holden ignored him. Did you read Naomi's edition at the end? Holden asked. The bit with the network nanobugs for increased processing power? Yeah, that bit, Holden said. It makes sense, Fred. Fred laughed without humor, then stabbed one finger at his terminal. That, he said, that only makes sense to a psychopath. No one sane could do that, no matter what they thought they might get out of it. Miller cleared his throat. You have something to add, Mr. Miller? Fred asked. Miller, the detective replied. Yes. First, and all respect here, don't kid yourself. Genocide's old school. Second, the facts aren't in question. Protogen infected Eero Station with a lethal alien disease, and they're recording the results. Why doesn't matter. We need to stop them. And, Holden said, we think we can track down where their observation station is. Fred leaned back in his chair, the fake leather and metal frame creaking under his weight, even in the one-third G. Stop them how? he asked. Fred knew. He just wanted to hear them say it out loud. Miller played along. I'd say we fly to their station and shoot them. Who is we? Fred asked. There are a lot of OPA hotheads looking to shoot it out with Earth and Mars, Holden said. We give them some real bad guys to shoot at instead. Fred nodded in a way that didn't mean he agreed to anything. And your sample? The captain's safe? Fred said. That's mine, 
Holden said. No negotiation on that. Fred laughed again, though there was some humor in it this time. Miller blinked in surprise and then stifled a grin. Why would I agree to that? Fred asked. Holden lifted his chin and smiled. What if I told you that I've hidden the safe on a planetesimal, booby-trapped with enough plutonium to break anyone who touches it into their component atoms even if they could find it, he said. Fred stared at him for a moment, then said, But you didn't. Well, no, Holden said. But I could tell you I did. You are too honest, Fred said. And you can't trust anyone with something this big. You already know what I'm going to do with it. That's why, until we can agree on something better, you're leaving it with me. Fred nodded. Yes, he said. I guess I am. Chapter 38 Miller The observation deck looked out over the Nauvoo as the behemoth slowly came together. Miller sat on the edge of a soft couch, his fingers laced over his knee, his gaze on the immense vista of the construction. After his time on Holden's ship, and before that in Eros, with its old-style closed architecture, a view so wide seemed artificial. The deck itself was wider than the Rosinante, and decorated with soft ferns and sculpted ivies. The air recyclers were eerily quiet, and even though the spin gravity was nearly the same as Ceres's, the Coriolis felt subtly wrong. He'd lived in the belt his whole life, and he'd never been anywhere that was designed so carefully for the tasteful display of wealth and power. It was pleasant, as long as he didn't think about it too much. He wasn't the only one drawn to the open spaces of Tycho. A few dozen station workers sat in groups or walked through together. An hour before, Amos and Alex had gone by, deep in their own conversation. So he wasn't entirely surprised when, standing up and walking back toward the docks, he saw Naomi sitting by herself with a bowl of food cooling on a tray at her side. Her gaze was fixed on her hand terminal. Hey, he said. Naomi looked up, recognized him, and smiled distractedly. Hey, she said. Miller nodded toward the hand terminal and shrugged a question. Calm data from that ship, she said. It was always that ship, Miller noticed. The same way people would call a particularly god-awful crime scene that place. It's all tight beam, so I thought it wouldn't be so hard to triangulate, but... Not so much? Naomi lifted her eyebrows and sighed. I've been plotting orbits, she said but nothing's fitting. There could be relay drones, though. Moving targets the ship system was calibrated for that would send the message on to the actual station. Or another drone, and then the station, or... who knows? Any data coming off Eros? I assume so, Naomi said, but I don't know that it would be any easier to make sense of than this. Can't your OPA friends do something? Miller asked. They've got more processing power than one of these handhelds. Probably have a better activity map of the belt, too. Probably, she said. He couldn't tell if she didn't trust this Fred that Holden had given them over to, or just needed to feel like the investigation was still hers. He considered telling her to back off it for a while, to let the others carry it. But he didn't see he had the moral authority to make that one stick. What? Naomi said, an uncertain smile on her lips. Miller blinked. You were laughing a little, Naomi said. I don't think I've ever seen you laugh before. I mean, not when something was funny. I was just thinking about something a partner of mine told me about letting cases go when you got pulled from them. What did he say? That it's like taking half a shit, Miller said. Had a way with words, that one. It was all right for an earther. Miller said, and something tickled at the back of his mind. Then a moment later, Ah, oh, Jesus, I may have something. 
Havelock met him in an encrypted drop site that lived on a server cluster on Ganymede. The latency kept them from anything like real-time conversation. It was more like dropping notes, but it did the trick. The waiting made Miller anxious. He sat with his terminal set to refresh every three seconds. Would you like anything else? The woman asked. Another bourbon? That'd be great, Miller said, and checked to see if Havelock had replied yet. He hadn't. Like the observation deck, the bar looked out on the Nauvoo, though from a slightly different angle. The great ship looked foreshortened, and arcs of energy lit it where a layer of ceramic was annealing. A bunch of religious zealots were going to load themselves into that massive ship, that small, self-sustaining world, and launch themselves into the darkness between the stars. Generations would live and die in it. And if they were mind-bendingly lucky enough to find a planet worth living on the end of the journey, the people who came out of it would never have known Earth, or Mars, or the Belt. They'd be aliens already. And if whatever had made the protomolecule was out there to greet them, then what? Would they all die, like Julie had? There was life out there. They had proof of it now. And the proof came in the shape of a weapon. So what did that tell him? Except that maybe the Mormons deserved a little warning about what they were signing their great-grandkids up for. He laughed to himself when he realized that was exactly what Holden would say. The bourbon arrived at the same moment his hand terminal chimed. The video file had a layered encryption that took almost a minute to unpack. That alone was a good sign. The file opened and Havelock grinned out from the screen. He was in better shape than he'd been on series, and it showed in the shape of his jaw. His skin was darker, but Miller didn't know if it was purely cosmetic or if his old partner had been basking in false sunlight for the joy of it. It didn't matter. It made the Earther look rich and fit. Hey, buddy, Havelock said. Good to hear from you. After what happened with Shadid and the OPA, I was afraid we were going to be on different sides now. I'm glad you got out of there before the shit hit the fan. Yeah, I'm still with Protogen, and I've got to tell you, these guys are kind of scary. I mean, I've worked contract security before, and I'm pretty clear when someone's hardcore. These guys aren't cops. They're troops. You know what I mean? Officially, I don't know dick about a belt station, but you know how it is. I'm from Earth. There are a lot of these guys who gave me shit about series, working with the vacuum heads, that kind of thing. But the way things are here, it's better to be on the good side of the bad guys. It's just that kind of job. There was an apology in his expression. Miller understood. Working in some corporations was like going to prison. You adopted the views of the people around you. A belter might get hired on, but he'd never belong like Ceres, just pointed the other way. If Havelock had made friends with a set of inner planet mercs who spent their nights off curb-stomping belters outside bars, then he had. But making friends didn't mean he was one of them. So, off the record, yeah, there's a black op station in the belt. I hadn't heard it called Thoth, but it could be. Some sort of very scary deep research and development lab. Heavy science crew, but not a huge place. I think discreet would be the word. Lots of automated defenses, but not a big ground crew. I don't need to tell you that leaking the coordinates would get my ass killed out here. So wipe the file when you're done, and let's not talk again for a long, long time. The data file was small. Three lines of plain text orbital notation. Miller put it into his hand terminal and killed the file off the Ganymede server. The bourbon still sat beside his hand, and he drank it off neat. The warmth in his chest might have been the alcohol, or it might have been victory. He turned on the hand terminal's camera. Thanks. I owe you one. Here's part of the payment. What happened on Eros? Protogen was part of it, and it's big. If you get a chance to drop your contract with them... Do it. And if they try to rotate you out to that black op station, 
don't go. Miller frowned. The sad truth was that Havelock was probably the last real partner he'd had. The only one who'd looked on him as an equal, as the kind of detective Miller had imagined himself to be. Take care of yourself, partner, he said. Then ended the file, encrypted it, shipped it out. He had the bone-deep feeling he wasn't ever going to talk to Havelock again. He put through a connection request to hold him. The screen filled with the captain's open, charming, vaguely naive face. Miller, Holden said. Everything okay? Yeah, great. But I need to talk to your Fred guy. Can you arrange that? Holden frowned and nodded at the same time. Sure, what's going on? I know where Thoth Station is, Miller said. You know what? Miller nodded. Where the hell did you get that? Miller grinned. If I gave you that information and it got out, a good man would get killed, he said. You see how that works? It struck Miller, as he, Holden, and Naomi waited for Fred, that he knew an awful lot of inner planet types fighting against the inner planets. Or at least not for them. Fred, supposedly a high-ranking OPA member, Havelock, three-quarters of the crew of the Rosinante, Juliet Mao. It wasn't what he would have expected. But maybe that was short-sighted. He was seeing the thing the way Shadid and Protogen did. There were two sides fighting, that was true enough, but they weren't the inner planets versus the belters. They were the people who thought it was a good idea to kill people who looked or acted differently against the people who didn't. Or maybe that was a crap analysis, too. Because given the chance to put the scientist from the protogen pitch, the board of directors, and whoever this Dresden piece of shit was into an airlock, Miller knew he'd agonize about it for maybe half a second after he blew them all into vacuum. Didn't put him on the side of angels. Mr. Miller, what can I do for you? Fred, the Earther OPA. He wore a button-down shirt and a nice pair of slacks. He could have been an architect or a mid-level administrator for any number of good, respectable corporations. Miller tried to imagine him coordinating a battle. You can convince me that you've really got what it takes to kill the Protogen Station, Miller said. Then I'll tell you where it is. Fred's eyebrows rose a millimeter. Come into my office, Fred said. Miller went. Holden and Naomi followed. When the doors closed behind them, Fred was the first to speak. I'm not sure exactly what you want from me. I'm not in the habit of making my battle plans public knowledge. We're talking about storming a station, Miller said. Something with damn good defenses and maybe more ships like the one that killed the Canterbury. No disrespect intended, but that's a pretty tall order for a bunch of amateurs like the OPA. Uh, Miller? Holden said. Miller held up a hand, cutting him off. I can give you the directions to Thoth Station, Miller said. But if I do that, and it turns out you haven't got the punch to see this through, then a lot of people die and nothing gets resolved. I'm not up for that. Fred cocked his head, like a dog hearing an unfamiliar sound. Naomi and Holden shared a glance that Miller couldn't parse. This is a war, Miller said, warming to the subject. I've worked with the OPA before, and frankly you folks are a lot better at little guerrilla bullshit than at coordinating anything real. Half of the people who claim to speak for you are crackpots who happen to have a radio nearby. I see you've got a lot of money. I see you've got a nice office. What I don't see, what I need to see, is that you've got what it takes to bring these bastards down. Taking out a station isn't a game. I don't care how many simulations you've run. This is real now. If I'm going to help you, I need to know you can handle it. There was a long silence. Miller, Naomi said, You know who Fred is, right? The Tycho mouthpiece for the OPA, Miller said. That doesn't draw a whole lot of water with me. He's Fred Johnson, Holden said. 
Fred's eyebrows rose another millimeter. Miller frowned and crossed his arms. Colonel Frederick Lucius Johnson, Naomi said, clarifying. Miller blinked. The butcher of Anderson Station, he said. The same, Fred said. I have been talking with the Central Council of the OPA. I have a cargo ship with more than enough troops to secure the station. Air support is a state-of-the-art Martian torpedo bomber. The Rossi? Miller said. The Rosinante, Fred agreed. And while you may not believe it, I actually know what I'm doing. Miller looked at his feet, then up toward Holden. That, Fred Johnson, he said. I thought you knew, Holden said. Well, don't I feel like the flaming idiot, Miller said. It'll pass, Fred said. Was there anything else you wanted to demand? No, Miller said, and then, yes. I want to be part of the ground assault. When we take that station crew, I want to be there. Are you sure? Fred said. Taking out a station isn't a game. What makes you think you have what it takes? Miller shrugged. One thing it takes is the coordinates, Miller said. I have got those. Fred laughed. Mr. Miller, if you'd like to go down to this station and have whatever's waiting for us down there try to kill you along with the rest of us, I won't stand in your way. Thanks, Miller said. He pulled up his hand terminal and sent the plain text coordinates to Fred. There you go. My source is solid, but he's not working from first-hand data. We should confirm before we commit. I'm not an amateur, Colonel Fred Johnson said, looking at the file. Miller nodded, adjusted his hat, and walked out. Naomi and Holden flanked him. When they reached the wide, clean public hallway, Miller looked to his right, catching Holden's eyes. Really? I thought you knew, Holden said. Eight days later, the message came. The cargo ship Guy Molinari had arrived, full up with OPA soldiers. Havelock's coordinates had been verified. Something was sure as hell out there, and it appeared to be collecting the tight beam data from Eros. If Miller wanted to be part of this, the time had come to move out. He sat in his quarters in the Rosinante for what was likely the last time. He realized with a little twinge, equal parts surprise and sorrow, that he was going to miss the place. Holden, for all his faults and Miller's complaints, was a decent guy. In over his head and only half aware of the fact, but Miller could think of more than one person who fit that bill. He was going to miss Alex's odd, affected drawl and Amos's casual obscenity. He was going to wonder if and how Naomi ever worked things out with her captain. Leaving was a reminder of things he'd already known. That he didn't know what would come next. That he didn't have much money. And that while he was sure he could get back from Thoth Station, where and how he went from there was going to be improvisation. Maybe there would be another ship he could sign on with. Maybe he'd have to take a contract and save up some money to cover his new medical expenses. He checked the magazine in his gun, packed his spare clothes into the small, battered pack he'd taken on the transport from Ceres. Everything he owned still fit in it. He turned off the lights and made his way down the short corridor toward the ladder lift. Holden was in the galley, twitching nervously. The dread of the coming battle was already showing in the corners of the man's eyes. Well, Miller said. Here we go, eh? Yep, Holden said. It's been a hell of a ride, Miller said. Can't say it's all been pleasant, but... Yeah. Tell the others I said goodbye, Miller said. Will do, Holden said. Then, as Miller moved past him toward the lift... So, assuming we all actually live through this, where should we meet up? Miller turned. I don't understand, he said. Yeah, I know. Look, I trust Fred, or I wouldn't have come here. 
I think he's honorable, and he'll do the right thing by us. That doesn't mean I trust the whole OPA. After we get this thing done, I want the whole crew together, just in case we need to get out in a hurry. Something painful happened under Miller's sternum. Not a sharp pain, just a sudden ache. His throat felt thick. He coughed to clear it. As soon as we get the place secure, I'll get in touch, Miller said. Okay, but don't take too long. If Thoth Station has a whorehouse left standing, I'm going to need help prying Amos out of it. Miller opened his mouth, closed it, and tried again. Aye, aye, Captain, he said, forcing a lightness into his voice. Be careful, Holden said. Miller left, pausing in the passageway between ship and station until he was sure he'd stopped weeping, and then making his way to the cargo ship and the assault. Chapter 39 Holden The Rosinante hurtled through space like a dead thing, tumbling in all three axes. With the reactor shut down and all the cabin air vented, it radiated neither heat nor electromagnetic noise. If it weren't for its speeding toward Thoth Station significantly faster than a rifle shot, the ship would be indistinguishable from the rocks in the belt. Nearly half a million kilometers behind it, the Guy Molinari screamed the Rossi's innocence to anyone who would listen, and fired its engines in a long, slow deceleration. With the radio off, Holden couldn't hear what they were saying, but he'd helped write the warning, so it echoed in his head anyway. Warning. Accidental detonation on the cargo ship Guy Molinari has broken large cargo container free. Warning to all ships in its path. Container is traveling at a high speed and without independent control. Warning. There had been some discussion about not broadcasting at all. Because Thoth was a black station, they'd be using only passive sensors. Scanning every direction with radar or radar would light them up like a Christmas tree. It was possible that with its reactor off, the Rosinante could sneak up on the station without being noticed. But Fred had decided that if they were somehow spotted, it would be suspicious enough to probably warrant an immediate counterattack. So, instead of playing it quiet, they decided to play it loud, and count on confusion to help them. With luck, the Thoth Station security systems would scan them, and see that they were in fact a big chunk of metal flying on an unchanging vector and lacking apparent life support, and ignore them just long enough to let them get close. From far away, the station's defense systems might be too much for the Rossi. But up close, the maneuverable little ship could dart around the station and cut it to pieces. All their cover story needed to do was buy them time while the station's security team tried to figure out what was going on. Fred, and by extension everyone in the assault, was betting that the station wouldn't fire until they were absolutely certain they were under attack. Protogen had gone to a lot of trouble to hide their research lab in the belt. As soon as they launched their first missile, their anonymity was lost forever. With the war going on, monitors would pick up the fusion torch trails and wonder what was up. Firing a weapon would be Thoth Station's last resort. In theory. Sitting alone inside the tiny bubble of air contained in his helmet, Holden knew that if they were wrong, He'd never even realize it. The Rossi was flying blind. All radio contact was down. Alex had a mechanical timepiece with a glow-in-the-dark face and a to-the-second schedule memorized. They couldn't beat Thoth at high-tech, so they were flying as low-tech as you could get. If they'd missed their guess and the station fired on them, the Rossi would be vaporized without warning. Holden had once dated a Buddhist who said that death was merely a different state of being, and people only feared the unknown that lay behind that transition. Death, without warning, was preferable, as it removed all fear. He felt he now had the counter-argument. To keep his mind busy, he ran through the plan again. When they were practically close enough to spit on Thoth Station, 
Alex would fire up the reactor and do a braking maneuver at nearly 10 Gs. The guy Molinari would begin spraying radio static and laser clutter at the station, to confuse its targeting package for the few moments the Rossi would need to come around on an attack vector. The Rossi would engage the station's defenses, disabling anything that could hurt the Molinari, while the cargo ship moved in to breach the station's hull and drop off her assault troops. There were any number of things wrong with this plan. If the station decided to fire early, just in case, the Rossi could die before the fight even started. If the station's targeting system could cut the Molinari's static and laser clutter, they might begin firing while the Rossi was still getting into position. And even if all that worked perfectly, there was still the assault team, cutting their way into the station and fighting corridor to corridor to the nerve center to take control. Even the inner planet's best marines were terrified of breaching actions, and for good reason. Moving through unfamiliar metal hallways without cover while the enemy ambushed you at every intersection was a good way to get a lot of people killed. In training simulations back in the Earth Navy, Holden had never seen the Marines do better than 60% casualties. And these weren't inner-planet Marines with years of training and state-of-the-art equipment. They were OPA cowboys, with whatever gear they could scrape together at the last minute. But even that wasn't what really worried Holden. What really worried him was the large, slightly warmer-than-space area just a few dozen meters above Thoth Station. The Molinari had spotted it, and warned them before cutting them loose. Having seen the stealth ships before, no one on the Rossi doubted that this was another one. Fighting the station would be bad enough, even up close, where most of the station's advantages were lost but Holden didn't look forward to dodging torpedo fire from a missile frigate at the same time. Alex had assured him that if they could get in close enough to the station, they could keep the frigate from firing at them for fear of damaging Thoth, and that the Rossi's greater maneuverability would make it more than a match for the larger and more heavily armed ship. The stealth frigates were a strategic weapon, he'd said, not a tactical one. Holden hadn't said, then why do they have one here? Holden moved to glance down at his wrist, then snorted with frustration in the pitch black of the ops deck. His suit was powered down, chronometers and lights both. The only system on in his suit was air circulation, and that was strictly mechanical. If something got fouled up with it, no little warning lights would come on. He'd just choke and die. He glanced around the dark room and said, Come on, how much longer? As if an answer, lights began flickering on through the cabin. There was a burst of static in his helmet. Then Alex's drawling voice said, Internal comms online. Holden began flipping switches to bring the rest of the systems back up. Reactor, he said. Two minutes, Amos replied from the engine room. Main computer. Thirty seconds to reboot, Naomi said, and waved at him from across the ops deck. The lights had come up enough for them to see each other. Weps? Alex laughed with something like genuine glee over the calm. Weapons are coming online, he said. As soon as Naomi gives me back the targeting comp, we'll be cocked, locked, and ready to rock. Hearing everyone check in after the long and silent darkness of their approach reassured him. Being able to look across the room and see Naomi working at her tasks eased a dread he hadn't even realized he'd been feeling. Targeting should be up now, Naomi said. Roger that, Alex replied. Scopes are up, radar up, radar up. Shit, Naomi, you seen this? I see it, Naomi said. Captain, getting engine signatures from the stealth ship, they're powering up too. We expected that, Holden said. Everyone stay on task. One minute, Amos said. Holden turned on his console and pulled up his tactical display. In the scope, Thoth Station turned in a lazy circle while the slightly warm spot above it got hot enough to resolve a rough hull outline. Alex, that doesn't look like the last frigate, Holden said. Does the Rossi recognize it yet? Not yet, Cap, but she's working on it. Thirty seconds, Amos said. Getting radar searches from the station, Naomi said. Broadcasting chatter. 
Holden watched on his screen as Naomi tried to match the wavelength the station was using to target them, and began spraying the station with their own laser comm array to confuse the returns. Fifteen seconds, Amos said. Okay, buckle up, kids, Alex said. Here comes the juice. Even before Alex had finished saying it, Holden felt a dozen pinpricks as his chair pumped him full of drugs to keep him alive during the coming deceleration. His skin went tight and hot, and his balls crawled up into his belly. Alex seemed to be speaking in slow motion. Five, four, three, two. He never said one. Instead, a thousand kilos sat on Holden's chest and rumbled like a laughing giant as the Rossi's engine slammed on the brakes at ten Gs. Holden thought he could actually feel his lungs scraping the inside of his ribcage as his chest did its best to collapse. But the chair pulled him into a soft, gel-filled embrace, and the drugs kept his heart beating and his brain processing. He didn't black out. If the high-G maneuvering killed him, he'd be wide awake and lucid for the entire thing. His helmet filled with the sound of gurgling and labored breathing, only some of which was his own. Amos managed part of a curse before his jaw was clamped shut. Holden couldn't hear the Rosie shuddering with the strain of her course change, but he could feel it through the seat. She was tough. Tougher than any of them. They'd be long dead before the ship pulled enough G's to hurt itself. When relief came, it came so suddenly that Holden almost vomited. The drugs in his system stopped that, too. He took a deep breath, and the cartilage of his sternum clicked painfully back into place. Check in, he muttered. His jaw hurt. Comrade targeted, Alex replied immediately. Thoth Station's comm and targeting array was the first item on their target priority list. All green, Amos said from below. Sir, Naomi said, a warning in her voice. Shit, I see it, Alex said. Holden told his console to mirror Naomi so he could see what she was looking at. On her screen, the Rossi had figured out why it couldn't identify the stealth ship. There were two ships. Not one large and ungainly missile frigate that they could dance around and cut to pieces at close range. No, that would have been too easy. These were two much smaller ships parked close together to trick enemy sensors. And now, they were both firing their engines and splitting up. Okay, Holden thought. New plan. Alex, get their attention, he said. Can't let them go after the Molinari. Roger, Alex replied. One away. Holden felt the rosy shudder as Alex fired a torpedo at one of the two ships. The smaller ships were rapidly changing speed and vector, and the torpedo had been fired hastily and from a bad angle. It wouldn't score a hit, but the Rossi would be on everyone's scope as a threat now. So that was good. Both of the smaller ships darted away in opposite directions at full burn, spraying chaff and laser chatter behind them as they went. The torpedo wobbled in its trajectory, and then limped away in a random direction. Naomi, Alex, any idea what we're facing here? Holden asked. Rossi still doesn't recognize them, sir, Naomi said. New hull design, Alex said over her. But they're flying like fast interceptors. Guessing a torpedo or two in the belly and a keel-mounted railgun. Faster and more maneuverable than the Rossi, but they'd be able to fire in only one direction. Alex, come around to... Holden's order was cut short when the Rosinante shuddered and jumped sideways, hurling him into the side of his restraints with rib-bruising force. We're hit! Amos and Alex yelled at the same time. Station shot us with some sort of heavy gauss cannon, Naomi said. Damage? Holden said. Went clean through us, Cap, Amos said. Galley in the machine shop. Got yellows on the board, but nothing that'll kill us. Nothing that'll kill us sounded good, but Holden felt a pang for his coffee maker. Alex, Holden said. Forget the little ships. Kill that comare. Roger. Alex replied, and the Rossi lurched sideways as Alex changed course to begin his torpedo run on the station. Naomi, as soon as the first one of those fighters comes around on his attack run, 
Give him the calm laser in the face, full strength, and start dropping chaff. Yes, sir, she replied. Maybe the laser would be enough to screw up his targeting system for a few seconds. Station's opening up with the PDCs, Alex said. This'll get a mite bumpy. Holden switched from mirroring Naomi's screen to watching Alex's. His panel filled with thousands of rapidly moving balls of light and Thoth Station rotating in the background. The Rossi's threat computer was outlining the incoming point defense cannon fire, with bright light on Alex's HUD. It was moving impossibly fast, but at least with the system doing a bright overlay on each round, the pilot could see where the fire was coming from, and which direction it was traveling. Alex reacted to this threat information with consummate skill, maneuvering away from the PDC's direction of fire and quick, almost random movements that forced the automated targeting of the point defense cannons to adjust constantly. To Holden, it looked like a game. Incredibly fast blobs of light flew up from the space station in chains, like long and thin pearl necklaces. The ship moved restlessly, finding the gaps between the threads and dodging away to a new gap before the strands could react and touch her. But Holden knew that each blob of light represented a chunk of Teflon-coated tungsten steel with a depleted uranium heart, going thousands of meters per second. If Alex lost the game... They'd know it when the Rosinante was cut to pieces. Holden almost jumped out of his skin when Amos spoke. Shit, Cap. Got a leak somewhere. Three port maneuvering thrusters are losing water pressure. Going to patch it. Copy, Amos. Go fast, Holden said. You hang on down there, Amos, Naomi said. Amos just snorted. On his console, Holden watched as Thoth Station grew larger on the scope. Somewhere behind them, the two fighters were probably coming about. The thought made the back of Holden's head itch, but he tried to keep focus. The Rossi didn't have enough torpedoes for Alex to fire shot after shot at the station from far off, and hope one made it through the point defense fire. Alex had to bring them in so close that the cannons couldn't shoot the torpedo down. A blue highlight appeared on the HUD surrounding a portion of the station's central hub. The highlighted portion expanded into a smaller subscreen. Holden could make out the dishes and antennas that made up the calm and targeting array. One away, Alex said, and the Rossi vibrated as her second torpedo was fired. Holden shook violently in his restraints, and then slapped back into his chair as Alex took the Rossi through a series of sudden maneuvers and then slammed down the throttle to evade the last of the PDC fire. Holden watched his screen as the red dot of their missile streaked toward the station and struck the comm array. A flash blanked out his screen for a second, and then faded. Almost immediately, the PDC fire stopped. Good sh- Holden was cut off by Naomi yelling, Bogey one is fired. Two fast movers. Holden flipped back to her screen and saw the threat system tracking both fighters and two smaller and much faster objects moving toward the Rossi on an intercept course. Alex, Holden said. Got it, Chief. Go on defensive. Holden slammed back into his chair again as Alex poured on the speed. The steady rumble of the engine seemed to stutter, and Holden realized he was feeling the constant fire of their own PDCs as they tried to shoot down the pursuing missiles. Well, fuck, Amos said almost conversationally. Where are you? Holden asked, then flipped his screen to Amos's suit camera. The mechanic was in a dimly illuminated crawl space, filled with conduit and piping. That meant he was between the inner and outer hulls. In front of him, a section of damaged pipe looked like snapped bones. A cutting torch floated nearby. The ship bounced violently banging the mechanic around in the tight space. Alex whooped over the comm. Missiles did not impact, he said. Tell Alex to stop jerking her around, Amos said. Makes it hard to hang on to my tools. Amos, get back to your crash couch, Naomi said. Sorry, boss, Amos replied with a grunt as he yanked one end of the broken pipe free. If I don't fix this and we lose pressure, Alex won't be able to turn to starboard anymore. Bet that'll fuck us up good. Keep working, Amos, Holden said over Naomi's protests. But hang on, this is going to get worse. 
Amos said. Roger that. Holden switched back to Alex's HUD display. Holden, Naomi said. There was fear in her voice. Amos is going to get... He's doing his job, do yours. Alex, we have to take these two out before the Molinari gets here. Get me an intercept on one of them and let's kick its ass. Roger that, Cap, Alex said. Going after Bogey 2. Could use some help with Bogey 1. Bogey 1 is Naomi's priority, Holden said. Do what you can to keep it off our backside while we kill his friend. Roger, Naomi said in a tight voice. Holden switched back to Amos's helmet camera, but the mechanic seemed to be doing fine. He was cutting the damaged pipe free with his torch, and a length of replacement pipe floated nearby. Strap that pipe down, Amos, Holden said. All respect, Captain, Amos said, but safety standards can kiss my ass. I'm getting this done fast and getting out of here. Holden hesitated. If Alex had to make a course correction, the floating pipe could turn into a projectile massive enough to kill Amos, or break the Rossi. It's Amos, he told himself. He knows what he's doing. Holden flipped to Naomi's screen as she poured everything the comm system had at the small interceptor, trying to blind it with light and radio static. Then he went back to his tactical display. The Rossi and Bogey Two flew toward each other at suicidal speeds. As soon as they passed the point where incoming torpedo fire could be avoided, Bogey Two launched both his missiles. Alex flagged the two fast movers for the PDCs and kept up his intercept course, but didn't launch missiles. Alex, why aren't we shooting? Holden said. Gonna shoot his torpedoes down, then get in close and let the PDCs chew him up, the pilot replied. Why? We've only got so many torpedoes and no resupply. No call to waste them on these munchkins. The incoming torpedoes arced forward on Holden's display, and he felt the Rossi's PDCs firing to shoot them down. Alex, he said, we didn't pay for this ship. Feel free to use it up. If I get killed so you can save ammo, I'm going to put a reprimand in your permanent file. Well, you put it that way, Alex said. Then, one away. The red dot of their torpedo streaked off toward Bogey 2. The incoming missiles got closer and closer, and then one disappeared from the display. Alex said, Shit, in a flat voice. And then the Rosinante slammed sideways hard enough that Holden broke his nose on the inside of his helmet. Yellow emergency lights began rotating on all the bulkheads, though with the ship evacuated of air... Holden mercifully couldn't hear the klaxons that were trying to sound throughout it. His tactical display flickered, went out, and then came back after a second. When it came back up, all three torpedoes, as well as Bogey 2, were gone. Bogey 1 continued to bear down on them from astern. Damage, Holden yelled, hoping the comm was still up. Major damage to the outer hull, Naomi replied. Four maneuvering thrusters gone, one PDC non-responsive. We've also lost O2 storage, and the crew airlock looks like it's slag. Why are we alive? Holden asked while he flipped through the damage report and then over to Amos's suit camera. The fish didn't hit us, Alex said. The PDC got it, but it was close. Warhead detonated and spread us down pretty good. It didn't look like Amos was moving. Holden yelled. Amos, report. Yeah, yeah, still here, Captain. Just hanging on in case we get knocked around like that again. I think I busted a rib on one of the hull braces, but I'm strapped down. Good fucking thing I didn't waste time with that pipe, though. Holden didn't take time to answer. He flipped back to his tactical display and watched the rapidly approaching Bogey 1. It had already fired its torpedoes, but at close range it could still cut them apart with its cannon. Alex, can you get us turned around and get a firing solution on that fighter? He said. Working on it. Don't have much maneuverability, Alex replied. And the Rossi began rotating with a series of lurches. Holden switched to a telescope and zoomed in on the approaching fighter. Up close, the muzzle of its cannon looked as big around as a corridor on Ceres, and it appeared to be aimed directly at him. Alex, he said. Working on it, Chief, but the Rossi's hurting. The enemy ship's cannon flared open, preparing to fire. Alex, kill it. 
Kill it, kill it, kill it. One away, the pilot said, and the Rosinante shuddered. Holden's console threw him out of the scope view and back to the tactical view automatically. The Rossi's torpedo flew toward the fighter at almost the same instant that the fighter opened up with its cannon. The display showed the incoming rounds as small red dots moving too fast to follow. Income, he shouted, and the Rosinante came apart around him. Holden came too. The inside of the ship was filled with flying debris and bits of superheated metal shavings that looked like slow-motion showers of sparks. With no air, they bounced off walls and then floated slowly cooling like lazy fireflies. He had a vague memory of one corner of a wall-mounted monitor detaching and bouncing off three bulkheads in the world's most elaborate billiard shot, then hitting him right below the sternum. He looked down and the little chunk of monitor was floating a few centimeters in front of him. But there was no hole in his suit. His guts hurt. The ops console chair next to Naomi had a hole in it. Green gel slowly leaked into small balls that floated away in the zero-G. Holden looked at the hole in the chair and the matching hole in the bulkhead across the room and realized that the round must have passed within centimeters of Naomi's leg. A shudder swept through him leaving him nauseated in its wake. What the fuck was that? Amos asked quietly. And how about we don't do it anymore? Alex, Holden said. Still here, Cap, the pilot replied, his voice eerily calm. My panel's dead, Holden said. Did we kill that son of a bitch? Yeah, Cap, he's dead. About half a dozen of his rounds actually hit the Rossi. Looks like they went through us from bow to stern. That anti-spalling webbing on the bulkheads really keeps the shrapnel down, doesn't it? Alex's voice had started shaking. He meant, we should all be dead. Open a channel to Fred, Naomi, Holden said. She didn't move. Naomi? Right, Fred, she said, then tapped on her screen. Holden's helmet was filled with static for a second, then with Fred's voice. Guy Molinari here. Glad you guys are still alive. Roger that. Begin your run. Let us know when we can limp over to one of the station's docks. Roger, Fred replied. We'll find you a nice place to land. Fred out. Holden pulled the quick release on his chair's restraints and floated toward the ceiling, his body limp. Okay, Miller. Your turn. Chapter 40 Miller. Oi, Pampa, the kid in the crash couch to Miller's right said. Pop seal, you and bang, eh? The kid's combat armor was gray-green, articulated pressure seals at the joints and stripes across the front plates where a knife or flechette round had scraped the finish. Behind the face mask, the kid could have been fifteen. His hand gestures spoke of a childhood spent in vacuum suits, and his speech was pure belt creole. Yeah, Miller said, raising his arm. Saw some action recently. I'll be fine. Fine's fine is fine, the kid said. But you hold to the Foka, and Neto can pass the air out to you, eh? No one on Mars or Earth would have the first clue what you're saying, Miller thought. Shit, half the people on Ceres would be embarrassed by an accent that thick. No wonder they don't mind killing you. Sounds good to me, Miller said. You go first, and I'll try to keep anyone from shooting you in the back. The kid grinned. Miller had seen thousands like him. Boys in the throes of adolescence, working through the normal teenage drive to take risks and impress girls. But at the same time, they lived in the belt where one bad call meant dead. He'd seen thousands. He'd arrested hundreds. He'd watched a few dozen picked up in hazmat bags. He leaned forward to look down the long rows of close-packed, gimbaled crash couches that lined the gut of the Guy Molinari. Miller's rough estimate put the count at between ninety and a hundred of them. So by dinner, chances were good he'd have seen a couple dozen more die. What's your name, kid? Giagu. Miller, he said, and gave the kid his hand to shake. 
The high-quality Martian battle armor Miller had taken from the Rosinante let his fingers flex a lot more than the kids. The truth was, Miller was in no shape for the assault. He was still getting occasional waves of inexplicable nausea, and his arm ached whenever the medication level in his blood started thinning out. But he knew his way around a gun, and he probably knew more about corridor-to-corridor corridor fighting than nine-tenths of the OPA rock jumpers and ore hogs like Giagu, who were about to go in. It would have to be good enough. The ship's address system clicked once. This is Fred. We've had word from air support, and we're green for breach in ten minutes. Final checks start now, people. Miller sat back in his couch. The clicking and chattering of a hundred suits of armor, a hundred sidearms, a hundred assault weapons filled the air. He'd been over his own enough times now. He didn't feel the urge to do it again. In a few minutes, the burn would come. The cocktail of high G drugs was kept on the ragged edge, since they'd be going straight from the couches into a firefight. No point having your assault force more dope than necessary. Julie sat on the wall beside him her hair swirling around her like she was underwater. He imagined the dappled light flashing across her face. Portrait of the young pinnace racer as a mermaid. She smiled at the idea, and Miller smiled back. She would have been here, he knew, along with Giogu and Fred and all the other OPA militia, patriots of the vacuum. She'd have been in a crash couch wearing borrowed armor, heading into the station to get herself killed for the greater good. Miller knew he wouldn't have. Not before her. So, in a sense, he'd taken her place. He'd become her. They made it, Julie said, or maybe only thought. If the ground attack was going forward, it meant the Rocinante had survived, at least long enough to knock out the defenses. Miller nodded acknowledging her and letting himself feel a moment's pleasure at the idea, and then thrust gravity pushed him into his couch so hard that his consciousness flickered, and the hold around him dimmed. He felt it when the breaking burn came, all the crash couches spinning to face the new up. Needles dug into Miller's flesh. Something deep and loud happened, the guy Molinari ringing like a gigantic bell. The breaching charge. The world pulled hard to the left, the couch swinging for the last time as the assault ship matched the station's spin. Someone was shouting at him. Go, go, go! Miller lifted his assault rifle, tapped the sidearm strapped to his thigh, and joined the press of bodies making for the exit. He missed his hat. The service corridor they'd cut into was narrow and dim. The schematics the Tycho engineers had worked up suggested they wouldn't see any real resistance until they got into the manned parts of the station. That had been a bad guess. Miller staggered in with the other OPA soldiers in time to see an automatic defense laser cut the first rank in half. Team three, gas it, Fred snapped in all their ears, and half a dozen blooms of thick, white, anti-laser smoke burst into the close air. The next time a defense laser fired... The walls flashed with mad iridescence, and the smoke of burning plastic filled the air, but no one died. Miller pressed forward and up a red metal ramp. A welding charge flared and a service door swung open. The corridors of Thoth Station were wide and roomy, with long swaths of ivy grown in carefully tended spirals, niches every few feet with tastefully lit bonsai. Soft light, the pure white of sunlight, made the place feel like a spa or a rich man's private residence. The floors were carpet. The HUD in his armor flickered, marking the path the assault was meant to take. Miller's heart stepped up to a fast, constant flutter, but his mind seemed to grow perfectly still. At the first intersection, a riot barrier was manned by a dozen men in protogen security uniforms. The OPA troops hung back, using the curve of the ceiling as cover. What suppressing fire there was came in kneecap low. The grenades were perfectly round, not even a hole where the pin had been pulled. They didn't roll as well on the soft industrial carpet as they would have on stone or tiling, 
so one of the three went off before it reached the barrier. The concussion was like being hit in the ears with a hammer. The narrow, sealed corridors channeled the blast back at them almost as much as at the enemy. But the riot barrier shattered, and the protogen security men fell back. As they all rushed forward, Miller heard his new, temporary compatriots whooping with the first taste of victory. The sound was muffled, as if they were a long way away. Maybe his earpieces hadn't dampened the blast as much as they were supposed to. Making the rest of the assault with blown eardrums wouldn't be easy. But then Fred came on, and his voice was clear enough. Do not advance. Hold back. It was almost enough. The OPA ground force hesitated, Fred's orders pulling at them like a leash. These weren't troops. They weren't even cops. They were a belter, irregular militia. Discipline and respect for authority weren't natural to them. They slowed. They got careful. So, rounding the corner, they didn't walk into the trap. The next corridor was long and straight, leading, the HUD suggested, to a service ramp up toward the control center. It looked empty, but a third of the way to the curve horizon, the carpeting started to fly apart in ragged tufts. One of the boys beside Miller grunted and went down. They are using low shrapnel rounds and bouncing them off the curve, Fred said into all their ears at once. Bank shot ricochet. Stay low and do exactly as I say. The calm in the earther's voice had more effect than his shouting had. Miller thought he might have been imagining it, but there also seemed to be a deeper tone, a certainty. The butcher of Anderson Station, doing what he did best leading his troops against the tactics and strategies he'd helped create back when he'd been the enemy. Slowly, the OPA forces moved forward, up one level, and then the next, then the next. The air grew hazy with smoke and ablated paneling. The wide corridors opened into broad plazas and squares, as airy as prison yards, with the protogen forces and the guard towers. The side corridors were locked down, local security trying to channel them into situations where they could be caught in crossfire. It didn't work. The OPA forced open the doors, taking cover in display-rich rooms, something between lecture halls and manufacturing complexes. Twice, unarmored civilians, still at their work despite the ongoing assault, attacked them when they entered. The OPA boys mowed them down. Part of Miller's mind, the part that was still a cop and not a soldier, twitched at that. They were civilians. Killing them was, at the very least, bad form. But then, Julie whispered in the back of his mind, No one here is innocent. And he had to agree. The operations center was a third of the way up the station's slight gravity well, defended better than anything they had seen so far. Miller and five others, directed by the all-knowing voice of Fred, took cover in a narrow service corridor, keeping a steady suppressing fire up the main corridor toward ops and making sure no protogen counterattack would go unanswered. Miller checked his assault weapon and was surprised to see how much ammunition was left. Oi, Pampa, the kid next to him said, and Miller smiled, recognizing Giogu's voice behind the face mask. Day's the day, Pasa. I've seen worse. Miller agreed, then paused. He tried to scratch his injured elbow, but the armor plates kept anything satisfying from happening. Bekastu? Giagu asked. No, I'm fine. It's just... this place. I don't get it. It looks like a spa, and it's built like a prison. The boy's hands shifted in query. Miller shook his fist in response, thinking through the ideas as he spoke. It's all long sight lines and locked down side passages, Miller said. If I was going to build a place like this, I'd... The air sang, and Giogu went down, his head snapping back as he fell. Miller yelped and wheeled. Behind them in the side corridor, two figures in protogen security uniform dove for cover. Something hissed through the air by Miller's left ear. Something else bounced off the breastplate of his fancy Martian armor like a hammer blow. He didn't think about raising his assault weapon. It was just there, coughing out return fire like an extension of his will. 
The other three OPA soldiers turned to help. Get back, Miller barked. Keep your fucking eyes on the main corridor. I'm on this. Stupid, Miller told himself. Stupid to let them get behind us. Stupid to stop and talk in the middle of a firefight. He should have known better. And now, because he'd lost focus, the boy was... laughing? Jagu sat up, lifted his own assault weapon, and peppered the side corridor with rounds. He got unsteadily to his feet, then whooped like a child who'd just gotten off a thrill ride. A wide streak of white goo stretched from his collarbone up across the right side of his face mask. Behind it, Jagu was grinning. Miller shook his head. What the hell are they using crowd suppression rounds for? He said to himself as much as the boy. They think this is a riot? Forward teams, Fred said in Miller's ear. Get ready. We're moving in five, four, three, two, go. We don't know what we're getting into here, Miller thought as he joined the sprint down the corridor, pressing toward the assault's final target. A wide ramp led up to a set of blast doors done in wood grain veneer. Something detonated behind them, but Miller kept his head low and didn't look back. The press of bodies jostling and their ragtag armor grew thicker, and Miller stumbled on something soft, a body in protogen uniform. Give us some room, a woman at the front shouted. Miller pushed toward her, cutting through the crowd of OPA soldiers with his shoulder and elbow. The woman shouted again as he reached her. What's the problem? Miller shouted. I can't cut through this bitch with all these dick lickers pushing me, she said, lifting a cutting torch already glowing white at the edge. Miller nodded and slid his assault rifle into the sling on his back. He grabbed two of the nearest shoulders, shook the men until they noticed him, and then locked his elbows with theirs. Just need to give the tech some room, Miller said and together they waded into their own men, pushing them back. How many battles, all through history, fell apart at moments like this, he wondered. The victory all but delivered, until Allied forces started tripping over each other. The welder popped to life behind him, the heat pressing at his back like a hand, even in armor. At the edge of the crowd, automatic weapons gurgled and choked. How's it going back there? Miller shouted over his shoulder. The woman didn't answer. Hours seemed to pass, though it couldn't have been more than five minutes. The haze of hot metal and aerosolized plastic filled the air. The welding torch turned off with a pop. Over his shoulder, Miller saw the bulkhead sag and shift. The tech placed a card-thin jack into the gap between plates, activated it, and stood back. The station around them groaned as a new set of pressures and strains reshaped the metal. The bulkhead opened. Come on, Miller shouted, then tucked his head and moved through the new passageway, up a carpeted ramp and into the op center. A dozen men and women looked up from their stations, eyes wide with fear. You're under arrest, Miller shouted as the OPA soldiers boiled in around him. Well, no, you're not, but... Shit, put your hands up and back away from the controls. One of the men, tall as a belter but built solid as a man in full gravity, sighed. He wore a good suit, linen and raw silk, without the lines and folds that spoke of computer tailoring. Do what they say, the linen suit said. He sounded peeved but not frightened. Miller's eyes narrowed. Mr. Dresden? The suit raised a carefully shaped eyebrow, paused and nodded. Been looking for you, Miller said. Fred walked into the op center like he belonged there. With a tighter set of the shoulders and a degree shift of the spine, the master engineer of Tycho Station was gone, and the general was in his place. He looked over the op center sucking in every detail with a flicker of his eyes, then nodded at one of the senior OPA techs. All locked down, sir, the tech said. The station's yours. Miller had almost never been present to witness another man's moment of absolution. It was such a rare thing, and so utterly private, that it approached the spiritual. Decades ago, this man, younger, fitter, 
not as much gray in his hair, had taken a space station, wading up to his knees in the gore and death of belters, and Miller saw the barely perceptible relaxation in his jaw, the opening of his chest, that meant that burden had lifted. Maybe it wasn't gone, but it was near enough. It was more than most people managed in a lifetime. He wondered what it would feel like if he ever got the chance. Miller, Fred said, I hear you've got someone we'd like to talk to. Dresden unfolded from his chair, ignoring the sidearms and assault weapons as if such things didn't apply to him. Colonel Johnson, Dresden said. I should have expected that a man of your caliber would be behind all this. My name is Dresden. He handed Fred a matte black business card. Fred took it as if by reflex, but didn't look at it. You're the one responsible for this? Dresden gave him a chilly smile and looked around before he answered. I'd say you're responsible for at least part of it, Dresden said. You've just killed quite a few people who are simply doing their jobs. But maybe we can dispense with the moral finger-pointing and get down to what actually matters. Fred's smile reached all the way to his eyes. And what exactly would that be? Negotiating terms, Dresden replied. You're a man of experience. You understand that your victory here puts you in an untenable position. Protogen is one of the most powerful corporations on Earth. The OPA has attacked it, and the longer you try to hold it, the worse the reprisals will be. Is that so? Of course it is, Dresden said, waving Fred's tone away with a dismissing hand. Miller shook his head. The man genuinely didn't understand what was going on. You've taken your hostages. Well, here we are. We can wait until Earth sends a few dozen battleships and negotiate while you look down the barrels, or we can end this now. You're asking me how much money I want to take my people and just leave, Fred said. If money's what you want, Dresden said with a shrug. Weapons? Ordnance? Medical supplies? Whatever it is you need to prosecute your little war and get this over with quickly. I know what you did on Eros, Fred said quietly. Dresden chuckled. The sound made Miller's flesh crawl. Mr. Johnson, Dresden said, nobody knows what we did on Eros. And every minute I have to spend playing games with you is one I can't use more productively elsewhere. I will swear this. You are in the best bargaining position right now that you will ever have. There is no incentive for you to draw this out. And you're offering... Dresden spread his hands. Anything you like, and amnesty besides. As long as it gets you out of here and lets us return to our work. We both win. Fred laughed. It was mirthless. Let me get this straight, he said. You'll give me all the kingdoms of the earth if I just bow down and do one act of worship for you. Dresden cocked his head. I don't know the reference. Chapter 41 Holden The Rosinante docked with Thoth Station on the last gasps from her maneuvering thrusters. Holden felt the station's docking clamps grab the hull with a thud, and then gravity returned at a low one-third G. The close detonation of a plasma warhead had torn off the outer door of the crew airlock and flooded the chamber with superheated gas, effectively welding it shut. That meant they'd be using the cargo airlock at the stern of the ship and spacewalking over to the station. That was fine. They were still in their suits. The Rossi had more holes now than the air cycling system could keep up with, and their shipboard O2 supply had been vented into space by the same explosion that killed the airlock. Alex dropped from the cockpit, face hidden by his helmet, his belly unmistakable, even in his atmosphere suit. Naomi finished locking her station and powering down the ship, then joined Alex, and the three of them climbed down the crew ladder to the ship's aft. Amos was waiting there buckling an EVA pack onto his suit and charging it with compressed nitrogen from a storage tank. 
The mechanic had assured Holden that the EVA maneuvering pack had enough thrust to overcome the station's spin and get them back up to an airlock. No one spoke. Holden had expected banter. He'd expected to want to banter. But the damaged Rossi seemed to call for silence. Maybe all. Holden leaned against the cargo bay bulkhead and closed his eyes. The only sounds he could hear were the steady hiss of his air supply and the faint static of the calm. He could smell nothing through his broken and blood-clogged nose, and his mouth was filled with a coppery taste. But even so, he couldn't keep a smile off his face. They'd won. They'd flown right up to Protogen, taken everything the evil bastards could throw at them, and bloodied their noses. Even now, OPA soldiers were storming their station, shooting the people who'd helped kill Eros. Holden decided that he was okay with not feeling any remorse for them. The moral complexity of the situation had grown past his ability to process it, so he just relaxed in the warm glow of victory instead. The calm chirped, and Amos said, Ready to move. Holden nodded, remembered he was still in his atmosphere suit, and said, Okay, hook on, everyone. He, Alex, and Naomi pulled tethers from their suits and clamped them to Amos's broad waist. Amos cycled the cargo airlock and flew out the door on puffs of gas. They were immediately hurled away from the ship by station spin, but Amos quickly got them under control and flew back up toward Thoth's emergency airlock. As Amos flew them past the Rossi, Holden studied the outside of the ship and tried to catalog repair requirements. There were a dozen holes in both her bow and aft that corresponded to holes all along the inside of the ship. The Gauss cannon rounds the interceptor had fired probably hadn't even slowed appreciably on their path through the Rossi. The crew was just lucky none of them had found the reactor and punched a hole in it. There was also a huge dent in the false superstructure that made the ship look like a compressed gas freighter. Holden knew it would match an equally ugly wound in the armored outer hull. The damage hadn't extended to the inner hull, or the ship would have cracked in two. With the damage to the airlock and the total loss of their oxygen storage tanks and recycling systems, there would be millions of dollars in damage and weeks in dry dock, assuming they could make it to a dry dock somewhere. Maybe the Molinari could give them a tow. Amos flashed the EVA pack's yellow warning lights three times, and the station's emergency airlock door cycled open. He flew them inside, where four belters in combat armor waited. As soon as the airlock finished cycling, Holden pulled his helmet off and touched his nose. It felt twice its normal size and throbbed with every heartbeat. Naomi reached out and held his face still, her thumbs on either side of his nose, her touch surprisingly gentle. She turned his head from side to side, examining the injury, then let go. It'll be crooked without some cosmetic surgery, she said. But you were too pretty before, anyway. It'll give your face character. Holden felt a slow grin coming on, but before he could reply, one of the OPA troops started talking. Watch the fight, hermano. You guys really kick some ass. Thanks, said Alex. How's it going in here? The soldier with the most stars on his OPA insignia said, Less resistance than expected, but the protogen security's been fighting for every foot of real estate. Even some of the eggheads have been coming at us. We've had to shoot a few. He pointed at the inner airlock door. Fred's heading up to Ops. Want you people up there pronto. Lead the way, Holden replied, his nose turning it into, Lead the way. How's that leg, Cap? Amos asked as they walked along the station corridor. Holden realized he'd forgotten about the limp his gunshot to the calf had left him. Doesn't hurt, but the muscle doesn't flex as much, he replied. Yours? Amos grinned and glanced down at the leg that still limped from the fracture he'd suffered on the Donager months earlier. No biggie, he said. The ones that don't kill you don't count. Holden started to reply, then stopped when the group rounded a corner into a slaughterhouse. They were clearly coming up behind the assault team, because now the corridor floor was littered with bodies, the walls with bullet holes and scorch marks. To his relief, 
Holden saw a lot more bodies in protogen security armor than in OPA gear. But there were enough dead belters on the floor to make his stomach twist. When he passed a dead man in a lab coat, he had to stop himself from spitting on the floor. The security guys had maybe made a bad decision in going to work for the wrong team, but the scientists on this station had killed a million and a half people just to see what would happen. They couldn't be dead enough for Holden's comfort. Something tugged at him, and he paused. Lying next to the dead scientist was what looked like a kitchen knife. Huh, Holden said. He didn't come at you guys with that, did he? Yeah, crazy, no? said one of their escorts. I heard of bringing a knife to a gunfight, but... Ops is up ahead, said the ranking trooper. General's waiting. Holden entered the station's ops center and saw Fred, Miller, a bunch of OPA troops, and one stranger in an expensive-looking suit. A line of technicians and operations staff in protogen uniform had their wrists cuffed and were being led away. The room was covered deck to ceiling in screens and monitors, most of which were spooling text data too fast to read. Let me get this straight, Fred was saying. You'll give me all the kingdoms of the earth if I just bow down and do one act of worship for you. I don't know the reference, the stranger said. Whatever else they were about to say stopped when Miller noticed Holden and tapped Fred on the shoulder. Holden could swear that the detective gave him a warm smile, though on his dour face it was hard to tell. Jim, Fred said, then gestured for him to come closer. He was reading a matte black business card. Meet Anthony Dresden, executive VP of bioresearch for Protogen, and the architect of the Eros project. The asshole in the suit actually reached out like he was going to shake hands. Holden ignored him. Fred, he said. Casualties? Shockingly low. Half their security had non-lethals, Miller said. Riot control, sticky rounds like that. Holden nodded and then shook his head and frowned. I saw a lot of protogen security bodies out there in the corridor. Why have so many guys and then give them weapons that can't repel borders? Good question, Miller agreed. Dresden chuckled. This is what I mean, Mr. Johnson, Dresden said. He turned to Holden. Jim? Well then, Jim, the fact that you don't understand this station's security needs tells me that you have no idea what you've become involved with. And I think you know that as well as I do. As I was saying to Fred here, Antony, you need to shut the fuck up, Holden said, surprised by the sudden flush of anger. Dresden looked disappointed. The bastard had no right to be comfortable, condescending. Holden wanted the man terrified, begging for his life, not sneering behind his cultured accent. Amos, if he talks to me again without being told to, break his jaw. My pleasure, Captain, Amos said, and took half a step forward. Dresden smirked at the ham-fisted threat, but kept his mouth shut. What do we know? Holden asked, aiming the question at Fred. We know the Eros data is coming here, and we know this piece of shit is in charge. We'll know more once we've taken the place apart. Holden turned to look at Dresden again, taking in the blue-blood European good looks, the Jim's sculpted physique, the expensive haircut. Even now, surrounded by men with guns, Dresden managed to look like he was in charge. Holden could imagine him glancing down at his watch and wondering how much more of his expensive time this boarding party was going to take. Holden said, I need to ask him something. Fred nodded. You earned it. Why? Holden asked. I want to know why. Dresden's smile was almost pitying, and he stuck his hands into his pockets as casually as a man talking sports at a dockside bar. Why is a very big question, Dresden said. Because God wanted it that way? Or perhaps you want to narrow it for me? Why Eros? Well, Jim, you can call me Captain Holden. I'm the guy that found your lost ship, so I've seen the video from Phoebe. I know what the protomolecule is. 
Really? Dresden said, his smile becoming half a degree more genuine. I have you to thank for turning the viral agent over to us on Eros. Losing the Anubis was going to put our timeline back months.